time Cause I'm already gone So long Can you stay the night? Cause you're the thing I want I want I know you're feeling different when you're stressed out But even with no makeup you still stand out Cause no one makes me feel the way you do now you do now The way that you move your body You make it look like a hobby Every time that you touch me It's electricity Things we discovered Underneath last night's covers Everything came so easy It's electricity
지지 않는가 I'll never miss this chance Make you dance 해가 뜨는 것도 모를게 Dance, time to dance 집에 가는 것도 감옥해 울가진 너의 하얀 불을 좋아해 울가진 문제들은 모두 가볍게 손 들고 태워 이 순간을 밝아 시작하면 되는 걸 처음이 어색하다 해도 이미 익숙해진 걸 I'll never miss this chance Make you dance 해가 뜨는 것도 모를게 Dance time to dance 집에 가는 것도 감옥해 
ESL One Kuala Lumpur is brought to you in part by Intel Arc, Acer Predator, DHL, Monster Energy, and One X Bet.
And with that, we have concluded the group stage here at Kuala Lumpur. We're the second best team in the world, and I think I take some pride in that. We were always one step ahead of the meta. Last time in Malaysia, we got last place. But this time we'll do a lot better. Like uh, all year, like every tournament, like a lot of people are saying like we're like one of the fa favorites. I think we as a team actually have uh, what it takes to win. Need to sh show it, I guess. We just lost our, our strategy. Then we try to be better, better and better. It was kind of close to get to TI. That's life. I mean, it's gonna be fresh start for us, for, for others. Just the full tournament. It's gonna be start of new season, Team Secret. Well, looking back, I think uh, we've always been super close. We've always been like a series behind on trying to like get top eight. We're always like one game away. And I think we've all grown a lot, even though it's been like a very disappointing year. I think we all learned a lot and I think we can make it because I think this patch kind of favored us a lot. I think after this tournament, it could be a fresh start for us and a new beginning. It also could mean that like the end. Uh, everybody on our team are very skilled and they also everybody's giving yeah, all they have to Dota. I think the reason that the other teams didn't beat us the last season was we just have a very good fundamental strategies that we made. Yeah, we were just all on the same page. We kind of know what we want to do and also if we lose, we're really good at like fixing stuff or like building on it. We kind of just figured out what to do, right? Especially before the big patch with the big map, we were like unbeatable, I feel like. They changed our stuff, like we get nerfed a bit, right? And then you have to like get on the same page again. 我对我们新的阵容就是感觉大家都是很有实力的选手，然后这一周多感觉大家在一起磨合的也蛮好的，就是。我们AR战队带着新阵容来到了这个比赛 I feel really good about this event and, and the team going into it. I feel like we have a good chance of, of going far and beating other top teams. Yeah, I feel like this team has the potential to, to be on top. I think this year I feel very motivated about the, myself and my role and, and making sure I can be the best position for it. 就是我们在小组赛是拿了第一名嘛，然后虽然是输给了对手，坚定了败的组，但是我们还是那个很有实力的战队，然后我们会在主舞台中证明自己。Yeah, we're a brand new roster, and uh, I hope we can show that we're capable of uh, competing with the biggest teams here in Kuala Lumpur. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to ESO One Kuala Lumpur, baby! Ah, oh, it feels good to be back once again. Thank you so much for you this morning. We have bought, brought the greatest Dota players in the world. You guys want to see some Dota today? There we go. And of course, we have returned to the greatest crowd in Dota 2. Let them hear it at home, my friends. There we go. Woo! But best Dota in the world, best crowd in the world. Very exciting, feels very good. However, I do have one more question. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to see a new Dota patch, baby? Woo! Oh, it's been a long time. We got some crazy neutral items. We got some insane new strategies for you guys to cheat, go home, and lose all your ranked games tonight. Don't be afraid, my friends, because the action is starting now. Let's go ahead and take a look at the group stage that happened yesterday, remind you guys of old Dota before we get in to the rest of your lives. Let's take a peek.
Quinn back. Quinn is going to be fighting this one. Long raise. Uphill miss. Oh, oh good one. Who would have? Oh. Wait, what? Uh, I think that's the best shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Nothing to say. He's got a good echo, but they can't get the burst. Not they don't get the initial kill. They don't have that damage. They make the jump and they try to make it work, but you've lost your Earthshaker. Sky buys back, now Monet the focus, the Razor is falling, the good shield crash and rolling thunder there to take him down. Get onto Tofu, nothing to say, Blink echoes the gyro, but what Ooh, next? Centaur is gone. What next? Sam taking way too much damage. Rubs is going to come out on Maureen, but XM still dropping low, does go down. Meanwhile, the Doom committed. They are still trying for the Pango, but Maureen just stand his ground. He finally oh. goes down and now Stink oh. you. Oh, Stink you. What an, what an initiation! This is a oh, very oh. dirty way to win the game, but Lo, he's going for it. The Ancient under siege, Primal spit out, Skinner, he's gonna have to chrono these units to try and get rid of them, I think. He's still trying to fight this one out. XXS is still just focusing on the Ancient. Somebody deal with this guy. Lo, he brings them back oh, and it's all it's over. Done. It is all <laughs> over, Sora <laughs> Ray. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are live from the Malaysia International Trade and Exhibition Center, and we started off with 12 of the best teams in the world. We already cut that down to eight of the best teams in the world. And by the end of it, we will only have one team that will be undisputedly the best here at ESL One Kuala Lumpur, powered by Intel. It's going to be a fantastic road. And I know, you know, normally we talk about all the, the normal things. Oh, what's happened over the last few days, the bracket, how the team's been looking, who's doing better than they expected to, who's doing a little bit worse than they expected to. But uh, we decided to rip up that page in our, in our production rundown and just start a fresh one because we got a fresh patch and there's so much to talk about. And that is exactly what we're going to do here with my panel. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody welcome. It is BSJ, it is Kasu, it is Effie. And uh, they have done their best to try and read up on everything, Effie. How far did you get? I mean, I skimmed through most of it. I, I didn't expect to wake up to a patch today, but here we are. You know, I think it'll be pretty chaotic, pretty exciting, and we'll figure it out together as the yeah, tournament yeah. progresses, both the panel, the teams, and the audience. So that should be a good time. Yeah, I tried uh, my best. I feel like I read through it three times, and I remember like 10%, maybe 20. <laughs> I remember when I was playing too, when you wake up to a patch like this, it's kind of like Christmas. Maybe not the day where you need to play a tournament, because it's pretty rough, but it's, uh, it's a good feeling. Yeah, it's also the stuff that you read over and you're like, okay, I remember what that said, but what does it actually mean? You know, yes. How is this going to play out as mm -hmm. the professional games, like, is this going to change? Is it going to be broken? Is this going to be completely useless? Are players going to be willing to try it? Like, that's the question I have today. Today is all about the lower brackets. So in terms of being experimental, I don't know. I don't know how many teams will be experimental with that, uh, with that patch note. Uh, and with the changes that happened. But we want to focus a little bit on a couple of changes that we feel like might have a big impact here. It's OK. So you got to know this patch is big. It's got a whole new number. So it's no longer in 34. We're in 35. So there's a lot of changes. There's a lot of neutral items new. There's neutral items removed. There's new items. And there's a lot of changes on the heroes as well. But we, we got a couple of highlights. Uh, Brian, out of these, uh, where would you like to start? I would like to start with the Conda. I think that with the change to Silver Edge no longer critting and now this being like a targetable crit mm. um, item, I think the carry itemization is going to be significantly different with this patch. And whenever certain items go in and out of meta, that also drastically affects who gets picked. So I'm eyeing Morphling for today with that item. But I think like also just to add on to that, especially with like Phylactery, I like, so Phylactery is a newer item, and now they build onto that and they make mm. it upgradable into something new. I always like seeing that, because now you have new options for different heroes to do different builds, and I think that's the most exciting part about Dota, when people figure out new stuff. Yeah, for sure. And all of these, you know, cheap 2k gold items that you start buy at the start of the game, they typically have a place in Dota when they have a build up to an even greater item that allows you to scale into the late game. And we, when we look at heroes like Skyrath Mage and Zeus who have already been buying Phylactery, this will give them a little bit of an extra play. But on that note, I want to talk about the Parasma because this is a new Witchblade upgrade. And every time there's a Witchblade patch, you know the heroes like Puck are going to be good, you know heroes like Queen of Pain are going to be good. And the former Witchblade, the Witchblade upgrade of the past was the Revenant's Brooch, which was very situational, right? It makes it so that you can hit targets while they're ethereal, and 
you often never saw it. I think I've only seen it like 20 times since that item's been released. But now that you have this Parasma, it gives you that magic corruption passive, which makes it so that if you hit a target, you're just doing damage amp on them. So those heroes that I mentioned, like the Queen of Pain, like the Puck, are going to be that more potent. And I think just with these two items alone, like it's two spell items that got better. You have DD Rune that gives spell amp. You have Divine Raper that does some spell amp stuff too. I think, you know, this could be a patch where we have some magic amp heroes just be better. Same with Bloodstone, some AoEs here. I mean, I'm, you know, I could be talking trash because no one actually knows what's Nobody good, but knows. small claim. Uh, I want to also talk about the Roshan changes that you saw in there because there were two very exciting ones for me. The Roar! So, you know, a team takes Roshan, Brian. It's great sometimes, you know, it doesn't, it happens at maybe 15 minutes, it happens at 25 minutes, doesn't matter. Team takes Roshan, they'll basically have a chip on their shoulder because if they try to take the next Roshan, Roshan gets mad. Yeah, he roars you. If it's like 30 minutes in, this is 350 damage that that roar is going to do to pretty much everybody on the team that's doing it. It's a pretty wide radius. And not only that, the enemy team knows. Yep. And it makes you take 25% yes, extra damage five. from all sources for eight seconds. So if we're thinking like we've seen the echo slams of the past and the contesting of the team that's behind, a lot of teams since the Roche has been on the side of the map have kind of just given it up and said it's not worth the risk of just losing the game instantly. And now it's like, we might be seeing teams might not even be willing to go for it or some crazy ass smoke plays on top of the Roche fights. Very true, but there's a great reason to go for it still, Kazu. Mm, so the thing is, the Roshan banner, which is like the other change. Yeah. I think, first of all, I love that they put this in where you are now notified when the enemy team does Roche, because mm -hmm. then you know, oh, you know, they're doing it, let's go to their contest. But the second thing, the banner, you're gonna drop this banner when you wanna push. It makes your creeps like, 75% more tanky, 50% more damage. So now if you're strong enough on the second Roche and the enemy team gave it to you for free, you might just go high ground and get a free rack. Yeah, and adding that kind of stakes to Roche, I feel is very important because with the addition of the banner and of course the general creep upgrades that happen where super creeps and mega creeps yeah. do more damage overall, they're saying that, okay, creeps are going to be strong and people are going to go high ground earlier because if you recall, one of the biggest problems of the last patch was nobody was able to go high ground. It was far too risky. And because of that, we were taking these 50 minute games, 60 minute games, and we were seeing them as kind of a norm in the patch. But now there are all of these little changes that will hopefully make for average game time being shorter. Yes, and contesting Roshan, been made a little bit easier as well because the teleport time for the Twin Gates got reduced, so you can always teleport to your half of the map, and if Roshan is on the other half, then you can just go to, through the Twin Gates. Does cost a little bit of mana now, but even if you don't have any mana, you can still go through, it just takes anything you can get. So that is something that is definitely important as well. Yeah, not just that. Uh, actually, the TP to outposts on both jungles is shorter. It went from six seconds to mm. four seconds, yep. I believe. So now the buyback into TPing on the outpost into Roche, you can contest Roche, Roche much faster and much easier. And I actually really love that change, not just for Roche, but for the ability to just gank and help your teammates when they're being run out in the jungle. I mean, that six second TP time was very significant and now it's better. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And I love that they did it this way too with, you know, you're faster around the map, it's easier to contest Roche because I think Brian was saying it too. People got very good at just farming the whole map. The map is so big, there's so much gold. You can contest Roche, okay, chill. But now I think that shit is no more. No more. You need to contest that. A lot of fights in the corners of the map yeah. is what I am, uh, what I'm thinking. Uh, there were also we mentioned three heroes on, on that graph that you just saw with the Ember, the Viper, and the Lion. And there is a lot more heroes that have so many things changed. And we'll talk about all of them. Or at least, you know, we're gonna do our best <laughs> to talk about all of them. There is a lot. But uh, why not also see how everybody else is experiencing this patch that dropped as we check in with Sir Action Slack somewhere in the crowd. Hello, yes, that is right, my friends. I am here in the crowd with the guys in the front row. These are the people that came in first, the most dedicated fans. Yes, we're laughing, we're excited. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Oh, I'm good excited. to hear. Yes, hi. What made you want to be in the front row? Show up first, be right there, staring at every pore on Insania's face. Yeah. I mean... That was it? That's yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Let's take a little look around here. Insert name, team name here is on this sign. Why? No fans? You're in the front and you don't even care? I mean, you want to watch the great Dota, so you Aww. cheer for which team wins. Yeah. That's fantastic. Anyone else here just, they don't care about teams, it's just the Dota? Can anybody hear that? <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. That was a lot of people. What is this? Uh, Team Liquid and GG again for finals. Bro, why? Why? It's been a year, man. This is not necessary, please. It's Team Secret. Anyone else? 
No, no one else no. is worth it? No, no, no. Uh, Liquid and Gigi is a classic matchup. Oh my God, stop it. We are not doing another El Clasico. Let's get something else, although we are here for the good Dota. What do we got over here? Hello, you guys are really camped out. What time did you show up to get here in this front row? Uh, we were here at about nine. Yeah. At what, nine? Because we, we traveled all the way from Norway. What? Oh my goodness gracious. It's our first time. Yeah, and um, uh, we, our flight is so early, so we came straight from the airport. Uh, Let's go straight from the airport, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic. All right, all right. If you had one dream, one player to meet, who would it be? Uh, Ace. Ace. From Ace, I'm coming yeah. for you. All right, you're going to Norway, baby. You're coming in this crowd. We're going to say hello. Malaysia, can we get one more time before we get these teams on the stage? Let's hear it. Oh. Yeah. They are wide awake over here. We hope you guys are watching at home, too. Back to you guys on the panel, who I know are awake. All right? I know you're awake. I've been hearing you. <laughs> We're definitely <laughs> awake. I love the energy already here, bright and early from the crowd. And it's only going to get better as we're going to get the Dota underway very soon. But uh, before we get to that, couple of things. First of all, I mean, we talk a lot about the, the patch, and I'm sure that you guys at home also have a lot of favorite changes. Or maybe you want to share what was in your Naughty or nice gift? Who knows? There's been there's been a couple of wild ones out there. So why don't you share that with us? Use hashtag Rise Above Fate to share everything you want here for ESO on Kuala Lumpur. As uh, we'll, we'll keep check on that, and, and I hope you all have been nice because the naughty ones, whew, they 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 harsh out there. They're rough out there. All right, let's take a look at what's coming today because yeah, we will still look at the brackets. Of course we will. There's uh, been a lot of Dota already, and that meant that we have teams seeded into the upper bracket, seeded into the lower bracket. Now we already have had some matches played, and uh, you know we're gonna keep everything a little bit of a secret. But uh, we already had some matches played in the upper bracket, Brian, and uh, we have Azure Rain and Gaming. They are not playing today. I just want to point that out. They are not playing here today. Uh, but what's your biggest surprise so far in terms of the teams how they've done i would say it's azure ray like mm -hmm. this is a new roster almost entirely and they're looking consistent like it's not just like they're out skilling people or anything like that their teamwork looks cohesive and i think that's going to be something that's super important now that you've introduced the chaos of yeah. what we have today i think uh, chinese dota is what is so far impressed me in this tournament even though g2ig they lost their match against gaman i think azure ray and them they look phenomenal. Mm. Mm. Now that it's new patch, you don't really know what to expect, but just from gameplay and like doing and playing as a team, they're really up there. Yeah, and as for the lower bracket teams on the other hand, the ones that surprised me most have to be Secret and Tundra. I can say with full honesty that I did not expect Secret to do this well. Yes, they're starting out in the lower bracket, but it was so close. They were tied with Gaiman in the group stages, and they made it to the lower bracket through a 1v1 mid showdown. But before that, they looked so consistent. They were playing hyper-aggressive, they had very innovative strategies, and it seems like something clicked for them. Whereas on the other hand, Tundra, formerly TSM, I did not expect to see them in this kind of form. I thought that they would struggle with the loss of their former organization, with the loss of Ari having to maybe adapt to a new four player. That wasn't the case at all. They've been looking very clean. They have been looking very clean, and we will see Tundra later today go up against Beth Boom. We'll have Falcons play today as well, and they will go up against the winner of our first series of the day. Now, someone mentioned earlier that they want to see an El Clasico. If there is any El Clasico here today, it's Team Secret versus Team Liquid. Now, it's been a little while, but I'm very excited for this series, and we don't have to wait that long, so stay tuned. We'll be right back with Team Secret versus Team Liquid here at ESL 1 Kuala Lumpur. Stay honest, honest. So do a little dance, do a little wiggle. Hey. It's 
it's your turn. Your turn. Yeah, learn how the universe works. Hey, yeah, come on. You can't control the world. versus Team Liquid, a best of three in the lower bracket here at ESL1 Kuala Lumpur. That is how we will start the day. And I mentioned earlier that it is a little bit of an El Clasico, and that would be 100% the case were it not for the fact that last year things were a little bit different. Of course, last year, as in a full year and a couple months ago, these two teams met in the lower bracket finals of the international. And, and since then, things started to go very far south for Team Secret. The question is, is, is this their upward trajectory, their comeback arc? It seems to be a little bit of the case. We're focusing our attention first on Team Secret. As Effie, you mentioned them earlier already, this is the team that has impressed you most. Yeah, they've just been looking so solid. And what I want to point out is even, I mean, the new patch dropped, so this is going to be even more relevant. But when everybody felt like they were recycling the same ideas in the group stage meta, they clearly had an identity. They clearly had a way to play. They're even picking these bizarre position five heroes, starting their draft with ogres, venomancers, things like that. And it was working out for them. They play tempo, they play aggressively, they found Priscilla's hero pool, and something finally clicked. I have to say, though, I don't know how much that will translate to the new patch, but based on what I'm seeing, I think they'll be able to transition very well. Yeah, I, I do like the point you bring up about, I would say they're very free when it comes to the drafting and their gameplay. What I love most about Secret right now is their aggression. There's mm -hmm. like four heroes in one lane at seven minutes, twin gating here, twin gating there. 
Sure, in some games they still lost, but overall bringing this, especially in a new patch, it brings chaos. You know, the, the other team is still thinking, oh, is my hero good? What new item do I need to build? Bam, you're dead. Good luck. Yeah, I've seen a lot of fearlessness from these guys. I see where they're coming out of the laning stage, like down 3k, 4k, and they're the ones making plays. That's like the kind of thing I like to see. They're playing to win, absolutely. And this is a roster that I think a lot of people were skeptical about yep. when it came out this year. And I was one of those people. And I've been thoroughly impressed with them throughout the entire event. And it's mainly the fact that if they're winning, they look solid, like consistent, they're executing their plan. But if they're losing, they're not counted out. It's, uh, it's quite phenomenal that this team came from not Open Qualifier 1, because they didn't make it through that one. They qualified through Open Qualifier 2, which is like your ultimate last chance. And then first match, instantly, boom, knocked down to the lower bracket. And they still made it here. And not just that, they've been just steadily improving and improving. And I actually think they might have an edge here today. Kezu, I, I look forward to your, hearing your expertise on this, because mm. obviously you played under Puppy. And yep. uh, this is a new patch. And yep. if anyone has experience playing on new patches, especially mid-tournament, which used to happen quite frequently, it's Puppy. Yeah, he is a, he's a genius. He's got the big brains. And he's also very open to then incorporating. It's like, okay, guys, you just woke up. You read the new patch. What's good? Let's combine it. Let's mm -hmm. try to make it happen. But the one thing for Liquid, the nerdiest player on Earth. He's not here, but he's with them. 3-3. Yeah. Three, three. I, I bet every, my entire life that he's already demo-moded 1,800 offlane heroes with combinations <laughs> and telling Sableite and the boys what's good. Yeah, completely. I mean, you can't talk about Liquid without talking about the addition of their new offlaner, who unfortunately is not here and is being stood in by Saberlight. But 33 is one of the most creative and one of the most impactful in how he transitions these ideas to Dota. Players of all time, him alongside Aoi yeah. back when they were on Tundra, they were the heart of this team. They were the brains of this team. They made everything work. So I actually feel like he's been sitting at home ever since the patch dropped, trying everything and sending every single text to the Liquid group chat, the Liquid Discord, to try this, do this, do that. So because they have 3-3 in their corner, I would give them an edge over Secret just for uh, drafting in this new patch. Brian, could you confirm or deny being a Team Liquid streamer that there's a WhatsApp group? Uh, yes, that you're I can't potentially part I, of. I, I, <laughs> I can confirm that Netta is definitely nerding out okay. and giving as much information <laughs> not, as he can. You're not invited in the group? Yeah, no, they, they, they had to kick me after the Because oh, no. <laughs> I'm there like, ah, oh, I can't share all the secret information. No, the thing about this team is that I we're, they're, no, uh, they're, they're familiar with the lower bracket. This is where they belong. Like, every tournament I watch them, like Berlin Major comes to mind yep. from last year, where you think they look kind of average in the group stage, but they kind of brought it like together towards the end, they won the games that they had to win in order to secure their slot in the playoffs. And this team operates even better with less pressure. And I think that they are good at taking that pressure off themselves. And I think a new patch also for them, they're like, what are the expectations? Yeah. Like we have a stand in, he's got good vibes. Like we don't have any expectations going into this. And I think they'll really thrive in that environment. Yeah, uh, on top of that, of course, I mean, yeah, they, they lost Azai after TI, it was their drafter together with Blitz. And then it was gonna be Blitz and 33 that was gonna take over. And both of them are not here. <laughs> so Enjoy. Mickey has got his work cut out for him here as he's the one uh, clicking the buttons, I've been told. Very excited to see what's gonna happen in this upcoming best of three. But of course, you know, it's all great to talk about this upcoming matchup, but one very important thing is missing still, and that is some players on the stage. So for that, we are gonna head to Slack. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for some Dota? Ah, yes, feels good. We are about to get started our first match of the day. Now, it has been a long time since I have been able to say this, but it fills me with such joy. Ladies and gentlemen, coming back with a vengeance, may I please introduce to you the first time in a long time. Bring him out. It's Team Secret! Oh, the Puppers has come. Look at the swag coming out here today. Fantastic. New patch, new rules, new secret here on the main stage. They look ready, they feel ready. But are you ready to see their opponents, my friends? Coming out, one of the most dominant teams that Dota 2 has ever seen. Let's get it together for a little bit of water. Bring out Team Liquid! Goodness gracious, there we go. Crowd goes wild, two crowd favorites, as you can tell. 
And they look like they are ready to destroy it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it appears that our teams are ready to go on our first match of the day. New patch, new rules, same old Dota and same old Malaysia. Let's give it up one more time for our two teams. All righty, to your booths, please, and we will throw it back to the casters. Let's, oh, excuse me, the panel. Let's get this party started. <laughs> Thank you, Slack. Uh, we're talking about Team Secret and Team Liquid. I feel like there's a big elephant in the room that we have to mention here because, yeah, we talked a little bit about how Team Secret hasn't looked uh, really amazing in the last year and making a comeback. Now, the question is, why? Why have they not looked amazing? Could it be that there was one team in particular that just kept picking players mm. from one team in particular just to take take the best away, Zai, Nisha, Matu, all were stolen. <laughs> stolen, Brian. You know, they've willingly left, I think. They were stolen, Brian. Stolen. They were stolen, oh. bro. Come on, man. <laughs> no, but do you think that there's maybe a little bit of, you know, bad Oh, it's definitely like, you know, puppets at the training grounds, just <laughs> yeah. sending them off to the liquid boot camp now. I mean, I, there's definitely a little bit of anim not animosity necessarily, but you're like, come on, man. It's like, like one time, two times. Two ti one time, two times is fine. Yeah. The third time. There's, there's a pattern here. Yeah. There, there really is. It does seem like Team Secret has found a, a good mix again. Of course, I say again, but these are all familiar faces, Kezu, yep. uh, coming back to Team Secret. It's honestly kind of, uh, I would say, a cool thing. The fact that, you know, you can pick up an older player. Like, I don't know all the details if they were kicked or if they left. But either way, you know, bringing back older faces just to see it. You know, maybe we've all matured, we've grown in a way, let's try it one more time. And we can see so far that, I mean, it looks pretty good, right? Boom is looking phenomenal in this tournament. Mid one used to be one of the best mid players. I feel like he's trying to shape up to that. So yeah, overall, uh, they're looking great. Yeah, he's had a little bit of, uh, of a carry stint as well, now back in the middle lane. And uh, if, if he might not have won the, the 1v1 mid against Quinn, but he's a very stable mid laner, mm -hmm. Effie. He really is, and he's not necessarily the most technically solid mid laner. I mean, he's an excellent player, but when you think about mid laners, there are different styles, right? There's the lane dominators like Quinn, there are the tempo controllers like mid one, and there are the basically second carries of your team style mid laners. But the tempo controller in mid one seems to fit in so well with this iteration of Secret, because like we've talked about before, they've been very aggressive. They've been bringing three, four heroes to side lanes, Minute 10, they've just been constantly barreling forward even with net worth disadvantages. And the style of heroes that Midwin has been playing in his invokers and in his any, any kind of playmaking hero like Pucks, it's been working very nicely. And I like a lot what he's been doing, even when his gameplay or his early laning such isn't as good, it doesn't impact his gameplay. Like he will still do the same thing on Invoker if he has 10 CS or 30 at five minutes, just because this is what we do, this is the script, this is how the team works, I'll still do it. Yeah. Yep. I will always express my skepticism when a mid laner wasn't playing mid for like a sizable amount of time. And that's something that we only really see in the mid lane, like the actual laning stage itself, because Miro was mentioning he is a playmaker. His like game sense around the map, knowing where he needs to be at the right time is absolutely there. But against a player like Nisha, I am absolutely concerned for like what that five minute CS count looks like this game. Well, we're going to find out uh, which heroes they get to play in that mid lane with as we are in <laughs> the draft. Hello. It is time to, to try and educate everybody, including ourselves, a little bit on, on the changes, uh, the heroes, and the lion pops up first. And that, Ryan, is one of the heroes that we wanted to mention already at the start, because it is a big one. Yeah, the shard is no longer a meme on Reddit anymore. This <laughs> now does 100% of the mana drained as damage. So I not only think that gives him, like, some mid to late game usage of the shard in fights, but also like in the laning stage, you can just impale mana drain somebody and suddenly it's doing damage. Yeah, and that makes it really relevant because in the past, the way Lion traded on lane was he would impale and mana drain anyway, just so that he could get the mana back from the impale. But he was losing those couple of seconds that he was mana drain as a trade. The other support would either choose to right click him while he was draining or just walk away so they don't get their mana drain. So now there's definitely more utility to it. and. That was one of Lion's biggest weaknesses, honestly, is his laning was fine. It was all right. Like, if you paired him with a hero like Dawnbreaker in the past, you mm. could get kills. But outside of that, he just fell short compared to any other popular lane support, like the Dark Willows. I feel like Lion was already creeping up a little bit. And now when those heroes who have the trajectory also get a buff, they're naturally going to be very good. I also like the secret. You know, they just take with the Nature's Prophet. I think this is a great hero for, especially day one of a new patch. 
you know, they're still thinking about what's good, what's not. Nature's Prophet was good last patch. Didn't really get changed very much. I think very minor nerfs, but it's a great hero for Puppy. Speed it up, fits perfect with their, with their lineup. Yeah, something I actually want to bring up, uh, you were talking, Brian, about how against the lane dominating mid laner like Misha, it's going to be a little bit scary for mid one. But I really feel like with the changes to the power wounds, with them becoming stronger, shouldn't that make rotations for a player like mid one even more powerful? And wouldn't that make it more necessary for teams to play around power runes more than they used to instead of side lanes? Oh yeah, absolutely. And Nature's Prophet's going to be one of the best supports just to do that. I think what Secret does is they're willing to take fights no matter what the game state looks like, and they'll always bring the numbers. Because you said, like, they'll just bring four heroes to a side lane. In this case, with the new patch, they might have already discussed exactly that. Like, yeah. maybe that's going to be much more focused on the mid, game, mid lane this game. Yeah, I think runes are just so important. I don't know if this will ever change throughout the course of mm -hmm. Dota, because it just does too much, especially now with all the changes to the runes as well. Like Spellcasters who now, yeah, you have good right-click damage anyway with Aditi, but now you get Spell Amp in the early game, like you mentioned some Zeus, Storm, whatever it may be. Now they don't just want Arcanes, DDs are good too. So, you know, rune stonks, up. And I'm glad Arcane Rune got nerfed. I, I do have to bring yeah. that out. And especially with the, um, the Spell Prisms and the Quickening Charms of the world getting cycled out of this patch and its neutral items, I I think that's an excellent change. I think CDR in Dodo is way too broken. I fully, fully agree. This stuff was way too good. I mean, I also always like when stuff like this gets like cycled in and out. Maybe it's a bit hard to like get used to. But uh, when it comes to the next pick, Mars, there were a lot of changes to this hero. It's a lot easier to do the good old arena spear combo. You have less backswing, you have less formation on the arena. And I think Mars as well was uh, a bit underrated until we saw a game from Amar. He pops off, now he's back. And Bulwark now gives Mars phased movement, which kind of sounds like nothing at first glance, but things like that are very relevant, especially in the laning phase when you could potentially get a skill point in this and it could help you just run through a creep wave, make it faster. Just these little changes really add up on heroes like Mars who have already been kind of good, but not good enough. Yeah, it's important to note that they're not necessarily game-breaking changes on any of his spells, but if you look at the patch notes, it's all four spells for yeah. Mars <laughs> that got buffed. So. That's going to absolutely play a role. And you mentioned the, the spear into arena combo yeah. being so much easier to execute with the formation time of arena. That's also going to make it so if you just go for the arena in the laning phase, you're not going to have that time where you miss them. Yeah. That happens maybe 10, 20% of the time. These little changes that just these niche situations where it would have potentially gone the other way. As Mira said, you get past a creep wave because they're body blocking you with summons. There's just so many matchups that are now slightly in favor of Mars when they weren't before. And it makes it makes Mars better at catching out these pesky storms and pucks of the past. Now that this combo is faster, he's actually a pretty legitimate hero to pick as a solution versus these uh, hard to catch mid laners. I mean, you don't have to be careful as Monkey King, like you can get cut down from your tree. But either way, I like Liquid's response with the Monkey Lich. Like you want to stop this tempo from the Mars coming in. You know Nature's Prophet is very likely to TP to this lane. And we cannot forget as well, there's a very easy sprout into spear combo at any point in the lane if Puppy does TP over to the lane. But, you know, Team Liquid, they're very good with Monkey King. They can play it on one, they can play it on Nisha as well. Lots of tempo, fits very well in this game. Yeah, and Liquid were already running this Monkey King plus Lich lane as a response to Slardar, and it worked out really well, even when these heroes weren't that good. But now, guess what? These heroes are also buffed. I don't remember monkeys exactly. I'm scrolling to them right now, but there are a lot of quality of life changes, like the Boundless Strike shards, Primal Spring damage is higher. The Tree Dance did get lower cast range, but now on max level, you get 0.8 seconds to refresh it, which makes you a lot harder to catch, right? Those 0.2 seconds can be very, very effective. And the CD decrease on Wukong, Wukong's command, you think 10 seconds on level one is not that relevant? It actually really yeah. is. These 10 seconds add up, especially when there's a lot of fights going on in the early game. So it feels like Monkey King just has a better presence early on. One thing I want to note, because you guys are touching a lot on the small changes, Dota at the highest level is all about the small things. You put yourself in a position where you're like, okay, if they go on me here, I will still live and I'll get out in a small change, like 0.1, 0.2 seconds or a few hundred range. It will change everything. Suddenly you die, you look like a clown, the entire fight is over. Like, it's gonna be hard to adjust to these things. But Team Secret, back to basics, mid one invoker, a classic. And also Monkey King used to be a traditional counter to Mars and that once Mars would place an arena, Monkey King would throw down his ring and kind of take that area back for his team. Hmm. But now that Wukong's command got an extra plus 75 AoE cast range on it, that makes it easier to do this arena counterplay. So it's a very cool concept. 
I think Monkey King is also one of the primary beneficiaries of the Orb of Corrosion change. Yeah, the Minus mm. Armor was okay for him, but any hero that also benefits from attack speed with the movement speed slow of the Orb of Venom, in the case of Monkey King, helping him build up those Jingu stacks in the laning phase, suddenly you're looking at Boundless Strike being 15 mana less at level 1. That's going to help you secure uh, range creeps in the lane. Then yep. you've got this Orb of Corrosion that's going to buff up that like 3-4 minute timing in the laning phase. You might even be having like the Lich kill combo with Lion going through the portal. But all these little things, right? That's, that's what these teams are going to abuse. And I like that these teams are sticking to their signatures mm -hmm. that they think got buffed in a relevant way in a new patch. That's actually a really good point about the Orb of Corrosion. Monkey King should be one of the best new carriers yeah. of this item. And in the past, when you would go Orb of Corrosion, the Blightstone active wasn't as good as all of the extra attack speed and armor for farming neutral camps, right? That's the issue with Orb of Corrosion, is that it doesn't really translate to mm -hmm. the farming stage of your carry that well. But this new Orb of Corrosion, not only is it strong in lane, not only does it give you armor, but it's going to help you just kill creeps faster. Yeah, Colossal Haze, I would say, is like one of the nicest feeling items as a carry. Mm. Like just early attack speed on any buildup is great. But I want to touch on the how the draft is developing. I think mid uh, Invoker is great in this draft. You have the dispel. You can have sun. You have sunstrike set up if you want to play Cosvex. You have the tornado to dispel. And both teams are kind of like building on top of what they have. And I think Liquid with a lot of team fight like counter control with the Pango is super important against heroes like Rasta, the Mars Arena as well, the Invoker. So I think both teams are literally getting exactly what they want. Yeah. I don't know how they're going to kill the Shadow Shaman. They gave him one base armor. <laughs> it's unkillable. In the, new, in the new patch. But also, if you think about like three, four patches ago, Shaman Hex was just a Hex. Yep. Now, with the new level 10 talent and all the buffs he's received, it is 35% damage amp on the target that is hexed. It is insane how, well, they like... They gave him a hex damage amp talent on 10. Yeah. All right. So, like, suddenly you're just, like, <laughs> half as tanky as any hero in the game when you're hexed. And that's going to contribute to, like, heroes like Invoker with the Meteor combo, the Sunstrike, Mars. There's a lot they can dump in that three-second yep. hex. Yeah, that's not insignificant whatsoever. Right now, the hero that benefits most from Shaman's new hex would be the Invoker, but even that is enough, right? You're talking about this Shaman suddenly setting up for these Sun Strikes in the early game with the Hex into Shackle. That could be a, a lot of damage, a lot of ways to get those early kills on side lanes the way that Secret liked to play. And of course, Shaman's always had incredibly high attack damage, yeah. so he was good at trading. We laugh about plus one base armor, but plus one base armor to a hero with base damage like Shaman's is pretty crazy. It really adds up in those first few levels. These support trades are going to be really important, and I feel like Shaman should be able to out-trade Lich quite easily. Ooh. What I think this, this is a pretty dirty pick, I think. I'm already surprised Visage has only been played once in this tournament. I think heroes who go like Vlad's, AC, Solar Crest are incredibly strong. You already have Minus Armor as well with the Lucky Shot. And these two supports, if there's two supports that don't want to play against summons, I mean, these two are on, in my top three list of Rasta and Nature's Prophet. So Visage got buffed, right? So Soul Assumption damage is now calculated before reductions. Whereas before it was doing damage after reductions. So he's just going to do more damage overall in the laning phase with his Soul Assumption. Where do we want to see everybody lanes? Because I feel like Pango and Visage could go anywhere. And actually maybe Monkey King also. Probably going to be Pango mid and then the Visage off lane. I'm just interested to see. Yeah. Like you, against Visage, you always want a hero that can just kill him. Because level one, he's very weak. But if you don't threaten him, that soul assumption hurts, and then once he gets like level two or three with the grave chill points, and then a point in grave keepers. Okay, so they actually go for void. That's the opposite of a hero that I think would punish the visit. The wombo combo potential on the side of Team Secret, it's real. though. Oh my goodness, that's gonna hurt. This is all about pacing, I think. Team Liquid's always been a high-paced team. They yep. They doubled down on that with the Visage. Monkey King is going to be likely to get very active in the early game. But if they get to that late game on Secret, yeah, as you guys said, the Wombo's there. Secret scaling is uh, pretty nasty, I would say. But I am afraid for them. I think Team Liquid's early game pacing. Visage in the lane, you have a Pango who doesn't have too many answers apart from getting chrono a Monkey King lane as well. I think Secret's early game, they have to damage control hard. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be another classic story of tempo versus scaling into yeah. the late game, which team will be able to pull off their strategy better. But I think that with all of the changes to potentially going high ground earlier, with the way that super creeps are changed, with the way the Roche banner is now a thing, that could potentially contribute to the game ending faster, making yeah. these scaling lineups a little bit less potent. Um, my biggest question mark is actually Pango. I wanted to ask you about him, because like, mm. can you quickly say something about the changes, like good or bad? Um, I honestly don't even know what happened to him, so uh, hold they, on. They gave him the level 15 talent kind of for free on the shield crash cooldown. I remember. I think this is yeah, a, there a you huge buff. I don't know why they did that. Now it means you don't have to take the other talent. You can take the lower duration of your ult 
they just gave him a shard for free. Well, we did talk about the importance of the mid lane in this matchup with Nisha versus mid one, and it seems like mid one on his invoker has his work cut out for him against the pango of Nisha. We're gonna find out how it's gonna play out. First game of our first best of three. Malaysia, make some noise for Cap and SPG. The first match here at ESL One Kuala Lumpur on the main stage is also the first with the new patch, Avery. It's uh, exciting times. Whenever you have a big new patch like this, it's always big question marks. I mean, it's one of the rare times I feel like there's an even playing ground across not just the pros, but the community. Everyone's learning together. That's right. We're all terrible at the same time, <laughs> yep. same degree. Can't ask for anything more. I guess if you were a team that was dominating, maybe you're a little bit upset. You know, yeah. if, you, if you were figuring out the patch, you had the consistency going. But hey, that's what Dota's all about. Adapt, improvise, overcome. Uh, both these teams, you could say, were not doing the best because they weren't in the upper bracket in the first exactly. place. So, you know, maybe they're both happy there's a new patch to be figured out. I know Insania was talking about it. He tweeted out about it. He's like, well, if we lose, uh, then this is terrible and we hate this. But if we win, it was great for Dota. So. Yeah, set up the reasons before the match happens. That's, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, 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 that's what you got to do anyway, because uh, we're probably going to be stretched out for... When it comes to this match, there's a lot of things unexpected here, right? We've got Lion. Everyone's talking about the Lion. It was a meme. Now it's become real. Now there's real damage behind it. It was the first thing that Slack said when we went into the green room. Did you see Lion? What'd you guys think? I was right all along. No, he was just wrong very early. That's <laughs> yeah. how I like to think about it. I mean, that's a dangerous precedent, though. Yes. That means if you just make enough noise about a hero, mm -hmm. you put enough fake news out there. Yeah, you just meme real. enough about it on Reddit. Yeah, meanwhile, I'm arguing for like, give me five base damage on Bane for like six years, nothing. <laughs> this guy makes a rant and in a day becomes the most broken first pick support of the patch, potentially. Ah, I mean, bad precedent if I say so myself, but we'll see. Maybe it'll lose, maybe it'll be terrible. Maybe, I don't know. It's gonna be interesting because I, I already saw like a couple pro players trying out in the mid lane. I saw uh, a miracle, not uh, Mir Southeast Asian miracle. Oh, he was playing mid lion. Obviously, we're not going to be seeing it here. They're picking boring old fake ass yeah, hero pango. You know. You know what Invoker's change was? It was like one base damage or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really yeah. exciting. Yeah. Like a little bit more agility or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Nothing super exciting there, but. Uh, Lion being picked up, I think Visage, I mean, Visage is one of the heroes that I was going to look for, uh, not because of the Visage change himself, but the biggest changes in this patch were actually the items, right? And I think that Visage and Pango actually both take advantage of uh, one of these items, which is Bloodthorn. Yeah, a lot of the crits too. I mean, even something like the, the Conda could be interesting, right? Like Visage was a phylactery buyer at yeah. that point as well. There's a lot of really big changes to the itemizations that are going to affect a lot of the offlaners in particular, I think. I think the Veil into the Shivas is another route because it uses Helm of Iron Will. Anytime these big region items get turned into items that can scale into the mid game, eventually it feels like the offlane meta pushes that direction, right? Especially with some of the rings or like these other random part buildups getting nerfed a bit. Yep. It's going to be interesting to see maybe some of these Int or even Agi offlaners have a bit more viability compared to all these strength, you know, bruisers we've seen for the last year or so. So if you guys are wondering, if you guys haven't actually checked out the patch, or if you have, you probably don't remember anything in it because it's massive. But what we're talking about when it comes to at least the Bloodthorn is the new active. It makes it so all attacks against the target deal 60 bonus magic damage. So that applies for the Visage. It applies for the Familiars too, I believe. When we were testing it earlier, it worked that way. Pango with a Swashbuckle. There's another one as well. You also were talking about the uh, the new item. Which one? The the Parasma? The Wakanda. The Wakanda. So that Conda, one is Conda like, forever, Cap. Conda. <laughs> of course, of course. That one's the upgraded phylactery, right? Yes. No. You're tricking me now. What? No, it's the upgraded phylactery. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're talking about where line. now <laughs> when myself. you get the extra damage, basically, phylactery does extra damage when you put hit a spell on somebody, right? Single target spell. But now it's uh, when you upgrade it to Conda, it, the spell is similar to Phylactery's passive, but the bonus damage is rescaled from a flat 100 to 100 plus 75% of your attack damage. And there's a lot of heroes that could use that. Uh, first hero that came to mind was like Clinks for me, right? Additional sure. flow, well, hopefully a hero not that already Clinks. builds physical damage. Just keep that hero out of the meta. But, uh, <laughs> it looks like a game's starting up soon. And of course, I mean, the one hero that I have to mention, the Shaman Cap. He, of course. He, he has been rising for so long. This tournament is about rising above fate. The Shaman <laughs> will now rise above the fate. He has gotten the extra armor. He has finally gotten the buffs this hero requires. And now we are seeing him on the main stage, on land, in a vital elimination match. 
There's and a reason why. This hero, in my opinion, incredibly good. The new level 10 talent as well, plus 10 on the Hex damage amp. This spell is no joke. You get Hexed in the middle of a fight. It's like getting, it's like, it reminds me of the old Soul Amp from Shadow Deep. Yes. Like Soul Catcher. You're just thinking. like removing effective draw percent HP because of the effective buff. This is something I want to look out for, and I, I like the support duo that is coming out from Secret in general, because we also saw Puppy just popping off on the Fury on this whole tournament, right? It felt like this has been his highest impact hero because it's a support that he can basically just play core on. And if there's one thing we know about Puppy, it's that he basically wishes he could play carry every game. Yeah, pretty much. And we're going to see him already looking at the phylactery, which is pretty interesting. I assumed he was just going to be rushing Solar Crest, right? No longer you can go go the medallion, which is probably a, a hit to Furion in his playstyle, but Solar Crest is still going to be value, but I guess you can't use it offensively anymore, so maybe that item is going to fall by the wayside. We'll see. The battle begins. Early smoke up from Team Liquid. Did not find anybody here. They're going to get a battle over the bounty runes here, and they're going to trade two for two, but Mikke is going to take some serious damage from Boom on his way out. This game might come a lot down to the tempo, and which of these support duels can create that for their cores? Because if the Visage for Saberlight just gets off to a massive start here, there's not a lot that really deals with the Familiars outside of, again, the flip side, the Mars being able to have his teamfight impact felt, especially if Invoker is maybe going to have a tough time mid, where we've seen mid one kind of lose lanes, but then come back in the mid game. This is a lineup with, of course, you're running Invoker plus the Faceless Void. You kind of want a slower game here, right? Yeah. You just want to get to your later core levels, go to the late game, get the double Chronosphere up, where this game is probably going to feel impossible at that point. Because I don't think the monkey is fighting this void in the ultra late here with Invoker to back it up. Furion's going to push your lanes in. It's going to be hard to get that jump from Liquid side. So they're going to try and play faster here. Put Saberlight in a position where he can just start mowing down these towers, take over the map, and then all of a sudden, like, do you have time to get to that late game? Do you have time to use these Chronospheres off cooldown and make them felt? And of course, maybe you're not going to have the mana to use it. This lion proves to be as strong as everybody has claimed. That was a rough one after the time walk gets hit by the Soul Assumption. That was another big buff about Visage that he received in this patch is now that damage that, you know, he amps up, it's based off of before reductions, which I think is a massive buff to him, right? It means he's going to get those ticks of Soul Assumption a lot faster and just Wait. be throwing them out nonstop, especially when later on you get that, like, level 15 talent. Way easier. The 15 talent also seems really interesting. That's what I'm saying. I wouldn't be surprised to see like this phylactery visage style come back. Just play a lot more off the soul assumptions. Yeah. On top of your birds still doing decent damage here. We'll see what Saberlight opts to go for. His itemization I think is gonna be the most interesting to me. Just in terms of how fast it ramps up. Our mid matchup we talked about a little bit, and panel certainly talked about it quite a bit, is the mid one versus Nisha matchup, how that is probably expected to go the way of Nisha. And Candidate. I think in this matchup as well, Pango versus Invoker, Quaswex Invoker, Melee Hero naturally has an advantage for CS early. And Nisha is winning that lane. However, I do think this is an incredibly good tornado game, for, for lack of a better way to phrase it. Like, you're playing versus Lich, they saw that in the draft. You get your dispel right away. You get extra control in the fight. And this is an incredibly power hero, powerful hero versus most carries, but particularly Monkey King. Monkey King really suffers versus Invoker in the late game fights because he's all about taking the fight in an anchor spot around the Wukong. And Invoker's happy to just either kite that out with Ghost Walk, slow you down with Ice Wall, you get disarmed, you get tornadoed. Yeah. All these spells, they reset the engagement to where your Wukong is useless. If that ever happens for Secret, they're going to be super happy in those late game fights. So I think mid one is definitely the most impactful person in this game in terms of dictating where those fights happen and who is controlled in those engagements, right? So the lane, yeah, it's going to be tough here, but who cares, right? Yeah. Are you expecting him to uh, make that transition to Exor? I mean, he's got great Cataclysm combos, right? Basic consideration and the Mars. Box, Box getting in trouble, trouble here. First blood available. Sprout. Slowed down by the Sprout and the Blood Grenade, and he's going to be caught and killed. Puppy will take that first blood. Uh, that's really good for Secret. This is not a lane I expected them to get aggressive on and take those kills down, but Time Dilation is going to do it, and Puppy straight in the top lane is going to make his presence felt on both side lanes here. This is exactly what we saw from him in that other Furion game. I think he's been the most consistently active on this hero in the lane phase, and it's usually winning Boom's lane. So Boom has traditionally had a very good start when Puppy plays this hero, whereas Crystallis has not suffered too much, and that is a decent recipe for success. Just leave mid one alone mid. It's kind of a play style that I think a lot of people aren't used to. Normally these TPs go around mid lane for the power runes, these water runes, just displacing that advantage. 
Secret happy to just let mid one sit there and soak up the XP. Do you think that's uh, kind of like a, a weird around, like it's outside the box. Is it a buff to Nature's Profit, the fact that these gates now cost mana to go through? Uh, like sure. there is a resource cost, so Nature's Profit, he's able to make these rotations for free. Well, half for free, you know. He's got to go back. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, it's the same as like a teleport scroll in theory. So the more you move around, the more it'll cost you. And Liquid just still not able to connect on the kills off this line. I mean, we're seeing Boxy go the one one zero, so he is trying to line up the hex for the, the all in with the soul. Another yeah, teleport coming into the top lane, and Tini gonna be caught by the spear. Puppy not even necessarily needed there, but it does make sure that Mickey can't really get aggressive while they're killing his support. I mean, he's happy to get the, the bonus gold here. Puppy is already accumulating more net worth than his carry in this early game. That's why they need to get this kill out of crystals, but they can't quite get it. Very low, but not quite enough. Meanwhile, a dive in the mid lane as Nisha gets aggressive on mid one. Gets his mana burned out, though. Can't really threaten him much anymore. And Puppy is the one rushing Flactory in this game. So he's going to try and transition all this early net worth into a very powerful kill item off the Sprout if you get it early, right? The earlier you get this, the better it is. Yeah. Maybe also due to the fact that, you know, Medallion got removed. <laughs> so you're, maybe your item choices are getting a bit streamlined here. Still, the fact that Puppy's able to skew this top lane as well is pretty big because this is a kill lane for Liquid. I mean, this is Lich Monkey, a traditionally very strong lane and one that's able to just run you down. So every time Liquid get put on the back foot up here, it's doubly nice as, yeah, the wolf's not going to work. Finally get that kill that they would have been looking for. All right, the Shadow Shaman's payoff later in the game. You know, he's, mm, okay. he's, not a, he's not a traditionally a lane dominator. <laughs> Just get the levels, get to the... Uh, that's not the, what the panel talked about. He got bonus armor. He has some of the highest base damage. I mean, bonus armor can only do so much. Mm, okay, okay. Earn picked up for mid one. So very important to get that early kill. And it looks like the rotation is going to come right away. Yamach off of his death tries to surprise Nisha. They could have gotten that kill. They could have gotten the power rune. It both would have been really nice, but they're actually going to roll up nice and early. Yamaj, he's going to be caught by this one. Yeah. Ooh, Sprout and pushed up to the high ground. Nisha is going to fail to get this kill as he's ran out of mana. Didn't want to shield crash up there off the wand charges, so he just gives up on it. Free courier as well. Man, Puppy's feeling this early game. He's had a lot of small, impactful moves, wasting a ult off Nisha there. Pretty big as Yamaj makes the, the right read up the cliff. And while Liquid are kind of pulling ahead a little bit in the lanes, the net worth is stabilizing. And again, I feel like Secret has the much slower lineup in terms of cores and, you know, you're running a Shaman. So your early game's a bit rough. Oh, you're not going to be able to make it out of there. Yamich right behind Boxy. Boxy thought he was getting a sneaky mid ward there to help protect Nisha from rotations. But he gets caught in the act and he gets his ward kill so really nice for Yamich huge amount of XP and it means he'll get this seven minute with the rune for sure as puppies fight oh, for the other one. Out with the sprout and he's gonna make the no, teleport wait. play they do have Insania here he's got the disabled to be able to pull him back Ooh. and Insania does manage to get that wisdom rune just away from puppy ever so barely but he gets it and they'll get the kill as well <laughs> if you get that wisdom rune, you're gonna blow this game open right yeah it, puppy very close to outplaying him there but it'll be a double TP Move for Liquid to secure it, and once more, that move from Boxy, just, it hurt him a lot. Getting the, the ward killed immediately, losing out on this gank potential. Still stuck at level 3 down here. And all of this happening for the Lion means, you know, this faceless Void has a much freer game. Boxy showing up to the mid lane, not to refill bottle, but to give you a little bit of mana drain recovery there for Nisha, who's been constantly burned down by the EMP. I mean, you, you have to think that Liquid want to combine these supports for something on the map right now, right? Because yeah. you're not going to get the XP off of stacking or a random sort of, you know, I'm just going to take a lane and you move Nisha. It has to be Boxy and Insania combining, looking for the pickoffs. That's what these supports are designed to do. Puppy just TP straight into one. Yeah, Puppy really aggressive. just didn't care if he died whatsoever. Anything to try and secure that power rune. It actually goes over to Mickey, who made a rotation. That's a pretty interesting move. I mean, he's been left alone in that top lane for quite some time, so... I guess he feels like his time is better spent. I know some of these shrooms got buffed, but did they get buffed that much? <laughs> Just throw your life at it. Mid one's going to find a, a random boxy. Again, struggling to find the gang connections here. Oh, he managed to get a two minutes done with Nisha right there, but the tornado is going to be able to intercept the Rolling Thunder. Now reset, gets it off and hits Yamich once. He's going to bounce over to mid one as well. Trying to finish up Yamich so Insania can help him with the kill on mid one. It looks like they've got him both dead to rights. Double kill for Nisha. Big connection there. 
I mean, Boxy's still sad he's not getting the XP, but this is what these supports are designed to do. Start killing for the cores, upping up the net worth pretty fast, and that's going to push Nisha into a very fast defusal here. Yeah, it is done on that Courier. He, he did skip the boots entirely here. This is about as fast as you're going to get it at nine minutes flat. It's flying out. He is very farmed after the double kill, and this is a good defusal game in terms of burning the mana off either of these supports in the fights or burning it off the faces void of the Mars later. It's going to be very high impact. It's going to give him a lot more damage on these kill attempts. It's crazy how big Diffusal Blade was in the last patch, and it feels like it could be just as important, um, most notably because I feel like there were some overall mana changes, right? Like going through the gate costs you mana, mana boots don't give you nearly as much. Uh, it yeah, feels like that true. resource may be a problem, which makes Diffusal Blade all the more potent. I mean, it is, a, it is a huge factor. It's first the Invoker EMP in this game too, right? Yep. All these mana burn spells, usually, I mean, you're crying for your supports to pick up the Arcane Boots. If we don't see it as much, or we're seeing supports that don't utilize the Arcane Boots as much, definitely makes these mana burn spells a lot more impactful. It could see some anti-mage, you know? Yeah, and I think uh, Disperser was definitely being built quite a bit uh, in the previous patch, and I think some people are excited about the new Disperser. No longer giving damage, but now giving a ton of agility. So some of these agility cores are going to really reap the benefit of that. And it'll be Saberlight who picks up the mana boots in this game, actually. So it's him providing the mana for everybody else. Looking into a Vlad's, potentially. Now, remember, this Vlad's doesn't build in it anything. So he's just, you know, getting it online for his other two cores and the birds here. Nice little damage buff. But still, we're not seeing what Saberlight necessarily wants to scale into in the mid game here. Yeah. Just picking up some small skirmish items. And once more, Liquid showing that they want to fight often, they want to fight early, and they want to bulldoze these towers. Early Diffusal plus a Vlad's pickup would allow you to do that, allow you to do early Roshan as well. So Liquid saying, we're going to put you on a clock here. You better be ready for the fight because it is coming. Yeah, I mean, honestly, Team Secret did everything you could expect them to do to secure the laning phase. But it could just fall apart if these pushes from Liquid succeed. Caught in the Cold Snap plus, they have the Sprout there to continually tick that damage, ensuring that the MP lands. He does have a regen rune. Now, that doesn't give the big boost right away, but it is going to come into play here as they come in from behind. Sneak a kill onto Puppy here. Swashbuckle, not quite getting it, but finally Soul Assumption is there, but now he's been caught by the arena as the rotation comes from Boom, securing a trade-off in kills. Chrysalis comes in from behind, catching Boxy out as well. They'll be able to get two for one. Once again, Team Secret well aware of Team Liquid's constant moves into the mid lane and countering it well with heavy rotation. This is just a hard tower to rotate into if mid one is full of resources. Like, the Invoker's always going to displace one of your heroes, and then the timing's just going to get thrown off. You also don't have that Finger of Death yet, so... Well, you get the Puppy Kill, Secret happy to just pull all their cores in and defend the tower. This is the most empower important tower for them in the game. So the longer they can keep it up, the, the worse Saberlight's map movement's going to be. Right now, I mean, Boom is just having the best game of everybody. Once again, those early rotations top from the Furion really set him up nicely, and he is Omega farmed on this Mars, basically unkillable with the Double Bracer. Thinking about it, power rune spawns bottom. Arcane rune, very important for both of these heroes. Tango would love to get his hands on that, but it's looking like they're going to have to fight over it. Yamich gets there a little bit late to stop the Arcane rune pickup, and with all these extra supports here, they're going to try and go for the fight here. Trying to first down the Shadow Shaman, quick and clean, that's not a problem. Secret have abandoned him. Uh, he was debating dropping the wards there. But again, if you're Secret, keeping these ult ups for the objectives fight, I think feels better. Like, you want to fight around this tier one mid, so unless you're getting a really good skirmish somewhere random, and get counterplay open. And yeah, I mean, this is the forced move, right? Like, Saberlight needs this tower down to control the aggressive jungle area, and it's what the Vlad's is designed to do. But again, the turnaround, he do a lot of damage, taking through his armor so damn quickly, and he just dies. Not even the armor from the Lich could save him, and Puppy doesn't go down easily, especially with the lack of a mana. That Diffusal Blade stops doing damage, oh, and a beautiful a chrono. Crystalis was already going to feast on this team fight, cleaning it up, but the three-man Chronosphere secures it. And even Puppy survives from the birds on the backside. So Liquid get nothing out of that for four heroes. Another Saberlight Visage rotation that yields nothing off the early Vlad's pickup. He just feels way too squishy. He gets hit by a couple Furion spells and like a tornado. He's half HP, it's tanking tower, earn charge ticking him. And of course, what really seals the deal here is this time dilation. His Faceless Void has wreaked havoc in these early fights with dilation going into the Pangolier. You just can't get multiple spells off. I mean, the, the three-man Chrono is just... Just way too easy there. Yeah. This mid tower has proven the bane of Liquid's early game here. And once more, Secret, they're happy to just take these fights, go back to the jungle, farm back up until their ults are there, as Boxy is still looking for a finger of death in oh. this game. 
It's the God's Rebuke. That's going to slow things down a little bit on this kill. As he got out the Chain Frost, will make things a little weird. They certainly have the kill on the support, but Nisha might be able to get a return here as Puppy. Yeah, he's certainly dead. Mickey's going to jump into this fight. They get a chase for more now. Rolling Thunder is up on Nisha, but the blink away. Yamich, he's going to be the target instead. Birds are coming in, dropping him, slowing him down. And all they need at this point is maybe a swashbuckle to land. Mickey will catch up to him. They get him eventually. There's that double kill. Liquid again going to try and force this rotation into the mid tower. They want it so badly. Ooh, missed out on the boundless strike. Swashbuckle does land, and he's burned out of all of his mana here. Mid one doesn't have too many things to protect him, but they can't keep up. This will get them to mid tower, though. Finally, and the third time is the charm. Pick some heroes off first. Definitely helps instead of just forcing that, you know, 4v5 where Mickey wasn't joining earlier. And we get the next set of Wisdom Roots. So that'll finally give Liquid access to both their ultimates for the first time. A little delayed, but better late than never. So now it's a question of how well you can control the map as... Uh, Boxy's doing back. it, man. Yeah, he is. He's maxing the drain. I mean... <laughs> maxing the drain and going straight to the shard at 15 minutes. No Blink Dagger Rush. He's going to try and buy that shard upgrade right away. Prophecy fulfilled. What more can you ask for? Yeah, he's just going to buy it. I mean... I think there's a world, there's an argument to be made about not buying it, but if he feels like it's going to be that impactful in the fight, I guess the question is if he just sits there and mana drains you. <laughs> Did he just drave a salve for his life? He, he left it behind and kept his life intact. Okay. A little peace offering. Yeah. Secret. I mean, what they really wanted out of that would have been best is catching that Monkey King who has been kind of slowly him anyway. away. Got him with the spear into the arena. Beautiful set up. Now that Sunstrike's not going to do that much damage with this much follow-up. Maybe they can still finish him off. They need more damage, but it's just not coming. And Mickey is getting the life steal out of this because Nisha has completely caught the back line with the Rolling Thunder. Mickey, he'll just start life stealing off of Puppy. And, Nowhere to run. And eventually get that kill. So that, it seems like at this point in time, Avery, <laughs> Whoever makes the first move ends up falling first as well. Because both these lineups are very good at turning around the engagement once you commit on the frontliner. Like the Frost Shield there, there is no way you are getting through a 1500 HP monkey in Wukong armor with Frost Shield plus the Pavis. As Insania just rushed at this game. The second you commit on a single target, you're in trouble, basically. Unless mid one's there to like dispel all these buffs and then maybe you can take the extended fight, right? Yeah. And for Liquid, it's got to come off the back of the Rolling Thunder. The Rolling Thunder can create space around the target you go on. As Yamich will work trap. Whoa, Puppy actually he beat into this one? Okay, they're actually moving the Chrysalis over here, so he is giving up his life for his team to maybe have a chance at this skin train, man. Gaberlite and Big Game, they're both staying away. Boxy will finally be going down here. The Familiar is going to control a mid-one a little bit. They need to be able to catch this Visage, though. And boom, with his rotation through the gate, is right on point. Solid read to just take the fight with the Furion and, and keep him there long enough for the course to react. This is not a part of the map that Secret want to give up these deep jungle areas. I mean, Mana Drain did some work. <laughs> he really did. He got two off. It's almost a thousand damage. I mean, they don't have too many ways to actually, like, hit him <laughs> with physical damage unless That's what the I'm saying. Uh, void is there. It kind of just has to be. Crystallis, right? Or it somehow gets... Or you jump the line. I mean, just wait till he starts buying plate nails. That's true. Val's created a monster. <laughs> he bought a Wraith Band. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I mean, that's the poor man's plate mail, I guess. Yeah. He actually bought a Wraith Band. <laughs> I mean, I, I would understand at the 25-minute mark. Is it that good right now? I saw somebody got the, uh, the new Tier 2 Light Collector. Produce a brilliant flash of light that destroys trees in a 325 AOE. Why would a Monkey King want that? Does he destroy his own tree? I assume he does. <laughs> yeah, who does he? Does. Grief himself. It's the future. <laughs> Let's see. The passive provides wear with health regeneration during day, mana regeneration during night. Yeah, this item seems okay. anti-synergy. Sure, you always want to be near trees, but yeah, that is a little weird. Yeah, pans out. They got a fast stab on the supports here from both teams. Nisha thought about looking for more, but better that he doesn't right now. Oh, Boxy a little bit of whiff there. I, he's invincible. Yeah, you can't touch him, mid one. He's going to drain more mana. Yeah. And you got what? The arena and Chronosphere. This lion is a goddamn threat. They have to stop him, apparently. His spear <laughs> comes on through. Beautiful stuff. Hits Nisha and pins up to the wall, but he got off to shield crash. That'll protect him for now with Mickey coming through the Wukong's command. They'll feast on some wards here. Get some extra gold off of that. 
ultimately a trade-off that I think actually goes the way of Liquid because of those wards and the heavy ultimate usage to kill Boxy's Lion. I mean, when, <laughs> when you identify the raid boss, you got to take him down. I guess. Just throw it all. I kind of understand the chrono because, like, you're worried about the counter, the counter plays there. I guess, but even then, like, the roll was already used, right? Maybe you're trying to just prevent Nisha from going back in and towards the end of it. I mean, they must have thought there was more heroes behind that <laughs> yeah, line, right? It just looked a, a bit funny, but yeah, they did kill Boxy. They got him. By the way, seven death for him. He has really struggled to stand there. And... Yeah, Yamich is also not having the most fun in this game no, either. Both got four it. positions are just being tackled by the enemy team in these three four-man ganks. Midwan burned out of mana. Nice move. Get the kill over to Saberlight. And that's four Deso charges instantly off that single move that just got picked up from uh oh <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Little dicey there. A fast move from uh, Team Liquid after getting those kills in mid lane. TP up to top. This is the point in the game where Liquid want to take the fights for the bigger objectives. Like, they want to be getting Roshan in this period because Secret are pushing towards their next set of items, but they're away away. Like, you have 3,000 gold on Boom right now pushing towards the PKB, and you just picked up the Midas for mid one. So, while you're trying to get to these PKBs, in court, including Crystallis's, this is a big item gap where if Liquid can take advantage of it, they have to be favored in the 5 on 5 in terms of itemization right now. Sure. You just picked up a drum on Saberlight. You just picked up a Solar Crest on Insania. Again, all the little items coming out for Liquid here signals that they want to be taking these fights as frequently as possible into more objectives. Yeah, if they get to BKB on Faceless Void, I don't know what really threatens him on the side of Liquid for like a solid 10, 15 minutes. I mean, his biggest problem is the physical mitigation from Insania. Frost Shield plus Solar Crest. That's what he has to fight through. And these heroes are pretty tanky right now, right? You have Vlad's giving you some extra armor. I mean, the Lion's invincible, so you're going to have to chrono him. Of course, of course. And of course, the Pangolin and the Monkey are... They both feel pretty tanky, if the, especially if the Wukong's up. I guess that's where the Maelstrom feels quite nice on Faceless Void nowadays, is uh, trying to protect their Wisdom Rune. Nisha hops in a little bit too late to stop the Wisdom Rune being gone, but if they could kill Midwan, that would be worth it. Coming in. Oh, we got three here. Locking down the Vistage and the Birds. Very nicely. See if Stabilize is going to live through this one. He actually has the shard, so he's going to be okay for now. In that stone form, Nisha in the back line, so his roll of thunder ran out. Yamich caught him with the disables, but Mickey to the rescue. Kills Yamich, takes away those disables, and now they're out of damage. But once again, farm the wards after winning a fight. Just so tanky. Again, the second you get in there with like a decent shield crash, the focus priority from Secret's just all over the place. Puppy, he TP'd way in the back and just got Wukong down. So you're going on three different parts of the fight at the same time with your secret, and you end up getting nothing there. Sustain working out really well for Liquid as, I mean, Drum and Vlad's for Saberlight, plus that shard. If he can just stay alive in the fight and provide the auras, he's doing his job. Big part of this also, Nisha being level 15, so he has that extra three seconds of rolling thunder. You can see mid one's just not doing anything. Yeah, he, did not get the, he did not get to play Dota here. He just got solo killed, basically. Yeah. He actually did die to the Tormentor. That's, you know, got oh, a little he bit going Oh, he died to the, you. like, swashbuckle yeah, on swashbuckle both of them. AOE, but yeah. still, the, it, the bigger problem is Nisha just... Only one mid got to play that fight. Yeah. And it, like I talked about, I think Invoker is the most important hero for Secret to have up for the duration of that fight so past the Chronos. He's their control, he's their longevity in terms of damage. Getting the Alacrities out later is gonna be really important as well. So Crystal is still having a tremendous game here. I feel like that's what's keeping Secret in this. But if they get Roshans and they have Aegises, suddenly it's harder for Crystal to go in and just pick some of these heroes off, right? Yeah. Tank here, they get the, if they get a second life, could be looking at a pretty early high ground here. I mean, that makes mid one dying even worse, right? Some of their scaling is gone if this yes. Invoker can't get maxed out Exorcs. And he wants that... He wants that Axe as fast as possible. Yeah. Throw the Cataclysm into the Chrono is going to help make sure it counts no matter what. Especially since Crystallis has been catching you know, two to three heroes every time. These fights have been pretty clumped from Liquid. And it will be the Ghost Scepter for Boxy, not the Plate Mail. Note that down. <laughs> Left a Blightstone behind. Guess nobody needs it. I never thought I'd see the day where there's only one point in detail. <laughs> Radiant's yeah. bottom tower is Used to be the attack. only skill you max. Now it's the last. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. So the question is, do you want to go high ground with this Aegis? Yeah, I mean, Liquid are pressured 
in a lot of ways, right? There's no way they want to let this uh, game go too late. So they need to make as much happen with this Aegis as possible. It starts with taking this tier two, but going into high ground is very dangerous. It's, a, it's an awkward lineup to go high ground into. The Furion's going to split push you. You have Insta Hex available if you try and jump them behind the tower, and then, you know, Chronosphere and Voker turn around, plus a Mars and Gibby. Not the easiest heroes to take that fight. No. They'd rather get the pick off first, and they're looking for it, but EKB should get him out. So again, the map's getting split right now. Well, that's where uh, Puppy and I guess Midwan are going to have to pull in some, some double duty here. They're going to have to clean up the ways while also being available to defend high ground when needed. This would be a nice pick up here in the top lane if they can get it, but they have already seen it coming. They're going to finish off the Lion Shore, but Yamish is going to be caught, and if Bidwan's not careful, he's surrounded by heroes right now, invisible of course, but they spot him for a moment off of one sentry. That's such a classic Dota situation. Lion and Rasta both die for each other, everybody else leaves. <laughs> I mean, that situation has to be good for Secret, right? They rotated all of yes. Liquid's heroes back. Anything that stalls out this Aegis period, they're happy with. And I think, honestly, they're going to get more gold out of the map with their heroes. Than liquid, than the liquid are in a stronger position right now. Sure. This golden is just not going to grow. It's it's too hard to stop the the split push action on right now. I don't have, I don't think Secret have any interest in taking the five on five unless Liquid really force it like the high ground or something like that. And it'll be Ags for Puppy. So he, he took a brief stop at the four staff and phase boots just to get some extra you know skirmish power going. But this Ags is probably the biggest item he can get in this game. I don't think anything about that has changed. No. The Disarm Root's just going to be really nasty for this lineup. Particularly the Monkey King, if he gets caught in a weird spot. Again, the longer this game goes, the more Mickey has to battle into. I mean, also just when you're trying to end the game, having the, this ultimate up every wave is insane. Wrath yeah. of Nature just clearing out all the waves that are trying to push in. Feels damn good. Yeah. Nope, two minutes left on the Aegis. Mickey is trying to catch mid one. He missed the dust, actually. That was very close. Land that, you might be able to connect, but that's another smoke move that Insignia popped. And just yields nothing as Secret too elusive on the map right now. I do like the split that Liquid is doing here where they're, they're taking tier two towers, but they're simultaneously hunting. It is risky, though. You never know when Team Secret might just decide, let's take five to, you know, one of these side lanes or an event. Event. And there's a second dust. Got him this time. Tornado cannot come out in time. Damn, he melted there. Savoker has absolutely no armor. He gets caught by Mickey with the Desolator. You are gone. And it's been Mickey trying to set up the catch, not Boxy, right? Downside of this kind of defensive shard-oriented line build, you're not really catch. There's a big ghost off. off. Actually got pushed away from the arena walls. They needed that extra bit of damage here. Boxy's gonna live. Oh, that is unfortunate. Very clutch ghost up there. Mitigate some of the damage. And now they might catch oh, boom. boom. Yeah, he's still gonna be caught here. Gonna have to be as he's gonna have to pop EKB and TP out, which he will. Actually could have maybe just TP'd there. And he used both stuns, but he doesn't know where everybody else is. Sure. And this Aegis will run out, 50 seconds left. Secret push through this period. Liquid got a decent amount off the map, maybe more than I thought. Because, I mean, these two supports are not going to farm anything. So they're not going to grow the lead. It's going to be based off your cores. And Misha's getting big. Full soul booster in his backpack. So he's ready to get another item here the second the stage just expires. And, I mean, Mickey, he was able to complete an entire harpoon during that. So you're going to trade this harpoon for full Mjolnir on Crystallis, who is still, you know, the one guy scaling really well here for Secret. But, I mean, these next couple fights Radiant's are really going to come down to the Chronosphere, it feels like. Attack. How much can this Faceless Void do, who is also yet to die in this game? 7 0 right now. That's yeah. a big streak if Liquid pick it up, right? Yeah. Yeah, Mickey also has a crazy high streak. He's only died once, but that, that was in the early death. Since then, he's picked up 11 kills. So, anytime any of these carries get caught, it is a big win for uh, the opposing team. Another pick off here is Yamich. Again, they're just trying to get out there somewhere, do these little split pushing annoying things. So far, Liquid is keeping up. Classic Shaman game. I mean, if you don't have double digit deaths on Shaman, you're not playing the hero, you know? Faceless Void, uh, Crystal's picked up the Nemesis curse. 
Yeah, I was looking at that. It's yeah. Pretty interesting. I mean, it makes sense, right? Because the downside of this is you're taking more damage, but if you're a Faceless Void in Chronosphere, in theory, you're not taking that much more damage. Yeah, combined with Mask of Madness, it's actually pretty crazy. You're really amping up your single target damage quite a bit. Now, granted, you're also amping up the damage you take, possibly, but for those of you guys who don't know, Pacify, it, it, gives a, it puts a debuff on a hero that increases the damage received by just that hero by 12%. So just flat out, 35 damage, and he's increasing his damage when he's hitting somebody by 12%. Pretty powerful. It almost feels like if you get the Chronosphere off before the Wukong, you're pretty happy, but if the Wukong goes out, and then you have to take a fight by going in with Chronosphere while the Wukong's just there, maybe killing somebody else. Pulling it back in, hit it with the spear. This is the pickup. Oh, Nikkei got off his BKB. No more disables were left. They're trying to fight through it, but it's just not enough. They are lacking the damage to fight through that BKB. And now Secret's in Boy, trouble. Did. Oh, he went back in. Got him inside the Chronosphere. Gets that kill. Finally picks up that Beyond Godlike streak. Chrysalis now going to try and run down more. Puppy being targeted by Nisha right now inside of its own Sprout. Will end up falling. Chrysalis is damaged. Now trying to get out after the buyback coming up from Boxy. Got to get away from these disablers. Remember, Chrysalis. he has no BKB here. If he gets spotted, he's probably dead. But if he stays... He went into oh, the bird. no! He went into the bird! Wait, no stun? But no what? stun. The bird didn't drop in time. Oh, and boom, gives the tip over to Saberlight. It was almost like that leap was... It was so weird. Saberlight got confused. I feel like that should have been a kill. And that was, a, again, the, that was the big one to pick up. That was the eight no shriek for the Faceless Void. Yeah, but it gave you so much map control here. Yeah, that how, how much gold did our Faceless Void get out of that one? That was massive pickup for him. A that thousand a gold pickup. and 796 yeah. for his team. And again, like we see there, right, it's about when this Wukong comes out, when the Chrono comes out. If Kristals can come in after all of a sudden done, he's pretty happy in that situation. Still, that Monkey King is so damn tanky. In fact, he can just sit there with so much bonus armor right now. If you don't kite it out, you're just in trouble. Still, it's a big swing in this game. And the threat of the Faceless Void is growing all the time. That is Lumi. As Secret are still looking for these big Agonim Scepters. They finished mid one, so Cataclysm Online going to make this Chrono Threat even greater. Yeah. And Puppy is closing in on his. He's 900 off. I mean, that just makes the high ground harder and harder and harder for Team Liquid. They're definitely going to need the next Roshan, which is another point of contention for Team Liquid because that means they're grouped up for more of that team fight action, more of those Chronospheres and... It's, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, their lineup is also very good around the pit. Like, you can just commit the Wukong at the end of Roshan. That's the true. spell's only yeah. 80 seconds now. I don't think you're too worried about committing it for objectives. One of the nice parts about that buff. That's, that's definitely a dangerous situation. And full nullifier completed for Boom here. Another really big pickup. Gives you another way to deal with this Frost Shield and some of these annoying debuffs Insania has been throwing out. Again, you're just trying to find yourself in a burst situation. And I feel like the one the one player that's been doing work in this game consistently is Nisha. He just hasn't been shut down in a lot of the fights. Yeah. And he is scaling like a beast here. Thinking about A on disc, I think that's pretty reasonable. Maybe he can just go and burst set the fight up for his Monkey King, not be worried about getting chrono. Well, I think Basher is also a pretty damn good consideration in this type of game. He may want to reconsider that with the Nullifier being completed by Boom. Yeah, that's why I'm thinking, okay, this say on this seems okay right now, but will it be great, you know, the next three or four minutes here? Yeah. And he has also gone for this Nemesis curse, so... Very aggressive choice, but again, he's not been the one getting focused down in the fight. And he deals a lot of damage right now. He will keep that Aeon disassembled. That is something else to look for. If Nietzsche can assemble the Aeon disc, almost beta Chrono out or something, it's kind of hard to notice this off an initial jump for Crystallis. That's an easy fight turnaround there. Smoked up, not sitting inside the pit, waiting for that Roshan. And look at all Instead, the summon scouting. Trying to catch Secret as they push out towards the pit, not finding anything though. Between the familiars and the uh, treants and everything else, Saberlight, he's going to cut through now. They have an idea. Nisha immediately popping the Rolling Thunder, but Team Secret, if they could just get out away from all this one, it's a big ultimate down, but he did get picked up once on Chrysalis, and Puppy's going to be caught on the high ground there, spotted by the Familiars. Nisha still rolling around, still trying to slow down these heroes, rolls up a little bit longer, and now Mickey's going to jump oh, in with they're all BKB, and they have the arena, but they're stuck inside the Wukong's man. Crystal is going to be able to get away over the side, has that Chronosphere on it too, with Cataclysm coming in, he finished off the Pango. Can't go for Mickey though.
they have to leave him behind. Meanwhile, well, <laughs> Damage does what he can, but he's throwing away his life to try and stall up these heroes and let his cores get out of here. Still trying to get it, though. They have the Tornado, finishes off Boxy, slows down the rest of these heroes, just trying to get Boom out of here. Yeah, the kiting. Beautiful EMP that almost seems like an opportunity for Secret to pursue. But... Yeah, they're like thinking about going back in there with another jump. I mean, when the Wukong's down, I don't know if you're afraid of too much, but Mickey still feels untouchable once that spell goes off. Like, you're not dealing any damage to him. Even the Cataclysm, it just felt like it chipped him there. Yeah, tickled. And Crystallis just has to get the hell, preserve his streak here. And Nisha's just, he's just too big of a problem. This Rolling Thunder duration is is nasty. They have no control for it, though they will catch Mickey without oh, a Wukong. This would be amazing if they could blow him up. They have the Nullifier to be able to take away that armor with he's the gone. Meatball right on top, and they'll finish him up. A what were you doing pickoff. there? Team Liquid, they would have taken that Roshan. There was no Chronosphere to be able to contest this, but now without their carry, they're going to be run down. Insania is the first one to fall. Saberlight is able to get away thanks to his Aghanim Scepter flying and invisible. So it's Team Secret who will pick up that Roshan now, and that is a massive blow to Team Liquid. A huge win for Team Secret. I, I have to feel like they are majorly favored to win this game now. That is uh, probably the biggest swing in this game, and it all starts with mid one just scouting in the ghost walk, catches Mickey off guard, playing a little bit greedy on the map when he has two heroes dead, and most importantly, that Pangolier that has controlled every fight for Liquid this entire game. Yeah. Of course, Wukong was like 30 seconds off cooldown. The thing you can play around in this game is that Wukong is going to be up for decent chunks of time when the Chronosphere is down. Like you were saying, that Roshan, in theory, it's Liquid's with the ult. Oh, oh, Chrysalis, now it's his turn to get slipped up and caught. Does have He's a second life. lose that Aegis right away. They're probably not going to try for the second life. No reason to do so. You hit him with the sun all right away, chaining it up. No, PKD goes off from Chrysalis and time walks away. But big resources cost. Oh, they and Chase actually hit him with the Hex as the BKB wears out. He gets disabled. Yamage running interception, just trying to stop these heroes from chasing Chrysalis. And he does so successfully, though it costs him his life once again. The Shaman Sacrifice. How many more times does he need to sacrifice to give Team Secret a win here? 14 deaths for Yamage. It's a rough life out there. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit. It's just bailing these carries out, man. And yeah, like you said, Crystallis gets caught. That's a BKB down. He did not have Chronosphere up. Awkward situation. But we'll still preserve that streak. He's yet to die in this game. And finally, Secret will try and get a Tormentor of their own. Yeah, they didn't get it uh, when it spawned at 20 I, I don't know what this attempt is. It looks pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no! I mean, <laughs> come on, guys. I feel like that one was not hard to read. <laughs> no. That was not going to work at all. We saw it coming a mile away. Also, he's dead for 80 seconds. Oh, my God. That's not like all oh, your support died for 30. That is an 80-second mid player off the map. That was his dieback. So maybe in some ways, you, is that oh, is that good in a way? Like <laughs> he gets rid of his die. Yeah, you get rid timer. of your dieback timer while there's nothing happening. There's no Roshan. Here. I mean, we'll we'll just see what Team Liquid does to punish this uh, 60 second window they have left. I mean, I'll tell you one thing. If I'm mid one, that's what I'm saying in the comms right now. <laughs> Intentional. I'm like, yo, don't worry, guys. That was my dieback timer. Yeah, right, right, right. We're not trying to fight anyway. Chronosphere. Actually, Chronosphere is off cooldown. Well. Looks like Disperser pick up for Mickey while the Basher or Basher for Mickey while the Disperser is going to Nisha. I thought Nisha would have wanted a Basher in the game as well, considering how little control they have for the Rolling Thunder. Like it doesn't seem like Crystallis wants to commit a Chronosphere for this Pangolier who has way too much HP to try and burst down. Yeah, and again with the buff that they gave to Pangolier, where it's a three-second cooldown on the Shield Crash during Rolling Thunder, you with an Aghanim Scepter, you're getting a lot of little bits of damage out there. Yeah, it's a lot. Took the swashbuckle damage talent as well. Yeah. He hurts, man. This is probably the biggest hero for Secret to try and take out in the fight, and the biggest hero for Liquid to play around. You can send the Pango in with a Frost Shield, create some havoc, maybe find the supports off the boxy blink, which is finally online. Sounds like a decent way to set it up. I mean, an Aegis would have helped you, you know, but chill. Beggars can't be choosers here. Was also an Aghanim's picked up for Saberlight, who also has his 15 and 20 talents here. This Vista just pumping out a lot more damage, has Quiver on top of it. Like, he built the Horus for the early game, but now he's trying to pick up some of the scale and just probably find the Shaman, find the Furion, burst down on an easy target at the start of the fight, give Liquid a numbers advantage. Yeah, I immediately thought of Yamich when we were thinking about oh, he's gonna melt, dude. <laughs> like, if Saberlight finds Yamich, he is gone in one second. There is no saving it. But what about the one armor buff, Avery? Get some feathers coming out. 
I mean, <laughs> one armor, yeah. <laughs> we get about 10 more of those. They'll do okay. All right, so who got the feather? Uh, mid one. So 25% evasion and 30 movement speed, which is a ton. Well, he He's going to need though. every bit of movement speed here. At least he gets lifted up to hey, die. Hey, look at him. <laughs> That's nice to add an animation for it. <laughs> I mean, mid one is also very squishy in this game. Yeah. We're talking about Yamich getting bursted. I mean, if mid one gets found, he's just gone too. He has no defensive capability in this game yet. It's just all offensive based on the Chronosphere. So, again, I feel like initiations favor Liquid so much in this game. It's about who box he can find, how Nisha goes in, and just if you find any of these spellcasters, you're, you're very happy. Which is where, boom, and maybe Puppy, but mostly Boom, have to step up the most, right? Like, those are the heroes that can frontline for you. Right. They can give you the initiation, allow Crystalis an easier time to follow up and find a better Chronosphere. And Hex finished for Boom as well. This Hex is cheaper now, so we're probably going to see a lot more of it in the meta. Yeah. Also means he can build into Refresher and have the mana to be able to double Arena later on. Yeah, 30 in. It's a lot. So he has 1,400 mana now. He even took a Timeless Relic. I mean, boom stuns are pretty nasty here. He goes in, he can hit two people off the spear, he can hex somebody, he can nullify or somebody else. You get a refresher for all that. He becomes a terrifying force in his own right. And the fact that he could do it all off of uh, Blink Spear into the arena. Boom was already employing that before. Gotta say, I mean, his, his play is uh, as an offlaner lately. Has been looking pretty strong. We're gonna see some more new neutral items. Rattle Cage for the Little Cage. Okay, <laughs> he just wants the armor, I guess, because I don't know if the physical damage coming out is that high as they get a catch. Beautiful pick up on to make it. If they can finish him off the Cataclysm and they're going to use the Chronosphere. Now, can Liquid take this fight just off of Nisha's firing power? I guess the Mana Drain. Yeah, Mana Drain. Time walks away, jumps back in. Yeah, Mitch now going to run Interception as he gets some Disables in. Mid one's here as well. Trying to control up these heroes as much as possible. Nisha's almost finished off Moon by himself. Tries to the Swashbuckle, but he gets the Blink away. Go, and now you're boom, and he, oh, he comes back in with a Nullifier. Aeontes will remove some of that Disable, but it's not going to last for long. As Hank comes down, another Swashbuckle over away to the side. This Pango, out, man. Trying to get away from Chrysalis while they're going for Mid one on the side. Saberlight, his damage is amping up on the Vistage. Now they got the disables. Boxy going for Sableite. Lincoln protects him once. He's trying to keep his distance. The Vistage Familiars are dropping on him. He's got Yamich and Puppy joining him now. They're going to go. Nisha got him with the Hex. Can they finish him off? They need to be it's able to get mana. one more hit. He got him in time. He got but trained. But in the meantime, Chrysalis can't fight against the damage of the Vistage. Sableite will be able to stand tall with the rest of his cores fall. And he will help deliver the kills to wipe Team Secret. Oh, this buyback from Boxy did so much work in this fight. The fact he's able to get down there because this Tier 1 is still up for Lincoln on the bottom lane, but look at the damage coming out from Saberlight. Holy crap, man. He dealt 12,000 over the course of that. Three Hexes, double Greaves, nine Soul Assumptions with that level 15 talent hitting three heroes. I mean, that is what does it right there. I'm quoting him and also paraphrasing for him. He said that in the group stage, he played on like crap. And he put some of Team Liquid's performance on himself. But he said, when we get to playoffs, I'm going to carry these guys. Just watch. And I boy, mean, he shows up at the right time. Let's be fair. A lot of that fight is Nisha just being unkillable for so damn long with the Disperser debuffs and the Aeon disc. But Saberlight definitely carried the damage load as Mickey went down without getting anything off. Secret had a 5v4 without Liquid's carry. And the other two cores are strong enough to pick up the slack. They're oh, going damn it. I don't know if you wanted to do that. Yeah, that and is poke not the bear. Where you want it to be. Hey, Boxy immediately jumps in and gets the heck. And he gets the two man stun right as Boom tried to jump and counter him. Invulnerable now. They're going to try and just hit him. But Mickey comes in Wukong's command, trying to kill the line. Yeah, man, hit him. But they're stuck inside the Wukong's command. A lot of damage delivered back out with the soul assumptions. That's a dieback for Boxy. Gem on the ground. We'll get the gem. And they'll get out. Now, Liquid guy. Take their victory and escape. That, that also pushed Saberlight to level 25 on this Visage here. So he gets all of his best talents. Another familiar. Look at this he has move. the corruption. Yeah, the other one's trying to catch here. He, I mean, he knows there's cooldowns. Yeah, but he's way far ahead of his team. Oh, he is done. entirely solo. He didn't keep track of where that gem was. Maybe just didn't see Saberlight. Yeah. Saberlight will add another notch to the belt here. It's, I mean, he has just taken this game over in the later stages, it feels like. 15, 3, and 11. Man, Bobby does manage to sneak the Wisdom Rune away from them. Whose items are these? Why are there just items on the ground? <laughs> 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 just a Quelling Blade, a Blight? Someone's opening their own secret shop, or what? 
<laughs> it's the uh, missing side chop. He's, he's coming back. Oh, that's the new patch. Yeah. So another familiar for the Visage, which, you know, I mean, he's already outputting crazy damage, but with that talent. I mean, it's level 25 for Nisha as well. These are big level 25 talents. And this Rolling Thunder has it's been unstoppable. It feels like you have to chrono him, but then you also have to line up the Nullifier from Boom on the Pango in the chrono. It's very awkward, right? Yeah. I can't believe Boxy's still dead. <laughs> His timer's so long. Oh, yeah. Just forever. He also has that cone talent for the impale. It feels like if you don't take out this line, he actually causes you problems. I mean, you get mana drained pretty fast over the course of a fight. Crystallis was just out of mana at the end there. Otherwise, I think he might clean that up with another time dilation. Gem in the pit will scout Roshan, and this is banner plus refresher shard. Oh, yeah. Do we have cheese on second Roshan? I didn't even see what second Roshan. No, they got a radiant side, right? Where was the banner? That's what I'm thinking. What? Did I miss it? Maybe it got planted. I don't know. Either way, this will be a banner. And since Liquid didn't take the previous one, they don't get roared. <laughs> that is true. The refresher, Shard, and Banner to Nisha here. I mean, how many Rolling Thunders do you need? I mean, the way these have been working out, I'll take everyone I can get. Even has a Shield Rune in his bottle right now. So if this Nullifier does not go on Nisha, he is absolutely immortal in that fight. That's scary stuff for Team Secret. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to try and sneak a little split push here, TP away. And he does not die for once. Yeah. Nobody kills Shadow Shaman 70 times. <laughs> your lesson to learn. Uh, I, I, no, I'm pretty sure he's going to die 17 yeah, times he, he at might, least. This he might day. get to 20. He might get to 20. We'll see. Or is oh, down? The, I mean, that's the Shield Rune okay. Pango, though. Yeah, the Shield Rune Pango is going to be tough to be able to fight through, and he slipped in the Antis as well. And oh no, the stun came out onto Boom right as he was trying to get the Nullifier onto the Pango. Now his BKB is going to be go. wasted, and now the Faceless Void is being controlled up as well. Oh, this is looking really, really bad for Team Seeker. Cataclysm goes out, no follow-up to it whatsoever. I mean, They're going to leave Boom behind. Does everybody else get out? Fox is not even dead. Oh, he gets sprouted. No, sprouted. Earned. No. <laughs> the <train. laughs> Siphon. He's too powerful. No, the creep died. Oh. The <laughs> Siphon ran out because the creep died. Chrysalis is going to dream. He has no mana. Away, but he's running out of mana. He only has so much more to be able to work with. The meatball's going to come down, but the Invoker's already dead. He's going to get the no, hell out. But he's low. And it's Dania actually right in front of him. Now comes out Arena. Oh, oh turn around. Spear. That's pretty nice. Catch it with some of the buybacks, though. No, they have to control these heroes. Oh, he got bumped out of the Chrono Sphere. That's okay. He's still controlled up, but he'll still die. No, rolled up he's for a, a second. No. Okay, he does go down, but it's same time. Buyback from Nisha. He help. He's all out of mana. Somebody give him some mana. He's going to die like this. Nisha is back, and that means you need to get the hell out right now. Do you have buybacks on secret? You have Crystallis's, you have the Shaman, but nothing for mid one here. And without a Chrono, oh, and he gets pulled back in by the Hurricane Pike. Sure, Crystal's buyback, but without a Chrono Sphere, what does it really matter? Refresh, refresh from Nisha. He rolls it up. Four staff, it's only going to do so. Time walk. There's two, but he disables the die back there, and that's just it. Nobody has buyback on the side of secret. Puppy, the captain, will be the last to go. Last to go. With the ship, you will fall, and that's going to be GG Team Liquid. Take game one. Ah, what a performance here from all three cores on Liquid at various points in that game. Mickey carried this last fight with over 13,000 damage locking heroes down on the Wukong. Man, that line was annoying. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if it's a hero you think about banning or taking or whatever. I don't know how powerful exactly this hero is, but those later fights when Boxy's sitting there, he made these chronos non-existent because Crystallis just didn't even have mana in the last fight. And the, the Chrono goes out eventually, but by then, it feels like it's a little too late. And these other two cores were picking up the slack as Saberlight, that fight bottom was tremendous from him. And every single fight, this Rolling Thunder was just, it was unstoppable, man. There was absolutely no answer to Nisha in these engagements. Memes made their way into the patch, and Memes will help Team Liquid take game number one in this series. But it was pretty crazy back and forth. Was pretty reliant on, as you said, all three of their cores stepping up Saberlight, the stand-in, of course, in particular, was able to, to, you know, have his moment. At first, he was just buying team yeah. fight items, but then transitioned to, to a real damage-dealing core. I mean, he was 16-3. <laughs> like, he owned yeah. this game. He got to AC at the end as well. Another big aura in terms of bumping up this armor. That was one of the biggest problems for Secret in this game. Like, how do you deal with the armor? That Invoker Tornado, they had the Nullifier on Boom, but you have to line those up with the Void going in off Shaman Shock Shackles. It's tough. They just couldn't really line it up because the disruption from the team fight was way too massive.
with a game like this and a new patch as well, there's so much to break down. We can't possibly do it, so we'll lead you to the experts on the panel in Cheever. <laughs> Thank you, Cap. Yeah, very, very friendly uh, morning greeting from Cap there. And uh, there's so much to talk about, actually, and I am actually going to refer to my panel for this because I also cannot break this down because madness has happened, and I feel like, Brian, we have not seen teams commit as hard to fight as we have this morning. Yeah, these teams just, you can't do the math, you know? You have this, like, understanding of your thresholds, of your limits, but they're like, oh, well, we're committed at this yep. point. Let's just buy back and see what happens. I feel like we saw some of the crazier fights, like, in the bottom half of the corner, where it's, like, three or four people at the same time are, like, beyond godlike, killing each other. You know, there's new items coming out, new builds, boxing with some 144 rushing the shard. At first, I was like, what the hell is this build? 114, you know, doing this, but looks like it was pretty good. And I think, honestly, Nisha, Saberlight, whole of Team Liquid, they really popped off in the mid and late stages of this game. Yeah, it was so hard to actually comprehend what was going on, because in these new patches, there's so much chaos, there's so much fighting, and a lot of these fights, it looked like, oh, wait, Secret's winning. Wait, stop, no, Liquid's winning. Wait, Secret's winning again. Okay, Liquid just won the fight, and that really felt like the story, but we can break it down a little bit easier, just going back to that early game. I really think that Liquid played so incredibly well around that mid lane, the rune security, that they were constantly bringing heroes. Um, in contrast to Puppy, who played an incredible early game, he was kind of the only player making those first eight-minute moves. But on the side of Liquid, you even saw Mike coming to the top rune to secure it, where Insani and Boxy were on the bottom rune securing it for Nisha. And it was just fighting after fighting after fighting. And that's when your Monkey King comes into play, right? The Monkey King played an excellent game in those first 20 minutes. After that leading stage was over, he joined the fights and he led every single fight. So now you have the damage of the Pango, the aggression of the Pango, paired with the Monkey King, paired with the Frost Armor, it was just running into Secret's heroes over and over again, and they could really only counterplay when Faceless Void TP'd in and chronoed, but Secret took advantage, I mean, Liquid took advantage of the time that Secret was a little bit weaker, and they played the game off of that. Yeah, they didn't have to wait for any big cooldowns on the side of Team Liquid, Brian, because they could just fight basically non-stop. Yeah, there's so many changes where we talked about what is the real implication of this change? We see it, right? The Visage, Damage is now calculated before reductions in terms of gathering soul assumption charges. Yeah. Saberlight, we saw, did yeah. 12,000 damage in that one fight with nine soul assumptions. I have to imagine in the late game where teams have magic resistance, a lot of armor, those charges were racking up much faster than before, and suddenly Visage is like three times everyone else's damage in the fight. Yeah. It's, and it's this fight right here. Yeah. It lasted forever. We got, a, we got a buyback in there as well, and I believe it tur turned later on into a dieback as well. But the fight. Kazu, these fights, they were they were crazy. It's just really high skill Dota when two teams go at it, no, no, go at it with each other. In a new patch, especially, just like a lot of going in, going out, time walking in, time dilation. Yep. You have buybacks, you have new items, people have neutral items where half the people don't know, okay, this makes me tanky. Like mid one even had this item that when he gets lower HP, he can walk over cliffs and like have all this nasty stuff. It's just, I love seeing new patches. And I think half the teams don't even know exactly what to do. And I think that's just the beauty to watch them try and figure it out. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of fun, but Secret packed a punch and they put up a fight. I think that Liquid's sustained damage and their ability to take longer team fights was Secret's win in the end though, because they were super dependent on Void's BKB timing. They were super dependent on Invoker's BKB also, the Arena for Mars, and they were playing on those cooldowns. Whereas Liquid, they did not really have any cooldowns, right? You had the Visage just throwing out those soul assumptions over and over again in fights. You have this Pango that they're throwing everything on and it's taking forever to kill him. Then of course you have the Sludge buffing off the entire team and the Monkey King who is not a cooldown dependent hero and you just saw Liquid winning these longer engagements because of that. Yeah, we, we talked earlier about that in the previous patch, one of the things that was very difficult to do is going high ground. I felt like that was a lot more smooth, Kezu, this time around. Yeah, I was a little, like one thing that surprised me is I don't know exactly if I read the patch wrong or whatever, like disregarding the high ground just for a moment is mm -hmm. the banner that came out on the second row's bottom, where I feel like Secret also just straight up dropped it on the lane. I would have loved to see that, you know, combined with some of the high grounding stuff, but I think just reading the patch alone and some of the stuff going on, it will naturally make people try and go high ground a little early on the games. Yeah, maybe that was a little bit of a misclick because, I, yeah, the, the banner was just there and it was just ready to just be clicked. Hello. It wasn't even <laughs> placed on the lane itself. It was just there. Yeah. Uh, and then it wasn't. It had to be a misclick. But also, yeah. what the heck was that banner spawning on Radiant's side? Isn't it supposed to spawn yeah. on Dire's side? I feel misled. I feel That's lied I to. I am confused. I've been lied to as well. I don't like it. It's it, a feature. It's a feature <laughs> and teams have clever use of game mechanics and all those. I mean, it's the first, first game of the patch. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy 
that we got such a back and forth out of it as uh, that was our first game. There was one more thing that we want to highlight of that game, and it was two players that we chose for our Acer Predator player versus player that both played so well, Brian. Chris Litsamike. Oh, I love highlighting the carry players. Any excuse I can find. And these players <laughs> gave us uh, more than just a simple excuse. As Like, when I saw Chrysalis, he had a lot to play around in that game. You're dealing with Lion Hex, a lot of burst coming out, like a lot of control from the Pango. So he has to pick and choose when he goes in carefully. And yet he's still 12, 3, and 8 at the end of this game after most of his deaths coming in the last 5 to 10 minutes or so. Mickey, on the other hand, had a bit of a weird start. Like, he was showing up to a lot of these rune fights and being active, but he wasn't really able to get much done at that stage in the game, and then suddenly he just pops off right when he gets that Deso timing and goes beyond godlike as well. I think you both already said it very nicely with the fact that, like Chrysalis, eventually Secret's damage will kind of run out, which means Secret only have, they have one shot in every fight. Chrono needs to land with all the AoE. If that falls flat, the fight is just straight up over. So him ending this game 12-3-8 and having this impact he did is honestly huge credits to him. But also, I would attribute that to uh, Invoker not being able to dish out damage in these fights because he was just so prioritized by Liquid supports, right? And then, especially when Visage got the Hex later on and Invoker was getting Hexed, he couldn't provide the damage needed for this lineup to actually work. But with that being said, I think Crystal's played an ex excellent game. That was not an easy Void game by any means. He landed so many good Chronos, and it was because of his rotations early on that Secret were able to strike back at the times where it looked like Liquid were overrunning them. Yeah, I think, uh, oh, go for it. No, like the point that you're mentioning, Mira, with him not having like maybe the best game, I think that goes all the way back to the start where you were saying, Liquid bring all these heroes mid, they give all the runes to Nisha, who played probably, he's my MVP in this game. Like he popped up in the lane, they help him, he just does everything. So I think next game for Secret, maybe put a little more eyes on the runes in the mid lane. Oh, well, this is this is where teams have the ability to really showcase that they deserve to go further in a series like this. Because not only you have to adjust mid-series, which is normally already Pretty tricky, but you have to do it on a fresh patch. So very curious to find out what the teams have learned from game number one as we prepare ourselves for a second game between Team Liquid and Team Secret coming at you soon. Do you want to play like a pro and gain that sweet MMR? Watch the DHL Pro Tips to improve your gameplay. Then test your knowledge to win a Steam gift card. Become a pro by visiting esl.gg slash DHL Pro Tips.
two of the series lives up to the expectations created during game number one because what a brawl, what a bloodbath. And I am uh, I'm curious, what, what's going to happen? We saw a first phase pick line. I want to start with that one. I'm joined by BSJ, Kezu and Effie. And Brian, BSJ, Lion first pick was a meme. Yeah. It worked out really well. And I was wondering, is it going to be picked or is it time to actually Space I think it's worth considering because we saw in that one of the later fights that the only reason Chrysalis couldn't do what he wanted to do yeah. is because he ran out of mana, and that was the combination of the defusal from the Pango, but also this mana drain. Like this adds up over time, and also if we remember the mid game, the first like three Chronospheres were a solo lion yep. who was draining like two or three heroes at like the 15, 20 minute mark. So he was actually inside of like in the middle of five people draining them. Just to get solo chrono, that's a lot of attention having to give to a support. This hero is good, period. <laughs> this one game is enough for me to... I don't know if it's going to be first phase contested always, but this is a banger hero. <laughs> I can tell. I think you guys are overhyping it a little bit. Nah, <laughs> no. no. Yeah, I don't think so. Because <laughs> I, I saw when he went first item shard on the line. Um, it looked nice, but I, I didn't feel like he was doing that much damage, to be fair. And I feel like you could pick any support hero with stuns and... Is it like the intimidation just factor? Play, play around runes in the same way. I mean, it definitely looked good as the game progressed, but I'm not sure it's first phase ban material at least. Maybe I'm wrong. We'll I, we'll wait more than one game to decide. Okay. I'll agree with you. I I, I would think so. Yeah. Did you guys feel like the damage it was doing was significant? I, I didn't really notice. I didn't it, notice no. that. I did. I mean, I saw some damage come out. I'm not gonna say it's the best hero in the game, but <laughs> I think it's pretty good. I just, I have to imagine there is something going on that we can't see. Because if you're Chrysalis and you're feeling the need to Chronosphere this guy three times. <laughs> Something's, there's a problem. Something's up. There's a problem. 
<laughs> Something's up for sure. Now, other than the lion, are there any other lessons that we can pull from, from game one like that? Not necessarily even hero related, but also maybe in terms of the tempo that's set, because this was non-stop fighting, and we did see that the potential Wombo Combo team fight, it, it would, well, it, it was not happening because there was just mm. fights all the time, and you, that means you never have your cooldowns all together at the same time for the big blowout fight you need. I think one thing both teams did that we were thinking about behind the stage is that you need somebody that secures your Roche mm -hmm. because if you're winning, that second, we never saw the Roar come out because they alternated Roche, one, two, yep. like one for Liquid, then second for Secret, third for Liquid. But if you don't have that, you don't have that reliable way to get that Roche, secure the game, and go high ground. So we're going to have to keep an eye out for like what heroes fill that niche. Uh, Shadow Shaman for Li Secret that game, Visage for Liquid, um, and I think every team's going to need at least one. Yeah, um, something that I want to point out is that Invoker has been a good hero for a while. Uh, I kind of lost faith in that hero, honestly, mm. after that last game. I just feel like with all of the brawling that's going to be happening in a new patch, the archetype of mid hero that you want is, you know, something tanky that can play for these runes, and it doesn't really feel like Invoker does that exceptionally well. Uh, also, as the game progressed, this hero was just dying so quickly yeah. and it really couldn't have that much impact. Maybe it was just a game-specific thing and there is still hope for this hero yet, but I honestly think that with the way that this patch is shaping out to be or how it's changed, Invoker may not have a place as a tier one mid hero. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like these Pangos, maybe Primals, Conkers, who can like kind of stand there, tempo control and help you with the rune. I think they matter quite a bit. And one thing, at least like from this one game that we saw, I do think Damage mitigation and auras are still very, very important. Like on Liquid, you have you have Solar Crest, you have Lads, you have AC, you have a Frost Shield that's coming around. So like so many different options that can make it hard for Secret to like take the fight or something that can just barely go wrong. And if all you can do is one Wombo combo, if one little option goes wrong, if you get outplayed, if they have vision, just one little thing doesn't go your way, your fight is done and you might just lose one lane or the next Roche. You guys are talking about brawling, you're talking about runes. I see Ember Spirit buffed, Void Spirit buffed. You know, are Ooh. we going to go back to a meta of potential spirit heroes? Or do we think it, it's just too much tankiness still on these other heroes? Like Pango, too hard to bring down, Primal. Like, is this something that's too early to tell? Are these teams willing to try this out? Um, like, these small buffs, mm. we've seen add up already on some of these heroes. I think, think spirit heroes could have a place in the meta, just because the runes feel stronger. Uh, heroes like Storm now have a buildup on the Witchblade that's actually pretty relevant to them, but we'll still have to wait and see. I know heroes like Coddle got buffed, and when a hero like Coddle gets buffed, naturally these Coddle duos, like Coddle plus Storm, get mm -hmm. stronger, so we could see Storm back in the meta. Also, Io got buffed, and Io Storm was a very famous duo yep. too, so it is something to consider. I will. Uh, Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I would not be surprised to see some more embers. Like Abed has popped off on it, even though they're not here anymore. He showed that the hero's damn good. Mm -hmm. It gets buffed. I think it's a great point with the kind of enabling supports, your Coddles, your Ios. Like these heroes are no joke, and they make other heroes so much stronger. Also, can I ask you guys? So this rattle cage item, both position fives had it in the last game, and it gives you plus twelve armor, which sounds pretty good. But the the passive that shoots out the thing that gives you the attack speed slow, mm -hmm. how often does that happen? Does that have a cooldown? It's I didn't check yet. I hope it's not literally every time you take 180 damage, because then it sounds really strong. Because it, it really looked like the supports of the last game, they were living for a yeah. very long time, and it's because of this plus 12 armor item. But I, this item needs to have a cooldown. I just couldn't follow it yeah. very well in the last That's game. one problem I used to have with Craggy Code, and now it's back. Items that make you tanky, that like literally change the way you can play and the way the enemies can attack you, it creates a lot of chaos, especially in the first game of a new patch. I think these armor numbers, they're no joke. No, this is a neutral item, of course, so you can't really guarantee yeah. that you're going to get it. You can't really play for that, oh my goodness, I'm going to get one and uh, my hero will be OP. So it's, it's situational in that sense, yeah. but uh, I don't know, Brian. Well, there's also so many things that you're checking in the new patch, and I, if there's anything I've struggled to check when I'm looking at other people's inventories is, oh, they have that neutral item. Yeah. Like, I thought I would have killed him, but yeah. he has extra 12 armor. But the, this, the problem is even like when you click on it, if I play a game now and I click, I don't know what item is like that. You see it, I'm but you have to yeah. hover it and read it again. I'm like, okay, I got it. The next one, it, like, it takes you a little bit out of your flow. I, you guys were earlier this day mentioning how much of a difference 0.1 seconds can make in a professional yes. Dota game. So if you have to take your time to hover over a battle cage, what, what one is that again? That's another couple of seconds that you need to take out of your game to really understand what your enemy is going for. We are having a draft on our screen in the meantime for game number two. Team Secrets on Radiant side, Team Liquid on Dire side, first pick for Team Secret. 
And second pick for Team Liquid. And the bans are coming out again as well, with Nature's Prophet being one of them, because we did see Puppy mm -hmm. uh, do uh, very well on that. Other than that, the biggest change is that so far is that Razor is still in, yep. and so is Muerta and Slardar. Yeah, I think the Muerta ban is kind of a whatever, so I'm not too surprised to see it gone. Uh, I would say Secret Banning the Pango just makes a lot of sense. I think Effie's onto something with... I don't really know if I want to play some Invoker against these type of heroes that are in the pool. Just take it out and then Liquid. They, they felt this early game from Puppy. Like, don't give him this Nature's Prophet again. Yeah, also, I want to point out to Sloan Druid. I thought that the, the nerf to the bear having zero armor at level one was really significant. I don't, I don't know if it's still worth a first phase round. And I don't play the hero enough to know, but to me, it feels like it could easily be punished by any uh, ranged right-clicking support that could just whittle down the bear really early on. Even at level three, the bear has only got two armor compared yeah. to its three armor at level one in the past. So I feel like letting Lone Druid through might actually be a viable strategy because the bear can easily be exploited. It honestly also matters a lot because there's this trick with Lone Druid where you keep it level one, then they go on you, you level it up because then you can resummon, you get a new Savage War. So I really like this change. I still think the hero is very good, but I think people will experiment leaving it in the pool. Yeah. Avery uh, SVG was mentioning that on a new patch, like Death Ball is always one of the most reliable yes. strategies because there's just so many unknowns. And yeah. maybe these teams are just afraid in the lower bracket to mm -hmm. lose a game for free at 15, 20 minutes to a Lone Druid high ground post. Yeah. So it could be that they aren't really sure mm -hmm. if it's as powerful as it used to be. Or like, I agree, these nerfs are certainly relevant to the laning phase. But in the lower bracket, you know, that you is fair. You, you don't really have that much uh, time to experiment. I mean, all of these players woke up today and were completely caught off guard by this new patch. So the only thing they can do is go in with their draft, draft prep, their old draft prep from group stages into this lower bracket series. I mean, at least, you know, Chrysalis, he gets his Razor. I would say him and Amar are probably the most feared Razors out there in the entire world. So surely Secret must be happy with that as Liquid. You know, they, they put their attention on more, I would say, the faster type heroes. Razor's still a fast hero, but not as fast as the others that they did ban out. Yeah, the level one link duration going from five seconds to 10 seconds, it's really important to note that the static link only starts the debuff countdown once you end the link itself. So this is effectively adding five seconds of damage drain if you're able to connect in the lane. Yeah. Now the question is, you picked it first. So a lot of times you usually, in the past, pick Razor if you saw like offlane Tide or some other melee hero that can't get away from the link. But Liquid's likely not gonna give that to him. So is this a flex pick? Is this strictly for Chrysalis? Like, what do you guys think? I actually think Razor as a flex pick to mid is a lot more viable now with the changes to Static Link and also the changes to Storm Surge doing more uh, movement speed decrease, that could make it a more impactful mid laner. So I, I would like to see teams experiment mm -hmm. with the uh, mid lane flex. I know that a team like Azure Ray would definitely do it on XM, but I'm not yep. sure if it's something Secret are comfortable doing on mid one. I think it's it's a nice hero to flex, but the only problem from first pick, but what you have to do now is Liquid, is craft a mid lane and an offlane that this guy does not want to go to. Or at least you have one hero that even if he gets flexed away, you just destroy him in the game. Could be some bad rider type hero, sniper, like these heroes don't care if they lane against him or not they will destroy him later. So Secret need to kind of cover their bases, take out the Morphling, very, probably the most traditional carry counter alongside like what, maybe Faces Void that you would want to take out, Brian? Yeah, any hero with mobility that can also like go on you and then disengage from you yeah. as well, like with Faces Void with the reverse time, or time, doc, time walk, excuse me. With Razor, I think these are small changes that are so interesting to a way a hero gets played because his level 10 talent used to be 14 agility and now it's 10% spell lifesteal. That's like a completely different like, way to play the hero. Instead of turning into a right-click mid-game carry with like Manta and other stat items, are we going to be seeing yeah. a more utility-based Razor, whether it's in the safe lane or the mid lane? There was this Bloodstone build for a while. Like, you know, maybe you pair it up with this, it's good. I, I don't really play Razor, but I think going back to the question about Crystal is and whether they should flex it, the beautiful thing with people who have 1,000 or 2,000 games on a hero, they don't really care. They have played these matches for 50 times, 100 times, you know, if they bust out four counters, he's like, guys, I don't care. I have this secret build. I'm going to do this. I'm getting this new item. You know, I got this. Yeah, it would be cool to see the uh, Bloodstone Razor make a comeback because the Bloodstone got the plus 75 AOE, AOE range. And that is actually really relevant to something like Eye of the Storm that does a lot of high damage intervals. I also think it yep. would be extremely relevant to heroes like Lush Rock. So we're probably going to be seeing a lot of bizarre Bloodstone Coming back. experimentation moving forward. Yeah, I, I, did te I did test it early in the lobby with Lash. It, it looks strange. It, it's gonna just—it's another thing that will catch people off guard, like some random AOE increase. It's—it's uh, it's nasty. A lot of this you play by feel, right? Yeah. You're thinking like, oh, I'm slightly outranging Leshrac, and now you're not. Um, but and these are the little things that, if you are not paying attention in the middle of a chaotic team fight, might make or break the difference. As Grimstroke, 
did he, his only nerf was to the shard. Yeah, oh, some I... some shards and like a talent related to the shard and something small to soulbind. Cooldown increase on yeah. soulbind, which I think is pretty relevant. And I think the the heal on the shard was actually really important if you're playing with these tanky heroes. So I feel like the hero is weaker overall, but it's still a really solid hero because it enables the initiating type Ooh, of melee leaders that Secret love to play. Yeah. I do like the Avenge a lot, first of all, against the Razor. I think it's a hero that can suffer from being put out of position, but also you can instantly break the link by swapping out the other guy. I'll take Grim, still a great hero. Puppy Ogre, honestly, another classic. This hero, in my opinion, is underrated. His laning is good. He just gets in there. He's a body. He gives bloodlust to your bros. It's just another. These are some feel good supports. You know, if I'm any player in Team Secret, I see these two, I'm happy. Yeah, and also by nature of a patch coming out and popular supports getting tweaked or slightly nerfed, supports like Ogre, who are always fine, are going to be better just by nature of other heroes changing. So if I'm Liquid, at least one thing that makes a lot of sense with the Venge as well, apart from like, you know, having the swap against the Razor, is that it makes heroes that can man fight or outrange the Razor a lot better. Like range carries are pretty nice with Venge. I would say minus armor as well is really nice against Razor because the hero relies on just getting in there, staying in. So Slaughter for now could be a flex. Maybe they think that, you know, we can just straight up lane against it too. I think it can go both ways very quickly, but good pick. Maybe, maybe something like TV, like with the Slaughter. I know we haven't seen too much of the hero. Maybe it's a bit of a double-edged sword against Grimstroke, but they do go for the Invoker themselves. So. They didn't listen. Yeah, they, they are also <laughs> blind picking it. They don't know their opponent mid laner. What will Team Secret do? They, a lot of the heroes that we talked about, the Pangoliers, the Primal Beast, they're already banned out. And there are still the Shakers that were played during group stages that might potentially work, but you need to pick heroes that can play for these runes. Mm -hmm. And if Invoker is picked, but he's not laning against something like a Pango, he should still be fine, especially with supports like Moira's and Ventral Spirit, who are going to rotate to the mid lane. Now, Secret have to be able to match that pace themselves, and I think Puck was the perfect pick for that. Yep. Outside of me thinking Puck is going to be better because now there's a Witchblade upgrade, he got a small quality of life change with his orb having faster speed. Just an overall like nice hero. I think it fits well. Some heroes that they may, may be looking at are banned with the Pango, Kanka. I think Puck is great. You mentioned they're probably going to want a hero that the Grim and the Ogre can kind of play with. Gives you a lot of lockdown. Not the easiest catch for now for Liquid. Like maybe some random Atolls in the silence. Maybe consider an Orchid on the Invoker. So it could be a pretty nasty Puck game. Yeah, you can easily dodge the Venge Sun. Slardar is not going to be reliable with the Crush. Even if you do hit Puck with it, it's only a one second disable. I, I'd say when I'm looking at this Puck pick, my concern is whether or not like there's going to be someone to play with the Puck. Because you have Grimstroke, like, are you going to ink swallow the Puck? Are you going to have, like, the, what's the follow-up to the Coil in the mid-game is the question I have right now. I mean, I guess the nice thing is, like, Razor, at least after, like, 50 minutes, he should feel good enough to, like, kind of run in, right? Like, be a semi-body, back up the Puck. I think you have ink swell, another semi-body in the Ogre. So for now, at least, I'm, I'm pretty okay with it. But if I'm secret, I'm looking at an offlaner that can help my course fight into this double minus armor for now on Team Liquid. Because I think if you don't, Razor's game can very quickly go into the drain in the mid game. So I'm looking at these Venge changes. I don't know if you guys read them yet, but Venge stopped doing damage reduction on her swap, and now she gives a damage barrier based on how much damage her swap did in the first place. So it scales from 150 damage level 1 to 300 damage to 450 damage. And I was thinking, how relevant could that be? I think she's actually going to be pretty impactful against these blink targets of the past, now you can't really blink out of swap or buy yep. some kind of raindrop to offset that initial 50 damage. So it feels like she has more utility. It, it was a weird change, but now that I'm reading it, I think it's actually better. No, I kind of like it. I think Venge Swap has it's kind of an underutilized spell. Like The really good teams know exactly how to use it aggressively. Get this guy in, now he can't blink out, and you save the guy, and now he, you have a damage barrier when you go in. I don't know, it just feels good. Do more damage too, right? The 150 yep. damage level one plus your magic missile level four is going to be a significant amount of early game damage. It might be. I'm looking at a hero like Visage. Never mind. It's going to be a brew. But I think anything that gives you a little bit more team fight and has the option to build auras, I will stress it enough. I think the minus armor is very, very nasty for Team Liquid. That also preemptively counters any illusion heroes they might go for. These are all just the bad matchups for Razor. Yep. Right now, Razor is going to have a tough time tanking up, but he also needs to at least. You want to give him a good link target in the carry if possible, because Slardar is melee, but he's also very fast. Slark, also very fast. 
I'm loving the pit changes they gave to Slark. First off, the Orb of Corrosion. Yep. We saw Monkey King last game being one of the primary beneficiaries. I also think Slark's up there, so his landing stage will be much more powerful. And also giving this hero stat gains on his int and strength. Like, this is something you can't underestimate because this hero's stat gains are usually atrocious. Uh, I, they still don't have a way to burst mid one, though, so I don't know what they're going to do about that. I think eventually we'll just see them get to a point where they build that Hex on Invoker and they'll play off of that, and they can just try to overrun these side lanes of the Invoker instead of play around the mid lane, and that's a pretty solid approach. Uh, I also want to point out the Echo Saber change made Slark more viable if fighting early on, because I believe it gives more strength now, mm -hmm. more tankability, so it's going to definitely be interesting. I love the Slark pick. I think it's really good at chunking down these heroes like Ogre, these heroes like Brewmaster, and it hasn't had its time in the sun yet, but it could very well be a Slark patch. I think the Slark pick is very good. Like having heroes that can go in and out to outlast Brew Split, out outlast the Razor BKB, I think it fits very well. For Secret, I'm really looking at this top lane because I have seen Brews play against Slark before and it has gone horrible. So I hope that they have a decent plan to damage control Mikke's early game. Final words, Brian? Uh, I think uh, Liquid's going to outpace them this game. All right, let's find out if they can indeed make this a 2-0 or perhaps Secret can strike back and keep their tournament's lives alive in a third game. We're finding out together with Cap and SVG. Thank you, Shiva. That's right, getting into game two, Avery. A fresh new draft, a whole new list of heroes that we can scramble and look at uh, the Dota patch notes and figure out what the hell is going on. Yeah, they're going to do the same, you know, read the patch notes in the middle of the game. Uh, I've, I've been there, I've done it. Still, Puppy is playing his ogre. Apparently, he just doesn't mm. care. Yeah. I'm just going to throw some Bloodlust around. You deal with it. Crystal is still playing his level 30 Razor. Doesn't care, you know. Change static link, whatever. I'm still going to link you. You got to farm that Arcana for something. You can't just give it up. Yeah, that's true. Is there any hero on this list of drafted heroes that you felt like, oh, that hero got a big buff? Uh, I mean, the Venge change could be pretty big. Like, this hero is usually on a threshold of if it's really good, it's really good. And if it's not, you just never see it. Yeah, so it has been one really of good. <laughs> <laughs> there was one TI. I remember Kuroki played it a little bit. Uh, okay. I don't know. I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to tell. I feel like a lot of these heroes ne didn't necessarily change that much. Uh, I guess Puck. Could go up a lot more. Yeah. We were not seeing that hero at all last patch. So maybe mid one can show us what is different about the puck in this patch and how better he can play just off of like the lower cooldown. I mean, anytime you lower cooldowns on puck, it's pretty scary, right? Yeah. <laughs> because the hero just gets to a point where you can't interact with him, you can't touch him. The thing about the strap that I think is interesting is Liquid really went in on making Razor's game as hard as possible. Like this is a first pick Razor for Crystallis. They know he's going to take it if you give it away, probably. Yeah, different patch, but you got to kind of play what you know anyway. And they really just made his life miserable. The Mort is not a hero he interacts with at all. You have Venge, which you don't want to link the Venge. She gives bonus damage, which can help you fight through the link. And she can swap someone out of link. You have Slardar, which can just physically burst the hero. Even that's probably his best matchup here, because Slark and the Invoker are terrible. Very hard heroes to link generally in the fights. A lot of control and a lot of displacement. The Invoker one can be okay during your BKB times. But again, they have like the swap. They have more to call and you have to run into. It seems like a very hard game for Crystallis to deal the damage. And then... That's why I go back to the puck for mid one. If you're looking at a hero to pick up some of that damage slack in, that, in those big game fights, I feel like it has to come from the puck. Sure. I think uh, the Slark's item buildup is going to be really interesting. Uh, we heard Mira bring up the point about the Echo Saber, uh, Diffuse Blade, I think is still a very valid item. Yep. Aghanim Scepter is going to be super important in this matchup against the Razor. So, what is his buildup going to look like in this game? Uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that. We do have a little bit of an uh, audio issue here. It should be fixed down very shortly here. But uh, Brewmaster also being the last pick up here for uh, Boom. I'm not sure if I've uh, seen too much of Boom Brewmaster. We'll see how he does with uh, the micro element of he that hero. did play at this tournament. He had a very solid game on it where he was just like highest net worth all the way through. That was one of the games where I think that was the game where Puppy rotated to his lane with Furion, similar to last game, and just set it up for success. So he's very comfortable on the hero. He has looked very damn good on it. My biggest issue is like, is it enough damage in this style of game, right? Again, how much are they going to rely on Crystallis and Midwin to get the job done? Because traditionally, Brew is not a hero that deals a huge amount of damage in the fight outside of when you're just rolling the game, which could happen. Uh, and he also has some like decent spells to worry about. Like, how does he stick on these heroes? Who is he tossing? And if you get jumped by a Slardar Amp into like a calling, you get silenced. There's no save. This yeah. Grim Shard can't really bail you out of that every time. So. It's something Boom's going to have to think about in terms of who's waddling in. Is it Puppy first? Just trying to tank the initiation with the Ogre and, and set it up that way. And how much damage does he actually get out in the fight? But it's a very different style draft uh, coming up from Liquid. They have a decent amount of vision. They have a decent amount of physical damage amp to put into this Slark. 
traditionally a hero that actually wants attack speed more than the damage, but he has alacrity to throw on there as well. So triple physical buffs coming out from Liquid between the Venge, the Slaughter, and the Invoker. A lot for Mickey to play around with, and even Boxy if this game goes very late. We're talking a lot about what we don't know and are going to figure out, but what about the, some of the things that we do know? I mean, you were hyping up Grimstroke before this tournament started. You said this is going to be the hero of the tournament, and it was most picked, most banned. Like, it was definitely targeted as a very strong hero. Thank it you. did get touched up a little bit in this recent patch. So, yeah, since you're such an expert, you, how does you these changes uh, affect him too much? It's got a little bit of a shard nerf, doesn't get it quite as much damage or heal uh, with this shard. A uh, little bit of a nerf to Soulbind cooldown. Definitely hurts him a bit. I mean, some of the value of that hero was like his massive uptime on all of his spells. I think the biggest factor for me and that hero was just super flexible. Like, he enabled so many heroes of the patch. All these melee offlaners that were big with hearts and stuff, he just excelled because he keeps them alive. All of his spells combo really nicely in the fights. You can chain some people, you can chain them into silences. It's just the perfect hero to set all that up. So that might be the biggest factor. A lot of these core heroes change because we're going more towards ranged in heroes, or like if the Shrek comes back, you know, he's just not going to combo as well, and then the hero might fall off a bit more. Whereas, like, those types of heroes generally like the Bruiser supports, these Ogre yeah. Magis, these Treants that can buff them up and just turn them into raid bosses. So, you know, Dota's a game of cycles. We'll go in another circle, and maybe even though Grim's still good, he might fall back to the bottom. You know? All right, so where do you think this cycle is currently trending to? Because we had, we had the <laughs> tank meta of TI, Hearts and blade mails everywhere. Then we had a little bit this of a. This is going to be the Veil of Discord. Uh, I mean, uh, people are hyping up Veil. That item seems really good. Veil of Discord black during meta. There you go. Oh, what about Shiva's? Maybe well, Shiva's. that's included. Yeah, Veil is going to be good because you build it. That's true. That's true. Reminds me of like that Arteezy water cycle meme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's in secrets back on the table. Yeah. It is worth mentioning, you know, we are paused here. Uh, I think we had to fix one of the headsets. I would like to mention, you know, Puppy is in this match. Yes, so he's the is, captain of yes. Team Secret. You are correct. It is a little ironic that we had a broken headset, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe after that game one, tensions got a little high in the secret back room. Started to do a little <laughs> headset monitor flinging, you know what I'm saying? But old yeah. habits die hard, Cap. New patch, but... You know, I had a chance to uh, talk to Puppy, and I asked him about uh, their run in the qualifier. To get here in the first place, there was a lot of people who doubted them, and... Uh, they received most of the doubt when they went into that lower bracket elimination match in the Western European uh, Western European qualifier, matched up against Alliance, and almost lost that game three. In fact, some would say probably should have lost that game three. Yeah, should have, would have, could have. What was it like to you know recuperate? Did you feel like you clicked? And he said, no, not really. We just decided, screw it. We almost got eliminated. Let's not care too much anymore. And. Uh, well, it's hard to keep that mentality when you're here on the main stage, but if anybody can get a team together in that kind of thought process, it's got to be the most veteran of uh, Dota 2 players and Puppy. Absolutely. Let's we'll see if they can muster a win back here. Down a game on the brink of elimination already at KL. Mickey checking for a ward. He will scout it out. Question is, is do they know... Yeah, they know Which exactly. Which it is, and they're paying in exactly. So this is going to be a benefit for Liquid the whole game, the Slark Night Vision. It's really big here, because again, I feel like the initiations for Secret are a bit harder, right? Like, you can coil someone, you can run in with the Razor, but it's it's kind of obvious. So if Liquid can just scout where Secret are, start the fight on their terms, they're going to be pretty happy with that, especially if it starts out with Mickey just building stacks. Begins. There's not a lot of lockdown for the Slark if he gets to the later items here. Maybe you get three Bounty Runes on the side of Liquid. And they were actually baiting out Puppy in the bottom lane, trying to get a first blood off of him. But since Liquid had three other spots controlled, they were like, yeah, there's no need to try and fight over this one. I mean, Puppy's job is just going to be bloodlust. I I'm looking towards Yamich this game. I think he had a, a really rough game one on the Shaman. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> some of that's the Shaman, you know, 18 deaths, so what can you do? But this game, like the Grim, I have a lot of faith in Grim. I still have faith in it in terms of until this patch starts to get figured out, which, you know, I'll see you in a year. I think Soulbind is a really big spell but for both teams, in a sense. Like, I, I was mentioning the lockdown for the Slark. Soulbind is, if it catches the Slark or the Slark plus one in these fights, that sets a lot up for Secret here. Right. So I'm looking towards the Grimm's levels and in the lane for him, too. Like, we're talking about this Panda potentially having a rough lane versus the Slark, which is 
been a va very favorable counterpick for a lot of these European teams over the entire year. If it's still the case, then you want to give Boom a good start. That falls down to Yamich as well. Play this lane well, set your panda up for success, and then he's going to pay it back by giving you levels in the fight. That's mainly what I'm looking at in terms of Secrets game plan. And if you're liquid... <laughs> <well>. <laughs> Bumpy's like, I got all the time in the world. I'll wait for you to come back this way. Yeah, I've been playing this game for 15 years, son. You're going to have to juke a bit harder than that. Well, Get plus up. level one, by the way. So just looking to play off of Crystallis with the rundown. Definitely helps the Razor a lot. Yeah. And this Link lasts longer, right? Like, that was the biggest change to this hero. Less oh, yeah. damage for Tick, but the 10 seconds on the Link. So if you bloodless this guy up and he just runs you down in a fight, it seems kind of toxic, to be honest. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, especially, like, as a laning phase sort of thing, it's pretty difficult to get that link off of you. Yes. When you're moving so slow, that's a massive difference at level one. Very Here. obnoxious as mid one Radiant facing his own set of difficulties here. Just getting his mana burned out early. Yeah, he was using a lot of orbs early on to try and secure CS, and if he gets hit by a single EMP, then that is pretty much all she wrote for his mana until the bottle comes in, which is coming soon. Yeah, Nisha doing pretty well in these early waves for Quas West and Quex here, and just burning mid one out. But we'll get water runes guaranteed on Puck, so I'm sure he'll be fine. And for me, we're looking towards Saberlight for Liquid. One thing I was gonna mention is like he picked up a lot of that damage slack in those those later fights, right? Slaughter is a hero that can do that if he has a really good game, but he is up against some tough spells and like the coil, the the brewmaster split that can dispel him and toss him and the soulbind. Yeah. I almost feel like he needs BKB, but we've seen some of these Slardars struggle to get there sometimes. The fights and the Roshans and the Tormentors and all this nonsense can't go their way. Especially uh, potentially having a rough laning phase. I mean, it's just a tough lane. Honestly, I feel like he's doing great given the, the early matchup. Yeah, I mean, sees the opportunity. They managed to get him a little bit of that brew burn damage. Hit him with a stroke as well, but Magic Missile keeps Boom at clap bay. Missed. Still level one clap. Huh? I think Liquid are pretty happy with how this laning phase is going. I think Nisha's doing fine mid. I think Saberlight's getting a lot down here. 15 and 5 on the slaughter. 14 and 2 for Nostalis. He is suffering and Vice is dead with the blood grenade. Yeah, they actually killed him instead of the Razor killing Slaughter. This is going to be terrible for Team Secret. His damage is all being taken away. And he doesn't have the bashes, but Boxy's got the damage instead. First blood goes to him. He missed that life by one stick charge because he popped it early. I don't know if he wanted to survive there in the end anyway, but big pickup for Saberlight is, I was saying this lane is, was going really well for him. Now it's just going extremely well. Two points in the crush will get the job done with the extra damage. Even though you lose all your base damage, Slaughter doesn't care. He's still bashing you. He's still stunning you. I don't know. I read an essay recently I that you, you should definitely <laughs> be leveling out the bash. So that's very interesting that he did that. Yeah, it is. It pays off. It seems like... Uh, Maybe he knows what he's doing. Didn't even need the sprint. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you really threw that guy under the bus, wherever that random person is from the internet. And some people set them themselves up for it, you know? I hope he's here. I hope he comes up to you after this match. I would love to meet him. I didn't appreciate that, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my friend, the guy who wrote the Lion Shard essay. <laughs> now that guy, I definitely want to meet. That guy is an oracle. Hashtag rise above fate. He knew. <laughs> Another EMP will not latch on mid one, so mid one some of his resources up. You'd like to be able to see him maybe keep just or at least gank some of these lanes. Oh. No, uh, yeah. you got Ignite and you're only level two uh, in Bloodlust, so no stun to stop that TP away from Boxy. At least they kick him out of lane a little bit of time, but still not stopping the Slardar domination. Top net worth right now. And he's just a full level ahead of Crystallis. And he is well out in front. This laning phase going extremely well for Liquid now. All three cores top of the board. And the problem is they, they just keep burning mid one's resources mid. So, like, normally you try and, you know, skew some of these lanes Oof. and turn it around. Where's yeah, the turn? Around? Burst damage. Too much to handle. The Ogre was going mid. And they even had the rotation coming from Insania. Wasn't needed at all. It's a costly rotation now with the, the gate mana. Yeah. That was 150 mana to make that little back and forth. Wait. He didn't, he didn't lose man. Did he only lose it one way? Maybe there's a cooldown on Yeah, a little buffer. Mm. I don't know. Interesting. I mean, that would make sense if they put that in, because I feel like it would be a little bit too punishing the other way. Still, Crystallis just hits level four. Saberlight's almost six here. We'll clean up a couple triple wave. I mean, Puppy's just trying to give him as much solo XP as possible, and you can't blame him. 
But this is also going to hurt his game. He's still level two. Yeah, Puppy might just be dying out here. Chrysalis has got to come out, bail out his support. I mean, this is no real bailout here, right? Like, what? <laughs> One more hit, he would have gotten the bash, and then maybe Boxy would have tried to line things up after that. Foul Rune, first one of the game, does spawn, and Nisha is going to get his hands on a shield rune. Now, that's kind of whatever for him, but the important part is keeping out of the puck's hands. Exactly. Mid one's game just continuing to get slowed down. He had to go to base, he's behind on levels, not getting the power runes, doesn't have the resources to gank or counter gank either of these side lanes right now. This is where Liquid are happy, because when you're winning the lanes, just keep them how they are, and just keep building it over time. Get the six on Saberlight. You can definitely look for the kill on Crystallis again, especially if Insania is willing to make a gate rotation. I think you look for it here because once more he's up far in the lane and Insania does not have to be top right now. You already have six on the Slark. So Midgay is fully independent. In fact, he's going to look for the Wisdom Rune contest. Liquid making plays on both silings right now. Secret. I don't think Yamich can fight this man. This. He's going to have to give up his life. An attempted Wisdom Rune. Oh. He does manage to get away from him. Mick A will probably collect the kill, though. Yeah, yeah. Is that worth? I, I actually don't know if that's worth, because the Slark gets a stack. He gets extra solo XP. That was your own rune, right? You're not even going to get both. Yeah, and it's going to speed him along to the Diffusal Blade, which is going to be his item choice. Now, they did First dodge up. the gank bottom. Crystallis aware of the rotation off the puppy scouting, so they will not lose their Razor again. Secret dodged that one. But they're falling behind on these lanes right now. And, like, the move has to come somewhere. I feel like it has to come off the puck, because I don't know if your supports are doing enough damage right now. Yeah. Seems like Brewmaster is uh, the one core that is doing okay until he gets ganked by the Z-Man support rotation. Navigation. Makes well. That'll give him enough, thanks to, yeah, in part, the, the uh, evasion there. Yeah, three points for the Brawler. Just trying to play the lane as much as possible with double Bracer, three points Brawler. It's a big commitment to just try and stay alive and get to your level six. But this does not help you fight the Slark at all in terms of aggressive capability. Good attempt at a dodge, but sadly does not net the power rune over to mid one. That is still controlled by Team Liquid. It feels like Liquid are just winning all these little battles, right? Yeah. Uh, even Crystal is having trouble standing on bottom. The early level discrepancy, phase boots for Saberlight as well. The chase down potential is there. Which is super concerning uh, given the fact that Team Secret they lost that game one, but the biggest ray of hope was their laning phase. They dominated that, mostly off the back of Puppy's Nature's Prophet. Yes. And this Razor has been a hero for them that they've used to try and win the laning phase off an early carry pick. This is not a hero that you really want to, you know, have lose the lane and go jungle. It's pretty slow, pretty clunky. It's not a hero that you want to see being ganked like this. Puts himself in a corner, does have the TP rotations. Good read by... Uh, Crystallis as he managed to get just away from Saberlight in time. Now they go for the punish. Ignite to slow down. They're not going to fight back into this Brewmaster, so I think Boxy's life is forfeit here. Probably try and go for the neutral deny and does not get it. Almost got it off the clap. Yeah, it was a close call. Still a good turnaround for Secret. They have to protect Crystallis on this bottom lane. He cannot go jungle yet. We'll see if he opts for Midas here. I mean, it is a route you can go on the hero. He feels like he has to catch up in levels. But he's going to be behind Mickey, right? Mickey has just been given solo XP this entire time. And once more, Liquid just going to bring the numbers on the Razor with a oh, Sunstrike. Oh, Sunstrike adding the extra bit of damage required. Another kill on the Razor. All right, well, at this point, you got to bring this puck to something because things yeah, are just to. going way too wrong for Team Secret. Mickey is just abusing the fact that... There is so much attention away from his lane, and right as Bin one tries to make the rotation, he just TPs out. Space created for himself in this instance, and the whole time this is happening, Nisha just gets to sit mid and sun strike some plays, right? I actually feel like this level one Xor sun strike has been underutilized. It does a lot more damage now than it used to. Yeah, it's all pure, so it doesn't cost you too much. You can just sit here and throw it out on all these little skirmishes or ganks. And once again, Crystal is in trouble. This would be a fourth death for the Razor. He does go down at the end of this. Roshan's helping him out, though. Yeah, a little bit. Saberlight is going to commit for this kill. He's taken a lot of damage from that ultimate, but alone, nobody TPing rotating from the side of Team Secret now with the Amplified Damage Rune on Nisha. This is getting a little out of control. Yeah, they, they have to kill him right here. There is no doubt about it. They have to commit for this kill. They have to get a punish somewhere in here, and they're going to use Coil and Brewmaster's ultimate to get it. 
But in the end, they do manage to collect a bounty that was worth 750 gold for them. That's yeah, one of those numbers you see and you're happy you got it, but at the same time you're like, well, this game is going a little <laughs> rough if it's worth that much in 10 minutes. Yeah, we must be behind a lot, and I they do, are. I do like this Inkswell Puck combo, though. Yamich did max it. They don't have a lot of ways to use it super early, but if you can swell mid one in off a of coil and just guarantee that extra stun into the silence, that's a lot of control. It will help you make these early plays on the, the mobile heroes from Liquid. But man, Saberlight has been unchecked in this early game, and mid one should be fine. Yeah, mid one might have to use an orb here to make sure he's okay. He gets silence off the tornado. Blood Grenade gets thrown out. He's low. Oh, jumps over the side just in time, and the Sun Strike will not land. Just walked into it. Close, close call, Liquid. He's gonna have to go to base, and the question is, can Liquid pressure this tower? They rotated Mickey over. He has a full defusal done, by the way. Yeah, that is. It's gonna be scary. There is a glyph up. I just don't wanna have to use a glyph when there's not even creeps on it. Like, Puppy does not wanna lose this tower right now. Echo Saber done for Saberlight. So, this Slardar is. He's top of the board. He could also make that rotation in the mid. Now, last game it plagued Liquid, but I think in this type of game, they just make mincemeat of him. Because nobody is standing against Corrosive Have plus the Vengeance Wave coming through. It's so much minus armor early. Yeah, that's a good point. Add on to the fact that it has this attack damage reduction as well. Pretty potent tool for these early game fights, which is why Team Secret are playing so defensively around that mid tower. Only leaving the Ogre out there. Yeah, Puppy knows that the fight is coming to them. That's why he's been sitting here for a while. He just wants to be ready for the move. Liquid have overextended oh. on these mid-tower pushes before. And Tornado, good job to be able to stop that lane. Uh, this, this is, is the, the problem with playing Razor in this matchup. Shit, just controlling everything about these fights. Meanwhile, Boom burned out a mana here. They get the silence onto him with the ink swell, but Mickey is going to be fine. In fact, Boom may still be in trouble. Thankfully, the ink swell is oh too God, big of a threat for Mickey. Pick up there as he's just rushing Radiance, by the way. No Boots Brewmaster Radiance rush. Honestly, might have it at a decent time here. Yeah, I mean, he's gonna have to do some heavy lifting on damage the way that uh, this Razor game is going so far. Soulbind, Boxy marching up solo here. Does have the help coming in from Mickey soon. We gotta start retreating. Mickey. Backstab. Oh, backstab from Saberlight. Beautiful play by him. Finally making his face show up in some other lane, and it nets them two kills for his effort. Yeah, this game is getting very troublesome for Secret. That rotation from Saberlight is the perfect one, and he didn't even have to do it with the tower still up. The tower died in that entire sequence as well, so just gets a free two-hero backstab. He's going to have a very fast blink here. Just feels unstoppable. I mean, I guess this is why this hero was number one banned. Oh, no. Mid one, not able to get the jump over to the orb. Controlled up for too long, has to use the silence down, but now the urn hits him with a cold snap on top, and that's easily kill for Nisha. Mickey sets it up, and Nisha knocks it out of the park, getting the kill. Look, we're just taking over the entire map right now. And Slark does not make these types of map control positions easier, because he kills all your wards at the same time. Yeah. Roche is also going to be open very early for Liquid off the Slardar amp lineup. He's going to have to draw something back. And it's going to have to be off of support bolts, I think. Like, get some good multicast ignites going through off a of Soulbind with Max Inkswell. And this Radiance off the Brewmaster, punishing over extension. Being chased down, trying to get off the ultimate. Oh, man! 30 HP! And he, he got that off of the Drunken Brawler toggle. He went to the Void. Brew for the status resist. Oh, that's good. Make read. sure he didn't get, you know, chain stun off the cold snap. Dude, very boxy. Play. Oh my god, boxy. He's well, gonna they... try and get the shot onto him right as he comes back. He doesn't even need to hit him with the shot initially, slows him down and gets the finish. Now the smoke did connect on Nisha, so that's still worth it for Secret. I mean, really heads up play by Boxy. A lot of solo XP for him, but yeah, almost a thousand gold for that kill. This invoker kills the bigger one. It frees up a lot of space on the map. You get some breathing room, get your cores involved. Man, this, these deep wards are, are playing secret right now. Puppy is searching for them, but it does not look like he will find this last remaining dire ops in their jungle. And Vicky is just controlling the whole other side of the map. Level 11 right now. And we'll get his courier back, so Mage Slayer for him. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. What, what do you think? I mean, it's a it's, great Mage Slayer game, but it doesn't build into yeah, the Bloodborne. Yeah, they removed the scaling on it. Yeah. 
has to feel worse on carries now, but he just feels like he's probably going to be invincible with the extra resist. And he seemingly is not wrong so far. A double link. Onto two, they can get the double link, yeah. Double break. But they can't actually get aggressive off of it. Not with Saberlight lurking there in the wings. I don't know if I like this Mage Slayer. You can't build in anything. Just feels kind of stagnant in a game where you're leading a lot, right? Yeah. See if maybe it'll save him in some of the fights. Maybe he feels like he's going to have so much damage with all these amplification spells coming through that if he's alive, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, it certainly fits the play style that he's trying to use this Slark with right now, right? He's being super in their face. Really like caught Boxy. They do manage to catch him. Oh, okay, Coil's going to be used. They do manage to finish him off. Mid one's going to be a little bit low here, but the stacks are not quite there for the Slardar. Deals with that Phantom before he starts back away. He's really looking for another Flink engage, maybe. As no, Mickey just TP's out, so he's just going to abandon the fight. Okay, Secret getting more than just a pick off. Managed to get two this time. Yeah, mid one finally completed that Witchblade, and now they have a bit more damage, a bit more kiting ability. Slow down the Slardar. I mean, you got to remember, like, I still feel like the Slardar's team fights are difficult. For Sableye to blink into Coil, Soulbind, uh, potential Razor Link, Haze, Radiance, Burn with Evasion, it's still a bit annoying until unless he wants to commit for BKB. It's just his game is so damn good, though. No, yeah. Good, he's just untouchable. The big question for Liquid is how early do you want to try and Roshan in this game? You have so much map control. You have all the lanes pushing in. You have the night vision advantage. I don't think they're thinking about doing it early. Big crush. Almost bursting him down in time. The Soulbind's going to keep him at bay a little bit here. Midwad can't jump to his orb in time. It wasn't going to go far enough anyway. Just too much damage too quickly for the puck to be able to operate with. I'm going to go for it. 12 Saberlight. Oh. Yeah, that the Lackerty. Combined with the Slardar's yeah. burst of the bash against a hero with no armor. And that's a that's a two points X order lacquer, so that's not even close to online yet. Yeah. Like that's twenty-two bonus damage. <laughs> so we'll see you in about you know ten minutes here when that slaps a bit harder. Wait, Radiant's he's going solar crest? Done for boom. And he's almost level twelve. So this is a big brewmaster timing. And then he's picking up a Pavis, yeah. He should thinking about solar crest. Maybe oh. it's just a value item now. I mean, I, a value item, maybe, yeah, but very curious. I mean, I, mean I, I guess he doesn't need to do any damage, right? He's got two cores that could do it for him, so you support utility items. I mean, this is an item that's been built on a poker. Not out of the realm of just generally good. Coil after the Dark Pact here. Mickey's immediately going to snap it again, in part because that Mage Slayer, he's tankier than you would expect. I mean, Secret want this level 2 brew team fight. This is like Boom's strongest timing for a long while. The difficulty is going to be finding enough heroes here. Swap's actually going to be used on the Mickey. I'm not sure if that's what they actually want out of this. Insania is definitely dead, and Secret wants to be able to find more fights. In fact, they've almost got him. Soul Bind is controlled. That's a really good one. He got up his ultimate, but it's only going to last so long. The Plasma Field almost finishing him off, but they don't continue the chase. They go for the Invoker instead, who slips through the trees, but now he's got the Ink Swell on him. Do they have the detection? Got him with the dust. Pull him Hold back on, in. Man. Nice use for the Void Panda to push him right into the full team of Team Secret. And Saber Life now comes back in with Mickey, but with Mickey? their Volker already dead. No and ult. Mickey's in trouble. No ultimate here. The Glimmer Cape buys a little bit of time, but it's not enough. Team Secret, a massive win as instead of just cutting their losses, Liquid try and save everybody and instead lose three heroes and they could have just lost one. Really nice smoke from Secret. Maybe just catching Liquid off guard with how that started. I mean, Insania swaps, and I feel like at this point, you're just getting out. The Soulbind was incredibly nasty here as mid one scouted that TP just at the edge, and Yamich catches both the cores you want to catch. That is the setup that is going to lead to success in the team fights. For, for Secret, if they can just run everybody down with some extra buffs from, you know, the Ogre, giving you Bloodlust, giving you the move speed, giving Crystallis a bit more damage, just catching people in an isolated position. I mean, you're just watching each other die at this point if you're Liquid, and Mickey makes a bad leap in with no ult. Each yeah, player not saving. One during and a half. Yeah, that, that's a big misstep here as he was having a very free game. And I, I feel like that's going to hurt his build as well, right? Like, you go this oh, yeah. early Mage Slayer on the Slark, you want to be winning these fights with the Slark playing super aggressive, putting Secret in a position where they can't come back. Now, this item, I don't want to say it feels like a dead item, but... Certainly can't afford to be dying. 
And Aghanim's going to be slowed down, which means the Razor is going to feel all the more potent for this window of time. I don't know. It feels like Secret just have better spells. Unless Saberlight is controlling the fight. Like, he's the big fighting force here. Yeah. And I, and as I said, I think he needs BKB to be able to stick in there. If the Brew gets split off, Saberlight can't take the long fight. Because he's going to get Dispelled, Tossed. You can't really burst the, the Brewlings yet, I think. If they get to that point, it's a very different story. But this Radiance is doing a lot of work. And that level 2 Brew ult just prevents Saberlight going in along with the Soulbind. So he kind of needs BKB to man up. And that's a ways away here. You can see uh, Armor is the name of the game here. We have three different Dragon Scales. We uh, are going to have just a little bit of audio at issue, and uh, we'll get right back into this game two where Team Secret, I mean, it was kind of looking at this point that, uh, or not this point, but five minutes ago, that they could just get shut out pretty hard. Uh, Team Liquid, they dominated the Western European qualifier, and they easily came at first. Team Secret, they managed to limp through the lower bracket, and the way this series was going, it looked like Team Liquid was just showing we're the superior team all around. I mean, but yeah, this is a big turnaround. Ten minutes ago, you could have said this game might might just be over. Yeah, but now I actually think they're probably favored here for like the next four or five minutes. Yeah, they've got a good window on Team Secret to make things happen. Yep. One of those things is probably that big man on screen right there, the uh, Roshan. Uh, it, if it, they can steal Roshan, that is huge. Their lineup's really bad at doing it. So yeah. Like, they even have to, if, like, win a really big team yes. fight. But even if they stall out Liquid from taking it, like, this is a game where Liquid could have done it at 15, 16 minutes if the game's just steamrolling over. Yep. The fact they get these team fight wins means that's going to get delayed, and that's a good sign for them because they can contest the later Roshans. It's the early ones that are probably the more difficult. And we're looking at that man on screen. That's an Ogre with a Midas. Oh, <laughs> okay. Puppy has caught up in this game. He's almost level 10. He's got that Midas roll. <laughs> he's, he's ready to scale, baby. I mean... And he's going to go Lotus next to uh, help deal with the Corrosive Haze. There's a lot of single target, actually. Yeah. Magic Missile his, swaps. His items can be super impactful this fight if he gets to the Lotus Orb, extra armor items like Casual Vlads, anything like that, Four Staves. If he gets to Hex, Hex is cheaper now. Ogre uses a lot of these offensive items better. E-Blade, they got buffed, for example. Yep. Uh, you could get really far. Man. Just the fact that Puppy recovered in this game, I don't even know really where he got that recovery from. He's the highest farmed support in the game. Off of him being like level two at seven minutes, right? Yeah, he was given uh, Chrysalis all that solo experience. Maybe it didn't work for them in lane, but he found a footing. Nice uh, frog. Now let's see if they can. Observing his monstrosity. <laughs> what, the Slardar? <laughs> Everything. Everything's a monstrosity in a new patch. From your uh, initial gut reaction, what do you think is the one thing that it's like immediately going to be nerfed in the B patch? What is the first thing that Ice Frog puts in, you know, like the the notes? Other than Shadow Shaman minus one base armor? <laughs> no, I think the, the Shadow Shaman from last game uh, kind of showed that the, the hero's not OP yet. It's hard to say. It, it's probably items, right? I, I yeah. feel like items dictate modern Dota a lot more than heroes sometimes. And some of these items just got buffed a lot. They got rearranged. I'm sure there's some heroes that just like abuse the hell out of the new veil. Or I also feel like Aether Lens being built into another item is a pretty big deal. Yeah. Like Aether Lens is one of the strongest items in Dota in terms of team fighting and skirmishing, which is where the meta has been pushing the game. Right. So if you can build an early Aether Lens on all these heroes and then have it go into a powerful item later, which, you know, E-Blade is no joke. Like that's a pretty good recipe, right? You remember the patch where Octarine became the item of the patch. Yep. That was because Aether Lens built it. So that's something I'm looking at too. Like those types of items, I think, change the game a lot and they make certain heroes really powerful. So one of the numbers things that stood out to me was actually, we have not seen him a lot, but Abaddon. A me curse too. damage. Yeah. It seems pretty nice, right? Like that's one of those heroes where he becomes very toxic and hard to deal with very quickly. Yeah. Once he starts to become viable on like these flex positions and core ab and stuff like that, I'd be interested to see if that hero has a place in this meta because he's just been out of meta for so long. I don't even remember the last Abaddon patch. It, he uh, does do level think? one, level one curse. If you get to the four stacks, it does 135 damage. Yeah, that's a lot. Like it's a lot of extra damage to just give a hero out of ran randomly, you know? Yeah. We'll see the rundown here. I mean, this is why you skill the points in crush, right? That's the lesson of that. Oh, yeah, you just, can't win the trade-offs. It's just a crystalless death deal. <laughs> like, that's, that's how we're doing now. It's going to brief <laughs> recap of the game. Well, it's going to be a recap of Team Liquid killing heroes for like 15 minutes straight. And then uh, 
And a couple of turnarounds from Team Secret. Yeah, the one thing about this Liquid lineup that maybe slowed them down a bit is I don't think their supports were the best at enabling the start Mickey had. Which, there's not a lot that necessarily do it with the, the Slark, but I'm thinking of, like, IO Slark, right? Like, let's say this was an IO instead of Avenge, just running around with the Slark. Yeah. I, I feel like you'd have to be up more gold and just controlling the map way easier. It's just the supports for Liquid are a bit clunkier, so they kind of have to choose who they play around and choose their fights a bit more carefully. And I think it, it maybe hurt him a little. Not that it's, like, the biggest factor, but it's interesting to see these, these differences as mid one will get his double dodge here. Oh, they didn't see the second one. Okay, no highlight reel for you, sir. <laughs> Well, it looks like we are about ready to go back into the game soon here. So, we get, uh, get some more Dota underway. Shout out to everybody who's here at the stadium. Man, you guys really showed up at the stadium nice and early, man. Friday at noon is usually not a time for a stadium to be filled out. Shout out to all of you guys who made the trip, showed up nice and early to watch all of the uh, tournament here. I mean, it's Southeast Asia. They have a legacy of the best fan stuff holding, you know? Exactly. That's why we love coming to see in the first place is you guys, the fans, make it so fun to be able to cast in these uh, in these arenas, in these stadiums. Everybody's so loud. Everybody shows up. Not even a rookie in the game, let alone the crowd. Yeah, we're th is that hero going to be... Uh... I don't even remember if that hero got changed. Mana cost rescaled on tricks of the trade. Yeah, so basically, Jeez. you know... Good, luck, got good luck next year. Yeah. Maybe we'll see Ricky at some point in 2035. 2035. <laughs> He's on trajectory now. <laughs> oh, I hope Dota's still around by then. I hope I'm still around by then. Well, you might not be. But Dota, <laughs> Dota will outlast all of us, I have, I have a feeling, in some uh, capacity. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. Puppy maybe not too happy about this puppy pause. <laughs> All the memes coming back that's on old today. Meme right there. That's, that that's the pauses. The ogre magi. I asked about. Uh, I asked puppy about what uh, what happened with him at mid one. When, you know how he come back into that's the a, fold. That's a straightforward for question. Team secret. Yeah. Hey puppy, you guys still have m mega beef or? Uh... <laughs> I mean, something, you know, like if you guys split apart and you come back together after such a long time, it is, there had to be is, a catalyst, unique. right? There had to be something that triggered I don't even that. I don't even remember another instance in Dota where that's happened with, like, such high-profile pro players that had a good as run as they did. Yeah. They were the dominant team that season. And then, like, five years later, they get the player who many consider the best player of that year. Yeah. Like, going into that TI and that run and all those majors, it was middle. He was dominating that year, right? Yep. And then to end up back with your old captain on your old team like five years later. Pretty crazy. And uh, you know what it was? It was uh, this last TI. The uh, the team that mid one was playing for, they were having some visa issues, right, at the right. time. Yeah. And there was the, the potential. Puppy was supposed to stand in for them. Yeah, everybody thought he was going to show up. Yeah, and they got the Take visa. a WWE up. entrance with the machete out of nowhere. You know, but, <laughs> exactly. Uh, didn't happen. Yeah, John Wild the last second got his uh, his visa like literally the day before, yeah, something they, like that. So maybe uh, they had a talk, you know. Well, more than talking, they were scrimming together, right? Because That's you true. know, Puppy's gonna be playing. You got to start practicing, and um, so he was he was playing with them, and he said that he really enjoyed playing with uh, Midwan and Off. Get huh. a lot of praise to give them. Said Makes sense. a lot of their their attitude and uh, perspective on the game was something new and fresh to him. Uh, and that helps a lot, like yeah. honestly. It's one of the biggest factors in Dota is feeling like you have new ideas and new ways to go and you're not stuck in this bubble think tank that you've built over the years because it's very easy to get stuck in that in a team environment. It doesn't take long. Even a couple months sometimes you stagnate. Yeah, It's one of the biggest reasons teams like bringing coaches in. But it's also a reason coaches sometimes lose value over time. Yeah, I mean, they had a, a duo there, Puppy and uh, Heen, yes, for a the, long time. One of the longest, secret. actually, yep. in the history of Dota. And uh, they recently switched things up for this season. Now the longest running player coach duo in Dota is RTZ Volva. <laughs> that would be correct, I believe. Yes. <laughs> RTZ Volva still together. Yeah. It's been like six years only. Yeah, they'll uh, have to prove their worth with their new roster. True. Yopage, Kid Track, both coming in. Didn't get to see them for this qualifier, though. Biding their time. 
waiting in the shadows, waiting, <laughs> yeah, for, right. waiting for uh, Tundra to move to Western Europe, <laughs> so it's completely uncontested. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All according to plan. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he said, uh, on top of that, he said, you know, mid one, uh, obviously it's just been a long time. So he said mid one's matured a lot. He said he has a, a very, like this guy really wants to win, but he also considers, you know, everybody's perspective. And uh, I mean, I'll tell you the number one way you can humble a Dota player is kick his ass. Yeah. You get humbled real fast when you're sitting out there on the sidelines for like three months. You don't get a call from anybody. You, or, you or have even, to come to the realization, okay, I, I'm not good. Even worse, you uh, go and try and do your own thing, captain your own yeah. teams. That's and, the other way. Yeah, and then you're different. the captain, right? And you have to deal with all the bullshit that goes along it's, with captaining, uh, you know, four other Dota players. A thousand percent true. All, all these cocky <laughs> core players in the world, they think they can just go captain a team. You're like, I, I can do that. I can draft and uh -huh. strategize and tell people how to play and get people together. They do it for like one week. They're like, get me the hell out yeah, of here. Yeah, mid one probably <laughs> aged like 10 years within that one It really season. is, dude. <laughs> you have gray hair. You don't have it going in, but you got it going out. It is a tough job. Yeah. So, you know, it goes back to another recent Reddit meme thread about, you know, pro players are just kids pushing buttons. Somebody has to wrangle those kids pushing buttons. Mm. You yeah. know, someone has to teach them all these things and, and study all these games. And that's the coach or the captain. That's it. All right. Well, there's a lot of, to be taught, a lot to be learned in this new patch. And we're going to take a, a little break to you know, catch up on some patch notes, but uh, hopefully our game two of Liquid versus Team Secret will be coming back shortly. Don't go anywhere. We're just fixing things real quick and we'll be back.
Hello, world. Welcome back to KL. Yes, my friends, we are getting this game ready to go, fixing some technical issues here. But this is a rare opportunity, you know? Never before in your lives have you probably been in a situation where the players are trapped. They are unable to leave their booths as they must wait for these technical issues to be fixed. So, what's your favorite team out there? What's your name? Yes, my name is Han. Hello, guys. Hello! Get up! Are right, you like any players up there? Sorry? Do you like anyone up on the stage? Any players? Uh, luckily, I'm guy, but I really like Insania. Insania, do you hear me? Insania! He hears you! Woo! Anything you want to say to Insania? Yes, Insania. Thanks, but because of you, I reach Immortal. Thank you so much. Whoa! Fantastic! My goodness! All right. Anybody else want to say something to something? What do we got here? Oh, my goodness! Look at this! You guys custom make this? Yes. Yes, we cut the message. This is the cutest thing I've ever seen. This doesn't deserve to exist. It's so cute. Look at this little celery right there. That's beautiful. All right, well, they're not playing right now, but any words out there to them? Uh, uh, let's go, GG. Yeah, there you go. Fantastic. Wow, that's great. Who do you have? Oh, oh, the fire. Right, any words out there? Yeah, let's go, Liquid. Let's go, Liquid? Where's the chibis and liquid there? Uh, Boxy's crying. He wants to see his little cute version. Yeah, I can, I can see him cry right now. That's good. All right, keep crying, Boxy. Keep it off camera, though. Thank you very much. Oh, we got Dude, can you pick a real hero? Holy, oh, great. Yeah, I got me. Fantastic. Welcome. What do we got here? What is this? The Yule Scepter. Oh, the Yule Scepter. OK, OK. Can we embarrass uh, her? Is that OK? Sorry? Do you mind if we embarrass her? Why, what are you going to do? OK, if you could stand up and Yule's him for me, that'd be really great. you mind spinning around for us? Sure, sure. <laughs> I've never seen somebody so disappointed. All right, come here. All right, I need you to cast your Yule's, and you've got to spin around for me. All right, make it look real. Are you ready? Yes. All right, make the noise. <laughs> yeah, baby! Oh, it's so real. I felt it. I felt it. What else we got? What are you guys eating? What, what's going on over here? Wow, well, she does not want to be on camera. As soon as I walked over, she gave the biggest frown I've ever seen. Don't worry. You're safe. What are you guys doing? You think she's going to win, bro? Ooh, tasty? That clearly has a bite in it. <laughs> Why would you offer me that? He has an entire box uneaten. Can we get this, please? This entire box is uneaten, and he offers me one with a gigantic bite out of it. Why? Uh, spreading COVID. Ah, oh, that's my boy! Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you sit next to this guy. <laughs> that's fantastic. Hello, what do we got back there? Oh, secret insert meme here. Very uncreative. That's okay, my friend. That's why we watch. No problem. Hello. Oh, Team Secret Jersey. How you feeling? Uh, kind of nervous. Kind of nervous. Uh, well, Puppy just made eye contact with you, so I'd be nervous too. Any words? Four Team Secret there as they were about to get back into the match. They could use your help. You guys can do it. You three. What, what, say it again? Go for game three. Go for game three, Team Secret. Yeah, baby. That is what I like to see. Oh, my goodness. Hello. What are you on your phone? Are you bored? You don't like this? OK, we're filling here. How you doing? Uh, everything good. OK, OK. You having a good time? What are you, who are you texting? Uh, I don't know. OK, can I see? Huh? Uh, can I talk to him? Uh-huh. Let me see your phone. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Who are you texting? Uh, my... All right, thank you so much. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's all good. All right, don't worry about it. Oh, who else we got in the crowd there? Ooh, hello, hello. Team Liquid Jersey up here. You could have sat in the front, but you chose back here. I'm sorry, I came in really hot. <laughs> How are you feeling? Uh... Good, because they're winning. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Were you surprised by anything in that game? Anything look broken in the new patch? Should Ice Frog nerf anything? I think the day before, yeah, when Laundry couldn't pick up the items in yeah. Azuri's games. Yeah, I remember that. That was broken. I feel like we should have kept that. No. OK, great. Well, thank you for your input. Well, we'll file that one away. What do you got there? That's a Sheever face right there. Wow, look at that, Sheever. Wow! That is the least disturbing thing I've ever seen. Fantastic. Very cool. Do you, uh, why'd you pick Sheever? Uh, it's a uh, spin. So, oh. Yeah. Oh, do you like Sheever? Is she, you think she's a good host? Yeah, 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 I do. Okay. Any words for Sheever? She's listening right now. Uh, 
punch my number. No, 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 no! Put away! Put away! Very dangerous crowd here, very dangerous crowd. You look excited, hello? You guys wanna talk? Excuse me, hello, 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 pardon me. Hello, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome to the show, what's your name? My name? Yeah. What? Bowen! What's your name? Kimi, Kimi. Which one of you is the bigger Dota fan? Guess me, of course. Oh, gee, you're not even fighting for it, sir. Are you a bigger Dota fan? I've been playing from Dota 1. Oh my goodness, what's the MMR? Uh, I'm just a big fan of Flax. Oh, <laughs> it must be low then. <laughs> no. What's the MMR, sir? Uh, used to be Emoter, but now I'm 3K. <laughs> That's okay! What, what caused the drop to 3K? Uh, Emoter is my target, but I retire after Emoter. Oh, you retired. You fought, You pulled a, a Jerax. You won the game and then you let it go, huh? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's my... I think Dota 2 is just uh, a lifetime hobby right now. That's right, my friend. Well, you uh, retire in peace. Don't worry, guys. Just because you were once immortal, you can go down to 3K2. You can give it up. Thank you, sir. Any words out there? Any shout outs? Let's go, sir! Action Slacks! That's me. I don't need... Thank you so much! I'm doing fine, but I appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Anybody else want to be on camera? Oh, this guy's leaving. Where are you going, son? Hello? Oh, he just took a new seat. He just joined us. He has no idea that we're coming. Okay, hello, hello. How are you? Hey, what's up, bro? Where are you been? What? You just sat down. What have you been doing? Oh, I get some seats here. Oh, those are good ones. Monet, NTS, Baboki. Oh, yeah, that's good. Whose signature do you want the most? Nothing to say. Malaysia Bole. All right, fantastic, guys. Well, it seems like we have got more stuff coming your way, so uh, don't worry, everybody. Keep tuned in. I'll keep uh, attacking the crowd members as much as I can. We'll throw it over to you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Spin one more time. <laughs> Known Dota organization in a large part of the world, and for good reason. There's really nothing left for Talon. They're gonna call it here. GG. Team Liquid continuing to have Talon's number in playoff series. They spent the majority of 2023 chasing after a nemesis, gaming gladiators, but time and time again, ultimately losing out to them in the grand finals. And they'll call it. GG is called. Gaming gladiators once again. To one against Team Liquid. In spite of this, they still have to be considered one of the best teams in the entire world throughout the year. What makes them so consistent at the highest level of Dota? Team Liquid tends to favor and prioritize picking strong support heroes for the incredible support duo of Boxy and Insania, with huge success on aggressive heroes such as Ancient Apparition or Dark Willow. They can often seem lost in games where they don't have a traditional plus four that can make kills happen. Boxy. You better get out of here. Yep, that's gonna be another Sunder to bring down Boxy again. With an almost unrivaled level of team playing coordination, Team Liquid are experts at controlling the flow of the game from early game to late game and weaving in and out of team fights. This leaves their opponents with an extremely difficult task if they want to be one of the few teams to beat them, where they are required to either avoid fights and try to safely pick up whatever scraps or farm Team Liquid leave them, or take them head on in team fights, something most teams in the world struggle with. With Sai, one of the longest standing top pro players stepping down from the team as one of the main forces behind the drafts, along with being the top offlane player, 3-3 will step in and try to fill this extremely vital role. However, at this event, Saberlight will be standing in for them instead. It remains to be seen if the new Team Liquid will stand the test of time.
잊어버려 해도 가려지지 않는가 I'll never miss this chance Make you dance 해가 뜨는 것도 모를게 Dance, time to dance 집에 가는 것도 감옥해 울거진 너의 하얀 불을 좋아해 움켜진 문제들은 모두 가볍게 손 들고 태워 이 순간을 밝게 녹여진 분위기는 뜨겁게 아무리 어렵다고 해도 시작하면 되는 걸 처음이 어색하다 해도 이미 익숙해진 걸 I'll never miss this chance Make you dance 해가 뜨는 것도 모를게 Dance time to dance 집에 가는 걸 Welcome back, everybody. Team Secret versus Liquid. Game two is back underway. We are 20 minutes into the game. The 5,000 net worth lead for Team Liquid. Yes, Liquid is winning the game right now, but Team Secret just got themselves a very big victory. Hold up. Oh, okay. Nisha snipes one on the <laughs> Tormentor. Could have been worse, honestly. I mean, <laughs> what can you do? You know, you take Puffy with you. I guess they'd rather have the Tormentor go to them than Puffy not go. Asia, yeah, you know, so. <laughs> I would I would trade uh, a shard for Puppy's life. Yeah, yeah that was sure. very close. Uh, almost got it. So if you remember where we left off, you know, Puppy had picked up his Midas. He's starting to scale. Boom with that look of Whoa, where'd my captain go? <laughs> <laughs> oh, captain, my captain. But yes, Team Secret just got a big victory in a team fight. It feels like they were about to build up a little bit of momentum, but Getting, uh, okay, missed out on the fear shot there, so Boom's gonna be A-OK. -okay. So they have to find a way to back into that, that zone, right? That was working yes. for them, which was pretty much the team fighting. Made a really good move off the level two Brult with the Radiance. If they can keep going with that off cooldown, you wanna make it work while you can, and just continue to scale up. You have Bloodlust on your side, 
And you have a Grimstroke that kills a very effective soul There's line. Still going for this heal on to boom. Now his ultimate is just about to come up, oh, and he's going to get it off second. in time. Now Sableite's going to be in some trouble as the TP rotation is coming out. Coil snaps on to two, pull the back immediately, but mid one's got to be careful. Thankfully, the Inkswell is there from Yamage. Slows down the Slardar and that big burst of damage where he almost caught mid one out. Sableite's still struggling. Trying to get to that BKB in terms of the actual fights, right? Panda causing him problems. That was very close. He got some evasion off the radiance of the, the brew. Definitely proving problematic as well. I mean, pretty much have 100% evasion almost when this is up. Yeah. And there's not a lot that pierces it on Liquid side. Like, do you want to buy early MKBs on these heroes? Probably not. And he's really planning to just keep that scale going. He's looking at boots to travel, but Manta as well. I mean, any dispel is going to be really nice here. Remove the Slardar Amp, remove some of the debuffs from the Invoker. Even it makes it harder for the Slark to go in. So, yeah, these Mantas are going to be nice. Crystallis also rushed his on the Razor. I mean, I think you had two routes like go for the recovery Midas or just go Manta here. And perhaps they another well, play. trying to go for the kill, but a haste rune on the Muerta Boxy. He's got a Glimmer Cape. And this will be the early Roshan attempt from Liquid. They're going to try and force it with Sableite. They've had enough with this map not going their way in the recent minutes. So two Solar Crests. I guess you have permanent Solar Crest for your teammates that you can't use offensively anymore, but you have this hand. Yeah, that is really interesting. They just keep on putting on Table Light. He's taking no damage from this at all. And this is really bad for Team Secret because we talked about how they can't necessarily take Roshan for themselves, but winning fights and delaying it for Liquid right. could have been valuable. a key point. Still, the, he just goes to Slardar here. So, really prioritizing Saberlight's impact in the fight. They're not going to give it to the Slark, which traditionally is a very good Aegis holder. Because you go in, you can build up a lot of stacks, you can push your hero to the limit and not have to resort to the ulti or the shard. You can save him for the second light. It's going to be even worse if he loses that Aegis without a response whatsoever. The Inkswell's going to stall him up long enough oh, for Chris to be able to grab him. And yeah, that Razor Shard made it so he didn't go anywhere. Still has Coil, too. He has a Blink. Is he going to be able to blink? Wait, no. Bjorg was right on top. Good swap from Insania, though. Will bail him out. Boom is still going to look for him with the Brulings, but I think he's more than far enough away, so they'll just have to content themselves, take away the Aegis, get the Venge kill, and take it to Tier 1 tower. Not too shabby. Yeah, for free. I mean, you couldn't have Brule, but who cares? I've already seen the power of that Razor Shard. Another spell that's a problem for the Slardar in the actual engagement. Yeah. And also really nice for Slark if you ever catch him without the Pounce. Puppy. They're going to try and burst him down real quickly. But Yamich does have that dispel thanks to the ink swell. And Puppy's not too afraid of turning back around now. Glimmer Cape gets rid of that silence. Boxy, though, still going to be caught in the coil. Saber Light. Saber Light aggressive blink here. Got to be careful against this Razor. Doesn't let him build up too much damage. Just 58 stolen. So Ag's finished for Mickey. This is where some of the fight setup can change. You can start to let the Slark go in and build up some stacks, go back out. But you got to have somebody start to deal the damage here. And Liquid are just going up against a brick wall. They, they've had troubles committing onto the core, so I think they're going to try and force the issue. But his daytime hurts him a little bit. I mean, these Solar Crests are interesting, but I also wonder if this... I'm assuming that the Solar Crest buff is like a normal buff so it can get removed as well from the Brew Storm Panda. Yeah, they we dispel and he and has... So, like, there's a lot of buffs that are getting dispelled here off the Storm Panda. Boom, just cap, cast it off cooldown. And it's something to think about, because Boxy's also going utility on the Muerta. He's not building the, like, Atos, Lothars, you know, old-school scale build. This is a Glimmer Cape 4-staff Muerta here. Yeah, that, that is interesting. We would have expected somebody else to be trying to scale, and especially, I mean, it goes to show Liquid's mindset. They, between the Mage Slayer on the Slark, this double Solar Crest, the utility on Boxy, they really wanted to be able to win this part of the game. And... Well, they're certainly not losing it. They are not dominating it like they were for the first 15 minutes. And then it's a question of where's the scale going to come, right? If you're not running this game over with the agencies that haven't done much for you, if the game is kind of stalled out, are you happy with your scale going into this later portions with the Slardar lineup? I think you're pretty happy as long as the Slark is continuing to get big. you you got to remember, you can still throw this Alacrity plus a Solar Crest onto the Slark in these fights, yep. and he's going to gain that attack speed that the hero really wants. He's just going to go to town. And the other factor here is we haven't seen a fight where Liquid have gotten BKBs yet. That's a big deal. Like, this secret lineup is thriving off the spell power right now, but a lot of that goes out the window if you get the double BKB up between the Slark and the Slardar. And Nisha's is already done. 
So they're actually just going to commit for triple BKB timing here, try and line it up for that next Roshan, get that Aegis, and do a lot of damage in that window. This negates a lot of Boom's impact, negates a lot of Yamich's impact, unless you get a really good soul bind to kite it out. Speaking of Boom, he's level 16, man. He's doing great in levels, and he's approaching some very coveted levels, right? Level 18, so you have the level 3 ultimate, but then also right after that is the level 20, where you get the ruling health, 1,200. They're going to be pretty untouchable if they can get that faster than the BKBs you're talking about. I mean, Secret Scale, I feel like, is almost... It's split between the Puck and Brew as much as it is the Razor, right? Like, if this Razor gets 6-slotted, of course he's going to be the biggest damage piece, but 5 or 6-slotted Puck in this game could just be an absolute menace. And Brewmaster, we've seen this hero do some serious right-click damage, and you got to remember, he has a Bloodlust to back him up. It's going to be a very interesting game as it pans out and it's just going later, and it feels like it's going to be going later here. And Secret look for a quick flank around Tier 2 top, looking yeah. for Nisha up here. It's going to be a hard catch because he's in the trees, big spot, thanks to the Plasma Field, he immediately pops BKB. They still almost beat him down in time, either way. Losing that BKB charge right after you picked it up, can't feel good for Liquid. Little static link nerf coming into play. I oh, sure. in the tier two. Yeah, it doesn't. You're talking about the fact he doesn't amp up the damage as quickly. Yeah, yeah. it's lower. <laughs> I'm saying it saved him there, but it will affect some of these like burst scenarios. Sure. Octarine done for mid one. So Seeker getting to like their you know third set of items here. And just keeping this game static. However, BKBs are finishing for Liquid as Saberlight has finished his. You have the one done, Nisha, and Mickey is. Closing in here. So you have to imagine when that third BKB comes out for Liquid, you gotta make a move. You gotta get a fight going. And you wanna get close to this Roshan spawn so you can just transition into total map control. You still have two minutes of night time as well. So if you can get this BKB finished on Mickey and use night for the fight, that would be Radiant's ideal. Is under attack. How does Team Secret approach fights against Triple BKB? Kite it out, right? You gotta I Soulbind on two cores. Best case scenario, but if you can't get that, you just have to survive the initial jump and kite it out. Play around Crystallis as much as possible. He's going to be pretty strong in his BKB duration. And of course, Brew split is not bad here, because I don't think Liquid are just bursting down these Brew. I don't think it's where their lineup necessarily excels until in the ultra late, when, you know, Nisha's just right-clicking everybody into oblivion. Aggressive poke from mid one. He just wants to scout out some heroes. He also went for a Nemesis curse. Yeah, it seems like uh, everyone wants this item now. I mean, Could be the overdue item of the patch. Yeah, it's not bad, I guess. Looks weird on Puck. It'll be interesting uh, if he continues to scale into more of the right-click damage, right? He gets, like, the Aghanim Scepter and Could stuff. Could go that route. Yeah, for sure. Smoke breaks in. Link oh, already out. It's the Soul Fly. Yeah, one and two. They only have one drain. They do have a swap to be able to defeat that. So they get Stabilite out of here. Yeah, but it re -linked. Actually, okay. Now he's able to blink himself away. But both the supports, they're going to be run down. Crystal has felt untouchable in that. I mean, the second you get two heroes in the Soul Mine, that fight is almost over unless you have Mickey coming in with a shard maybe later or something. And there's still no answer in terms of directly fighting this Razor. Like, you have all these buffs on Liquid side, but nobody is there to stay on the ground with it. It doesn't matter. Didn't even have to use Split for that, by the way. And that's a level 3 Split as Boom is already level 18 here. And hitting high ground. Already tier 3 tower. Or down to half health. Glyph is gone. Mickey finishes his BKB and will take a tier 2 bottom. So they're going to wait for the heroes to be up. And they have triple BKB if they want to take the fight. Crystals does not have his here, so there's no way you commit to this if you're secret. But you are very happy with how this game has swung in the last 10 minutes. Yeah. Rolt's coming back off cooldown, but Liquid want to catch them as they're retreating, teeping out to their outpost on the side of the map, and then trying to sweep in and see if They'll find anybody from Team Secret. Not the case here. They retreated all together back to the triangle. It has to start with Mickey in the mix, though. Like, either he's initiating with the pokes off the Ags, or he's there to follow up on the Slardar crush. Oh, he'll be right in the mix. They actually got the crush onto the Razor. So, yeah, the pickoff on Ogre yeah, no is BKB. great, but a kill onto the Crystalis Razor is so much bigger for Liquid. Perfect smoke. You get a high ground ward, you get a really good angle. Secret just, I mean, Puppy's expecting it, but the crush on the back line just seals the fate for Crystallis, and his BKB was on cooldown for three more seconds off that fight top. So Secret not respecting how fast Liquid can get to that side of the map, and 
They didn't even have to use anything for it. All three BKB is still online for Liquid. As you gotta think about this next Roshan. Mid one. Hop it away. He is gonna be going for that Aghanim Scepter. He's gonna be cutting creep ways, which will help them with controlling this Roshan. It's gonna be a late one, though. Two and a half minutes left. The shard for Saberlight also helps these initiations a lot. It was a missing component, because he wants to go in and just crush the puck, get the amp, and not have to waste time casting his ult on the puck. Guarantee you can just bash him off of a, a primed bash, something like this. It might be enough where that little bit of chain stun guarantees you the pounce in, and it all, it's only gonna take one hit from Mickey. Yeah. Like, you, this puck is gonna disappear if he's amped, and anybody's hitting him with the, the lacrity, the minus armor debuffs, the, the bench of aura coming through. There's no armor on this puck at all. In fact, he's taking extra damage from the curse, so... What is it, 14 armor? With an 8% amp going through on 2000 HP? Is Good luck. You're just gonna have to dodge it. This will be a test. Elder Smoke. Mid one's capabilities on this puck on a roll that he hasn't been playing a whole lot in his career. was playing the off lane for the last couple years. This is all about Roshan. Secret will have Radiant side control of it for now. Kind of awkward for Team Secret. They have this control of it, and uh, it's not actually spawned. Meanwhile, Team Liquid getting really control, could control the other parts of the map. Boxy's pushing in mid aggressively. Top's going in as well. Oh, just a quick, clean up a quick Tormentor, or will they? Oh, Saber like, Top's not to. Yeah, you can't do it nearly as easily now that the Tormentor nope. can't go into negative armor. And we're seeing some of the new itemization, the Veil for Boom. Like, this is going to be built into a Shiva's for the Brewmaster, but seeing Bale on this hero with, you know, Radiance Burn, Haze going through, doesn't seem too bad. No, no. And their lineup's all magic damage. Now, it's pretty weak against triple BKB timing here. Yeah. But, but it'll you, were already, you were already bad against triple yes. BKB timing, right? Your whole plan was to kite it out, so. 6,000 net worth lead for Team Liquid. This game is going to break one way or the other over this Roshan fight, which... Since it's such a late Roshan, may end up even coming down to being on a dire side. We'll see. Now we'll have about a minute of a stalemate around that Roshan pit. Liquid can't take that risk, though. They have to smoke and contest this. They do not want to give it up. And this will be a daytime fight, so no Slark Vision. But you have Hex on Nisha to start the fight off. Something that can surprise Secret here. And you have the Ags finished for Saberlight on the Slardar. So if he goes in, he's going to be way tankier than last time. But it's all about the lead off. Mid one breaks it. Jump in from Saberlight, doesn't get it, immediately pounce in to follow that one up, but they got the Soulbite on the as Double well as This is perfect for Chrysalis, oh, he's going to be able to output the damage, so damage. this out. But they're turning around, the physical damage is too much, Chrysalis got to get out of here, swap back into his death. Too much for him to handle, even with the damage being drained away from Mickey and Saberlight, it's not good enough, and Secret start crumbling around the pit now. Boom still has his ultimate out back. here, he'll try and collect Oh hex. no, there's that Hex, and the Puck is in trouble, but the Pounce didn't quite get there to follow it up. Mickey needs to be able to, oh no, Coil only latching on to the Invoker, Mickey's still okay for now. Gotta be careful of that silence. Mid one, cannot keep caught by a single disable, otherwise he's gonna die here, and almost gets hit, the Fear, the fear. his mid one doesn't know, he ups away to his orb, just in time. Saber life it almost gets him. Meanwhile, Boom is going to be the off laner that gets brought down, is eventually back into his full form. We got oh, Nisha. Wait, actually managed to get Nisha. Min one stays alive and gets a kill. It's the only good thing in that fight for Team Secret is everything else goes the way of Liquid. Costly buybacks here from Secret is that initiation. It wasn't the best. I, I thought Secret were going to get way more out of it because they got a double curling, double link. Crystal's had two link buffs over 120 damage each. I thought he was just gonna start melting people, but you're stuck in the puddle and Nisha's hitting you from the back. Saberlight's bashing you. You're getting stacks stolen off the Slark. He just disappeared. He needs more survivability in this type of fight. Liquid able to capitalize off of the big item pickups for this engagement. Really make them work. The hexes and the puddle did a lot for Liquid's cores. Not to yeah. mention Mickey surviving all of this time. He's just building up the stacks, man. He ended up with like 30 stacks at the end of this. Now, Roshan did end up going to the other side of the map after that team fight. So, Liquid going to be playing in some way to their own advantage. They didn't have to use any buybacks in that last team fight. So, this is going to be an incredibly this? tough fight for Team Secret. But maybe they feel like this is an all-in. They have to do something here. Silence, uh, though, keeps on landing onto the puck. The soul fight, sure. But. 
the Puck is already caught and killed, and Chrysalis has already seen that Soulbind isn't good enough for him to just charge headlong into this Slardar, who cuts down another one as Yamich falls. And maybe they'd want to rather have this dieback go on cooldown now outside of his base, but another costly death here, and yeah, the calling to just wrecking him in the fights. He has no way to deal with the extended silence that just keeps rocking on him, especially if he gets hit by any sort of slower bash. He needs a four staff bailout, right? And there's only one. It's on Yamich. That's it. So if you don't four staff this puck out of the silence, he dies incredibly fast. This game has turned once more. It's 17k gold lead out of nowhere. Roshan controls. Slark will now take this Aegis, which is exactly what Liquid want. The ability for Mickey to play as aggressively as he wants as he finishes Disperser. Yeah, the damage is starting to pick up now. It is going to be so tough to bring this Slark down once, let alone twice. So he's got free reign to take all these tier two. And Alacrity is fully online. You have Max Exor plus the level 20 talent. So you're looking at like 115 damage and attack speed. Just incredibly nasty. Yeah, Slark may not be the best building hitter, but with an Alacrity. He'll chop it down pretty quickly. Glyph is going to go out immediately. Sableye looking for an entrance. Does find it. Yamex dies in an instant. Now they jump on a boom as well. Thanks to the side, they're going to be able to burn him out of the mana. Thanks to the MP. He has a little bit mana. more, but he has no chance to be able to pop his ultimate. Crystal's going to come too late. Tornado intercepts them, so no real rebuttal from Team Secret. That's just going to be a lane of barracks guaranteed for Liquid, it seems. This is going to be a lot here. As Yamex dies again? Oh, die die back. Yamex, that is... That is terrible for them to be able to have. The coil is there. They're going to be able to take the first life away from the Slark. Yeah, but that Link was not the Link Kristall needs to commit into the fight. So yeah, 19 damage stolen. Just going to be a Rax and Liquid. They're going to linger. They know Yamich can't come back in this fight, and they likely know that Boom does not have five based on the fact he bought out the Shivas. Pull back in, trying to mant it off. BKB immediately has to go out to Mickey. Get he's going to pull back in. They need to steal as much damage from him as possible because you know he's going right back to hitting those buildings. That's the Razor BKB, however. Big item to get out of their side is Mickey still has his, Nisha still has his. I mean, just commit for Megas here? Like, are you that afraid of anything? You have the Depth Shroud to fail. You got to think to really go wrong. Oh, you don't have a wave. Oh, that's <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, that's what you're afraid of. Is they're just going to have to retreat. I think that might have been Megas for sure almost. Or at least it would have forced Secret into some a really bad potentially fight. terrible fight. Yeah, you don't have the Razor B give you. You have to take some fight like that. Secret will survive. Two lanes, 25k gold lead now. It just exploded here. And another set of items that Liquid can fall back on. They are just stockpiling the auras. And we were talking about Boxy becoming another core. I mean... He started off with Glimmer Four Staff. He's now up to Pike Moon Shard. So this Morta is packing a punch. Also took the level 20 and level 15 damage talents. Honestly, Boxy is gonna he's gonna shred Crystallis in these fights as well. This matchup is terrible for Razor. I'll take that. You just get pounded by the Pierce the Veil. Can't ever really go on him. And uh, he was taking some time there. Everybody's picking up their neutral items and then taking a while to choose what they want because. Yeah, they've got to probably read what they do. He chooses the Ancient Guardian, which uh, Four damage. is an interesting one. It's 50 damage, but then it's an extra 50 if he's within 2,000 range of an Ancient. Not your own Ancient. It could be the en enemy Ancient, too. So they go into the... Uh, yeah, so they're just blinking their base and, yeah, and exactly. kill everybody, right? That's a, it's a very interesting neutral. Like, 50 damage on its own is a lot. So I think Secret are probably going to opt for as much utility or survivability they can get, more evasion for Boom, but it's going to have to be damage out of Catholic if they want. Like, that is what you're going to have to scale into here, because you are battling up against a Vengeful Spirit lineup with a Vlad's Drum that Insania has built. It is a lot of extra damage coming through across the entire lineup, which are basically four right-clicking cores at this point. Yeah. So this is where this lineup just thrives. Like, it's hitting peak damage capability right now. And you're not going to have a lot of time to react in the fight. Which I think leads me to believe that Secret need to start finding the jumps themselves. Like, I think playing these fights reactionary that work a decent amount early on, it's just not going to work anymore. Because the damage is just overwhelming. Puppy picks up his own Vlads. Trying to counteract it as much as possible, but... It's just going to have to be the evasion out from Boom on the front line. And once more, I think Yamich is still the most important piece. The Soulbind and the Ink Swells, that's what's going to win you these fights and kite out the BKB duration. 
I'm also looking at uh, Puck. Just, I mean, we're just scaling for Team Secret, because obviously they're not going to be able to take control of this game and end it anytime soon. Somebody's got to help this Razor push to late game, and I, I don't know if Brewmaster can do it for you. Puck's got to do something here. But he's still struggling versus the calling. Yeah. The biggest issue for mid one. Like, his scaling is going to come out decently in the damage, but the survivability is what I'm still worried about. Can mid one actually stick in the fight and not get caught by Boxy? If I'm Boxy, I I'm almost just holding that spell for the puck. Like, I'm waiting to see when he goes in, just hold it for him. I don't need to throw it out on maybe the Brewmaster if you think you can jump the Brew, burst him off the chain silence. But otherwise, just make mid one's life as hard as possible, and I think you're going to be very happy with that outcome. And of course, Liquid. They can close in on these level 25 talents as well. Slark's talents are great, but I'm looking at the Slardar one here. Undispellable Haze, if you really want it, is extremely troublesome in a lot of games. Honestly, this other 25 talent is not terrible either, but I, I think Saberlight's looking at the Undispellable Haze. Yeah. Like, all these Mantas go out the window, right? The Haze is going to stick on the Brew. It's going to stick on the Razor. Just nothing you can do about it. Yeah, when you combine it with the Shard and the Initiation, he's been getting time and time again. So they're going to look for another one here. Didn't actually get the smoke on the Saber Light, but it may not matter. And should pull him back in there with the Harpoon. Lotus Orb bounces back. Oh, Thumbs down, though. They're caught inside the coil. They're going to snap it. Mickey with the Dark Pact is going to be able to get away. The Soulbind actually latched, but it was on yeah. Revenge who died. Unfortunate latch there. Almost wanted him to live longer, <laughs> yeah. maybe. But that Lotus did some work. Reflected a Venge Stun with the Shard, so it bounced to both of them. They'll take the freebie for sure. So you're happy about that one. And that'll get the Puck closer to that, uh, I believe he's getting a Parasma, right? Upgrade the Witchblade. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Just more more damage to come through off the right click. Somebody has to help pick up the slack. Yeah, I mean, amplifying magic damage is not a bad play when your Brewmaster is doing quite a bit of it with his Radiance and such. And AC for Crystallis. I mean, Secret's path to victory in the fight is like that fight extends, right? If you get onto the other side of the BKBs and the Slark doesn't have a lot of stacks, you still have the stronger spells. That's never going to change. Your spells are just flat out better, but you have to be in a position where heroes are still alive to use them. Yeah, draw it out against the Slark. Don't feed away too many stacks. Uh, yeah, that's, it's uh... difficult. It's very difficult. And that's why Liquid want these late game talents. Push the advantage ever more in their favor. As Mickey will pick up a shield rune here and complete Dyer's a full Bloodthorn. And he is stacked right now. Ninja gear on top of it. So guarantee the initiation for him. We will see Crystallis here, but he's all alone. Just take away some of there's the there's that new item. Yeah, Paras, first time in Dota's history in competitive. Oh, and maybe having a zero percent win rate after this. <laughs> Don't jinx. I hope I jinx. It's an interesting item. Like you reduce magic resistance, you're dealing more magical damage. Your projectiles go out faster. Is some armor in there as well, which it seemed like there there was quite a trend of just uh, a lot of magic damage going around, right? Yes. They they amped up. Uh, what's that? Uh, I always forget that other item. That now you could do magic damage toggle it. I like how the tooltip for this. <laughs> while we're paused, if you hover over Parasma, uh huh, it just says new item. Like, <laughs> new item. Seven, three, but new item. And then devastating. That's the lore. Devastating. Devastating. <laughs> Period. It's like they ran out of time for the patch. Yeah, just throw it, something in there for the lore. Devastating. I'm just new. Well, uh, you're doing all right for yourself in this game, Boxy. Yeah, I think Boxy's had a pretty good career. Oh, he's, got, a, he's got the shard, and he's already got two snacks on him. Look at that. Bad. Get a little bit of extra spell I mean, he's, in. He's scaling. And like I said, this matchup for Razor is one of the worst in the game. Like, I think they had a they had an option where they could have played carry Morta in this game because the Razor matchup is just so favorable for the Morta. But if Boxy can get there on his own from a four, it's even better. Yeah, they picked all this to, uh, I mean, you were talking about at the start of the game, the Slardar is not supposed to have a good game, but Sableye has excelled. Yeah, that lane, I think, went a lot better for Liquid than they maybe anticipated or it should have. And it just catapulted him past a lot of the mid-game problems. Like, we saw in a lot of those fights, his team fight impact in the mid-game wasn't that high, right? But if you get over that and you get to the late game, then it starts to become a big problem again. And this hero is always a menace with these late-game talents, shard, ags. You just become incredibly tanky and hard to deal with. I mean, this guy's untouchable, man. 
He jumps in. If he's in the water, crushes. And from his Aghanim Scepter, he gets all this bonus armor. He's got a cheese. He's got an AC of his own plus a trick. Full out float. AC. Yeah, this yeah. man's backpacking a full harpoon, so he, he's living the life right now. He's uh, trying to buy an Aghanim's Blessing next, just to uh, open up one of those slots. That's how good of a game he's having. The secret going through the gate off this smoke that like didn't hit everybody, but just trying to find any sort of pickoff, any sort of good ward to prepare for next Roshan. Catch Liquid off guard. I mean, Liquid, do they know they're all up there? I don't think they do, but the thing is you have creeps in your base right now if you're secret, so the issue's getting forced a little bit. Nonetheless, Mickey's gonna run in and someone's gonna get surprised here. And it's gonna, gonna be moved. He jumped on, Lola looking like they could probably bail him out. Being pulled back in. That's a double link. Mickey. He's yeah, stuck. he's getting a lot of this damage, and they just can't break those links fast enough. That, problem is, you have to force the fight of your secret. Yeah, Liquid's just resetting, and Secret is going to run out. And your base is getting hit. There's four spirits in your base, so... Crystallis, he has plus 360 damage. <laughs> if you can't take the fight with the double link damage, you're very sad, and Liquid have identified... You don't have to force this that hard, I think. Like, they're happy playing around the Night Vision off the Slark, letting yes. this lane push in. The secret is up, though. So. Yeah, Roshan's up, but... All right, now you have to force it. And then you have this amplify damage on mid one. He's going to do a lot here. Doesn't get a hit by the Fear Shot. Good face shift. Going to leave him a little bit awkward. He gets Pull hit by the There goes that force that But Saber Light with a big entrance into the team fight. Went straight for Crystal. Got to swap back out. Breaking out that swap. And there goes Nick A right onto the Razor to finish him off. Just like that, Liquid take full control of the fight. Now they're just gonna run down whoever's left. They don't lose anything for this. Well, okay, me. Maybe I spoke too soon. Boom does manage to clean up that one kill on the support, but... Amage came back in. He's gonna die back here as yeah. mid one also goes down on the backside. This Hex from Nisha has disabled the puck completely, and that'll be a swift throw shot here as damage numbers they're just starting to pick up across the board. Like, you're looking at the second most damage coming out of Liquid. It's boxing. It's just Pierce the Veil Muerta sitting there. Just dealing with Crystallis. He does not have an answer for all this damage coming through. I mean, AC is something, but it's not nearly enough. He's just getting outmatched. In fact, he is now behind Boxy and net worth as this Muerta is truly a carry. That'll be an Aegis. She... They gave him the blessing, yeah. too. So just one more bit of control against the Puck or the Razor if they want it. That Liquid in full control of this game. It's just a matter of closing it out now. 30k gold lead. This lineup showing no signs of slowing down as they have all their level 25 talents now. So extra Essence Shift duration, undispellable haze, and double the effects for Invoker. And of course, Mega Creeps to back it all up, but I don't think they're going to stop there. And why would you? Another 15 seconds till Yamich is back up. So Liquid can start taking away some of these towers. If they want, boy, boom, dies fast. He went into that one. The side, the vice is almost not enough. They pull back in with the harpoon. They get him. Now the buyback. They have to get something out of this, and it's going to be the coil on to two. Yamich Step just crowd. now coming back up. They want that Soulbind to be able to get the double action. There it is. Soulbind is now out. And he's cast the to be it. the two of them. The swap didn't get him far enough away. Crystallis is getting a lot out of this one. He managed to take down two of the cores. The problem is, Mickey's still up. And he's slicing and dicing through Crystallis bit by bit. They do manage to take him down one time. Second life coming back up. Now the control of the Soulbind. Well, they got the they have what it takes to be able to get Mickey. Midwatt gets popped. Has to buy back immediately. But they can't stop. Team Liquid from retreating. Team yep. Liquid are the ones to buy back. They want to try and end this game here. Double buyback from them. This is this is all in. They did lose the Aegis. They still have two cheeses. Trying to burst out the Earth Bandit. Doesn't quite get it. Boom. Back into play. Mickey jumped on Mickey. into this one. Problem is, is that they just can't get through this calling with all this other AoE. Fortunately, the is tanky. He's getting away, but no, he didn't run out now. Dead for two minutes. Crystal's barely able to survive. Boxy goes for him. Try to manage to dodge some of those shots. Boxy eats the cheese. He stays alive. But Crystal's time is a problem. You can heal up as much as you want, but the Ancient is a problem that you cannot ignore. And he gets swapped back into his doom. Buys back immediately. But the glyph is now expired. And Liquid will end it 2-0. Over Just Team Secret. Devastating amounts of late game damage coming through from this lineup. I mean, Boxy turning into that fourth core really just pushed it over the edge. I think Kristal's gonna have larger impact in those fights and maybe bring his net worth back, but like, 
Not when he's up against four carries, man. It just feels unfair. You have yeah. this Alacrity and Boker hitting you from the back with four spirits. Everybody's super damage amp from the minus armor to the damage amplification on Liquid side. And on top of that, to add a fourth core to the mix, just way too much for like this one and a half, two core damage lineup to overcome. I mean, you have Bloodlust, but <laughs> Bloodlust ain't that good. Yes, David, I forgot. He's, he's with Team Liquid. He won. <laughs> Join him as he walks over. Give Team Secret a handshake, and that means we're going to be saying goodbye to Team Secret. I mean, they've had a great run. Community certainly down to them. They came through, went through the, the, the lower bracket of the qualifier in the first place, almost got knocked out. Then they made a pretty clean run after that. I think the biggest opponent they probably took down, uh, like they took down OG in that 2-1. Yeah. They came into this tournament, managed to do pretty well for themselves in the group stage. It's just, you know, unfortunately, they match up against Team Liquid, who kind of already had their number uh, in the last patch, and it looks like continue to do so in a new patch. I think they had a very decent showing. Like, this is a very new team, inner regional team as well. Those often take longer to gel. And like you said, a team that had to come through from the brink of elimination multiple times. So yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with their performance here, and I think that's a lot to build on. And also, I mean, new patch. Like, <laughs> what are you <laughs> yeah. supposed to do? You know, I, can you really put too much stock in a series that you have read the notes about for two hours? Yeah, it's a rough one to go for sure. But uh, Team Liquid will take the victory. And we've got Saberlight on stage with Slacks for the winner's interview. Thank you so much, everybody. I am here with Saberlight for Team Liquid. Saberlight, one of my favorite interviews in the world. So good to see you again. How's it feel to be at an arena once again playing on the main stage? Feels amazing. Thank you, everybody, for coming out and uh, cheering for us. You know, we're, we're, we'll make you proud. Let's go! Woo! There we go. So, how's the standing life for you? Uh, the guys feeling good? You vibing pretty well? Yeah, it's uh, it's great. You know, the guys are super chill. Uh, we're owning, and you know, it's always when you're standing, there's no pressure. It's like when when we lose this, they're like, oh, okay, standing issue, and I'll be like, oh, I have another team. It's okay, guys. <laughs> Well, that's good to hear. So you absolutely dumpstered in both those games, the Visage game in particular. Super, super good. Slardar game was great as well. Uh, how do you feel about the new patch? I, you're one of the biggest guys I want to ask about this just because you have a really good brain for this kind of stuff. Feel like those heroes were broken or you just had a, a good game on them? Uh, well, I did not have a good game on Visage. I missed some what? guys. I was lagging just Bro. to make it clear. Just to, when I didn't stun the void, it was lag, okay? Uh, okay, okay. You killed so many people, though. That was one misplay. Come on. Thank you, thank you. Well, I think these heroes are still kind of kind of bussing. The new, the new Visage talents were like uh, throw free soul assumptions. Quite nice. Uh, I enjoy it. And overall, like, it, it's actually so insane to like wake up and uh, we play uh, we play on a new, new patch, completely new items, everything new. And I didn't even play a pop or anything. I like I barely finished the patch notes before coming here. So it's just like, you know, luckily we are very fortunate. We have the the Shopify guys backing me up. Uh, we have uh, 33, you know, nerding it out in the. Uh, uh, Jobs has some friends who are helping him, so we, we're in good hands. Absolutely. Well, you could absolutely tell. Uh, game two, by the way, you got that slard. Are you taking any tips? There's some very passionate Reddit members out there that are writing big threads about pro players and slard. Are did you do any research? Did you crunch any two percents? Uh, I actually saw the post, and uh, my answer to that guy is, uh, "You don't get it, kiddo." Damn! Take it easy, bro. Take it easy. All right. Well, congratulations, sir. An incredible game. Hope to see a lot more coming out from you, from Liquid, and, uh, and uh, yeah. Thank you very much. One more shout out for our boy, please. Give it up. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, incredible victory that we saw from Team Liquid coming in completely fresh for the first series of the day. So thank you so much for that. And we'll throw it back to our panel, see what they have to think. Thank you very much, Saberlight and Slacks. And we will, of course, see Team Liquid later on today as they go up against Falcons. But first, let's break this down. I did also want to start talking about that offlane Slardar. Uh, he crushed it, had a great lane. And I think winning that lane, Effie, for Saber light, it kind of set the tone for the game. Oh, it absolutely set the tone for the entire game. Not only did they get the first blood on the Razor, because Slark had such a secure matchup versus a Brewmaster, they were able to bring down Insania on the Vengeful Spirit and pressure that Razor over and over and over again. And it made a lot of chaos in that first 10 minutes, and it gave Slarter the lead that he needed. But because this bottom lane was so busy uh, recovering, Afterwards, when the pressure shifted to the mid lane and they started to play for that mid tier one tower around Nisha, they were able to do so because Secret's heroes from the safe lane could not necessarily respond to that kind of pressure. 
And I think like that's why the draft and the early lanes are so important. You get the Murata, you always have the Deadshot against the Razor, defensive in the lane. Slaughter as well, you're really, you're really fast, you can always run it off. And because your lane is going as well, now Insignia can come by and it all starts bleeding like all over the map in your head. But I must say that Secret, they fought back pretty nicely in the mid game. Like when they took that fight around the Roche area and kind of like came back in the game. They're down like 6k, 7k gold, but they caught Li Liquid a little bit off guard. They used their spells nicely, and this was the only reason why this game even dragged on in the first place. Yeah, it felt really difficult even with Liquid having the lead for them to fight at the 5v5, but we saw the power of the Slark pick coming in at the end where we they had the round of spells, they had the Brewmaster ulti, they had the Puck Coil, they had the Grimstroke ult, but if they were able to disengage from that on the side yep. of Liquid, then suddenly it just felt like Secret didn't have any gas in the tank. And not only do we commend the Slark pick for that, but I feel like Insania for a five position Venge, like insane swaps that constantly reset the fight and that allowed Liquid to constantly do that. And I think that was essential for them to be able to scale well into the game. And not just that, the way that Insania itemized, which is a great point, Brian, is like the, he had the Solar Crest, he had the drums, he had the Vlads, he played the very traditional aura carrier because he understood the assignment, which is yep. just to keep Slark alive, keep him as strong as possible, and play behind his cores. So that was genuinely very beautifully played. And on the note that you mentioned, when it felt like Secret would run the gas out of the tank, it was also because Slardar and Slark got to the point where they could tank through these spells, right? They had the double BKBs, they were getting soulbound, but they were still able to get kills through the soulbind because of the BKBs. And to me, it just came down to the execution, right? Because Liquid were able to start these fights, to take these smokes, find them when Secret weren't ready to fight back, it made it so that Secret couldn't recover because they needed to engage. They needed to be the aggressors, the initiators. They really, really did. And unfortunately for them, uh, the road ends here. And uh, we already had an interview with, of course, one of the winners, but we're also going to witness the flip side of that as we head over to Slack for an exit interview. Thank you so much, Sheever. I am here, of course, with the legend himself. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Puppy here. Thank you so much for your, taking your time. So. I say this with uh, a bit of a, oh, yes, thank you. What a legend. Yes! You can do that on exit interviews, guys. Don't be so nervous. No, but um, it's, sir, I, I feel like there's a lot of times in Do Dota Pro players' lives where people say, a little unlucky. You know, uh, you guys go into a tiebreaker situation. It's, you know, mid one versus Quinn, and now the day before, hours before your big game, uh, new patch. Is that kind of how you're viewing this today? Because you guys have been improving so much. It's uh, it's a bummer to see something like this happen. Yeah, I guess it is unlucky. What you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> but are you, uh, you know, looking forward to improving and kind of put this one behind you, or do you feel like, you know, that's just what happened? I mean, I don't really have any thoughts right now. Once again, there's too big of a patch to even consider what went wrong. And uh, you know, we fucked up, played bad, and you know, the, then we lost. <laughs> well, thanks for the uh, the wrap up there, sir. Very good, very informative. Uh, are there you feeling anything in particular for the state of you know how the game's looking? This cool new patch, this incredible new thing that's uh, hit us. Uh, you guys gonna be hitting the books now and coming back even stronger? Well, I don't know the state of Dota, but one thing I believe it is in stake. Okay, thank you so much for the sponsor plug on the exit interview. Only a man up here. Talents in class could do such a thing. Thank you so much. All right, well, are we going to see you guys again? Because I'm so bored not seeing Team Secret at events. I got to see you here. Unluck that you're exiting now. But please, for all the Secret fans, myself included, will we be seeing you at the next one? Are you guys on your way back? Man, I love Malaysia. I'm coming back every time they, you invite me. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful uh, journey, and uh, we'll throw it back to Shiva. Thank you very much, Slax, and of course, Puppy there as we say goodbye to Team Secret. And they got eliminated 2-0, and I think they did have a good event. I think, Brian, I mean, obviously today it feels rough, but overall, Team Secret definitely had a good road. Yeah, absolutely, and I like that they stuck to their identity in a new patch. You know, Crystalis, Razor, first pick, like, per that's balls. You yeah. know, going into the elimination game in the lower bracket in a new patch. I just want to highlight for this new patch, like, I see three or four heroes in every game so far, the two games, I guess, that we haven't seen at all, really. I haven't seen any Slark, haven't seen any Ogre. Uh, like, I've, Razor's been pretty underpicked, so I just love the fact that we're seeing a bunch of new things and that these teams are not afraid to throw it out there. I think also one thing, just to go back to the interview, like, to, like sometimes you just don't play good enough, and I think it's okay to say, you know, we, we messed up, it's okay, it's a new patch, like, don't take it, you know, too hard, kind of learn from the replays, and, I mean, Overall, people just need to learn the patch anyway. Like, you don't really know what the hell just happened. Yeah, so long as they're not feeling discouraged by it, because they played a really great group stage. Yeah. I mean, the 
difference between them in the lower bracket and them in the upper bracket for this tournament was just one 1v1 mid, right? That could have been them in the upper bracket having some time to prepare and it might have looked different, but they should genuinely be very proud because they looked very aggressive. They looked like they all clicked with each other. They have ideas that work for them and this team shows a lot of promise for the upcoming year. It really does. It really does. We also have to talk a little bit more about Team Liquid, though, because when we're talking about lessons learned from a series like this, Team Liquid has to put them into practice uh, as fast as they can, because only one series break in between them playing again, Brian. After a series like that, uh, they did have some moments to learn from, I think. Where do you think Team Liquid takes this? Well, I would say that most of the time, the other team having more prep is going to be an advantage for them. Mm. But I think they have infinitely more competitive matches <laughs> on the new patch than the other team that, in this case. So what I'm going to say is that's a significant advantage. Like, I, I know it's kind of a joke. It's only two to zero. But at the end of the day, you do learn a lot at the start of a new patch. And it only goes down from there. So these two games are going to be highly valuable going into the next series. I mean, I really love what they were cooking in the series. And Sableye was saying, you know, 3-3 three, three is at home. He's helping. They're getting help from Shopify because he's just standing in. Jabs has some people coming around too. Like their item builds, at, like just looking at items alone, I feel like these games are just easier for them to play. So moving forward, if they do the same thing, they now play one, two pops and chill a bit, they'll be A-OK. -okay. That great support system they got back in the up definitely helps, Effie. Yeah, I mean, you talk about Liquid, you talk about their bajillion coaches and their bajillion data analysts and their bajillion friends are always... <laughs> no, but it's great. They definitely have an advantage over other teams when it comes to preparation and an infrastructure that enables them to do so with minimal resources expended from individual players, which I think is really important. So now these players can just sit back, play a few pubs, uh, just get a feeling of things while their team does all the research for yeah. them. That's an ideal scenario. An ideal scenario, and there's been a couple of other teams that were able to just sit back and watch and learn, and those are Tundra and Bat Boom. That's going to be our upcoming Best of Three series. Another one in the elimination rounds here at ESO on Kuala Lumpur, so you better sit tight and be ready for our upcoming match. Dota 2 is a video game, and video games have collision, and collision is not perfect. This simple fact is abused all the time by pro players. For instance, if you are playing Nature's Prophet and you TP on a cliff to ward, and then you realize, hey, I can farm here, then you can get yourself off the cliff without actually having to use a TP. Simply press Sprout on the edge of the cliff and you will bump yourself off. The reason this happens is because there isn't enough space on the cliff for both you and the trees. And since trees can't move, the game takes the thing that can move, which is you, and bumps you to the nearest available location. This just so happens to be off of the cliff. This bumping mechanic has a ton of useful applications in the game. Another example is that if you are playing Tusk and getting chased by enemies, you can run right next to a cliff, then throw ice shards directly on top of yourself. If you were precise enough, then the distance between you and the top of the cliff is shorter than the distance between you and the bottom of the cliff. In other words, you'll be bumped up, and everybody will think that you're really cool. Another example is with Storm Spirit. There are a ton of places on the map with unpathable objects that you can use to push you a small distance to save mana with your zip. The Ancient is one of these. If you're walking back to Fountain, you can get there quicker by zipping halfway through the throne, pushing you to the other side. Similarly, you can blink or force staff greater distances by also using these unpathable objects on the map to bump you to the other side. Interestingly, these sides of the map count as unpathable objects, but they're also high grounds. So, you can use these forced movement spells and items to put yourself off of the map temporarily, which gives you flying vision and essentially makes you unjukable.
You gotta be a quitter 
Tundra and Bedroom arriving to the venue. They were delivered safely and uh, without any collisions, as I'm sure you learned all about collisions in the uh, little bit of a DHL Pro tip we had right before these players arrived to the venue. That's right. I know you guys are all pros and all the Dota knowledge, and I will actually say that maybe this is the time, your final chance to test yourself on the old knowledge before the new patch fully needs to be mastered. But if you go to esl.gg slash DHL Pro Tips and you put that knowledge to the test, you have a chance of winning a 200 euro Steam gift card. So make sure you head over there and uh, try your luck. See if you know it all. Maybe there's still something more to learn, but that's okay. If there is more to learn, I got the right people for the job because Effie and Kezu still joining me. But Purge, now with Purge. us as well. Hey Purge, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, happy Frostivus, Christmas, happy whatever you guys want to call it. What it was in your chest? Uh, I just got some like generic fudge set that I didn't want. Okay, but no, no lump of coal. I'm not banned. Yeah, you got lucky. Not banned. banned. Happy, to, happy to announce that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it was, it was it was fun to wake up to that. Uh, I wish I went to bed earlier. That way, like the moment the patch hit, I was ready to, to experiment. Yeah, I only same. got to play one pub. I built a terrible item. It was not a good experience, but but I got what a item? taste. What item? I built a, a, a veil of discord naturally, and it's what? uh. That's a good item, I think. Yeah, and it's not on Winter Ranger. <laughs> Found out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fair. Not good. Not good. Not good. Well, maybe the teams that are playing today have got a little bit extra time to uh, to prepare compared to, to you. They also have the luxury of, of course, watching the previous series just now. Let's start talking about our next two opponents because Tundra and Bedboom are very ready. And Tundra is uh, maybe a little bit extra ready for this because when you're talking about Tundra Esports, I want to start by talking about Tomato. So the group stages had 10 games total per team. But if you look at Tomato's last 15 games, Kezu, mm -hmm. Different carry hero every single time. 15 I mean, games, 15 heroes. I mean, my, my boy is, uh, you know, he's versatile. What can I say? I think this guy can do anything. He's pretty much, a, he has been a shining star for many years, I think, already, when it comes to this team and playing with his boys. So I'm not too surprised. And I think now with a new patch, it will probably just continue. Like now there's different heroes being good. Why not, you know, bump it up? Yeah, it's more so about how quickly can they adjust? Because mm -hmm. we talk about a lot of teams and the kind of support system they have, but I don't exactly know the inner workings of Tundra, how many analysts they have, who they have doing this last second research for them. So I am quite curious to see what kind of Dota heroes they bring today. Yeah, and they do did start very well in the group stages, Purge. They started 4-0 and everybody's like, oh my god, they're doing so well. But then slowly but steadily, things started looking a little bit more rough, Purge. Yeah, well, I mean, we, I, I think 4-0 starting for them was amazing for them. Yeah. Um, they are, they've consistently looked like a solid team, a good team. They, they win their, their region consistently. They go to lands. They do kind of good, kind of mediocre. They're like a really, really solid middle of the pack team. So to, to see them top their group would have been a surprise. Yeah, that is, that is true. We're going to find out how they do here in this lower bracket. Their opponents today is a team that did not change anything at all after TI. They believe in this squad. It is Betboom. And <laughs> if you look at Betboom's group stage matches, Effie, uh, this this best of three series upcoming is going to be very interesting because they tied every single opponent. Yeah, it will be very telling what kind of what kind of state they're in. But Batboom, uh, they're a team that you can never count out. When it comes to their players, they have some of the most mechanically talented players in all of Dota in all of the regions. And if you look at their group stage performances, only a handful looked unwinnable in their case, but a lot of the series that they drew in during group stage were actually very winnable. And I think that they're aware of that and they definitely did a lot of preparation up until this point. I mean, this team, like their individual skill is through the roof. I saw them like throw throw one game that they definitely shouldn't have had, but you know, that's how you end up with tying everywhere when you make some mistakes here and there. But one hero I have seen Nightfall play in his pubs. And I, every time this hero has the specific spell buff, okay. he comes back as a carry. It's Tiny's tree throw. Oh dear. But we might see it again. There might be some Lycan, some Tiny, some Io Tiny. I'm ready for it, but this hero, when it's good, he is a very nasty carry hero. How experimental do you want the teams to be, Purge? I mean, when you see the patch, there's so many things that goes through your head. Like, there's so many different heroes you can play. And then you watch the first program, there's like a couple new items. And you're like, oh, Easy Venge Wave of Terror takes damage now. And they're like, I'm going to pick Venge. So uh, it's not going to be as extreme as it is when you when you read the patch. And I, I think that's the way you have to play it, especially if you don't have time to pub. If this patch came out yesterday and they had 24 hours to figure out what heroes are good, sure, uh, do some wild stuff. But I, I think it's safe to say that you should just pick lineups that are 
fairly straightforward to execute. Because if you're sitting there in game thinking about, oh, should I try this new item? You're behind your opponents. Yep. You need to think about like easy to execute things that are going to set up team fights in the right way. And you got to focus on your pro Dota uh, fundamentals. That's yep. more important right now. It is very important to know to know your stuff. I think both teams have got their work cut out for them, for sure. I want to talk a little bit about the new addition of Tundra in Immersion because this is a player that apparently Kazu was on speed dial for yeah. Kasane. And as an offlaner, how important is it that your your position four that you offlane with that you have that synergy there? Because I, I think the only reason why Kasane is just like, oh, we need position four. It's got to be immersion. Get that guy on board because I know him. We do well. How important is that synergy? It's incredibly important. It's important that you can just tell each other whatever. You know, like no hard feelings like, oh, yo, you mess up in this lane. I needed you to pull here and do this. You can see the same with like other teams. When you have this chemistry between the two, it will just go such a long way. And I think it is one of the big reasons why I would say they're doing pretty well at this tournament. Yeah, that synergy, they had that already. On the side of Bedboom, they never, they didn't change anything. So they had that synergy as well. And I think with Immersion coming in, the synergy coming out with those players, it kind of helps them skip a step ahead in terms of uh, having that adjustment. I also am curious who the fan favorite here is because I know that Moon has, I believe, double citizenship. He's half Malaysian, Effie. That surely will play maybe a little bit of part, having a crowd on your side. I thought Moon was Singaporean. Not according to Liquipedia. Well, I talked to him mm. at breakfast the other day, and he's like, dude, this food, this is what I grew up eating all the time. Really? Yeah. That's okay. not a data oh, There you go. He was, oh, he was like no really excited. I saw it in his eyes and everything. He's like, oh my gosh. I mean, Malaysian food, food has got to excite you. Yeah. yeah I, I think really it excites good. everyone. I think it excites uh, the players to the point where maybe they get slightly distracted, but uh, we are not going to get distracted. I want to talk about these players. I want to talk about matchups a little bit because we've seen a lot of focus on the mid matchup and uh, when talking about Bryle GPK, they have a lot of experience going up against each other because uh, Effie, you were there for it with the, the Dasha 1v1. They actually met in the first round. Uh, I think GPK was quite dominant <laughs> I, in that yeah. one. I mean, it's, it's GPK. When you talk about technical mid laners, he is one of the few names that comes to mind alongside Sumail and Quinn and players like that. But Bryle, as a player, has improved so immensely mm. in the last year. And I think a lot of his impact in the past used to come from his rotations. But now it feels like his impact is coming from his ability to play unusual heroes mid and maybe bust out a cheese hero. Like, he's been playing some Necros. They've been flexing his Slardar to mid. And at some point, he did bust out the Wind Ranger when they wanted to flex it and they stuck it on the mid roll at some point. So I feel like Bryle versatility is really what's elevated him as a player recently. I also, uh, just to chime in real quick, I remember that every time Brawl played, he, like Quinn would always have his number back when they always played against each other. I feel like his growth has, like, he has improved so much, not only with the gameplay, as Effie is saying with the versatility, but also team fight decision making. I think his <laughs> biggest downfall in the past was eventually he will throw his game. I think right now he is very clean. Very clean, and we are going to learn just a little bit more about Brawl himself. When we played any quals, we were down like 2-0 uh, and we eventually realized that they have like very specific heroes that they play very good at and we kind of focus on that and we kind of ban those and they kind of they kind of just made the series way easier for us. The region right now is uh, has been dead I think like if you compare it throughout the entire years um, there was peak of NA winning TI at TI5. The ability to grow at the region is just not there compared to Europe because our player base is really small and there's just not a lot of like talents being uh, developed in the scene. That's why it's like super, super really hard. Like the more players in the region, the more better it will be. It will be an exponential amount of growth having these players and having more uh, options. Us partnering with Tundra was a uh, very last minute. It was like planned like just this week before we were flying in and we we're like why not next year i feel like it's gonna be way different for everyone else because um i think after this tournament people are gonna go on a break and i feel like um this might be our last tournament together as a team so i think it's all up in the air whatever is gonna happen next but it'll be a really interesting one for sure yeah i don't know well it's like it's up in the air you know like you never know what could happen Nobody knows what can happen. It's all up in the air, is what he's saying. And that means that performing here and doing very well here, Purge, I feel like it's more important than ever because that basically means that you're not just, you know, showing that your team can do it. No, it's about showing that you can do it because if everything's all up in the air, you got to be able to sell yourself. It's like, look at me, I'm the best. Yeah, it's, it's very important to have good performances. Um, but uh, for a lot of these teams, uh, maybe it sometimes seems like they're... They're, they're good teams, maybe not the best, but yeah, having confidence going forward with those tournament wins, 
definitely impacts things like tournament invites with the DPC being gone. Like you need those good performances that allows you to dodge qualifiers and that gives your team more time to focus on relaxing in between those matches. So all of these things have really big cascading effects. Also, another thing that I feel like they have done a lot better with is I feel like they're they're more free. I saw it first at the Bedboom Dacha tournament, where I feel like they were just like more free. They were the way they play, the way they drafted. And now when a new patch comes out, I feel like you want to be free. You know, want to some guy has a good feeling about a hero, let's take it. We saw Visage do good, it looks good. I want to play it, let's go for it. And kind of like just start nice. Start nice. Maybe in game one, Effie, of the best of three. And then game two, if, you, if it didn't work out, you go back to uh, what worked. Yeah, I mean, I think freedom in Dota is, is quite important. I really like the point that Kezu brought up because uh, the thing about TSM, formerly TSM, now Tundra, is that it felt like there were a lot of self-imposed restrictions that they put on themselves, or maybe they put themselves in a little bit of a box because they were struggling with certain facets of their gameplay. Uh, the main one just kind of being a clear vision in-game and that leadership, but it really feels like in the last three to four months, they've mended that very well, and they're all able to communicate. And because of that, they just become more free-flowing, they become more experimental with their picks, and their gameplay just opens up. Yeah, it's not just the players that are able to communicate, Everybody's able to communicate online. That's right. We've been looking at the hashtag Rise Above Fate. And uh, I mean, we figured we'd check in a little bit. Not a bad way to start it. That first game of the day, though, also, Kezu. That was a great way to start anyone's day. That was one of the best games we've seen at this entire tournament already. And now a new patch. You know, we're here with the crowd. I don't think you can ask for anything more. Unless maybe in this series, Maybe it can get even better. Who knows? I mean, it's gonna, because whenever a big patch hits, this and this happens in pubs and pro games, everyone like doesn't completely know what's going on. Yeah. So they become less focused and organized and be yep. like, oh, well, everybody knows after I get this kill here, I go and take this tier one tower and then we take Roche. Now that stuff's out the window. They're, things get <laughs> yep. chaotic and there's just gonna be more kills, more blood, and the games are just more fun to watch. We're, we're gonna have that the rest of the tournament. Yeah, let's see what else uh, we've got coming from the Rise Above Fate hashtag. Uh, not me expecting myself on the naughty oof, oof. <laughs> <laughs> on the naughty list of putting this morning. Well, I think is anybody expecting here to be on the naughty list? We already know Purge not. I'm not expecting to be on the naughty list. I didn't list. check. You check? I didn't check, but I think I'm okay. I should be okay too. I think you're fine. I think we're fine. I think we're fine. Yeah. Yeah. See, we're a very <laughs> well behaved, well behaved, uh, nice panel coming up here. I hope for a lot of people here, they're not having a rude awakening and uh, you know having a, a naughty. Naughty lump of coal or something along those lines, but you can get cool sets like Fudge set, for example. If you if you play Fudge, Fudge is not happy. It was fine. It was a free set. Woo! Woo! Free set. <laughs> Throw it in the pile. Hey. <laughs> well, you don't really play that much Fudge, right? So that makes it. Well, now you should. That's, that's, that's the thing. And there's already like my Fudge items. I mean, I've been collecting cosmetics for like 11 years, 12 <laughs> years. Like I don't don't really need any more unless they're really nice. Then I'll buy them. The question is, uh, will we see a Pudge? And if we will, will we see it on the support? Because I know that Save, Effie, loves Pudge. He does love Pudge. You know who else loves Pudge on his team? Who? Pure. He does also <laughs> love and Pudge. I, I remember during one of the TI games that Bedroom played recently, they were fighting in booth on camera about who would play Pudge <laughs> between Save and Pure. And we just got that moment, and it was wonderful. Uh, it ended up being Pure in the end, but he did deliver. At I least, if, like, if I was a teammate, it would. I feel like I would get good vibes when I see my two idiot teammates fight over who should play Pudge. <laughs> so I feel that's a good start to my game. <laughs> yeah, it definitely has a little bit of an upbeat note to it yeah. if that's how you're going into the game. We're going to find out what kind of note the players are on and in what kind of mood they're on, as we should be having them take the stage very, very soon. So stay tuned. Tundra and Vetboom going up against each other next.
are getting Bedboom and Tundra ready to take the stage. But before they do, there's a little bit more time for us to talk a Dota 2 because these two teams going head to head against each other, Kezu, I, I want to kind of know what to expect from them. Honestly, I think we'll see a lot of fighting, especially with the new patch coming out. That's what I always prefer most. I think bring the chaos to them, you know, don't let them breathe, don't let them think. And the way I see Bad Boom is they're like the most mechanically gifted team. Maybe top three, maybe not the best, but they're up there. Mm -hmm. And they will use those rotations, then help each other and play really fast. So I want Tundra to kind of match that and make sure that they're just ready for these moves and keep a smooth game. Yeah, I love the point that Kezu brought up, and to add on to that, I feel like Betboom in the past have historically been known as the strongest laning team, or one of the strongest laning teams, and they are very hard to break in that sense, but I think in the last year a lot of teams figured out that if you target ban Pierre's hero pool and you take away that, you know, so short CD blink initiator yeah. like the Centaurs and whatnot. If you take that away from Pure, it makes it so that Batboom play for a longer scaling game. And a team like Tundra could potentially take advantage of that with the more early game oriented supports they've been drafting, right? They've been playing a lot of Enchantresses, a lot of Pugnas, a lot of Willows. Hmm. Yeah, that could elongate the game and give them some advantage because in those super long games, Batboom sometimes can falter in Roche fights and things like that. Yep. Um, they're obviously very, very high skilled, and I think that will leverage an advantage for them with this new patch though, because they should be a little bit faster at adapting. You know, they're just gonna be ready to play the game. Yeah, like they're just all gonna be ready to play the heroes and you brought up your centaur. If I'm a player right now, it doesn't matter what patch it is, I don't want to give this guy this hero. It's bad. I feel like he's the first guy that brought it in and every time I see him, when the game goes like 40, 50 minutes, he's like 8K HP and he just murders everybody. So you're looking to address pure in the draft already. Like that's where you want to win that lane or is it more Tomato and Whitemon that you have your eyes on in terms of trying to shut him down a little bit from the safe lane. I want both. I think okay. one one isn't enough. It's like we when you when well. you play against Omar, when you play 3-3, three, three, take out the heroes, but don't just stop there. It's the same like when you shut down a carry, don't just let him jungle for free. You need to shut him down and then follow him and you know, just despair. Keep him in mode despair. Make them want to quit the game. Feels hard to do against Tomato though, because I, I feel like I don't watch him have bad lanes very often. Like he almost always recovers. It's ready to make rotations, uh, play the map, and things like that. So even though I do respect Pure's <laughs> ability to like win that lane, I just feel like Tomato's going to be safe no matter what. Like they do prioritize making sure he has a good game. Um, yeah. yeah, you are right about that. I think something that Tundra are really good at, or have become really good at recently, especially from the Batboom Dota tournament, are playing around Tomato. Even when he does have the bad lane that we mentioned, they kind of start to rally around him, and they protect his jungle camps, and they bring their vision there, and their heroes are always ready to rotate in. Whereas on a lot of other teams, they're more uh, willing to play around the mid laner or sometimes around the off lane. This team is very, very heavily focused around their safe lane. Yep, and Tomato is the most versatile player at this event. The 15 games played, the last 15 games rather, 15 different heroes. So I'm very curious to see what he's going to play this time around. But before we have a chance to see that, we need that player on the stage together with his team and their opponents. Let's head over to Slacks to get that done. Hello, Kalapo, you guys still wake up there? Ah, yes! Still got some more Dota 2 action coming your way. Series number two, my friends. Oh, how much we've learned already from watching our pro players. But there's so much more to gain knowledge-wise from the best players in the world. In fact, our next two opponents are going to be extremely fun to watch. If you thought that 80 kill game in series one was fun, Wait till you see these guys. So, out from the stage first, coming all the way from North America to Europe, and now coming all the way from Europe here, please put your hands together for Team Tundra! Fantastic. And their opponents, one of the most aggressive teams left in the entire tournament. One of the last hopes of CIS. Please put your hands together for the unstoppable Bet
Looks like our teams are ready to go head to head for a bloodbath like you've never seen before. Tundra versus Bat Boon. Get out your notebooks, kids. Get out your mats in the front because things are about to get absolutely crazy. You guys ready to see some Dota? All right, fantastic. Let's get into this bad boy soon as we shoot it back to the panel. Can't wait to see this draft unfold before us as we watch the players take their seats so uh, we can get this draft on the way. And it is time for us to talk Dota 2 because, you know, we can speculate a lot. Oh, what lessons did they learn from the first series? I don't know if that's the first place you go to in this uh, scenario, Kazu. Are you just not going to ban the things that, you know, have been working for you? Uh, or are you going to look like, oh, maybe we should ban Muerta or maybe we should ban Lion? I don't know. I, I, I feel like that's the problem. I hope that they had, you know, a good team talk of, you know, what is good. What It's more, I think, about, okay, what do we want to first pick? Let's ban accordingly. It's like, okay, what do we not want them to have if we mm -hmm. respond like this? So I think it's less of like, oh, you know, this, that. It's more like, what will make us feel good? Let's just start with that. Yeah, and almost every single pro player that I saw at breakfast this morning was just like kind of slightly frowning, looking at their yeah. phones, reading the patch <laughs> notes, like trying to figure stuff out. But that's the advantage of playing second today, yeah. is that you actually had time to practice things. You could play pubs on some of your ideas. If you did want to try some wild stuff, you could just test things out in lobby. That first series squads, they didn't really have that same opportunity. So there could be some weird theory crafted stuff in this match. Yeah, and I feel like you just don't really have enough time to change your preparation. So you're going to go off of the information you have from group stages because the patch really is different, but heroes are only slightly tweaked, right? It doesn't really feel like any hero is put in the dumpster mm -hmm. or anything like that. So you can still go off of that. And when teams play versus Vet Boom, they just ban the same handful of heroes in the start, right? They ban the Dazzle, they ban the Treen Protector, Tier Protector from Toronto, Tokyo, they ban the Pugna. They have these heroes that they're I don't think they're going to change too much from. Yeah, we, we will see. I mean, maybe maybe that lion, though. That's the only one that I would be slightly worried about <laughs> if I was a squad. I mean, it, it, it did very well in the first game. And I know it was banned on second, so we only got one game to go off of, but that's no data whatsoever. Uh, so the lion would be one that I would be looking towards. But what we do know, what I know, is that for, I mean, okay, so we're talented in the green room. There is a lot of theory crafting going on, and then people go in the lobby, and what if you combine this? with this, and that's when the crazy stuff come out. So yeah, I, I agree with Perks that the, the teams have had some time to potentially come up with some crazy stuff, and Perks, wouldn't you do it? If you were going to do it, wouldn't you do it in game one? Yeah, probably. Yes. Um, I, I think you save it for like a later pick. I mean, the, the story of Tomato playing a different hero every game is that, you know, if he gets to delay his pick until later, it should be the best hero for that game. So if you do have something cooked up and you're picking late already, mm. maybe you got a, a juicy item build cooked up. Yeah. I think the items are really the big change, that, yeah. that you yeah. could switch things up. Some standard builds, they're gone now. You know, you, no one's going to buy a Meteor Hammer early anymore because it's like a fast Kai. It doesn't build up as easily. So there's some fundamental differences and some stuff to figure out, and maybe they had enough time to get some cool build ideas. Right, that's a great point. And on the topic of the Meteor Hammer, the, it felt like one of the main reasons why Tidehunter was such a viable offlaner in the last patch was because of that Meteor Hammer buildup and how he was able to pressure towers. But now I feel like that hero is just going to yeah. disappear unless it's incredibly situational. Actually, I didn't even think about that at all. Like Tide with his shard and blink later on is so good, but he kind of relies on this Meteor to like push forward the game, buy yourself a Ring of Health and like kind of chill. So I think this hero, there's one other build you can do with like phase boots, Vlad's, but I've only seen 3-3 do that, so mm. I think this hero, we will not see it at least today or tomorrow. Actually, on the topic of Vlad's, Kazu, I want to ask you, because you're an offlaner, so you saw that the Helm of Overlord removed Vlad's from its build-up, yep. and I, so how impactful is that for an offlaner like Kasane, who plays these Lycans, plays these Beastmasters? I think it is quite impactful. The item is still very good. Maybe it's just the type of where... I think these auras are just so valuable. Maybe you just go Vlad's on its own with an AC. Sometimes maybe you just go Dom and you hope that someone else can buy it for you. So it's definitely going to be something that he has to adapt to. Because I think he is like the best summons player probably at this tournament or like one of the top three. Because he just thrives on those heroes. And we do end up seeing the line picked initially by Tundra Esports uh, from a meme to a... Uh to a real <laughs> Val being like, all right, we'll encourage the meme, and now yep. it's just first pick or ban for the rest of the tournament. I mean, it's just, it, it, it looked good. You know, I'll wait to be even more impressed. We'll see if they can replicate it here as Bedboom get their hands on mm -hmm. Magnus, who I think is just a good hero. I don't know if he got touched much. I think there's something with a skewer where it's kind of like ruptured. Ah. The more you drag them, you've yep. got some damage going on. Pure is very good on this hero. I'm sure Nightfall enjoys playing, you know, being empowered. So both teams, good picks.
Yeah, skewer now deals uh, percentage-based damage depending on the distance, and I believe at max level it's 15%, so that should be a pretty interesting change to see. But outside of that, Magnus is relatively untouched, and in the group stage meta, people were experimenting with Magnus anyway. This yeah. crept into the first phase of bans versus a lot of teams, and it's been flayed as a, fle a flex to the mid lane and a flex to the off lane mostly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's still an incredibly viable strategy, especially when you pair it up with a melee safe laner like Spectre. I, so generally when we see Magnus, we like to talk about the combo breaks, right? We already did it in the group stage. There's heroes like Rubik that are already banned. There's other heroes that could come out, like maybe some Winter Wyvern, or you can do it from some core picks like Slark. You know, he can break free, then save his teammates with the shards. Is there any other combo break that Tundra should maybe be looking at? Because fighting straight up into some Magnus egg is not good. So I love the Abaddon response. It's maybe, we don't know if this hero's good, or I don't, but he fits the idea of combo break. You get RP'd, you break free with your ult, you shield your teammate. I'm down for it. Uh, I actually played him in a pub recently. I thought his armor was a bit weak, and he just got an extra armor there added. There we go. So <laughs> <laughs> the one armor. 6% more survivability or something like that. Uh, it's, it's not the worst. And yeah, you do damage per second when you proc Curse of Avernus. So if you do go a right-click ABBA build, which it could be at, the, at this point with three potential supports being picked, uh, yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's good. Yeah, that's definitely something you have to consider, the right-click ABBA, but his talents were also changed, so I feel like that might not be as good as it used to be, even when you add the DPS to Curse of Avernus. But regardless of that, it's very nice versus Phoenix as well, right? Mm -hmm. Because you dispel the Flame Spirits. So yep. if you're playing against Phoenix from the safe lane ABBA, whether he's 5 or 1, he's going to be able to fight back into the Phoenix and make him useless. So I do hope it's flexed around and played on Batboom's safe lane. I do think, like the Abaddon, that's the first thing that I looked at. I was like, wow, Curse of Avernus, you have this damage. But then I saw level 10 strength removed, level 15 damage removed. So I wasn't too sure, but I saw Tomato pop it this morning. So, you know, might just be very open to playing it as a carry. It does make sense against these picks. And I think, yeah, looks like they will do exactly what you said, Mira. Don't want to put the Phoenix in that lane. Just put the Dark Willow there, right-click him, play on range, and just chill. Yeah, Snapfire is also already there for the counter to the uh, to the egg of the Phoenix, though. So yep. I feel like this Phoenix is going to have a very sad game at this point. Beppu was trying to solve it with a pick up of the Willow. And it's a good pick either way. Like, pairing it with Line can be cool. Line can go and disable. You can bomb them with the Mortimer's Kisses. Gives you kill opportunities. Not to mention saves, get out of Brambles and away from Magnus, things like that. So it's a decent opening for both squads, but the, the team fight for Vetboom is really good right now. Yeah. I mean, the only thing, so they have some counterplay, of course, to the egg, as we touched on already, right? You can break free, you have the low shredder. Maybe if you're Vetboom, you want to look at like some stuns that can't really get dispelled, like a faceless void. It's, mm. very, it's quite greedy in the slot because, of course, you can get, you can get counterpicked, you have a Phoenix 5, but it's the type of thing where you want to make sure that your Phoenix has an easier game, and I think Void could accomplish this. I think with Phoenix versus Snapfire, um, you can just... Usually it's not as bad as it seems, especially if it's a support Snapfire, because typically there's vision on her, you have a core like Magnus who's just going to harp yep. her in and punch her in the face and keep her away from you. So I think that between the RP and the Terrorize, it should be enough to protect the egg, or at least cast eggs on high grounds. You don't necessarily have to depend on this Phoenix to just egg in the middle of the yep. entire team, right? You can just use it as area control. I do also think, there, like one thing I saw the Chinese teams do, and I think they are the best at playing Phoenix, is that in some games, they only put the Spirits at level 2, they max out Sunray first, and they don't play so much on the egg. They're just, you know, everyone playing these tanky heroes, I just play behind you, I heal you. If they go on you, I just destroy them, because they all have 2k HP. So I, I think it's totally okay to not just, you know, overanalyze on the egg. It's a cool plan. Um, and they pick a TB on the, the Betboom side. Very standard hero for their squad. They've been picking this for a very long time with Empower. You're getting a bunch of damage. Uh, the butterfly got changed. Uh, it's good, good hero to buy it on because you have yep. so many agility base. You get that extra bonus attack speed from that. So we could see a TB doing some cool things. I think Demon Zeal works on reflection, uh, reflection your first yep. skill. So the like illusions you make of enemy heroes could yep. attack much faster. So some some potential difference to the mm. hero. It's also pretty good at killing these Tundra supports in fights. It just does way too much physical yeah. damage and overpowers them. But something I want to point out about this Terrorblade is one of the strengths of the hero is its ability to farm in the jungle and push out lanes with the illusion, right? But Lion already naturally deals with that, and Snapfire is a very good wave clear support, especially when she gets her shards. So it doesn't feel like Tundra are in any position where they're going to get their map Naga, so yeah. to speak, 
where this illusion hero is just farming everything and they can't make moves, that's not going to happen to Tundra. Yeah, I, the supports are really, really good against TB. I think the main point about the TB that just came back to me is that I don't know, yeah, I don't think you can play carry Abaddon into TB. It's like one of the worst, worst matchups ever. You're not really going to click on him. If you stand his ground against him, it's not that you're going to touch him. It's going to turn around, sunder you, scud you. So I do like that Tundra did swap it up. They go with the Life Stealer, who we've seen perform very well at this tournament. Really good against these supports. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a free game, but it's a good life to pick. Yeah, I mean, the Disable to worry about, you got Terrorize and RP, basically, which is, uh, it's, you can play around this for sure. Uh, so, and he's had good success on the hero. Uh, I could definitely see Tomato do solid with it. Maybe some weird itemization. I mean, there's so many items changed. Hard to, I'm trying to yeah. figure, think like, how different an item build is going to be. Probably not that different. I mean, there's some stuff where like you have more attack speed from like some Maelstrom or some Yolnir, but I don't know if there's a new item that I would want to build on Life Suit. At least not one that comes to mind. You're still happy with your typical Radiance arm length, yeah. That's yeah. not going to change too much, and the Rage is going to be incredibly valuable. We were talking about how this Phoenix Egg is already threatened by the Snapfire. Now you have a Life Stealer with Rage. You're going to have to commit RP if he's ever on top of this Egg, and that can be dispelled by the Abaddon. So I think this Life Stealer pick gives Tundra everything that they needed right now. I am... There's still something for Tundra that I feel like they need to deal with. I really like their own draft and in the mid game, like how it comes together and how it can team fight. But I'm a little worried about like this 30 plus minute TB Magnus Phoenix scaling. So if I'm Tundra, I'm still like looking for an element that will help my life stealer carry. Because I don't think he will do it on his own against TB. So I'm looking for some, I don't know. Okay, so the ban out Lash, like maybe some Storm or maybe Zeus. Like Zeus can always ult, find the supports. So if you have Storm, you can of course Nakes Bomb and get in there. I feel like there's something that needs to alleviate this pressure from Nakes to just 1v5 this game later down the road. Yeah, they need a magic burst hero that can kind of frontline and be mildly tanky so that the infests actually really benefit them. So Zeus something is, that fits that. Zeus sounds really cool, actually. Sorry for <laughs> talking over you, Kev. But the Zeus isn't threatened by much on Bedwim's team except the Harpoon from Magnus later, and yeah. it should deal with the Terrorblade very well. Maybe well, if you got buffed too, you know, Rapiers give you spell amp now, True. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought maybe if they had wanted Zeus that they would ban Kanka. I think that would be a pretty lame matchup, at least for him. I mean, your other cores are good against it, but let's see. I think Zeus is one decent option. Kanka's um, maybe dead though. I mean, the, the Torrent Storm AoE talent's gone, so the Torrent Storm's got to be worse now. I guess they changed something. I'm too biased to the Waterman. Mm. I mean, he's been good for months yeah. and months. What about Necro? I know he got nerfed, but mm -hmm. his nerfs don't feel significant enough to not make him a problem in this game. I still like him with the Tundra heroes, just because like he can get Infest Bombed, he can get the Abaddon Shield, because like, Sunray is a bit annoying, so is Dark Willow and like an RP are being put out of position. But I think they can make it work with the team surrounding that they do have. And he's played it like two or three times lately, I think. So what I learned from watching the Liquid versus Secret game is the less cooldowns you have, the better. And it yeah. felt like when Secret were playing on these very teamfight dependent heroes, like their Brewmasters and their Voids, etc., they were just getting run over, I mean Secret. They were getting run over by Liquid's low CD heroes who were just going over and over and over again. And I think Thunder are in that same position right yeah. now versus Bet Boom. No, for sure. Especially with, right, you've got the Zeus, Life doesn't really have any cooldowns. I mean, I think if you're Bedboom, you need a secondary hero that goes in. Like, if I'm solo Magnus offlane in this game, I'm the only one that can jump against an Abaddon who will always save them, I, I want to cry. So I would ask my mid laner, bro, please help me out. Like, play some Storm or play some Kanka. Like, get in there, help me out, beta shield. Then I go in. Uh, you're going to have to deal with the Zeus now. The thing about Kanka is, even though he's strong versus Zeus mid, I feel like the hero Torrent Storm got nerfed, and that really was one of his primary yeah. strengths. He's probably not the best. While Life Stealer didn't get nerfed that much, it was just a movement speed decrease on Rage, which makes it so that if Life Stealer has a good game, yeah. he's going to run over the Kanka. I think it makes sense that they go Storm. I think once you see the Zeus, you need something to like help you. I like, it goes both ways. First, you need a hero that helps your Life Stealer. Now it's kind of the other way. Your enemy team has to do the same. So I th honestly, I think both teams have, uh, I mean, we're second game into the patch. But I think both teams have the type of drafts exactly what they want in order to go forward and win this game. Yeah, and GPK Storm is extremely good. Uh, he had very minor changes in the patch, so still should be a really yeah. solid hero. Um, as long as he spots White Mon and kills him, he doesn't have to worry about Disable that much either. So yeah. it's a pretty solid Storm game.
Yeah, GPK is definitely one of the best Storm players in all of Dota. Uh, with that being said, I feel like Thunder do have solutions for the Storm, right? They're going to have the instance done in the Lion Hex, especially if Lion is a good game. Mm -hmm. And they've got this Abaddon, who's going to do a lot by way of breaking Bedboom's initiation. So my eyes for Thunder are on Kasane. I think he has to play the Abaddon game of his life. Yep. But if he does, his team's got this. I would slightly lead with Bedboom, but if Kasane can pull out a sick performance, I think they got it. And another thing I want to look at is, I think with Zeus, you might want to go this Manta build, and then maybe you see this new phylactery crit thing coming out. So I want to see if Brile can, you know, cook up something cool. Final words, Kev? I, it, it could be really good. Uh, I just I have all these weird item and <laughs> skill builds that own as practice team backstage that are just not viable in my head. So I'll, I see. Yeah, it's going to be normal, normal as Zeus, maybe a little spicy. Maybe, maybe you know he'll get justified in his builds. We're going to have to ask and see what he wants to see out of this one because we're heading over to our commentary duo, which is Odie Pixel and Cinderin. Thank you very much, Sheev. Yes, absolutely can't wait for this here on the new patch, getting to enjoy some fantastic land Dota here in Kuala Lumpur. A fantastic place to be, of course. Bet Boom versus Tundra. Uh, Sin from the lineups and with the patch in mind, anything that you are excited to see here with this one? I don't fucking know. Does anyone know what's going on? I don't know what's happening yet. I need to see some games. Like, I, I woke up today, I looked at the patch, I was like, oh, okay, uh, I guess I'll have to process this in half an hour. So, you know. Uh, I think it's the same for the teams, right? They get in here, they have some, this is literally just day one, we have some sort of idea, we're gonna try to run it. And it's really interesting to see how differently they've approached it, right? For Betboom, it's a lot of their staples they're running. For the side of Tundra, their first phase, their first three heroes are heroes that haven't really been prioritized that much. They started Lion, Abaddon, and then Snapfire. All three of these haven't really been priority picks in this tournament, they've been run but they have definitely not been given as much attention as this team is doing. So I think it's really interesting. Um, if you ask me who my personal favorite is in this game, just again, you're often just going to go on off experience, right? And what we've seen recently, I think Betboom's lineup looks really strong and stable. But, you know, it's new tech. So, Tundra, if they maybe they can show a little bit of flavor here. Absolutely, absolutely. I think they're sort of both teams, their final pick's definitely going to be the interesting one. Zeus, of course, we've seen quite a bit as we saw on the win rate. I think it was something like, what, five and six. It's been doing fine, it's been doing average. Yeah, uh, and then GPK with the Storm. Uh, this hero just, you know, in the past patch, it wasn't doing great here at the tournament so far. I think, what, one and three. So, yep. uh, very interesting if GPK can make it work. Uh, if anyone was going to make the Storm Spirit work, you know, GPK is uh, probably, the, probably the guy to do it. So we do have the game on pause, so it's... Rock and roll time here. Yeah, I, I guess something to think about here is also going to be the laning stage, right? We had Kezu talk about the Terrorblade against Korra Baden matchup if, if both heroes are carry. Uh, how does the lane versus lane matchup go? I think Abaddon actually fares quite well in the lane itself. It's more about the later portions of the game where he doesn't do so well. And if he gets to lane against either Phoenix or Dark Willow, a Photic Shield is just an incredible counterplay to everything the, the enemy supports have. So I think Kasane as Effie mentioned, is going to come up big in this game, or going to have to, rather. Uh, but I think the conditions are there for an Abaddon. I'd love to see this hero. I don't know about you. I've always loved Abaddon. I think he's, he's an interesting one. I mean, he's cool for the hype saves, indeed. If he comes in clutch with some good aphotic shields, maybe even we'll see some sort of play with a new talent as well, right? The change to level 10 talent, you now can uh, get an additional you know, HP you know, regen yeah. on the aphotic shield. Um, is that something that's going to make it? Are you taking that talent, this game? If, you, if you're playing about in this Yeah, position. I think so. I, I don't think yep. you should really play that much in your Curse of Avernus, because no. the targets are kind of hard to hit to begin with, right? One of them is Phoenix, who's probably going to play on the back line. Dark Willow can use Shadow Realm. Terrible, you don't want to fight head on. Storm is going to be hard to catch. And then the Magnus will play Blink Dagger back line. So, yeah, I think just the Aphotic Shield regen talent could be interesting here and could be helpful. Um, it's, it really is like a, a, this is like a discovery phase. It's always so fun to see. Uh, but but ends up being good and obviously this patch is of a magnitude that when this tournament is over we might have an idea roughly of what the meta is like. No, because for sure the meta it, could change it, so drastically over day to day. Yeah. There's going to be new tech discovered, so no. uh, a lot of a lot of who is going to end up being in the grand finals or at the very least in the top three or four will be the teams that are very quick to adapt and get good ideas, or just the ones that have a Santa hat on their Zeus that might also. Absolutely, Brian. Yeah, certainly ready here for Frost of Us. Dressed up in the middle lane. Sweet. Interesting to see who's going to be able to get the edge out of this matchup. I mean, with sort of the lane setups that we're getting, uh, it, this is a certain side expected to come out on top in the early game as one team here drafted heavier for this early stage of the laning. It's something that Betboom in general are very famous for is their laning prowess, and they often draft around it. I think Tundra have done a pretty good job at not drafting significantly disadvantageous lanes. I think Lion 
Buzz Life Stealer should do well against any Magnus lane. Uh, I think the mid lane of Zeus against Storm, the lane itself is pretty even early on, and then it can get tricky, obviously, if Storm gets ganked when he hits level 6. And the bot lane kind of all recovered it. I think both heroes are just going to farm. I think bad and as well as Terrorblade will be okay down here. So, yeah, I, I'm expecting a pretty even turnout here. White one almost getting killed off there, very close, but we'll be fine. Yeah, it should be fine. It's got a fair set of tangos ready to rely on. Um, at the least, saved in good position here to try and keep both Tomato and White Mon held back from the lane. Definitely seems to be that they are going to have the, the slow starts here with the lane setups. Pure and Sage both positioned very aggressively up top. GPK really bringing it to Bryl here in the mid lane, playing very aggressively on the Storm. He's, this is obviously a matchup that he's very knowledgeable about. This was the overall last pick Storm, and he has played this countless times because Storm has historically always been a counter to Zeus, a very backline dependent hero, and you have one of the most mobile heroes, if not the most mobile hero in the whole game, playing up against it. And seems to try to take advantage here of just the raw range upside that you have against the Zeus. So, decent bullying, 10 to 0 against 14 to 3, so still roughly even. And could you see sort of Tundra coming with uh, any sort of move to be able to punish GPK pre-level 6? If the heroes they have possible for immersion to make a rotation there, I think, with the Snapfire. I think that's the most likely one. I mean, maybe ideally you want the Lion to come in for the gank. It's kind of close. I think Snapfire's damage is more meaningful in that kill. But in order for the kill to exist to begin with, I don't think GPK can be full health. I don't think Snapfire's use will actually kill him. He might just be able to disengage with all of his, with his fairy fire, with what I'm assuming will be a stick or a raindrop coming out. Uh, just stabilize there. And the other question is, do you have the luxury of leaving anyone alone? I do think you could make a case for leaving Kasane alone for a little bit. I think he's somewhat safe down here, given the Phoenix matchup being this good for a Baton, but we'll see. Not easy. Ryle being bullied again by GPK here in a really awkward predicament <laughs> here, standing in the middle of the river. Yeah, he sort of kept off his own high ground here with GPK blocking him off. It's going to be kept low, but still has stick charges, bottle charge, and the tangos. GPK not afraid of showing Brawl that he absolutely has a high ground for it. <laughs> the way he was just standing in the middle of the river shooting him up on the high ground, but obviously Brawl won't know exactly where it is. It's far off to the bottom right, and that will be a hard one to find with Lightning Bolt. You don't want to just throw out multiple Lightning Bolts just in case to try to find the ward, because this mana is your CS. So it's a luxury you don't really have. If you're very sure where the ward is, you can go for one bolt and get that D ward for 120 mana, but start spamming this like you need three or four of them, that's your entire pool gone and you're just losing the lane way too hard. So I think GPK is going to be able to keep that ward. Four minute rune coming up here. Let's see, neither support really interested in helping out much for these ones. On both sides sort of you know, keeping their hands full here on the side lanes. In terms of the, the last hits overall, we have Betboom getting a, a little bit of an advantage. That mid lane being where the difference really stands out the most. I guess you know, sort of in terms of looking at the side lanes, definitely the, a little bit of a slower start here for Kasanic. As Nightfall, not really showing any sort of pressure being put onto him at all. He's doing absolutely perfect on this bottom lane. Not a, a struggle at all for the Terra Blade. On top, Pure, maybe seeing if he could get in for, for some sort of skewer back there, but always difficult to do against these. Yeah. As long as White Mon holds the stun, I, it, they're never really going to get a kill, these two Pure and save. It's very easy for White Mon to put a stop to any aggressive play. Yeah, and if you if you do go for the skewer play, you need to be pretty damn sure you get it, right? Because if you, if you walk in to try to set it up, the punish, like the... You don't really get a very good trade, right? Life Stealer can get Rage off, and you can just get double stunned, and even if you survive, you just lose your laning presence. So I'm a little bit surprised to see Pure actually going two points in the Skewer for that reason. Maybe he saw a kill attempt that we didn't catch, or but I was expecting him to just get more points in Shockwave to just guarantee range CS in this lane and recognize that, from my perspective, this is not a winning lane for Magnus. You can get farm, but I don't think you can kill, and I don't think you can match Life Stealer, who's now 30 and 8 against your own 25 and 5, so... Still doing quite okay, but you'd imagine it gets harder and harder as Tomato starts getting more levels. You start coming in for CS, he's just going to punish you with more and more cool frenzy attacks. Lion can go for a little cheeky stun and you just build it up. And you always have the luxury, as you pointed out, just reserve the Hex. You just don't need to use it, you know? Just, if you just hold it all the time in this lane, it doesn't really feel like there's any kill for it. Now we're going to see both teams start to draw their attention towards this mid area. Yeah. The six GPK minute comes around. Six. See GPK. Tricky hero to catch now that he's got the ball lightning online, but also 
a hero that could play aggressive if he gets set up here from the teammates. We get the stun set up onto save. Opening with the stun into the hex. That'll secure first blood here. Rather late on, only six minutes in. For the side of Tundra. Fryer. Pick that one up. And he's looking towards GPK as well. He's got just enough mana to close in and pick up the shield rune in the bottle. See if he's got enough mana to play for the kill on towards Immersion. Not quite. Stick charges there. Immersion is going to be perfectly fine. Varl, he'll be able to back up, grab the bounty rune as well. Make sure that his mana's in a good spot. But both teams standing up to mid. Tundra, they end up coming out on top in terms of getting what is probably one of the later first bloods that we've actually had here at this tournament. Yeah, I, I do really like the rotation, though. Uh, the choice to bring both supports to the top rune, they really paid off. They have a great understanding of what the game state is. Bryle isn't six yet, Storm is. He's obviously going to go for the rune. If you don't bring the numbers, if that's a 2v2, the Storm might just come out ahead and get a kill. Instead, you completely pile on to the Dark Willow. Don't let her play, get the kill. Now, unfortunately for them, the rune was bottom, so they didn't get that, because that could have been a two-for-one special, where they also get the power rune for Zeus and really get him in a much better position, but still just getting the kill is, is definitely good enough to warrant that rotation. Again, because you always got to keep in mind, Dota is always a game of trades. When you, you gotta, if you're moving heroes around, it's going to cost somewhere else. But the way that Tundra has drafted, their supports have so much freedom, right? Abaddon is very static and very stable down bottom. He's not scared of playing 1v2 if that's necessary. And at the same time, the Lifestealer up top isn't facing a lot of aggression from the Magnus plus Willow. So your supports really do get to do whatever they want. They could. At this point, also play really greedy and start stacking camps if they wanted to, to maximize, but don't really have the best stack taken heroes. Zeus is okay, as long as it's not the Ancient, right? But it was it's definitely a consideration that you could just maximize. It, it, it feels great to play support when you're not pinned down, you know? The whole map is your oyster right now. A lot of potential movements. Well, we see Immersion return back to the bottom lane. Let me see if they can set something up themselves. We did see earlier just now, Kasani on his own, pressuring oh, Nightfall very well, but has to be careful with the metamorphosis here as Kasani starts to back up. Shield of the Red, he's back under the tower. We'll have to keep distant from the wave for, for the moment, whilst Nightfall has the meta up. And speaking of stacks, definitely something that Betboom could very well benefit from. You've got Storm, you've got Empower. So, and Terrorblade also, not the worst stack farming here. He's also not the best, but okay. Top lane, the setup's there for the global finish from Brawl. It's pure, taken out, Tundra. Picking up another kill here across the board. It's gonna bring Brawl closer to that phylactery. It's gonna be a very strong power spike for him. Obviously a great item, especially against Terrorblade, who has very low base health. So getting that extra little bit of spell burst can make that difference about between whether he gets off a of Sunder or not, or even gets to cast anything, really. Um, I like it here. I don't think we're going to see it upgraded. I know you really want to, but... They might get there. Zeus, you never know. probably not in the wheelhouse of the, the new item, the Conda. Doesn't really seem like the hero that would benefit that much from the attack damage crit. And <laughs> begs the question, you were testing this a lot backstage. You were running, you were like, this is my new favorite item for no reason. I mean, So it, I'm going to test good. it on every hero. It's good. And you found some tech that is really good when you have a couple of rapiers. Or there's, there's, re there's reasonable tech as well. Now, of course, uh, the ones we were testing with, obviously, if you're Rubik and you steal Enchant Totem, it's very nice. You use the Enchant Totem, <laughs> and then when you press Fade Bolt, you're getting the, the Kanda damage based on your attack damage, which, of course, is increased by the Enchant Totem. So there's a hefty damage nuke added onto the Fade Bolt. So let me get this straight. Your idea of reasonable tech is position four Rubik spent uh, 5,000... Oh, you know, okay, okay. A little bit of a mid Rubik. The enemies pick Shaky. You're like, boys, I got this. I'm going to play mid Rubik. I'm going to buy Conda. You're going to get the Conda. Steal Enchant Totem, and I'm going to play right click Rubik. Absolutely. Okay. And of course, my personal favorite is definitely the, the Axe, the Culling Blade Conda. Absolutely. Yep. Because nowadays, obviously, with Axe, the, the whether or not you get the stack is de de per determined on if the Culling Blade kills them and the Culling Blade does a set amount of damage. Now, if you get the Kanda and you've got that extra damage on top of the Culling Blade damage based on your right click, you can build right click items that increase the damage on top of the Culling Blade damage, and therefore you're doing so much damage, it's much easier to get the Culling Blade stacks. That is true. So you can do some sort of Rapier, Kanda, Axe build, the and it's actually good. The classic Axe build. It is. You're going to be seeing it in your pubs, and if the, you're not, they'll, they'll know now. People are going to start queuing that up the right 12, now. The 12,000 gold offensive Axe item build. <laughs> There's so many wonderful things you can do with new patches. I will say, though, I do think there's some cool ultra late game possibilities yes. with this item. Absolutely. That's, the that's... five rapier Kanda Nature's Prophet sits in base, casts Nature's Wrath globally. Bam! It's a point target spell. So you get this incredible 3,000 global damage nuke. Yep.
That's one of them. That's one of the really late game ones. That's <laughs> the one where you have, you have Prophet has five Rave Pierce too. And even better, Sin. One thing that a lot of people don't know as well, there was some little changes actually in the game files. And one of the changes actually with Phoenix, mm -hmm. it changed how Phoenix was labeled. It changed it from a ranged to a melee hero. Do you know why that is? No. Because this hero may lay an egg. Sin? Yeah, so I this bet. doesn't really come through so well on audio, but I'm actually just, yeah. We've got a pause here. Thank, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, Owen. Should be thank going back so on much. the game soon. That's, that's great. I don't have a counter joke. Oh. I, I have to admit, I, I can't stoop to that level. I can't come up with anything equally bad. Oh well. Yeah, looks like we've got a pause. I don't know. I don't know why we've got a pause. I'm sure it's a bit yeah, but probably reading the out. patch notes. It's a patch note pause, isn't it? It's like, well, I've got to go check what these new items done. We've got some of the new items already coming in on this game. Uh, we're getting some royal jellies picked up. This, oh, I yeah. think you're going to be grabbing this every time as you're playing something like a storm spirit. Or honestly, you're probably going to be grabbing this a lot of times on a lot of heroes. It's a lot of HP and mana regens. So what's the cap on this? You get 50 health, 50 mana flat. Yep. And then if it's capped out at 10 charges, you yep. get 20 health regen and 10 mana regen for 10, 10 seconds. And so it takes 8 seconds to build up a charge, so what, that's every 40 yeah. seconds. Every so 40 seconds you're getting this health and mana boost. So a fully activated mm. jelly is 200 health, 100 mana. Mm -hmm. And you have that every 80 seconds. Eight, no, 40 seconds, right? You get a charge every 8 seconds. Yeah, 5 times 8 is... Wait, not, why, not, why 5? Not. Oh, you get 2 charges per time? Wait, Oh, no, it's Ted, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> maths is, it, you know, it's difficult. They should have included the maths in I'm the... I'm starting uh, to understand yeah. why you like that Phoenix joke now. No, okay. It's a very... <laughs> but indeed. Such simple minds. The royal jelly. Has anyone else been grabbing anything new? Are we going to see anything else we grab? As you said, we might see some sort of build-up with the phylactery on mm. Zeus late in the game. So it's not going to be rushed. He's not going to get it first. So what's He'll the get the phylactery first. What's before. the other new tech? We've got Parasma. That one's just the, not as exciting. The upgraded Witchblade, which nobody's really... I mean, can Storm buy this? You reduce enemy magic resistance when you hit them. That's kind of good on Storm, maybe? That, it's pretty good. And what's the build-up? It's, uh, it's build witch, a build-up Witchblade. He does and want Witchblade a lot of the time. Yeah. I mean, this is... Potentially, a we might item. see this. The this Christian might Parasma. be actually the battle of Parasma versus Kanda in the middle lane. Yeah, just that. So we're going to find the Kanda will not be bought. So it will but, be the battle of Parasma against the well, hypothetical he's Kanda. He's buying Phylactery. When the game gets to 70 minutes, what's he going to do with the Phylactery? He's going to upgrade it. Isn't he's probably going to sell it and get another. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're going to see it. We're going to see it between. All the right. Uh, what else do we have that's new? We have new neutral items. We've new already neutrals. seen the jelly. Oh, that's true. This game, if it gets to the 60 minutes and someone's able to get this uh, unwavering condition... Unwavering condition, yeah. Is, this is a pretty busted game for it. For probably... Well, I guess both sides have got some physical damage either, yeah. so... I mean, we might get there at some point. It's a really special item because it makes mm. you insanely strong against... For Bet Magic Team, for example, it makes you incredibly strong, strong against the Storm, Phoenix, and the Willow. 95 But the Terror Blade is, is going to be having a field thing. It's going to be like, you guys are capped at 1,500 health? I'll three-shot you, so... I don't know. That That's one's true. a really weird one for me. I think it's going to be very hard to select the right game for it, so to speak. But well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we're back on with the action. Apologies for the pause. So this game continues. Yeah, how so dare far, you? So far. How dare you pause the game? Yeah, it was all me. Nine minutes in, just two to zero. At this point, Tundra with that lead of gold, one K advantage. Yep. Pretty good start so far. Obviously. Yeah, who's, who's happier with this calm start? I mean, uh, I would say uh, overall, the thing you want to see for Tundra is both Zeus and Lifesteal having a good start. I don't think a Baden in this game needs to have a ton of farm. I think his role is more of a supporting core, which sounds kind of weird, but he's not going to play like super aggressive in your face, go in and hit people as much as he's going to be playing more of a, a defensive protect Lifesteal, protect Zeus strategy. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing him itemizing for it too, right? He's going for Solar Crest. He's not rushing a Radiance or Radiance Midas or something of this kind, right? So he's got, he knows his his job in this game is is, is protective, um, and that's why he doesn't require insane amounts of network to accomplish that job. Whereas the life stealer and Zeus, especially the Zeus, I think if Brawl was having a terrible game, this is the game where you can just become a feeding, you can just go in a feeding frenzy against Storm. So very good news for him that he's doing this well. Actually ahead on network now against the Storm. Those two kills working wonders for him, and the supports are all getting kind of nothing, right? They're just getting levels. Nobody has any meaningful CS. There's not been many big stacks. No, a couple coming out, but... I think the, the action for the supports is certainly going to kick off once they've hit their sixes. It's still a little bit away from them. 
At least, uh, what have we got? In that immersion just hit the five. They're going to go for a smoke up here. Immersion and white ones. See what sort of play they can make around the bottom lane. Maybe get a catch onto Toronto Tokyo or Nightfall behind the tower. They know that they're going to be farming this bottom line of the map. See if they can get the, the lead in. White Mon with the finger at the ready. Nightfall yep. should be burstable between the two of them, but as Absolutely. it is, Nightfall... Absolutely, they also have the, the buffer of Zeus ult really true. helps. That, that is true, actually. Yeah, these two supports plus a Zeus ult, that will kill anybody. Uh, but uh, Nightfall's playing it smart, farming very, very deep on his safe half of the map, so this smoke will not find them any action by the looks of it. Well, it might now. Just walked into vision. Gonna He's got back up, though. Is under attack. Smoke just about to end. This um, is some pretty impeccable timing from Nightfall, given the circumstances. Yeah. If he was here, what, 10 seconds earlier, he'd be dead. Even five. Uh, yeah, but perfect read, really. So. And in fact, from the team itself as well. Bet boom. They'll smoke up in response. They're going to try and jump Kasani. Now that turns towards Immersion. GPK has used pretty much all of his mana here to try and close in on this. Immersion is going to be able to back off, and the backup's in. Brawl turns up with the backup of White One. They've got the finger, but it's not enough to burst GPK. Result? There it is. That'll blow, offer up the finishing blow to make sure and they take down GPK. Another kill for Tundra. Biggest one of the game. Getting that kill on the Storm. Keep in mind, both teams rotated for this, but mm. on the side of Bedboom, you also used your Metamorphosis, and now you're not going to be able to use this for any collateral pushing or, you know, either pushing the bottom tier one tower or farming a bit more efficiently, because you're still a little bit timid about this area. The enemy heroes haven't fully left. So he's still farming defensively, not going to farm the wave of the tower. Whereas if they were the ones getting the kill, he would also be grabbing this tower creep wave. So losing out a little bit of efficiency too from this. In the meantime, Tomato just completely free farming top. He is. So he's having a great time. He's building, he's building a meaningful advantage against Terrorblade, right? These two heroes, generally speaking, Terrorblade will probably be the faster farmer because he can illusion farm and farm wave. But, oh, hang on, he's actually in trouble, speaking of. He really is. They've got him with a hex in the silence. There's no way out of there at all for Nightfall. Toronto Tokyo can't offer anything up to save him. Tundra, they're, they're getting all the kills here in this early game. That boom, not really able to find a whole lot. That Kassan is skill built, the four point curse of Avernus and one point aquatic, or two point, three points aquatic shield, excuse me. Being put to good use there. During the lion stuns, he gets so much attack speed and gets that silence in. And this tower's gone. Yep. Tundra with a really, really good grasp here at this early game play. This is very solid. I mean, yeah, even bringing you know, sort of Tomato down to this area, it's now going to be very hard for, for Betboom to really get to, towards the life stealer when he's able to play between the top and the bottom with the Twin Gates as this. And to the point where, you know, if you're Betboom, what are you sort of, what's the plan in this sort of situation? What sort of move are you looking to make? Or is it just a case of not trying to make any moves at all and just not getting caught out by Tundra's attempts? I think waiting for GPK's Orchid is probably the right play. And I. I think you can make a case for this bottom move being a bit nonsensical to begin with. You were jumping on an Abaddon, who's obviously going to have some sort of protection or at the very least be a complicated kill. Uh, whereas you could have been happy to just farm and get toward that Orchid that suddenly opens up the game quite wide. Because when you have that, you can solo kill Lion, you can solo kill Snapfire, you can even solo kill Zeus, potentially. Maybe he's too tanky now with all these items he's been able to grab. But just like theoretically speaking, I think that bottom move was not a great one from Betboom and it's going to cost them. So yeah, they're playing now. Chill, farm up, get this Orchid, maybe play around the Magnus Dagger as well together. But you will have to concede your mid-tower. I think this is a good play call to not defend this. Nightfall, he's going to walk up into this. They've got the combo, they've got the finger. Oh my God. Nightfall caught completely by surprise there, stepping up to the high ground, leading the team into what well, ends up being a rather dangerous spot on the map for him of the position that Tundra were able to set up in. Another kill, five to zero. Tundra, yeah, they just not keep the action going. They're, they're not indeed pure. He's aware, though. Quick link back away from the wave before they're able to get any sort of connection. Pure will be fine. But Tundra just slowly crawling across the map, getting these kills and keeping Betboom behind. They will be gating bottom here. GPK should be ready for this, though. It is being spotted out. See so if they want to try and fight this. They do. They're going to go for Brava. As you said, he's got a lot of AP. The They've got the RP onto the three of them. The eggs there, the side skewer, and the roast down is this coming through, crashing through the three of them. They take out White Mon and Tomato. The Supernova Stun catches onto Brava. We'll dive forward to Toronto Tokyo, but the backup's here from Kasane. Toronto Tokyo will have to keep his distance. Kasane, a much tougher target to go for. Pure still watching from the side. Maybe considering if he can go for another Blink Skewer back. Skewer, it's back up now. There's the jump. Can't quite get the angle because he gets the drag back. And now, now he's they in look trouble. Turn. They've got the cookie forward. Kasane, he's in on top of Pure. Is there any assist from Pure? There is. They'll be able to push him back with the fear, but it doesn't matter. Brawl's able to reach him with the Arc Lightning and still get the kill. 
But boom, a decent strike back there with the Wombo combo, but not one that Tundra don't come out of with getting a bit of a trade themselves as they take down Pure towards the end of it. That was such a great setup bottom, though. They were really baiting that to the limit, right? They know what heroes are coming through the gate, or at least have a pretty good idea of it. And Eurosham was coming through the gate. <laughs> yeah. They had it all planned. So GPK jumps on the Zeus, and immediately, this looks bad, right? You're getting hexed, you're getting Earth Spike, but this RP from Pure just beautifully set up with the TPN. The egg. They could not have cast the spells any better here, I think. Honestly, it's a bit of a miracle the Brawl got out of yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, if he dies here yeah. too, this is just a travesty, right? But they actually end up salvaging it somewhat. Yep. But great play from Bed Boom, getting on the board, getting those two kills, and putting their RP to good use. This will also, at the when all said and done, result in the Orchid for GPK coming out. He's hiding it right now with the Courier in fog to not okay. Tundra the information now. And uh, not too far off from Brawl also having his own Orchid, opting to have a bit of lockdown with the Silence himself. Yeah, uh, I'm not really sure what I, what I think about that here. Like that's, the, that's the way to go about this. Because it, it gives you this timing window against Storm that's really interesting, where the Storm can jump you and Orchid you, and you Orchid him back, and then you're kind of just looking at each other. Um, on top here. Secure in time, White Mon not quite able to get in range. The Orchid is obviously incredible against basically every hero on Bet Boom. It is a really good item against their lineup. I just don't know if the longevity of this item on Zeus is going to pay off. Because as always, when you buy a... This is a glass cannon item, right? It always is. You're putting a lot of gold into an item that gives you nothing defensive. So, buying that on Zeus... They're going to look for Yep. Oh. See so if they have enough damage to take him down. It looks like they certainly they do with the Orchid. They get him completely controlled between the Vortex and the Bramble. Brawl is gone. And GPK, he'll be ready to go again whenever required. He still has that regem rune in the bottle. I wonder what the what the perspective is for Brawl here of buying this instead of, say, KB or either going something like Ags or getting a another defensive item like Lincolns against the Storm. You know, there's different ways for Zeus to solve the Storm problem with itemization, and he has the gold. So I'm a little bit surprised to see well, the impressive approach. No, for sure, it's just sort of what to reiterate, right? There was no changes with this item. It doesn't build in into anything new, and the item itself still does exactly what it did before. It's not as if there's a, a different change with the Orchid this patch. But maybe it's telling about Tundra's mindset here that they want to play aggressively. If you're opting for this over defensive item, like the ones I just mentioned, then it feels like you want to be putting it to use, right? So maybe they're trying to get an overlap between this item and Tomato's Radiance, and then they really just want to run at Bet Boom and fight them. And their mentality is we don't want to you know, just trade farm, play slow, build up to a, a strong Zeus for the late game, but rather really get your money's worth right now. So, see if they can manage to do that. Interestingly, Kasane is building into what seems to be... Let's go for the mountain to build, right? Hmm. Is that worth it here? I wonder. Oh yeah, maybe we'll see which one. It, it looks like he also wants Echo, right? Because this item builds differently now, doesn't it? So. I mean, he's I'm just looking, I'm he's looking got at a bit it. of every, yeah. I'm looking at, yeah, he's yeah. getting, okay, okay. Yeah, he's getting the Echo first. And then he's going to get... He's going Echo, Manta, yep. no Harpoon. So that a little bit conflicts the thing we were talking about with the supportive approach, right? That he went for the Solar Crest, but he wants to have the offensive capability as well. So he's committing to run that together with Echo Saber so he can just get in there, maybe try to get a fast silence. And obviously, frontline for his team provision, which you can technically do with any build on Abaddon, more or less, because you always have that ult to fall back on. Until you're playing against Break, which doesn't really seem likely that Bet Boom buy a Break this game until maybe Silver Edge on the Terra Blade, but that's far down the line. See what Tundra find with this one. I know that uh, Pure, uh, they'll see him cutting the creep wave, but Pure, he knows not to stick around too long. He doesn't even stick around to finish the full wave there, knowing that uh, it's in his best interest to get out of that spot of the map, map and he'll completely avoid the smoke. It's a good awareness from Pure. See if they can maybe turn this into some sort of move themselves. They, they do have the, the combo ready to go, Bet Boom. Same time, so does Tundra. All ultimates available right now. Immersion. Put the, the high ground position around the gate and save. We'll back off from that. Oh, they're in the mid, trying to skew back on Kasani. Won't get it. Even if it is there, though, Kasani, not an easy hero to kill. Level 12 now in the about it. I almost felt like that wasn't even a kill attempt, right? He's just trying to get in his head a little bit and try to force rotation. Or if that skewer lands, maybe Tundra TP in a support or two, and then that's a job well done. You'll also know whether they do it or not with the ward you have covering the mid tier two as Radiant. So just trying to. 
create space, I guess is the right way to put it. Like, just be a distraction, buy time for the Terrorblade and Storm to progress their builds. GPK going to go for the BKB. We're almost at BKB territory as well for Nightfall. So that's when the Zeus is going to start struggling a little bit more to find the impact. Bryl will be going for the Lightning Hands build. Which, of course, did get buffed with the change to Divine Rapier Cinder. And that's, of course, nowadays yes. Bell Amp as well. True. With what, one of the heroes that benefits the most from it. So if it does get that later portion, you've got Bryl's Azazu sitting in the base with the Rapier and the Mantis Shard sending these illusions out. Not only do they hit hard with the physical, they also hit hard with the procs of the magical. Well, the illusions don't really hit hard with the Rapier. No. But there's but 20, the Spell Amp, right? Like that, that's still going to work, right? They're still going to be dishing out increased lightning props uh, with the shard. I know this. I'll get back to you. We'll see what happens. Just 21 minutes in. I mean, it's a slow game in terms of kills, so if anything, that does, I would say, put us on, on uh, sort of on track for this one to be a long one. Neither team... I thought you were going to say it puts us in theorycrafting territory. <laughs> we have so much time. I mean, there's so many things to talk Just... about. Off to the torment they go. That boom. Should be able to take this easily. I mean, we're seeing Tundra go for a smoke up, but they're on the opposite side of the map. It's going to take a long time to get over this position. Not full, as you say. BKB's done. He'll head back to base, get the refuel. Toronto Tokyo nearly dying in that sort of situation, but he's fine. Happy also day. hit the 12. He's got his level 2 supernova ready for the next team fight. And he just got the shard, yep. so that's really, really nice for him. Obviously, Sunray... This is perhaps not the best Sunray game ever because the nature of the Dire lineup is extremely burst heavy, so you might not have time to heal heroes up when they get Zeus comboed with Finger of Death and Snapfire ult, but and even in Fest. Uh, but the Phoenix Shard in general is just a really good pickup. It's going to find uses. The tankier the heroes get, the better the Shard gets. You'll eventually get to that point. And I, I, I'm thinking to myself now, so Zeus Lightning Hands is a really good build against Terrorblade. And this is one of those games where you need to make the decision for yourself. Do you want to counter him or do you want to counter Storm? And he has made the choice to counter the Terrorblade. Yeah. Okay. Tries for a bit of a skewer back there. Going to throw the finger down. Oh, oh, nice thunder. He's going to be able to heal up there and he's perfectly fine, Pure. Goodness. And that's kind of the play that Tundra can make, so now it's probably back to farming for a bit. They used to do salt, they used finger. This is when you don't want to force any bad move. Just chill out. And they're going, do Bedboom want to do something? They use Thunder, but they still have RP, they still have all their stuff. I mean, these, these sort of defensive Sunders, it's, it's a fantastic counter to the moves that Tundra's trying to make. You know, Tundra want to make this move where they pick off whoever presents themselves first. As long as Nightfall's in position, he's going to be able to help his teammates heal up with the Sunder. And, and that's the thing about that move, right? You don't necessarily expect Terribly to be positioned for that. It's no. kind of, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that was by design, but maybe just a little bit by chance that Nightfall was farming in the neighborhood and sure. then, oh, we're getting jumped mid. Because uh, generally speaking, Terribly doesn't play around where his other heroes are to try to protect them. He takes advantage of the space they make to farm as offensively as possible. Uh, but in that overlap, he was in the neighborhood, so of course he's going to come over and help. Yeah, very well played by Nightfall. And that's now a 3k lead for Bet Boom. So slowly but steadily it, now, it they're really just getting is. more out of the map. They're running the Midas on the Phoenix, so he's getting a lot. They're running Midas on Willow. The mindset here is very clear from Bet Boom. It is. Oh, it is. We want to go late game, and we think we're just going to beat. You know? And what probably gives them this state of mind in the game is that they think they have good core-to-core -core matchups. Terrorblade against Lifesteal is pretty good. Storm against Zeus is very good. So if we match them on net worth or overtake them, eventually we feel like we will just beat them is probably the mindset for Betboom here. Okay, there's a skewer. They're going to try and see if they can take out Kasani. Now, uh, off the borrowed time. Got any further control. They'll drop an RP for this. They know Kasani's a pretty big target, and the kills, you know, they haven't been flying in this game, so why not drop a few ults here to secure an abandoned kill? They have to drop a supernova and make sure he dies. They've got the zip 4 They're going to go into the tier 2, tier, tier two tower over GPK. And he's trying to get the grab onto the line, but now he'll turn the snake over towards Immersion. Brawl turned up with the backup, the mana's low for pure, so they can't dive any further. And a quick kill, and yeah, they're, they're happy to throw everything down onto that poor old bat, and it gets the job done, so. Yeah, they were close to getting three there, yeah. so I think Tundra should be... You're never going to be happy to lose a core and get nothing in return, but given the circumstance, that could have been way worse. Nice rotation in there from Snapfire of Immersion to save... Save the, uh, save the lion as well as get out of there yeah. I mean, yourself, I, but it was close. I'd imagine they want to try and strike back because they do have Finger, they have the Zeus yeah. Soul, and now there's no RP, there's no Supernova. So this would be a pretty good window for Tundra to, to get back to that business of just hunting down and, and blowing up one of Bet Boom's heroes. The problem is that you don't have a stereotypical vessel for Lifestealer, right? <laughs> the only hero he can really initiate in is the lion support. So you need these heroes to connect, and Lion initiating first against this lineup is obviously going to be extremely dangerous. He, he'll have a hard time disengaging sure. once he's in there. You don't have any force staff to get out. You have a Glimmer on Snap that can maybe protect you a little bit on the way out, but if you fail the initiation whatsoever, he's going to get instantly killed off by Storm. So 
Got to be wary of how you find the opening, but I agree. I, it really does feel like the type of moment where Tundra should really be trying to do something here. Yep, they're going to take and the twin gate like over. They will. So Let's see what they can do from this sort of angle. They've got eyes on GPK, but they have no initial catch. So GPK able to get away from this, and now Betboom's going to have a pretty good idea of what Tundra's going to be trying to go for from this area of the map. So unlikely to find any catch at Tundra. Now look towards Roche instead, maybe. Not the best lineup for it. The Madden's pretty good, but. It's kind of all you have. Lifesteal are not the best carry at killing this. The Snapfire does have four in a little spreader, actually. Immersion went for a, an interesting build here with a 4 2 4. Did get buffed this patch slightly. <laughs> the little shredder did. It doesn't look like Batboom's going to try and make any this move actually up faster there. than I expected. Yeah, it's, it's going pretty smoothly. And obviously, okay. with the front line Getting of there. Kasani, it's a pretty safe rush. They're not taking any damage, really. So, Tundra, they don't find the kills, but they do get. Yeah. By the looks of it, this age. Now, the question is if they're going to be able to get something done with this. Because still, as the moments pass, as you mentioned, with the fact you've got a Phoenix and a Dark Will on the other side with a couple of Midas's, gold lead for the team does continue to grow for Bet Boom. So, definitely going to be pressure on Tundra to get something done with this five minutes of Aegis that Brawl's going to have. And they're opting to put the Aegis onto the Zeus mm -hmm. instead of Lifestealer, which tells me that they're not interested in using this Aegis to push towers. They're okay. interested in using it to fight because. If you wanted to push somewhere, you would probably generally put it on the hero that is putting itself at risk to deal the structural damage, which would be the Lifestealer. But the issue with putting it on the Lifestealer is, first of all, your Zeus is very vulnerable if we've already covered. But even if you put it on Lifestealer, if he gets uh, RP'd and then skewered into the base in any push situation or in, into an awkward spot behind the Tier 2, the second life might not actually offer him very much. So just a... Uh, yep. Yeah. Seems like just a, a stable choice, honestly, to put it on Zeus here. I do like that decision from Tundra. This Manta style recipe is so expensive. I'm looking at Brown like, why isn't he buying it? It costs 1550. Well, what sort of with the, this shift in the gold with what kind of have the diadem right instead of the ultimate orb? Yep. Makes for that sort of balance change to happen between the purchases. And Tundra, they'll start to show themselves on Bet Boom's half of the map here towards the mid. Bet Boom seeming seemingly unfazed right now. They're happy to still continue to pick up the farm outside on the map. To what point they do head back to, to look for a defense and how much Tundra are going to be able to get away with pushing for. Kasani is up to the tier two on the bottom lane. Bet Boom still looking relatively chill. They they don't seem to be bothered by this whatsoever. They, they know they're getting the favorable farm right now of the map. Yeah, they've got two support Midas's yep. and they've terribly. So yep. every, every rule of Dota is directing you in this direction as, as Radiant. It's just like, it's telling you this is good. Every bone in your body is like, Tundra. just farm, it's fine. Tundra's definitely getting more desperate. They've got to find something. They're going to try here. They're smoked up. They'll get the two solar hits to scout things out. They'll try for the jump onto Toronto. Toka, but he's actually able to dive away. Doesn't matter. Brow's there waiting for him. They'll be able to take him out. Good. He'll drop the RP onto Brow. Nightfall steps up with the BKB and the Metamorphosis. Looking for the follow-up damage to bring Brow down. Brow's still alive. He's going to try and turn and stand his ground. Still has the Aegis to rely on. Pure attempts to chase down Tomato, but he's going to be kited. Tomato's able to back off. Brow finishes up a double. They'll end up with the trade there. And Tundra, well, they'll be happy with taking that one. They only lost themselves to two supports. In return, they're able to take out a support and a core from Bet Boot. Vile, yes, just uh, proven to be a bit too beefy. We've got what's of the RP come in on towards him, um, but they weren't able to focus down this Zeus. So this is just so clutch from GPK. That Orchid, as Lion is blinking on the Phoenix. Sure, Phoenix ends up dying in the end, but it took them so much longer because GPK got that off. And still, despite that, that's why I think if you're Tundra, you're particularly happy with this result. You I ended think up, so. You conserved your Aegis, yep. and given that your Lion didn't even get to play the fight, getting a two for two there is very, very good. So Yeah, you, you still have fingers to play with, so still a window in which you can maybe look to continue to be proactive and get uh, even more done with this final two minutes of the Aegis. Tormentor going to the Lion. A potential layer of protection against Storm if you're really clutch here. I know all the memers out there are really hoping for a big play here. Um, not seeing any plate mails in the quick buy, though. It is Glimmer Cape because this guy actually knows what he's doing, so he will buy a Glimmer. And he will get infested upon again. So let's All see right. if there is a potential move coming out. No smoke on White Mon for now, as there's some Gloves of Haste being delivered for, I'm assuming, yeah, so Tomato, is that a completed item that he's receiving here? It, it, uh, is there a new build up here? Okay, that's the Maelstrom. Now uses Gloves of Haste, so that's completed. Let's see what White Mon can find. Coming in from this angle where they expect that that boom may be on the vision. Of course, with this gem, getting a good sweep of this area. The map shutting down the vision that Bet Boom have on their own half. 
is under attack. So if one can get the jump. Glimmering, trying to get in, get the hex opening. Do they have the burst? Piss is coming in, but the BKB's there. Nightfall's able to Sunder over towards Toronto and Tokyo. Get enough HP back up to stay safe. Pure thinking about the RP, doesn't quite close the gap on Tundra. They'll back away. They put a stop to the move that Tundra is trying to make. They get a kill. They take down White Mon. They don't lose anything themselves. Bet boom. They're, they were prepared. Spirit. Looks like Tundra, at the very least, recovered their gem there. I was quickly checking if Storm was able to grab that from White Mon, too. But sitting on Tomato. So they lose that one support kill. Which, not the end of the world, really. Uh, the trade off here is that you invade and get some good map control for the side of Tundra. You can confirm that there's no vision in the enemy triangle, you get a more offensive placement on the map, and now. The goal for Boom should be for Nightfall to start pushing out mid as well as bottom to just, you know, make some breathing room for your own team here. Kind of surprised to see this goal development, to be honest. I, I was expecting Boom to be starting to pull ahead further with these double Midas's and the heroes that they have. Sure. I think that the, the sort of the fact is that, you know, Tomato's still just farming up fantastic right with this Radiance man to build, cleaning up a lot of the map. And I guess this, oh, that was a very, very close to catching Pure there with a Lightning Bolt Brial, by the way, but just barely got out in the TP. I guess Bros is just going to be farming really fast because he's the Manta, yeah, right? Yeah, both You're just, you're just going, to, going to be ramping up at a good rate. And I guess we will we'll probably keep coming back to this later in the game, but there's a very high chance that the outcome of this game will be decided largely by the discrepancy in supports, right? If you look at the net worth distribution right now, the Phoenix and Willow are miles ahead of their counterparts on the Tundra side. So there's obviously going to be some key items coming out in that regard. You've got a pipe on. on Toronto. He's tried to set something up here, but GPK comes in with the back of Tomato. will jump out and look towards it, but the RP comes out onto the two of them. Pure able to get the grab. Good strike nice. by pushing Pure. back Kasani. So he can't initially get the save off onto Tomato. Tundra, they have to run, but they're not going to get the chance. The Merchant gets taken down. Kasani's going to go for the TP out, but the fear comes through as that puts the stop to the escape. This is going to be Bet Boom taking out the four of them. Pure. Brilliant RP on the two, the push back on Kasane, he just tears that team fight apart. He deserves those tips. The skewer on Abaddon was really clean there. Very well played by him. Finding the RP the moment it's available on the Lifestealer and shoving away Kasane from being able to help out in any way there. So yeah. <laughs> look at that popping off. Very, very well played. And just like that, the sure, network always. lead starts to sort of reflect, I guess, what you were expecting with these bills right now. Yeah. 11k gold advantage now for Bet Boom. I mean, it just shows sort of how volatile of a position this game kind of feels like it, it is in for Tundra. They lose a team fight, they get knocked back so far behind. Uh, that one fight doubled their advantage, right? I think they were up about six before it began, so really, really important moment for them to find there to get in a in a, an extremely comfortable situation here. And keep in mind, the last Roshan was killed by Tundra, right? So this is where we have one of those changes in the game where if Tundra try to sneak a Rosh now, there's going to be a global alert for Bet Boom, and this Rosh will be slower. So I believe it's when Rosh is under 80% health, he casts a debuff on the team that's hitting him that reduces yeah, their the damage area. by 20%, right? The yeah, whole so area like around him. Nine seconds or something? Something like that. Yep. So you have a lot of time as the team that lost the first Rosh to get there. It's like an extra layer of protection here from Bedboom that they wouldn't have had yesterday, where that might be the path back in the game for a team like Tundra here. Is Wait, are you, are you saying then there's going to be certain strats where as a team, you kind of let the enemy take the first rush? I don't know if you necessarily do that But by, there's maybe less incentive to stop less, it, to yes. take that risk to stop them from getting it. If you I, I know would, they're not going to be able to do too much with that timing, just yeah. play for the fact that you'll let them have that one, and then you can get that second rush without any sort of complications. Historically speaking in Dota, the second Roche is a lot of the time the monumental one, the one that decides the game the most. I'm not sure I would say it necessarily is anymore, but it's definitely not the first one. So if you're the team that doesn't get the first one, I think there's less of a downside to it now because you, you get that layer of protection for covering the second one. It doesn't mean that killing the first Roche is bad. It's not like you can't protect the second Roche, right? And there's also some really interesting fake-out plays where you kill the first Roche, you go and deal 20% damage to the second one, and then you turn it into a smoke, you know? like. There's going to be some added mind yep. games with this where you can, you can try to pretend knowing that the enemy knows and it becomes this rock, paper, scissors game. We know that they know that we know and then nobody really knows anything, right? So. Here we go. I mean, Bet Boom. Yeah, they've been playing it pretty Bet. calm for now. Sort of, pre pre sort of just reacting right to Tundra's moves. Now it's at a point where Bet Boom, they're happy to get active themselves. They are so farmed on both the ter Terror Blade as well as the Storm. Storm has the Axe now. The Terror Blade rocking that full on Daedalus. And the supports are closing in. Save almost has Axe on the Willow, level 18. Phoenix is also level 18. I mean, the, what the, are the supports the on the team enemy fight team? 13. It's going to be them. so tough for Tundra. The level discrepancy here is actually enormous if you bring up the hero level chart. 
This is very unusual that it looks like this. The two enemy supports for the Tundra side are the same level as your offlaner. And your supports are miles behind. That's what double Midas on your supports is going to do. Well, winning teamfights helps too. It's not only the hey, Midas. Come on, that's not winning. You, uh, Imagine buying Midas. Just buy Midas five, if you support. Five you levels need to know. in 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did, did Tundra want to walk into this fight? I don't know if they do. They, you know, you know that Bet Boom's there if you're Tundra. Do you really want to approach this? I think you have no choice, right? Like, I don't, I don't think you can just... With how this game developed in the last five minutes, I think fighting is the way back into the game. The problem sure. is Bet Boom have done a really good job at covering their bases and not getting caught very much. Uh, but I, I mean, you still have to play for the slip-up, right? If you just accept, okay, they're just too good, and then you go farm, I don't think it's a winning strategy in this game. Like, you have to try to catch them off guard, find them in a weak moment, get that lion jump with a lifestealer and kill a support. Like, jumping and killing off Willow, for example, is a really good fight entry for them. Dyer's middle tower is and you can always Zeus ult to cover your bases against the Magnus, right? Oh. Unless this happens, he's smoked. I know what's up now. Now, oh, this is really awkward for Tundra. Skewer, where's he want to jump? He's okay. going to try and get the skewer. Not going to get a catch on that initially. Kasani presents himself at the front of the fight, over to the side. Tomato oh. jumps out. He's going to look to try and take out Toronto Tokyo, but the supernova's there. Can they finish the egg? They can't. Pure's in with the RP, locks down Tomato. Tomato is gone as well as Whitemon. This fight, there's nothing left to be had here for Tundra. As they've lost three, they'll almost certainly lose Brawl as well. He's going to try for the TP out through the rear of the BKB. But the damage is done. Four heroes dead. Make that five by the looks of it. His Pure's able to get the drag back onto Kasani. They walk into a <laughs> team wipe here, Sin. Look at them just spam attacking him. It's almost like a taunt, you know? They're healing him to full four times over. He could have just walked away and waited and taken less damage on Pure, but he doesn't care. He's going to get the job done. Five kills. It's Roche time, and they will not have the debuff here, so more than enough time for them. I mean, what do you do? What do you do here if you're Tundra? How on earth do you play your way back into this one? 18k down. Bet Boom with the second Roche. It's going to be so tough to keep this game going here for them. We'll see the attempts from Tundra to fight back. But again, just excellently done here from Bet Boom as a whole. We see at the bottom of the screen, Tomato, he goes straight towards Toronto Tokyo, but he gets this egg off. Pure's there to cover him, get the RP off onto the Lifestealer so that the egg can't die. And yeah, GPK just being a huge nuisance on this back line. The fight, fight is just completely split. It just, it's just unplayable here for Tundra in that sort of team fight. And I mean, you see, you see this game play out now, and you go back and you think about how the draft went down, right? We were talking about it when the game began. Tundra are running some new tech, and Bedroom are running something that's been proven to be very stable in the previous patch. I was wondering, how is this first pick Lion going to shine? What is this early Abaddon? Are these heroes really that much better now that the experienced teams that know how to counterpick them can't find a solution? It seems like it's not the case, right? We got a jump. jump. They've got the kisses coming in, but Toronto Tokyo's able to die to the they kill him. He's still alive. He's able to get away. White Monster wants to die. Toronto Tokyo will finally be silenced here by Brawl as they will eventually kill him off. They also okay. are able to down the top. There's the Terra Blade that wants. Can they do it a second time? Brawl steps back. The BKB's there for Nightfall. Nightfall's going to opt for the BKB TP out, and that will do him well. Gets him back to base safely. <laughs> It looked for a moment like Betboom might have thought about turning that one around. RP was coming off cooldown in three seconds, but Storm was out of juice, so... Dyer's middle tower Let's go back to base. Attack. Look, by the way, at this little detail of GPK holding on to the Royal Jelly, right? This is a tier one neutral item he still has in the backpack. Uh, just, so we can slide it in and pop it. When, this, is like a, yeah? this is like a whole game item for Storm, <laughs> where whenever you disengage out and you have that natural downtime, you just get that little bit extra efficiency. That's, that's super nice, actually. So, because normally in situations you'd be like throwing out little... Casual clarity or something later down the line. Yeah, but this indeed, is with the, it's the true. jelly. This player. is kind of an economy item as well, right? Absolutely. Does it's it gain the charges slower in back? It should, right? It looks like it. Yeah, it should just have the increased back, back, backpack cooldown time, right? I would think so. I didn't yeah. pay full attention because it should be eight seconds, which means in backpack it should be. What's the multiplier again? I actually don't what remember. What are you asking this. me for? You know this. <laughs> You're the theory. You know this. You're the theory crafter. You were spamming I every hero with. numbers. With Conda Unless they're big numbers dealt by a five of Divine Rapier Conda hacks, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to Royal Jelly, you know, this is small fry. This is small numbers. We don't yeah, I, I don't remember what. But I think, yeah, indeed. It, it should tick up in the backpack. Albeit it felt like slower. it went from nine to ten charges relatively. Well, ten is after nine. Oh, quick. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. It, he did go to ten after nine, which yeah. is a healthy sign here. Maybe that's uh, why they were just checking. As, uh, we're all good to go. Sound. It does actually, in case it does get a charge every eight seconds in the backpack, that's actually quite it, it, instrumental no, for it, the impact. It's of the not item. getting it every eight. There's no way. It's okay. definitely going to be slower. Okay. We'll see. He's, he's putting it in between. You'll be you're able saying to that with so much confidence. I'm just going to believe you're sure and you're right. Thank you. Uh, we have a potentially dead one of these guys. Yep. Uh, pure and Brile are. Lincoln's is back up. 
But uh, indeed he's dead. Quite a big catch for Tundra to find coming back in after that pause there. Pure out for 90. Pure tried to solo Bryle as Mag there. Absolutely no backup near. He burnt the RP. Didn't get there, so... A nice little kill there for Tundra to keep their hopes alive. Maybe a power play in the cards. You know, there's no Aegis. You took that away the last time. There's no RP. There's no Magnus life. So this 5 on 4... Would really love to see them go for some sort of aggressive, at the very least, take control of the map and get some aggressive vision out so you can maybe set conditions for a better follow-up fight. But even smoking into a very aggressive move here could be something, but yeah, Bet Boom are going to know this and they're going to play it all the way at the outskirts of the map, down the bottom, even inside their own base on Toronto, Tokyo. This Phoenix, by the way, as we talked about previous fight, was a really hard kill. It's getting harder it was, and harder. Yeah. He's got Trickster Cloak, Pipe, and Vlads. 2.2k health. Yep. I mean, Tomato's pretty farmed, but as we saw in that last fight, he could not take down Toronto Tokyo before the egg comes into play. And mind you, he could have been way tankier, too. He took the other 15 talent. He took the damage one. So he could have had 500 more health on top of this, but... Well, you know, this is quite something, though. For a team, Tundra, down 14k. They're actually the ones knocking at the doors of Bet Boom right now, trying to yep. make the most of the fact that Pure's still out for 20 seconds. This should probably be the end of it, though. It's starting to get scary. 15 seconds left on the mag respawn. You know that you're always at risk of getting pulled in with the Storm Ags. And just as we talked a lot about GPK and his Royal That's Jelly, the then he, he just got rid of it now. <laughs> but he's had it this whole time until we cared about it, and then it wasn't cool anymore. That's... That's my life in a nutshell, isn't it? It's just always a bit too late. There we go. Okay. Oh, they got the jumper. Have they got the burst? They've got the stun for him. Have they got enough to take him down? Nightfall's going to be able to get out of the side turns. He's looking for a Sunder target. Not going to quite get it now. He will. He's going to be fine now. Back up to pretty much 90% HP. Not quite enough there in the tank from Tundra to burst through this Terror Blade in time. Yeah, he got off a Satanic hit on the melee creeps. He had nobody to Sunder at the time. Tomato was in there with the BKB to prevent that, but still did stay alive. Yeah, they'll back off now, Tundra, after that failed attempt. No need to try and force anything, at least whilst yeah, their ult's on cooldown. All five ults for that, so definitely. A, if Betboom wanted to make a really quick one here with their Metamorphosis running, they could. But again, looking at the big picture for them, probably not necessary, right? Just chill out a little bit. You're closing in on big 25 talents. Terrorblade just got the Wisdom rune there, so he's close to his. We'll be getting that either Sunder cooldown on meta duration. Wonder which one he's going to take here. I think probably the meta duration is the one for this game. Because it, it feels like this is a game where it's hard to use Sunder multiple times, right? Because of the nature of the burst on the enemy team. But. Yeah, but the burst hasn't been killing. Yeah, so then he doesn't need two charges. Yeah, but I, I, sure, I see what you're saying. That there's only going to be that initial start. There's going to be the one go where if he survives and gets the Sunder off, he won't need it the second time. Yeah, that will be interesting if that is indeed his thought process. I think the Sunder talent good in general is really strong when you're playing against high consistent damage because then you're forced to use it and then you'll be forced to use it again. I just don't think... I think when he gets the first Sunder off and stands his ground, he'd rather have the meta duration to capitalize and get a better, like a base push out of it or... You know, in a really long fight, you extend. Are oh, they going to try and go for another burst play here, potentially? White Moth. Got Tomato with him. Yep. Pressure done on Pure. Fingers ready again. They have Zeus Alt in 15. I bet Boom, they're playing smart. They know that the cooldowns are coming up. They're keeping uh, up on the high ground. That is not a part of the map that Tundra is going to be trying to throw themselves into anytime soon. So Bet Boom should be pretty safe. Yeah, they're in a very safe position here. This is defensive Dota. <laughs> Literally five heroes huddled around. There will be time to smoke now, though. Tony? Yes, they do. They're going to try. See how quickly they can do it as they'll take him down. Prop that borrowed time. Is there any backup coming from him? There isn't. So uh, it should be a kill. I don't think Kasani's got any way out of this one as uh, he'll be well and truly dealt with by Betboot. Kasani out for 85. Yep, they flat out just called the bluff here, right? It looked like he was baiting, but. They didn't fall for it. They just commit everything on him. They see there's no response. And yeah, Kasane was indeed just full on bluffing down the mid lane. And nobody to cover. So a nice little pick up there. They decided Bet Boom don't use too much. They use meta. So, uh, I guess a decent cooldown, to be fair. But it will be up pretty much around the time of Adonis as well. And I don't think Tundra have any interest in forcing the issue without their essentially their frontliner that gives their line of vision together with Zeus, right? You want this Abaddon in the fray. Giving in GPK. Oh, look at what GPK is buying. We were talking about it. It's the one. Well, the Prasma. Yep. 
I forgot what it was called. That's why I called it the one. Oh, I you were testing me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you self-admitted that. It's actually you, Phil, and I was That's proud of it. That's a self-report right? if I've ever seen oh, one. Yeah. Okay. He's going to be able to get Brawl out of the base. Gets him with the jump. The BKB's there, but the RP's in to follow up. That's Brawl out. 90 seconds there. A very quick catch from Pure, and of course, with that refresher, he'll be ready to go again if anyone else dares step up here to the front of the defense from Tundra. And they're going to force the buyback out of him, right? There's no way so, right. that they can defend without the Zeus. Nightfall is just going to front line with a lot of confidence here. There shouldn't be enough burst damage to kill him without the Zeus buyback, but maybe they can do this cheekily where they jump in and get the max lockdowns during it. Just... Oh, Pure! Oh, he's going to try and get the grab, but they've, oh. got the response. they've got the finger, the kisses oh. are coming out. This time, Pure won't be getting the grab. He'll pop the BKB, try and refresh, but the damage for the kisses comes in. They'll put an end to, to Pure for now. I mean, 95 seconds he's gone. Of course, the buyback did come out from Brile, just yeah. something forced him to return. But if you look at the, the buyback situation, and they might know this as well with the fact that he just came up to the fight with a refresher. He oh, doesn't yeah. have money himself for buyback. So this is a clean 80 seconds still in which Pure will not be able to play. I was a bit too cute. At the very least, he got the buyback, like you said, right? So that's a, that's a little bit of a band-aid on that situation, but yeah. It's just one of those things where it's going to look great if he pulls it off, but the risk reward, like, there was no need, right? You could just look at this in the replay and be like, okay, we could have literally. It was taken, pretty deep. There was a free lane of barracks, right? You could have taken that lane. You could have probably started knocking on top as well in that time window, but now you took the high risk route that could have possibly ended the game, didn't do it, uh, and you opened the door a little bit for Tundra to get a potential Roche. Now, fortunately for Betboom, this Roche respawned. Will be delayed another 20 seconds. Okay, we'll see how so, patient Tundra are for this. If they scout it as it spawns, I actually think they can kill it in time before Mag gets up here. But you literally need to be in the pit with all the heroes at the right time. Now, if Immersion is scouting it now, the time it takes Lifesteal to get up there from bottom, they'll probably be back up. But obviously, Tundra are not going to be transmitting the kill because the last one went to Bet Boom. So this time, the Aegis is. We have a little bit of a switcheroo from earlier. Back up now, see if they check the pit. They yep. do. Merchant will see it. He's pinging it out. Let's see what the adjustment is. Okay, they're all rushing up there. They really want to do this. The smoke's coming in from Bat Boom. Yep. No mean, really good teleportation point of connection here for the mag, though. He's going to have to take, take a long walk. a while. He'll probably port on the outpost and then start moving. That, I guess that port is faster now. It used to be it six, is. now it's four. It is indeed. So that is one of the big changes. So it'll be close, but will it be close enough? Roshan already down to half HP. Oh, the scan has been hit oh, as well. Ah. So Tundra, they're fully aware that this is going to be coming in. And indeed, they'll be able to finish this off in time and get the pickups. See if Betboom still want to try and fight into this. They don't. That is just huge for them. They get the Ags onto the Abaddon now. So an extra lane of defense for them. And this is... Late game Dota in a nutshell, right? You make that one high ground mistake on the Magnus at the wrong time. It's one thing to fail the play, but you probably don't have in, the, have in the back of your mind, oh yeah, by the way, in case I mess this up, we might lose Roche. That's the afterthought mm -hmm. that you get to once you're, you know, calmed down in your base for a minute. You're like, oh shit, I probably shouldn't have done that at that exact time. And Tundra, high skill teams know this. They're holding they, on. They will take any advantage you give them here. And that was about a, that one tower dive was essentially 8k gold because of the value of this Agon of Scepter Synth going on Kasane now. Seeing sort of bigger item pickups across the board as well. What we have here, Kasane trying to... Oh, oh find a pick. The catch here indeed with the finger. Oh, it's an easy one here, the catch out stay. Uh, okay. Tomato was trying to armlet toggle his cheese. Uh, you cannot armlet toggle oh, cheese. No. You eat the cheese when you armlet toggle the cheese. Unfortunate circumstance where you swap with, you know, you just have this muscle memory, you're armlet toggling Press and then the switching cheese. it off. Yeah, you know? that and that was the exact slot he put the cheese into, so just, yeah. Maybe, maybe he was hungry. Maybe the willow wasn't satisfying enough. It was like, there's not that much meat on there. So, maybe you get a little dessert, you know? Maybe you didn't read the patch notes platter. And, and you don't realize that cheese now gives you a permanent damage buff. Oh. Mm. Specifically when you use it after a kill. Otherwise, you could have used it right away. Yeah, it's like a BM move. It's like a uh, thorn. Okay. <laughs> Uh, back in action here down bottom. They're still looking for more. White Mom. And it's not going to be able to. I mean, the pure is underneath this, this vision sort of setup. Oh. But I mean, these two, they can't really do too much about it. They're, they're bringing in the backup. The, the rest of Tundra, they are going to smoke over towards this area to try and play around this vision that they've set up. Knowing that here is like knowing that Pure is farming this first okay. item. They're going to try and get the jump in onto Nightfall. Do they have enough first this time? Nightfall's able to put the BKB. He's able to turn. Stands his ground, punching in towards Tomato. GPK keeps his distance from Kasane for now. The Supernova's out. Tundra aren't able to finish it off. But boom, they hold safe on the high ground. Every time they try to kill Nightfall, they get within like 20%. Like they get you're, close. You can understand why they keep trying, but... 
The biggest thing here is that Pure is always in position to get that RP off onto the Lifestealer to protect him. It's been the... It saved him two or three fights in a row. Oh, it has. So they're yeah. definitely dependent on it, which means that if Tundra ever find this opportunity with Magnus dead or the RP on cooldown, or perhaps where you cancel the blink at the perfect time when he's far away with a Zeus ult, mm -hmm. maybe. But yeah, you've got to have the timing down to a T, right? Because Magnus cannot be in BKB and he cannot be in trade. Oh, well, he can be in BKB. And the Zeus ult is still going to cancel his blink, right? But if he's in Trickster Cloak, or if he's piped, Probably won't be able to pull off the same. But I mean, still, this game, for all intents and purposes, we could have almost been uh, looking at a new draft. Yeah. If this, uh, if this dire sure. face moved in. Because keep in mind, it's one thing that it failed. That Roche was probably Bet Booms too, right? Given how the game state was. Yeah. They probably get clean up the mid racks, they back off yeah. and get the Roche, they go Control again, the area, and they end find it. one pick when the enemy team has to come and contest them on the Roche and then finish that off with vision advantage. A little oh, oh. close call on that. War on that Earth Spike. I don't think he actually could have connected anyway. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Pure's just yeah, not going to mess around with that one. BKB TP. Learned his lesson. Arguably he didn't because he was still up there, but, you know. It was interesting to see, though, you're still the team with 10k lead. Betboom with their you know, favorable amount of farm. They're the ones, for the most part, being kept inside their base. They're having to really respect how Tundra is controlling the map right now. It's terrifying because your map is dark, right? You have no ward. You have one. Actually, that's not true. You have one lane ward top. But nobody's playing this area right now. So the, the ward isn't really offering any much the way of information. Now they're finally going to clean up the bottom one here, which I would yep. argue was way more instrumental than, the, than their own, because this one was actually likely to find a pick. Uh, but Toronto Tokyo will clean that out. Having the confidence to go for it with the Eon disc. Keep looking at the supports here. <laughs> Honestly, kind of funny looking at the CS. Lion has 18. The lowest CS on the enemy team is 140. The white one's definitely not been looking at the creeps this game. There we go. So GPK is going for the full purchase. Has the Parasma. That's a bit of a reminder for you boys and girls at home and here in Kuala Lumpur. It's the upgrade of the Witchblade. And uh, also now the Witch's Axe. I guess it is. Is it an axe? It's an hal it's halberd? Yeah, it's a, a halberd? That's a halberd. That's a halberd, that's isn't it? definitely a halberd. Yeah. I think that's very important that we define whether this is a halberd or an axe. Absolutely. So, and also, what, so as you said, with the attacks of this, you're able to reduce the enemy's magic resistance by 20%. Yep. Really good for him. Really good for Willow. Mm -hmm. Really good for Phoenix. Um, They're going to try and go for this. Very strong, yeah. Smoke up outside of the base. See if Pure's able to find the jump. Scan hits on the high ground. They're going to get the ward. Oh, oh, he's thinking about trying to get the drag back on towards the snap fine. He'll get it. Immersion. He's going to be able to live for now. They get the shield off towards him. He gets dragged back by the vortex. He'll fall. They'll pop the supernova. The stun control. They're on the tomato. Tomato completely trapped underneath the egg. Three heroes dead on Tundra. They have to run. Kasane will put the borrowed time, but the pretty much entire squad of Pepin will be chasing him down. Refresher or pop by Pure to get the secondary skewer back on towards Kasane. There's no escape for the Abad, and they'll get the four. Just a GPK shield. That fight, honestly, just completely clean, right? So they get the they get the offensive ward out. I love the way that Betboom set that up. They ward the high ground. They see this little sliver of Snapfire, and yeah. they jump on her. Honestly, that was a bit awkward for Pure, because he undershot the blink, and then he had to reposition. He was like, am I RPing? Am I not? He kind of pump faked it out Check and eventually snap. found the skewer. So you're seeing it here. Place the ward. RP can I mean, that was good reaction. And then he's like, right. OK, I yeah. can still get the skewer, saving the RP here, yep. which is really valuable, because now he's going to have it twice over for the life suit if necessary. Only needs the one, though. Gets it off during the supernova. Just too easy to shut down Tomato here. I mean, they just and in the off screen, Tom GPK just killed both supports, right? Like, he killed the Snapfire and then he jumped down and killed the Lion. Both of them just completely negated by this one hero. I make sure. Arguably, that refresher not even necessary there because the vortex of GPK was ready again. A little bit of miscommunication potentially, but not the biggest of deals. Already seen the uh, buyback have to come out here from Kasani as Bet Boom. Back to approaching the high ground of Tundra. Of course, this was the area where it did start to go a bit shaky after a bit of a dive last time. We'll see if Bet Boom make a bit of a different approach here on this, this one. And Pure. Oh, okay. And be able to get the BKB drag back onto Brawl. That's Brawl gone. Buyback comes out from Tomato. We'll see Brawl hold onto it for now. It looks like Tundra, they're going to immediately look to get aggressive. White Mon, he's got Tomato with him. See if they can get any sort of capture on the retreat from Bet Boom. They're going to go for Toronto Tokyo. The turn into the hex. Do they have the damage? He's down a half HP. Oh He's easily God. able to dive away. They did have enough. 
Trying to take his out of there, pure. He'll screw it, screw away for now from Tomato. They'll continue to back off here, Bet Boom, not allowing Tundra to grab anything despite their best attempts there with that immediate chase outside of the base off the back of Tomato buying back. It's just look how much of a difference it makes that the supports are this rich, right? Like, this is a support position. It, it's not dying. It's a position 5 Phoenix that didn't die to the enemy in Fest Bomb in at 50. <laughs> and he didn't have disc ready. He still didn't die. The disc was on cooldown. He's only, and, you know, he's only died two times this game on the Phoenix. Toronto Tokyo having a very, very good time. A 30k lead now. The numbers starting to get pretty insane here for Bet Boom. They will, though, however, settle things down once more. Roshan, we'll see when that's going to be coming up. It's going to be two more minutes on that one. But very likely that we may see Bet Boom hold back, look for the next Roche, and then look to go for the killing blow. Not a, not a shard that feels like it's going to be making a meaningful difference here, getting that upgrade to the Fire Snap cookie. Let's then again, was there any that really would have? They already have the Life Steal one. Tamata bought that one. The Open wounds. They have the line one that they got earlier. Zeus bought his own. So it was, yeah, yeah it was actually it was only Snapfire that could get it. The other ones already have it. So there was no RNG involved here. In terms of pickups as well, Nightfall. It's just being able to grab himself the Agonims. So something else that's going to cause issues when these heroes of Tundra are trying to hit something like the Supernova. They're yep. just going to get caught in this fear. There's so many ways for them to protect the egg and make sure that Toronto Tokyo continues to have excellent presence in the team fights. And this axe has actually been changed this patch. It follows you. Yes. So if you pop it and like blink in or do something. pop it, blink in. Yeah. In the past, you would blink in, then pop it, and it would be around where you are. But if you just keep moving around, you're just fearing people in your wake as you move, right? So really, really powerful yep. for, for the Terrorblade. Com combine it with the swift blink uh, for the movement speed. You just blink in, you pop this, and you just run through the enemy team and fear all of them. Give vision. Set up your team for success. Tundra. They're going to try and take a fight here by Luke Smith. Four versus five. Kasani. He's going to get caught. Does they really want to go for this? I mean, the jumps would be made to the back line. Oh, GPK and the BKB. The finger. Have they got it? A burst of cookies. It's not going to be in time. GPK is able to hunt the BKB. Get out of the side. Finish off Kasani. Kasani now dead for two minutes. Bro, he's TP'd over into this. I don't, Tundra, do they really want to still try and fight this? Four versus five. Pure's BKB is going to come down, but Nightfall blinks in, pops the BKB. Tomato's going to turn the stage towards Pure. Can they bring down this smash? As Pure pops the refresher. The RP's there to control Tomato. Pure's able to step back. It's going to be immersion left behind. That's the, the life steal out of the game. Brawl's gone. They don't have the buyback here available on Tomato. They don't have it on Kasani or immersion. Bet boom, they should be able to run it down a lane here and potentially end things. Only going to be Whitemont and Brawl left. Brawl, the only one with buyback. As Bet boom, they're ready to approach the high ground once again. And it's, if that fight doesn't prove it now, I mean, it's definitely official. Tundra have damage issues. They caught GPK without BKBing and they still didn't kill him in Hex and Earth Spike with three or four of their heroes. They just don't have enough in the tank. The fact that he gets to escape and get away with murder there is. Yeah, that's just the final nail in the coffin, you know. If they're not gonna, if they're not gonna kill the storm there, and it is, it's, it's just over. Not happening. It is over. GG is called. Bet Boom will take this game one. A well fought one here. 57 minutes. For this one ending up going on. Tundra trying their best to hold on, but at the end of the day, Bet Boom just continuing to grow their lead throughout this, and it just got to the point where there was not really a whole lot that Tundra could do to stop them since. I wonder what they're going to throw at us in the next game, right? Because Tundra, obviously, in this game, running some new stuff. Like they talked about, Bet Boom with incredibly strong team fight, very well scaling cores, two Midas supports. I win it's a long game. They get there. They were definitely slated to win this, I want to say, from like 30 minutes onwards. Yep. The writing was kind of on the wall that it was going to be tough for Tundra, and they never really found the opportunity. So now the question is, what are you doing in game two? Are you going to try to match them in greed? Or are you going to play faster tempo? Because you played a right-click Zeus and a Life Stealer against two core matchups that just aren't inherently that great for you and a BKB piercing stun on the Magnus. And the game got too slow for you, so. It did. It, it really, really slowed down. I think, you know, as a, a whole lot of things to, to be said really for all the members of Bet Boom on that one, very much the team effort. I think GPK in particular is going to be feel very happy because we saw that win rate for Storm so far here in this yep. tournament. Hadn't been great, one and three, but going 12, one and 15 this game. Uh, popping off, getting the Parasma. I'm sure definitely <laughs> added into that extra potential to burst through heroes with those yep. last few zips. He was closing in, reducing their magic resistance by 20%. Yeah, definitely a lot to be done. And, and an honorable done mention too, look at Bet Boom's lineup. Their supports have two deaths each only against Zeus and Lifestealer, right? This is a game that could have been hard for them, but 
they had great positioning all game. And yep. they the the most deaths were on the Magnus of all heroes, the initiator, right? That's true. I mean that's at the end of the day, that's just Peter doing his job. Sometimes he's gonna get caught out, and the times that he didn't, he gets off some incredible uh, reverse polarities. Well there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Game one of this best of three goes to Betboom. Thank you very much, Odie Pixel and Cinder, and indeed we'll see what happens in game number two, though. If we can have a third game to the series, if Thunder can strike back, or if Bedroom will close this one as a 2 0. But this game, I was promised something in particular. I was promised chaos, action, battle, back and forth, back and forth. Purge! I was lied to. Well, look, we would have liked to see more fighting. And when they did fight, it was really fun. It was yeah, very chaotic true, true. stuff. Uh, Storm hitting the back line, Magnus pulling people back. The, the hard thing is that the, the Tundra lineup was not good at starting fights. Mm -hmm. It was like a lion position five. That, you, that's the expectation for your guy to jump. Zeus is always going to play back line, basically. Uh, Ava isn't exactly like a big jumper, it's, other than like you play really aggressive. So it was just really hard for Tundra to take fights. And on the Bedroom side, they just needed Magnus to screw people back. They had way more options and tools to take those fights. That's why they just fought better. I feel like when Tundra were strong, or when I thought they were stronger, I feel like they kind of chilled a little bit when it came to the mid game. They did bring it back later, and like Pure made some skewer where he went too deep in the base and gave them an Aegis, and then the game came became a little more competitive. But I would have liked Tundra to kind of step it up a little bit. You know, it's not, I was expecting Chaos, it's not my fault it didn't come out this time. <laughs> yeah, I thought Batboom played their signature style here, where they just wait for Nightfall to scale into the late game. They have some initiating hero on here, and then of course they have the El Clasico and the GPK Storm. Yeah. And yeah, they did everything very well. But I have to point out, I think Tundra did not play their draft the way that they should have. Honestly, there was at some point in the game, their life stealer was top of the net worth. They have an Abaddon who successfully won, kicked Terrorblade out of the lane, but then they just don't play together. They sit back and they farm, and you're trying to outfarm double Midas's on the enemy team, a Magnus in power, and a Terrorblade. And I, I don't exactly know whose call that was, but when you're first, like, when you're drafting this Abaddon in this new patch, in this phase, and you play it as a core, you have to be able to play around it. But this Abaddon was alone so many times on these lanes, yep. just getting jumped on by Betboom, and there was nobody around him. The way you play around core Abaddon is you play behind this hero, you run down lanes, you run down towers, and that just wasn't happening for Tundra. So back to the drawing board, and maybe just go back to your old strategies before this patch, because I don't think they're quite there yet with their Abaddon. I fully agree, and one thing I would like to touch on, especially what they did in the early game. So they did bring it back later, mm -hmm. but I think the one thing I lacked in this game is when we just think about the two drafts. If we, if Tundra don't find a way to somehow initiate or do something, you're just waiting for Pure to fish you out, and you will lose by default. So what I need them to do is find a condition where you can start the fight in a way. Like, and it, sometimes you need to be creative. I think Kasane needed a blink, like get in there. Everyone needs to go in, and Zeus needs to just dish out all the damage on the go. If you cannot find this condition after 40 minutes, I think there is zero chance for you to win. And that's why something like this, it's critical that you can figure it out in the game. And it was cool to see how he itemized on, uh, on Kasane, at least, like these fast orb of corrosions, now that it gives armor. It makes these like run at you offlane heroes really dangerous. You're super survivable at an early stage of the game. But yeah, it didn't really transition to anything else other than him just taking 20,000 points of damage to die yeah. the one time. So it's cool, but you know, if you're worried about the skewer back while you're hitting a tier three tower, it just never really feels like there's a good time unless you team fight, wipe them. But Betboom is so good, they didn't let that happen. The few initiations that were like white mon disabled jumping a hero, even the times that that happened, they went at least even due to really nice plays between like Nightfall Thunders or things like that. So just really hard for Tundra to find the right opening for them to feel safe to actually go high ground. So despite all this net worth, it didn't turn into any, anything. Still for a little while though, it looked like Tundra was the team to pressure Bedboom into their base and it was Tundra that was, well, seemingly being the aggressor, Effie, but every time they then tried to make a move, Bedboom was like it was child's play, like they could just, oh, you know, we'll stop that initiation and we'll buy ourselves another 10 minutes. Yeah, I mean, they kept initiating with the Zeus Hex, was it? Yeah, yeah. the Zeus Hex on the Terror Blade, and he kept getting low, but they were never quite able to kill him, and that's because when they started to make these aggro moves, they did it when everybody was really farmed yep. on the enemy team. Terribly had a lot of items, the Phoenix was always there with the Supernova to save him, and his team was there to combo break or fight back. I, I just really think, and I, I said this already, but Tundra made some kind of miscall call in that game where they just decided to take five minutes to farm and farm alongside Bedboom, and that was just a massive mistake. This yep. is like, sorry, like this Go is the it. type of game where if you want to win it, at some point when they brought it back, you need to clutch it. 
And sometimes you fail that, it's okay. You make a missed call maybe early game, how you should play your draft. You know, now for game one is over, yep. talk about it, game two, let's go. Okay, so how much of this was draft related and how much was seemingly communication related, Perch? Because you mentioned some issues that they had just by nature of the heroes of not being able to go in. Yeah, um, I, I think communication wise, I, I, I mean, other than the them playing far apart, like Effie said earlier, other than that aspect, I think their heroes just don't have as many good options offensively to begin fights because Zeus, I mean, I don't know about these item builds yet. I, they looked pretty good, but like fast Orchid on Zeus, it's cool, but it doesn't really let him jump, for yep. example. Uh, so it just kind of felt to me like they didn't have enough catch options. The times they did catch, the burst wasn't quite enough, even though it was a lot. Um, they they just didn't weren't able to create an opening. So that, that feels to me like an obvious draft issue. Yeah, we, we also know that Ari is the player that they replaced, and we know that Ari, as a position four, was very vocal in their games in the past, Kezu. So maybe they lack a little bit of that as well. I mean, maybe, but then it just means like someone else has to rise up to the yeah. occasion, right? I think draft-wise, the game is easier for Bad Boom. They can be more chill, sit back and relax. So it is up to Tundra to make these moves and find the communication that you get to make the smokes on the, on the map and find the team fights you want. So, you know, next time around, it's easier said than done. Like, oh yeah, just communicate better and figure it out. But in this pause right now, I'm sure Moon, you know, he's cooking up something. He's telling them, guys, next time let's do this. We'll pick a different hero and it's going to be easy. Yeah. Yeah, but I hope what they're cooking up is not anything new. I think they should just go back to how they played during group stages. I don't think they should experiment in this game too with any picks. And they've shown us that their laning is good and that they play for scaling. So I think that the next game, they should just play for scaling if this is the way that they want to take it versus Bad Boom. Because Bad Boom played very well, but they played the way that you would expect this team to mm -hmm. play, right? They played for the late game, they played for farming, they played for the big initiations from Pure, and that's what happened. Yeah, and before the series started, we pointed out how important the mid lane was going to be. And that's why we have got our mid lane for our Ace of Predator player versus player purge. Ryle versus GPK, the Zeus versus the Storm. I think this is the, the story of the game a little bit. It made a lot of sense to pick Zeus here against the Terra Blade. You need some burst damage to, to pick up those kills in crucial moments. And his hero damage was great. Zeus ulti really racks up the numbers. And his KDA was good too. He played the hero well. But one of the things we mentioned before it got picked was like, we they needed some other way to jump and initiate. So it's like they, they said, okay, well, we'll have a TV solution. But as a result of that, they lacked initiation. Um, and so that, that kind of proved a problem. Whereas on the other side, GPK had a basically flawless game. He played uh, Storm immaculately with uh, Disables. He adapted to new items. He was not afraid to jump the enemy lineup to kill supports, things like that. His impact was so more visually obvious than what Zeus was doing. Yeah, and GPK's target priority this game was incredibly good. He was going on the correct targets. He got some clutch silences on the right heroes. And then later on when he got his Agnums, he was just a secondary initiation for his team, something that could set up for, or a primary one, or something that could set up for a better RP coming out of Magnus. So, textbook performance coming out of GPK. Yeah, like he's the one that goes in first every fight. He ends the game with one death. It tells me enough about the game. Yeah, and we saw, speaking of, of low amount of death, we saw during the draft, Phoenix was countered by Abaddon, was countered by Snapfire, and Sage only died uh, twice. Uh, sorry, Toronto Tokyo only died twice. Yeah. He had a great game. He played really, really good. Yeah. Uh, great sun rays. There was a lot of moments where he, I mean, part of it's because of his initiators being so good that both Pure and uh, GPK were willing to jump in. That allows him to play yeah. behind them and just slam the sun rays down. And it's also the lack of team fight coming out of the uh, Tundra side and the lack of initiation. This all just makes that backline hero so much safer to play. So when you have an amazing player playing that with a draft advantage in terms of initiations, he just gets to back up his squad and makes them live and makes him live too. Yeah, we had a, a, a few buffs on the Willow here and there. Uh, I, well, a tiny buff that, that the max damage was is reached earlier in the Shadow Realm, uh, even though Shadow Realm is a little bit shorter. But Effie, is, are we looking at another patch where Willow is going to be played as a position one, or is that is that off the question? Because it felt like Save thought that he was playing position one at times. I mean, if you're playing for the late game and you're playing to scale and you have a Willow on your team, it makes it's just the natural uh, progression of the hero to go Midas into Agnes into that Sniper Willow build. But that doesn't take away from the impact that he had in the early game. I thought he played the laning stage very well and he did his job. Everyone on Boom did their job, really. Um, I don't want to keep picking on Tundra here, but I, something weird happened that game where nobody did anything for 10 minutes and yeah. you really not want to do anything versus a team with Magnus and Empowers and Midas's and... I think like 
I'm they, sure they're thinking about it. I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure they're talking about they it right now. They so must know right now that like this is the problem too. So I think going into the next game, you just want to make it easier. Yep. So if they also think that this is the main problem, then let's make it easier. Let's you know pick heroes that want to naturally play more aggressive. Maybe pick a Grimstroke. You're literally forced to go link up with someone, ink swell their ass, and like try to get in there and make something happen. Because I fully agree with Effie. They probably feel it too. So next game around, they need to change it. That's uh, something that Saved did immaculately. He did that smoke with Storm. They run to the enemy side yep. of the map, put the ward down, and he's just like, "Hey, Bedlam on my Storm. Go bomb that." Go bomb that Zeus when they find him. Like that's just an easy two-man rotation that sets tempo for their team, slows yep. the storm's advantage, and you know it was part of the reason that Tundra plays a little bit slower. There's yeah. a, a lot of eyes uh, on the draft here for game number two to see if Tundra can push it back, or maybe Bedboom will have it all figured out in game number two. We'll have to wait and find out. We're gonna be back real soon with game number two of Bedboom versus Tundra. Ready for the second game in this best of three elimination series here at ESL One Kuala Lumpur 2023. We got Tundra 
and Bet Boom. Tournament lives on the line, especially for Tundra, who is one game down now. And Bet Boom was eager to show that they have what it takes to move forward to play tomorrow against G2 IG as the first series of the day. Tundra, though, they have definitely got their work cut off from. They need something more, and it all starts with the draft that we have coming our way in just a moment. I'm joined by Purge, by Kezu, by Effie. And we did say, Kezu, it's the draft where things need to change first. We want easy to draft things, straightforward initiation there. We need some disables, some damage. Mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. do you want the, to see the draft go? Because we know that Tundra opened up with the Lion previous game, which was supposed to be really good. I mean, I think the problem is not necessarily in how they opened, but maybe like how they shaped up after. I think it's a lot of counter picking, which as first pick, I don't think you necessarily need to counter pick all the time. You want to pick heroes to keep yourself steady because they will counter pick you later. So if you're counter picking and then, you know, they keep doing the same, your lineup can fall a little flat. So yeah. I don't think they need to change too much in the start. Change it more in the middle and keep it aggressive. Yeah, I mean, I harped on them a lot in the post game for game one, but I think that their draft was just very hard to pull off and they don't have to put themselves in that kind of position. What I would like for them to do is focus very heavily on Tomato and maybe getting him a good core-to-core -core matchup versus Nightfall. And if they want to play for the late game, I think Tundra are one of the better teams at doing so. They just have to set up Tomato for success in his hero pick. So that's what I'm hoping to see in this game too. Do we feel at the moment, Purge, I mean, maybe it's too early to tell with the patch only up of this morning, but do we feel like there is an advantage in terms of size uh, side? Like Radiant Dire, because I know that, I it's, mean, obviously it makes it different for the Roshan, but at the moment that seems flipped, so. It, it's gotta still be Radiant. I mean, they did some mitigating things, obviously. The the uh, the Rosh uh, spawn stuff for Radiant Dire is a bit different. The auras that the creeps get is probably more neutral now. For example, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the Radiant south side of the map, the creeps got mana regen, woo! But on the top side <laughs> of the map, they got HP regen, so farming there, yeah. that was actually slower. So there's small little changes that are gonna adjust the Radiant Dire win rate for sure. Well, Tundra right now is gonna be Radiant's second pick with Bad Boom being first pick Dire. And if indeed Radiant is the way to go, then Tundra's got a little bit of a leg up there as we have an opening pick from Slardar. Monkey King getting picked up there as well. A very flex hero that we know Tomato plays, but he also plays basically everything else under the sun. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see where it's going. We saw Slardar earlier, Kezu. Slardar still looking very strong. Yeah, this hero looks like he's just gonna pop off in most games. We did see him struggle, it was once or twice, but that is when he was heavily counterpicked. It was some troll CM or troll Venu lane. So I like that Tundra are, you know, instantly addressing. There's a slaughter, let's take a good lane matchup if, you know, you choose to lane it against it. If it goes mid, maybe I go mid. So for now, the start of the draft, I like it. Yeah, and uh, I think that this Monkey King versus Slardar is one of the better matchups that you can have versus Slardar. And I, I love what Liquid have been running with it. They've been pairing it with a Lich for the armor and just running down this yeah. Slardar. So I would like to see Tundra do something like that. An alternative approach would be to pick CM, who got buffed in the mini patch, and still try to run down Slardar with the Monkey King. But pick heroes that fight into this lane and punish this first pick Slardar. Yeah, I like it. It's uh, the, the opposite of what they did in, the, well, they did do a lot of counter picking last game, I suppose, but I felt like they were a little bit on the back foot in some senses because they were eventually forced to do line as a five. So uh, for the start so far, this just feels a lot stronger. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fully with Effie on this. I think Monkey Lich, we've seen it before. You can do it again. It fits perfectly because there's just some of these heroes where, yeah, now I have Monkey King against Slaughter. It's not enough. You need to double down. The, both of the heroes need to be good against it in the lane, so I would be very happy if they, you know, would continue to go down the route, and then you just take it from there. It's pretty chill. I'm actually curious what kind of heroes that Tundra can pick for Kusane in this game, because I feel like his zoo heroes got a little bit nerfed just by nature of the Helm of the Overlord getting mm -hmm. nerfed, and the Slardar was taken away, and there are some other things that Kasane played, but Lone Druid banned out. Yep. Lycan, like we mentioned, Helm of Overlord, not as good anymore. Wraith King also nerfed in the patch. Mm. And Kunkka, which they played a lot and flexed to Kasane on the offlane, got his Foreign Storm nerfed. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit hard. I still think you want... Like when I see Slaughter and I have Monkey King, who's like a tempo carry, I want to help my bro have a good game. I would want to play a hero like potentially Visage or maybe still like it and just go like some Solar Crest, AC, Vlads, like pump up my team with armor, make it hard for the Slaughter. So even though it's worse, I think you mm -hmm. probably still have to go for it. You talk about armor, but what about Underlord? I feel like Underlord's kind of been a forgotten mm -hmm. hero. He's something that can build armor and potentially buff up his carry. 
anything that will make the monkey games easier and maybe has the choice of building auras, I would be a fan of. I mean, you already have Lich who will do some of it, but all these Lunas, Monkey Kings, Juggernauts, they thrive so much more when you give them like this added buff of some, whether it's drums or Bloodlust, Empower, AC. So any of this, I would be a huge fan of. The auras are nice, but I, the one thing about Underlord that I feel is lacking a bit is his impact on ganks. Obviously, you can zip across the map, so you're contributing, but your contribution once you get there is kind of mediocre at times. So I, and I feel like the Firestorm is obviously a great skill and all, but it just feels like it's actually wild that it's a percentage-based damage AoE nuke, and it was not popular in the last patch in the sense that everyone had tons of HP. So there must be some issues there with Underlord and his viability. And yeah, that's a good point. I feel like you can correct it through a secondary initiator from mm -hmm. the mid lane, potentially something like an Earth Spirit or an Earth Shaker. It's uh, just a, it's a type of hero where you need a player to make it work, I think. Like, even until this tournament, like, people are like, no, Mars so bad, Mars so bad, but you see Amar, he pops off, and suddenly, you know, other people, they start believing. You know, sometimes you just need to, you need to see it first. And I thought it was buffed. So why haven't we seen it today yet? I don't know. We need to ask the players. Yeah. Well, we're on game... Four, four, four of the day, so there's still, <laughs> Ma, yes. still Give him some more days, time. <laughs> a few more days left to see what people Dude. pick up here. But I love this Tusk. I thought this hero was so great during the group stages. It's so versatile. When you pair it up with a Slardar, you have so much physical damage output, and it makes taking these Roshans a lot easier. This Gyrocopter, I'm kind of lukewarm on. I think it's a good support to carry flex, and the magic damage build got a lot more viable in the past couple of months, but I don't have any strong opinions on Gyro yet. I'm excited to see his new ulti. I didn't test yeah. it out myself. I think he shoot three rockets in a row, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, might be better as a support, actually, than, a, than the previous call down. Uh, but, oh, and there's the hero that we were wondering about earlier, the tiny. Yeah, but I guess it will not be played as a carry, or at least I don't really see the idea of why. So they're going to go with the tiny Razor, which, I mean, for now, they have a lot of flex, which is good for Tundra, right? The Razor can go any of the lanes. Monkey King can go most of the lanes, too. If Razor goes offline, you can pair it with the tiny. But I think to go back with the Gyro, I kind of like Gyro in this game. The magic damage is pretty nice against the Lich Shield and everything. But the one thing I also like about the Tusk, like an additional thing, is Bed Boom love their scaling. And I think the later this game goes, if it is a Monkey King plus one, he gets destroyed by Tusk in the late game, even if it's a plus four. You just Walrus kick him out of his goddamn arena, and now what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Winter Ranger a bit interesting. Uh, Javelin is cheaper now. Uh, the gold per damage ratio is better, actually, despite it doing less damage. So you could potentially do some cool item build stuff. Plus, there's so many like new int right-click type items that got added in the patch this morning that we might see some some interesting mm -hmm. stuff coming from the Wind Ranger. I really like this Wind Ranger pick, actually. Yeah. Um, I think the flex is still open between position four Wind Ranger and position four Gyro, but I am leaning towards core Wind Ranger here. I think it's such a great hero versus Monkey King, who I believe should be played on the safe lane. Power shot can cut down the trees. You run yep. them down with focus fire and. Once you get a BKB, you're not really threatened by Monkey King, Lich, or Tiny as a means to counter-initiate whichever target that you go on. Also, this hero can be put versus anything, right? You can win, win, run away from the Razor. And like I yeah. mentioned, the flex is still open, and that's really valuable when you're in this position. I also love this Wind Ranger for all the reasons you mentioned. And so the enemy team, yeah, they're flexing. You know, they think they're cool. My Monkey King can go anywhere. My Razor can go anywhere. Neither of these heroes want to go mid against Wind Ranger. So you can kind of already be like, okay, it's very likely they'll pick a new mid that the Razor's maybe offline. Now you can craft a carry where Razor doesn't want to go. Like, all these type of mind games, and it's really good with tag team and amplified damage. So yep. Bad Boom, honestly, they have a, a really, really sick craft. It, it feels like you could take two of any of their four heroes and make a sick dual lane, yeah. which yeah. is really cool. I mean, like you said, the tag team, they can do like a long range homing missile into like a, a power shot for yeah. 450 damage. Like, there's a lot of really cool stuff they got. Oh, and speaking of Power Shot, it got changed, right? So in the last patch, they put a slow on Power Shot. So that makes it she's stronger on lane because you can hit the enemy with Power Shot, you slow them, you get a few more right-click hits on. It's uh, going to be a really interesting way to approach the hero. So it is a save Wind Ranger and a Nightfall Gyro. We it have could... seen Nightfall play Wind Ranger carry yeah. this event as well. They could even swap that around too, where the Wind Ranger is the one with a Tusk 5 and the Gyro goes 4. Any of these iterations, they're all great. They go back for the Storm Spirit, too, in the last pick. I do think they have a better means of catching the Storm than they did in the game one, where they were solely dependent on the Lion to catch Storm, because now they have this Spawnless Strike, they have this Inner Sear Gaze as a follow-up, and they have Tiny, who is going to have the instant Avatos combo in Storm. Yeah, and the Sinister Gaze does drain a little bit more mana, too. So if you can catch Storm with that, it could be really good. Uh, do, you, do you guys, are, do you, are you solidified on Tiny being a support here, or do you think like the core is still possible? Because the tree grab did get buffed, I believe. I think it's probably a four, because then the Monkey King should be your one. 
Um, I'm trying to debate what Tundra won this last pick here. I'm not having the easiest time to find a hero that really wows me on the spot. Like, there's some maybe DK mid, it's like, okay, but you s any hero will die this game. So you can't, like, pick this unkillable hero that will do everything. I do think your Razor can go mid and off and you're okay with both, both matchups. And Lena got nerfed. Yeah. That would have been a really great last pick for Tundra, but I just don't think the hero is why everyone is experimenting with it. Nice call on the DK, Kazu. I, like, so the thing is, like, it was in my mind, but it didn't wow me. So I think it's good. Maybe there was still something better. Um, I think it's good against the Storm in the game, and you have some, like, follow-up damage. The only thing is, if something doesn't go great, like, you want to play these games with DK where you go in and you can't really die, but you know, win range or win to get one, two items, or attack team on top of you, or minus armor as well, it, it's, it's not a free DK game by any means, but it's good. I love the way that Bad Boom, uh, sorry, lay in these drafts. They have pure offlane Wind Ranger with save on position 4 Tusk. They have position 5 Gyrocopter uh, with a position 1 Slardar. And I think this is actually the most brilliant way you can lane this, because the Wind Ranger Tusk lane can punish this Monkey King, right? And they go Monkey King Lich to lane into Slardar. They dodge that completely. Slardar should have no problem whatsoever laning against Razor because he has a sprint to naturally disengage from Link. Yep. So everything looks pretty good for Bad Boom. And we were all wrong about how they were going to put the heroes. I think that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Tundra was wondering too. And they also have a lot of magic damage from Gyro support, which mm -hmm. is a decent solution against the Razor 3. So they've got kill options too, if they go first. This time, you'll get more chaos. I'll, I'll, mean, put, I'll put my money on it. There's no <laughs> way with these 10 heroes, they're just going to sit back and do nothing. A famous last words. Uh, I do think that the, uh, the support Wind Ranger, he will be up against the Monkey King. So I feel like already Bedboom has stronger lanes. So they might this time be the ones bringing the aggression. Yes, they have very strong, very chaotic lanes, and I think they will definitely be looking to push their advantage. Yeah. On the other hand, for Tundra, I think that DK is a very important pick. If DK can be the hero that Tundra can play around, make the magic happen, maybe make some rotations, take some towers, take some map control, then Tundra may have an in into this game. All right. A lot of pressure on Brial from the mid lane as he will go up against GPK Storm once again. Let's see if he does a little better this time around. We're heading over to Odie Pixel and Cinerin. Thank you very much, Shiva. Yes, looking forward to this game two here between Tundra and Bet Boom. Cinderin, uh, what do you make of it this time around? If we saw the draft play out for Bet Boom, a little bit of uncertainty for, for who is going to be picking up what. Uh, ends up being this sort of formation where they're going to rally around the Nightfall carry Slardar. Yeah. You're saying to me, though, you don't look at the draft from Tundra and think, I want to play Slardar into this. This could be a difficult one for Slardar. Yeah, it's kind of ironic. We were talking about it backstage. I was looking in the first phase, like, okay, there's already Monkey King and Lich coming out. These are two of the hardest counters to Slardar that we've been seeing in the previous patch. But, yep. okay, you know, Bet Boom like to throw a curveball sometimes. Maybe this is going to be a support Slardar, and they're just kind of baiting picks out, and then they're going to salvage it somehow. But guess what? They're like, okay, this is a bad Slardar game, so we're making it the highest upgraded position we can. We're putting it on carry into Monkey King, Lich, and Razor will be his lane matchup, which is a little bit double-edged. I wouldn't say okay. that's strictly See, the, the, the lane itself, starter. right, has set up in a way that out of all the sort of different lanes that this Slardar could be playing into, the start of the game could be worse for him. I mean, if you're playing Core Slardar, I think his best lane in this game would have probably been mid, but you picked Storm, right? So you can't do that. Sure, yeah. Uh, the, the lane matchup against Dragonite was probably his best And one. you don't want to move but the Storm after GPK popped off oh, no, as no, much no, no, as he did no, last absolutely. game. You're like, GPK, you just give us a repeat of what you did in game one. Yeah, and it's a great Storm game. So, of course, like, I, I don't see a problem with it. The Dragonite is a bit of a pseudo solution, but it only goes so far when Storm gets items. The hero is exceptionally good against the Monkey King, which is the enemy carry. You have high mobility, you have a lot of heroes to really play around with your aggression. And like Kezu pointed out, both teams in this game are going to be looking to play super aggressive. Tons of yep. stuns, strong lanes, get in there and fight and brawl. We're not going to have a 3 and 6 score at 20 minutes. We'll see, we'll see. Because there was some expect expectation before the game one that game one was going to be a bit more brawly. It was. Yeah. Uh, True. But you'd say with a bit more certainty that this one, we're, yeah. we're going to see some more action early on. And I would also think there's a higher volatility in the laning stage itself. Last game we had. The Tundra side had very unkillable cores yep. with the Lifesteal and Abaddon in their side lanes. This time around, I think they're way more vulnerable. The Monkey King is susceptible to dying. The Razor is way more susceptible. And I honestly think for both teams, playing with the gate here is going to be really important because the okay. side lanes have so much potential with that extra added rotating hero in. And that's where the question is, we have this nerf now. The gate costs 75 mana both ways. So if you want to rotate and gank one side and then head back to your own lane, you're paying 150 mana for that. So you're losing a lot of potential once you head back down. So you know, I'm, I'm very curious to see if you can itemize around that by buying, you know, some extra mango or you're buying clarities to gate now or whatever, but 
You obviously can't just gate, lose all your mana, come back to lane and be like, hey, carry, I'm back. I have nothing for you, you know? So, you gotta, gotta play to your strengths. Yeah, we do, of course, have a pause at the moment, ladies and gentlemen, so apologies for that. Should hopefully be able to get the game started yeah, soon. why do you get a pause again, Owen? Why are you oh, pausing the game? Pastor, start the game. Pastor, yeah. start the game. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, one thing I want to ask as well when it comes to, to Tundra's lineup, last game you felt with their draft that they were maybe trying to do something that was uh, kind of embracing the patch, maybe a bit too much. Uh, do you think we're sort of seeing some, again, some sort of uh, experimentation here? Or to you, does this draft make more sense in the context of the meta as we've known it from the patch beforehand? I would say compared to previous, the way games were played yesterday, this is a bit more in line with what we saw other teams do in the meta. Um, I think this time you're not like first phasing a line and running a, an abandoned core, which was barely played. Uh, the biggest curveball here for me is probably the Tiny that they're running here on Immersion on position 4. One of his best heroes, uh, I think the hero is playable. I think it got changed a little bit this patch. I want to say it was mainly the tree grab that got improved. Um, yeah. It's hard to remember everything. The, the bonus base damage now scales up each level. Yeah. So Warren is saying is a flat 20, yeah. goes 20, 25, 30, 35. Uh, yeah, so for the support, it's kind of irrelevant, actually. Yeah. Early cooldown's a little, little, little less. True. Yeah, you're still three level one, so you have it more in the lane. That's fair. That's actually quite important. That yeah, 22 seconds bigger. down to 60. Yeah, and a lot of tiny position four skill tree grab level one. They use it to help CSing, to harass, and you're going to have more uptime on that. So that's actually a pretty significant change for the laning stage of four Tiny yeah. as well. I mean, and because Tiny also went the previous, there were some of the patches before, I right, also got some nice buffs. Like with the mana cost, right, on one of his spells got tuned I down quite a bit. You're right, yeah. So it's uh, slowly but steadily getting there. Yep. It would be a shame to have a whole year without Tiny, you know, this hero is a staple. More yeah. or less. It was this one here. Well, yeah, 7.340, 7. right? Avalanche level one is, is 90 mana instead of the flat 120. Yeah. Scales up to the 120 now with each level. And uh, speaking of mana, like we just talked about with Gates, perhaps that is a problem for this hero, actually, in this patch that the teams might have not even thought that much about. Tiny's base mana is terrible. And if his, you know, he uses both of his spells that cost, I think, 210 at this point, right? Uh, le both back yeah, to back. so level one, it or was 200. Level one, it starts at 200, and so then it's going up about 10 each spell each yeah. time. Yeah. So you're gating with a cost of, like, let's say, two to two, 200 to 220. You pay 75 for the gate. That's your entire mana pool. And you actually can't it, even gate back. Then you're stuck. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you so. sort of do? Is there something you build in that? Are you just kind of getting extra mangoes out? I think out? you have to buy mangoes if you want to make that move, right? Probably. Or somebody in the lane that you gank has to be able to help you out with a bit of regen or no. whatever you do. But yeah, interested it, to see that. I think that's going to be one of the biggest changes in the meta of Dota in the first few minutes. Is certain heroes that really like doing that in the first ten uh, will will want to do it instinctively, and then they get there, and then they actually can't do what they want. So probably going to take a little bit getting used to no. the players. And as you say, just the, the fact that if you you don't get anything with that twin gate play, it's going to be doubly as painful because you're going to return back to your own lane, and you're going to have nothing to play with. Well, at least uh, not, not unless you've got the consumables and the regen out to support such a move. A bad boom. After that last game, we saw how well they were able to hold things out. Is this another game where we could see Bet Boom supports going down the greedier route? Yeah, I think. Are we getting a, some more Midas's? I think that's a good thing to bring up because in the previous game we talked about okay, Bet Boom played quite slow and greedy, and Tundra didn't really. I think Tundra tried to make a couple of moves that weren't successful, and then the game eventually kind of became a farm fest for quite a while, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, the nature of both lineups, however, this time are different. So I don't think Betboom want to take the game in the same direction. No, because so you got kind of both teams are upping the pace here, right? I think strategy. so. Yeah. Yeah. Nightfall on a Slardar. It's going to be pretty different to a Nightfall on a Terra Blade. Yes, and it obviously goes to show that by first picking the Slardar and getting double counter pick for Betboom, there were different avenues you could have gone down, right? You could have tried to get a greedy carry that has a good match against Monkey King and try to play it slow again if you wanted, uh, but just valuing the overall strength of their lanes too much here and. Perhaps concerned that if we play on the greedier side with the, how Tundra have drafted this time around, we're going to get punished too much. So almost had their hand forced a little bit to go in this direction. I don't think when they picked Slaughter, it was initially, all right, we want to play Nightfall Slaughter. No, I think they, they picked it with a flex. This was an adjustment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, a lot of things to consider with how Hero is going to be played in this new patch. And whilst we do just have this um, momentary uh, technical pause, uh, we've actually got a bit of content to show you in which we were able to get some of the players' opinions on this patch drop. Uh, it's nothing new that Valve will pull a patch up in the middle of the tournament. I have lost tournaments because they have pulled patches in the middle of the tournament. Yeah, I guess it is unlucky. What are you going to do? <laughs> so, uh, you know, 
keep it real. I mean, it's a shit show and uh, I'm all for it. Uh, it's pretty obvious what they're changing too. Like I think some neutral items and some items and stuff. I think in terms of balance, it doesn't seem like they're balancing any heroes or anything. If they do end up changing heroes, that'll be a big deal. Uh, I doubt they will, honestly. Uh, I don't know, it's valid. <laughs> I mean, we'll see. But I don't think so. I don't think they're gonna release patch right in front of the playoffs. This hope is gonna be just for us to more fun to watch as a viewer, but not so fun for us because like everything's like new, you know. Honestly, at this point, just just drop it, you know. Like I feel like if it would be way more fun, but like also chaotic. I mean, I would be that surprised because I feel like they've done crazy stuff like that before. Like you just kind of have to adapt. But like my initial thought is that like what the hell? Like let's say Tormentor can't be soloed by some heroes because he has more armor. Or, like so minus armor is like good at doing rush. That will change a big a big part of the hero pool as well. So obviously there's some changes that could could have a big impact. Uh, good for me and for our team, no. Overall well for the game and like it's it's fun. Like I don't mind it. Like it's cool. It was just a, a bit challenging. At this point, I prefer if they would do it because if they already done that, they need to keep being consistent and still creating shit shows because that's the way the game works. That's the you know the core, the essence of it. You know at this point. Hello. The crowd, what an ironic piece that was! Fantastic. Hello, oh, how are you guys doing? So, uh, yeah, my oh, man, front row here. How are you enjoying the show so far? I uh, enjoy very much, bro. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Who do you think is gonna win this series? Tundra. Tundra. Okay, okay. My buff. Okay, any support for Tundra out there? Fun. Yes, Tundra fans, right over here. That was a big yeah. They can hear you right now. They're sitting there trying to get back into the game. Any words out there for Tundra? Uh, shout out to my boy Whitemore from Indonesia. Indo Pride, let's go Tundra. <laughs> Indo Pride, all right. Oh, we looked over, give a thumbs up. Good, 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 good. All right, how you feeling, sir? Uh, I'm feeling great. Okay, fantastic. What do you think about the series so far? Uh, very balanced, I like it. Bring uh, your toes, uh, walking on your toes with yes. your face. Balance, you say. The patch been out for like an hour, bro. What do you mean it's balanced? I'm talking, I'm talking. <laughs> oh, the game, the teams are balanced. Yeah, game is not balanced right now, guys. Be careful out there. Uh, you think we're going to go to a game three? Yes. Yes, the prediction. Okay, one guy clapped. Thank you very much, sir. He's excited. All right. Whoa. Oh, guys, guess what? I got some news. The game's ready. Let's get back to the caches, my friends. Let's get in there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stacks. Indeed, we've got game two ready to roll here, ladies and gentlemen, between Tundra and Bet Boom. So let's find out, indeed, if we are going to be able to get ourselves a game three in this best of three, or if perhaps Bet Boom are going to be able to send Tundra home. Let's see it. Already, the action here, smoke up from both sides. Uh, as you said, Cinder, and earlier, we should be expecting a lot of fighting this game. Both teams not afraid of entering into the early game fights. And I would say, if you look at these teams and how they play inside their regions in general, I think a big part of the success that Tundra did have playing in the NA region when they were playing there was, uh, it came a lot from, I would say, the way they challenged the other top teams of the region was very much through early aggression and a strong laning phase. So these guys are no strangers to having to play this way. That said, Betboom is an incredible aggression based team, which is ironic when you looked at the last game. I thought it was a bit uncharacteristic for how they usually play. But they're obviously showing some flexibility and showing some development on that front in terms of like patience and just overall stability. But when it comes down to it, I think if these players could choose, this is the kind of game they would want to play every game. You know, oh, like every sure. hero has like a pairing or two that they can play around with and find kills, strong aggressive stun lineups with a lot of fighting in lanes. And now it's just a matter of who gets off on the front foot because this is the type of game that has the potential to snowball really heavily for either team, really, right? If you get ahead in the lanes and you have all that potential, you get that extra item, you're just going to keep running at the enemy until you grind them to, to dust. So let's see if anyone can build that meaningful advantage. And obviously, laning stage this time is going to be so different from last time, right? We were talking about the invincible cores that Tundra were running, this time a bit more susceptible. I guess the least likely lane to have a kill on is probably the one we're looking at right now. I'm like, Dragon Knight versus Storm is likely to bring anything from it, but the side lanes are definitely where it's at. So, the bottom lane, Chipier, backed up by Save here against Tomato and White Mob. And up on top, Nightfall backed up by Toronto Tokyo against Immersion and Kasane. Let's see 
I think sort of main focus on just how good of a game Nightfall will be able to have on the Slada in this carry position. In terms of changes, worth mentioning that uh, all this hero received was some sort of slight nerfs here and there, nothing too crazy. And they were all crush based, right? I think they were all the yeah, nerfs so that the, he got Yeah, so the crush for... radius, the, the cooldown reduction, some of the talents related to it, and yeah. a little bit weaker. See how well uh, Toronto Tokyo's going to be able to create space for him down on this bottom uh, top lane. And it's the bottom lane, in fact, pure. Any heavy harassment here from White Mon and Tomato. Well, this first sort of round of spam that Tundra's been able to throw out. Pretty big detail off camera here. Nightfall was able to get two range creeps nice together with Toronto Tokyo. The way they manipulated this lane, essentially they got three melee creeps running into the Razor as well as the Tiny, and that's when Toronto went for the push with the Rocket Barrage and shoved them off. And as a result, Nightfall got to deny both range creeps and they got a pull. So this is actually a really, really big win for the safe lane matchup against the Razor. Um, I, I don't think it's particularly likely they find a kill until they're level 3, perhaps, but sure. you're definitely still not safe as the Razor here. Gyro hits the 2 here with Homing Missile up. If they line it up nicely with a Bash, maybe there's some potential. Yeah, it definitely feels like you could try and just overwhelm Kasani with the damage. Immersion will only have one defensive spell. Keep that in mind. Until he's level 3, he has to choose now between Toss and Avalanche. Bottom lane. Yeah. Save. He's gone. Tundra. I'm going to be able to secure themselves that first blood here, but... This constant spam here from the Lich proving to be, to be a bit too much for safe to withstand in that lane. Leaving Pure now on his own. Both off laners uh, at the moment. Off to a slower start when it comes to farm. Just six last hits between on, the, on each of them right now here. Yeah, I think the biggest surprise of those ones is probably the Razor. Okay, bottom lane again. Alright, Mon getting caught by the shards. At the same time up top, we're seeing the sort of try and go for a kill onto Immersion. This time, Revenge is had down bottom. Pure able to help take down White Mon. Top lane, Toronto Tokyo. Barely getting away here from the efforts of the two of them. See a bit of control attempted here around this pool camp. Trying to walk out the body block again. It. Yep. Had to do that. That was a really good sentry timing from Immersion. He opened the camp at 2.58. A good tip for you guys out there, if you're looking to unblock camps, try to do it around that minute mark so you make it very difficult for the enemy team to react in time. But Toronto was on top of it here, being ready to body block with that opening. And as a result, that camp will be blocked and he will be able to pull the small camp once again. That should push the wave into tower for Nightfall, which he's very happy with. What you want as the slaughter against Razor is to not get the wave down to the Razor's tower so you can start walking the dog. Um, you want to be in your little house. Avalanche toss. Okay, pretty good combo on Toronto good here. Setup. They've got the static thing going, but he's under the tower. He's fine. Nightfall's going to head in and keep Kasani and Emerson held back away from Toronto Tokyo. Trying to trade into them as well, but has to respect the fact that Kasani's built up a fair bit of damage there with the Lynx and Nightfalls. Don't pull back. We've seen this uh, Max Crush build rise to prominence recently, but Nightfall is going for the more traditional 0 1 2 build here with two points up in the bash. I think many of the offlane players we've seen have gone 0 2 1. Uh, and even maxed out the crush Save. to 1-4-1. One, yeah. He's going to make the that move They've got the three of them ready to try and punish the fact that Kasani and Immersion are both sitting relatively low. Missile in, heading over towards Kasani. It should be enough to take him down. Nightfall with the final bat. Shards are up. They block off the escape from Immersion. They've been blood grenaded. They're diving into the tower. Crushes back up. Bet boom. With that move from Save, will secure both the kills. Yeah, we're seeing exactly what we were talking about in the pregame, right? This is a game where there's so much volatility from playing the gate. And we're also seeing the other thing we talked about. Well, now Save doesn't have mana. So he's kind of just stuck up here, and he's starting to walk down. I think under normal circumstances, he would probably gate back bottom and joined his Wind Ranger, but he can pop his stick and then take the gate, and then he's just there doing nothing. So I think he might actually just take this bounty and go back to base and TP bottom, maybe? Or is he going to make the walk and then send some region out? Let's see, he does have something on the courier, I believe. Yeah, he's got clarity in mana. Yeah, so there we go. Boots. Yeah, has to buy that yeah. extra mana that he ends up losing from doing the gate play, but still well worth it, of course. Yeah, sitting pretty low here as he steps quite far up the lane. They put the bound list into the pullback of the, and the jump off in the spring. A little risky of a, a position there for Pure to be playing in. Was sitting rather low and stepped up. Nothing comes for free here. I, it's, it's just such a terrifying lane to play against if you're alone. Uh, there's basically no hero that will do Radiant well against Lich Monkey King on their own. There's so much chasing potential, so much slow, so much damage. You can't TP out from the slows because each of the heroes have a stun. Part 1 has a fear, but the essence of it is the same. Yeah, Pure has opted to go for 2 in the power shot. I thought maybe he was going to go 2 in Windrun, actually, just because you really need to try to have some way of creating distance. 
I think he's going to go 0 2 2 now, and maybe even 3 in the wind run at level 5, just because, yeah, it's, it's the way you stabilize the bot lane. I think aiming to play offensively by skilling Shackle Shot here is not going to bring much with it. Whitemon, caught on the rune. So once again, really safe, making these moves from top over towards the mid, ensuring that that boom's core starts to have a good time. Of course, as we saw, pure paying the price as he was left on his own. A save, definitely making up for it, you know, for his absence down bottom with the impact that he's having in the other lanes. I think Save's play so far in this game has been... I didn't really see how he died the first time bottom, but you kind of have to make some sort of space for the Wind Ranger in the lane, so maybe it was necessary, but his rotations have been pretty much perfect. Just massive impact out of the Tusk so far. Same can't really be said for the Tiny. He's been more static up top, yet to find an assist. Um, obviously also hard for him to gank anywhere. You're playing a Dragon Knight mid without Dragon Tail. You're not going to rotate there on Tiny and look for a kill there. And if you take the gate, as we've talked about earlier, Tiny's mana pool is pretty bad, so going for that commitment, there has to be something that's worth it. And the lane didn't need help, right? If he leaves top to go bottom, he's probably sacrificing his Razor for, for what, right? The bottom lane's already going well for Tundra. Immersion. Will grab his own Wisdom Room, but Toronto Tokyo and save there. Gonna see if they can take him out. Backup comes in though. Tomato's in with a two-man boundless strike. Toronto Tokyo is a couple of hits have been taken down. Tomato, one more to do it. He'll finish off the job. And Steve, he's got to run. Immersion and Kasani hot on the chase. The plasma fills up. They'll slow him down. Bet Boom there with a failed attempt to take that Wisdom Rune away from Tundra. They don't get the rune and they lose two heroes for the efforts. Yeah, nice rotation there from Tomato. I think it's key there that he gets two kills. Oh, well, he got one of them himself, I believe, but just that both heroes get killed off. If he only gets a kill on a support, that rotation is hardly worth it, but getting both of them there, very good. Ooh. However, I mean, he tries Nightfall. to go here for the gate, but indeed Nightfall's waiting for him as well at Toronto Tokyo. He's trying to get the off, but the bash is back up. Tomato, he'll get taken out. He tries to get the, you know, back towards the bottom lane, but ends up getting sent back to base. Great read from Nightfall to be camping up there, waiting for the Monkey King. See over in the mid, bro. They chase GPK a bit, but GPK still got enough mana in case Brawl just continues to push forward. The second round of the Dragon Form, though, you can see already a lot of good pressure from Brawl. This He's actually already is going to be this tier one tower. Yeah, eight minutes in, second usage really of the Elder Dragon Form. That's a very early tower to be taking. Yeah, they also grabbed the Power Rune. It will be taken by Immersion, not the Dragon Knight, so potential gank here coming up. Two points in Avalanche, could rotate down to bottom. It's a really good hero against Wind Ranger when you do get up close. We'll save in Toronto Tokyo, they are on the hunt. They'll find Whitemon, power shot on mark here as Whitemon taken out here by the setup for the two supports. And Tomato setting up in the trees. I see GPK, he's gonna jump across. Tomato, he's able to get off the ult though. Final spring, and just throw the power strike right down on the two of them. Save's gonna get caught out. Tundra, they're holding their own here around the tier one. And GPK, he's completely out of mana. He's trying to ball up, but the damage is done. Primal Spring from Tomato slows him up. They'll get GPK as well as Tundra set up for Bet Boom's attempt. Great response. That was just such a huge rotation from both teams, right? Bet Boom make the first move before the Invis Tiny comes down, but this just transpires into a large fight where yeah. bringing the numbers. I think it was super well, close as well. I think GPK was very close to cutting the tree that Tomato was on when he Yeah, through. exactly. If he would have cut yep. the right tree with the zip, this is a totally different story because Wukong's command going off is the reason mm -hmm. that Tundra even have a fight in them there. Otherwise, the Monkey King would have just been burst down straight away, probably. Or we're looking at a completely different outcome, so... Right. It's millimeters. She's top lane. Tomato tried to pick up some farm, but he's turned up the lane that once again, Nightfall is more than happy to see him appear in a couple of times now where Tomato's tried to get some farm or make some sort of move on that top half, and both times Nightfall has shut him down. And as we have established prior to the start of the game, this is a game where Slardar should be struggling in theory based on matchups, so being 3-0 and zero and having this type of a game instrumental to finding impact later on. GPK? On, probably not surviving this one, unless... I mean, GPK is no. having to use quite a lot for it. We'll get the kill, and with the backup of Toronto Tokyo and enough mana in the bottle, he'll, he'll get away with it. Slardar is taking the tower minute 10. That is... He's getting a lot up in. Very now. unusual. Opts to go for the Midas. So he's going Midas into the new Echo Saber that uses Void Stone, so he'll get that mana region flying out. And uh, the full-on commitment to the Bash of the Deep build as well, right? He's maxing it out. This is the faster, I would say, if you're flat out just AFK farming, this is the faster build. Tomato was very scared of them making a move there. He actually just lays down the ult to sort of deter them from chasing him for more. Will work in the sense that Bet Boom back off. 
Tomato, yeah, full defensive right now. It's been a couple of times that he's been picked off on this top part of the map. He can't really afford for it to happen again. It's further Midas is here, Brian. He's also got his picked up. And so far, so good with the pressure that they've been able to apply around this Dragon Knight. Two tier ones already taken by Tundra. Mainly off the back of the Elder Dragon form pushes. See like what? Cure is going to go for a Maelstrom here. Oh. Pretty standard. Obviously, it gives Wind Ranger the possibility of really killing Monkey King, even during the ring, if you have good positioning. Get that max win run up and running and stay focus fired with the Maelstrom procs. A little bit of backup from your Storm, and you've probably got yourself arrested for a kill. Smoke now. Looking for an opportunity. They, this is the one tower they want to defend, apparently. So this one, they're not going to let Ryle go for. But he recognizes what's going on very early. I think understandable as well. You know, we've seen how strong Nightfall actually has ended up being at this point in the game because of the free farm that he's had. It's yeah. not a bad idea to try and connect with your Slada to defend that tier one. But as it is, the push, it's not going to come in from Tundra there. And, and Bet Boom know it. They're swinging around over towards the mid area of the map. Ryle, feeling strong with the haste rune, able to step up and get the D ward. See Bet Boom considering getting some sort of wraparound here from a, a bit of a different angle. But hard to do so. They don't really want to dive forward for Grile. Not really finding the initial connection that they'd hoped for there, Bet Boom. It's Tundra. Playing nice and defensive. White Mon has hit the six, so we'll have the chance to throw out a chain frost if Bet Boom go diving for him on the bottom lane, which is the place that Bet Boom will continue to hang around, around pure here. As the push begins here towards the tower. Tundra, they're looking to connect and, and take this fight. Smoke comes in from both Immersion and Brile. They're too late, I think. The tower's going to go. We'll see if Tundra still want to take a fight after losing it. Kasani having a bit of a poke. But boom. They themselves not going to, to take this as, as any sort of way of going in on the, the fight. They know that that sort of play from Kasani, that backup is inbound. And they won't look to take this with the, the number disadvantage. In fact, they'll try and capitalize on the fact that potentially Tomato, they might find him on his own on this top lane. So that's going to be the case. Similar to last game, Kasane is going for the Solar Crest. Hit that on the bat, and he will now do it on the Razor. This item has obviously been reworked. Stupendous. He's now completing it up here. So it builds from Pavis and gives a barrier. And you can't use it offensively, right? I believe that is correct. You don't want to give the enemy barrier. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's ever <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of some really weird edge case where that well, would be a would. good thing, but I <laughs> cannot there is think not. of one. <laughs> well, Toronto, Tokyo. He's going to get caught here. Now for everything out. White Mon just wants some dead. Throws out a chain cross. Get a bit of value farming here, but the ancient stack pretty much getting cleared. Bet boom, Bill. Maybe try and take this fight. They're TPing over. They know that the Chain Frost has been thrown out, so no threat here from the Lich with regards to the ultimate. GPK will jump straight forward for Kasane. He can burst through this Razor. He'll get the coverage of Immersion with the Avalanche. Toss back as well. Immersion trying to do his best to save Kasane. But Pure, he's already found White on Nightfall will finish Immersion. Can they chase for Kasane as well? GPK using all of his mana to try and close in. Pure is able to close up over towards the Razor. Another power shot. Is there anything else coming in to help Kasani? There isn't. There's no tower. There's no TP potential there from the rest of the team. Kasani left on his own. They'll lose the three of them. Bet Boom choosing the perfect time there to, to fight back against Tundra. As Tundra they did go pretty deep. And as a safe, threw a lot down to just kill off Toronto Tokyo on the gyro. As soon as Toronto Tokyo is back in action on top, I mean, Tomato's trying to go for him. He's apparently quite hard to take down this gyrocopter. Toronto Tokyo is able to drop the ult. Step back, Ryle will blink in. That should finish off Toronto Tokyo, who was not expecting the Dragon to appear in those final moments, so he will finally die. Ryle now able to put some pressure onto this tier one tower top as well. Yeah, I believe this was, was that an Arcane Rune Dragon form? It was, yeah, it was, it was popped so, during the end of it. Yeah, gonna have it again relatively soon. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that can happen that can really backfire when you try to go for a rune steal like that. So obviously Tundra, okay, maybe we'll never have time to talk about it. I mean, they're going to try and go again. for Shani, but he's a tanky hero here on the Razor, and he's able to turn. Pure's going to die for this effort, and so it's Dave. This time round, maybe overestimating how much they could do to Kasani. Is, even without the other two heroes showing up, they weren't really close to threatening this Razor's life. He is super tanky with Solar Crest. Solar Crest treads wand. I, it's such a long kill. I'm actually kind of surprised they went for it, like you said. It wasn't even close, so... 
get punished, as they should in that situation. Uh, yeah, what I was saying about the Wisdom Rune fight before, when you're invading the enemy Wisdom Rune, you should expect them to show up in spades, right? When you start showing that intent, t heroes are going to TP over. I think it was really crucial for Tundra's loss there that they didn't have Tomato connecting. Oh, Tomato, talking about Tomato as well. He steps out into the river. He'll try and get the ult laid down. Will succeed in doing so, but the missile comes flying through. Nothing to be done to keep him alive. Ryle, he'll catch up Toronto Tokyo on the river. GPK opting for the TP out. And he'll make it away before anyone finds him. They'll get the kill, they'll take out Tomato, they only lose Toronto Tokyo on the support gyro for it. Bet Boom continuing to have the favorable trade there. They could somehow have got vision there on the storm. That would have been a disaster for Bet Boom, but end up getting away with it, I guess I should say. Yeah, I mean the one for one trade is really good for them. They killed the enemy carry and lost their five. So. Uh, GPK going a different build this game. No Orchid, doesn't feel like it's worth it. He's going the Kai Assange, really wants the status resist against these tons of stuns to try to mitigate the risk of being jumped. Could easily see this potentially being a Lincoln's game as well. You are playing against that Dragon Tail. Or maybe you do need the BKB, because there's too much. Let's see what he ends up choosing. He hasn't shift you or quick. So Tundra, but that was at anything. So for the jump on save here towards the end of the smoke. Get a quick pick on the mid. Tomato's able to get involved. More money for him to help him towards that Desolator. I wonder if what Tundra are doing in this game is going to become like popular, running multiple solar crests, right? They're running one of the Razor. The Lich is building one as well. So they're opting for this over other items that would traditionally be really good against the heroes. I think this is just a... Okay, actually, they were going to try for that one, but... Okay, we'll get away in time. Um, you know, whenever you buy solar crest on a support, you're buying it at the expense of Glimmer Cable Force Staff, if you think of it that way. Or, you know, whatever other item Midas, if you really want to go that route. I guess they're really valuing the barriers against this heavy single target damage that Slugger has to offer, but... I don't know. Feels like a good Force Staff game to me. Oh, again in the mid. Hey, well, I think it's sort of been the third Chain Frost with oh Team White Mock throw down onto Toronto Tokyo, and uh, each time it certainly worked out. Another pick-off here, uh, in which Tomato is able to join up and get a bit of a gold bounty and an uh, XP with that pick-off. Do you like the new cooldown? I see pretty. I mean, he's, he's using it very easily, like to just what clear waves, push forward. I mean, ultimately, what what does sort of the changes mean for it? It means that, like, let's say you missile someone and they're running away from the missile, and then you call down. They now have to either run into the missile or run through multiple cooldowns back to back, right? If they're taking that path. I actually think the new cooldown might be really, really powerful with specific combinations where you forcefully displace enemy heroes or have a way of yeah, just how to say making their only path to run straight, ba straight back, right? Like, if you can block them off on the side, so you either run along the path of the cooldown or you just die, I think there's definitely something there, Brilliant potentially. <laughs> this used to be a high-level talent. Yep. He's going to be able to get the instant shank of Sean to wipe on. They'll snowball over towards Bryal. They've got the bashes and Nightfall pops the BKB to make sure he can completely commit in on towards the DK and look for more now as they go into the river, chase down Kasane. Bet Boom hitting very, very hard at and a point where you know, Nightfall's getting involved. It's continuing to have a flawless game. 4 0 5 on the carry Slardar and not afraid to fight now. Disassembled his Echo Saber to get the BKB timing for this play, and it pays off big time. It's always fun with these like hero dynamics of plus armor versus minus armor when you discuss like who's really favored, right? Because you could say Dragonite's one of the better heroes against Lara because he's pretty tanky. But well, your hero's generally reliant on being tanky, so when you mitigate that, like who's really countering who here, right? Yeah, he's just gone in a Ryle couple of just so quickly in this instance. Kasani as well. Yep. It's a lot of damage coming out from this slaughter. I wonder if these barriers are going to come back to bite them. I mean, it also gives armor, right? So it's not like the Solar Crest is bad, but in these situations, if you're caught, are the barriers really going to save you versus Force Staff, like where you can re reposition your heroes to get away? Just going to see how it develops here. So Minus Armor, speaking of, Tomato will get a Desolator, obviously on the opposing side here, but big DPS increase for him as well as his other two cores who do significant physical damage. I like him going this route, this game. Still difficult for, for him to turn up to fight. BKB queued up next, but it's going to take quite some time to get there. As we've seen, even in this sort of game, when the BKB is done, there's still absolutely ways that Bet Boom can threaten the cause of Tundra. It's not an easy yeah. game for Tundra to itemize. I think if you BKB and then you get Slaughter ultied and Wind Ranger ulted, and they're still tag team, like, you're probably still in trouble, honestly. So. Um, yeah, not easy indeed. 
GPK, we talked about what he's going to go next. He opted for the Witchblade, and he will not upgrade it yet. So he will not be getting the new axe that I already forgot again what's called. Parasma. I don't understand how you can remember that. Okay. Starnik, he's going to get jumped, but the backup's here. Tomato from the sidelines will be able to drop down the old and the boundless. Bet boom, they'll cut it out. They'll step out, chain frost, they're going to be able to split, save, falling low. Jackpack's <laughs> there. He's also sort of trapped in his own shards. But it doesn't matter. He's still able to live through this. They weren't quite able to finish him off. And now GPK will zip straight over towards Immersion Tundra. They have to run. White Mon's able to hide in the trees and TP out. He'll make it away from this, but we're seeing absolutely how strong Bet Boom are at this point in these fights. You, know, you mentioned it, the sort of snowball potential for one of these teams if they do start to get ahead, but we're yep. seeing that now with its 5k lead. Bet Boom's able to head into the Roshan. It, it's getting to the point where fighting back against Bet Boom in a 5v5, it, it's going to become increasingly more and more difficult. One of the absolute biggest upsides to playing Slardar as a carry here is obviously he can do a ton of the damage to the Roche himself. A lot of the time when you see Slardars go to Roche, they'll offer a Corrosive Haze as an offlaner, maybe not have that much in the tank, but he's really high level. He's got high attack speed, Orb of Destruction, um, and obviously is building to kill single targets in his itemization and has more net worth than an offlane Slardar usually would. So it's going to be a pretty quick Roche kill despite not even using Focus Fire on it. He still took that down very easily. And Nightfall is now opting for either Dagger or Axe. Queuing up both items for now. Curious to see what the verdict is going to be. You could make a case for not buying the Dagger at all, as a matter of Oh my oh, god, that oh, is oh, 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 oh. Okay, but well, it wouldn't be a Bet Boom game without a little bit of Tormentor fun. Uh, I mean, they got it. <laughs> it did cost them a couple of lives. The Tormentor got buffed this past. It did get buffed. What and were the buffs, Cinder, and tell me? So you can't give uh, it the low zero armor. Correct. And it has an aura. It does. That burns for DPS. And effectively, these heroes, this is, you know, good old muscle memory, I almost want to say. Of, we could have definitely done this yesterday. I wonder if we can do it today. And save is like, all right, guess I'll save myself. At least, yeah, at least he had his <laughs> snowball. You know, he was fine in that one. But uh, indeed, yeah, the new ability, the Shining, 30 damage per second on a 0.2 second interval. So six damage per tick. So and that I consistent damage DKB. adds up. Why is it always Bet Boom this happens? They're so funny to me. It's always them. Ugh. Well, they got it. They got it. And the shard it went, went to save, it did. so he will be able to... I mean, it's not the greatest, especially because his build is uh, only one in the shards. So obviously you would like to have more points. If you have four points in shards, you can actually clear full creep waves with this ability. Uh, but for now, won't be the case. A little bit of a technical pause here. They are reading the patch notes about why they died to the torment. They might be like, hold on, this is a bit stronger than last time. It's Bedroom, though, so yeah. they could be reading those patch notes every day, and they would still find a reason to die to the torment. It's just, it's part of the team's DNA. Every team has their Achilles heel. For Bedroom, it's not the opposition. It is the map that always is in their own. Smoke time here from Tundra. On the way towards the top. Uh, the one around that area was GPK, and he's out. Even this if is he a stuck around, he did still have his Aegis. That's a strong smoke from Bet Boom. Thunder are going to try to match them, but this is going to be all about who gets the initial vision. If you see the Monkey King first and you jump him, the fight's almost lost immediately. There's so much first damage coming out from Bet Boom in this play. The Sardar Dagger completed can easily connect on the move as well. Setting up some good... Offensive vision in the enemy triangle, which is actually going to see Tomato here. The enemy will go straight away from Toronto Tokyo, but the snowball save there. It'll go straight back towards Brava. He's tanky and they're turning. The battle strike comes in now to the turn, and Tomato is able to get the ult off in time. White one's being fully focused by GPK, and Pure is in with the BKB. He's able to bring down both White one and Tomato, and now looking over towards Brava, they'll finish off a four. As Bet Boom, more than happy to take these fights to Tundra. Unfortunately for themselves, walk in towards Kasani. Also in a whole world of pain, he's surrounded. It's going to be the team white triple kill for Pierre. Bet Boom's ability to fight right now, it's just too strong in comparison to what Tundra have. Ironically, in that situation, so Bet Boom plays this really good offensive ward at the enemy triangle, and it sees Tomato coming in from the left, but that's not where the fight starts. The fight starts in the river, but Pure picks up immediately on the fact that Monkey King needs to flank in from the left. He pops his DD, and he just runs him down and kills him solo. Like, Pure just flat out won that fight for his team, killing the enemy carry in a 1v1, as it kind of turned out to be, and... That was not a bad jump from Tundra by any means. They just couldn't bring Tomato into it. Immersion? All right, he will live. There's another... Frost Shield plus Solar Crest. There's quite a lot of defense. It's going to be quite concerning, though, for Tundra. 
They've not been able to make any real moves in this last 10 minutes. And once again, as in game one, they're falling behind a little bit faster this time. Down 10k behind Betboom. It's Betboom, they're only going to continue to scale. Save Midas on its way out. On a Tokyo. It jumped in the mid. Well, they'll have enough burst to bring him down. See if Betboom can punish this. Saves him with a shard trap. He's caught immersion. Nightfall assessing as the situation, looking for the best entry to get in on this. He'll go for White Mon first. Now he'll turn for immersion. Sure, they get Toronto Tokyo, but once again, it's just Bet Boom cleaning up these kills. Pure, they want to get both of those. So more money here for the Wind Ranger. BKBs are flying out. GPK's got his done. So he's got 45 seconds left on the Aegis, but with the BKB done on this storm now as well. How on earth are they going to get these core kills? It's, it's looking much, much more difficult now for Tundra as opposed to that point earlier where they were trying to make these smoke movements. At this stage, like, well, what is the plan for Tundra? Do you still try and look for these fights so you just got to avoid and hold back, wait for Tomato to get his build online? I mean, your, your lineup doesn't really have many other options, right? I guess you can maybe stall out until Tomato has BKB so you can at the very least have a better chance of standing his ground against the Wind Ranger. But the fact of the matter is, top three networks are on the enemy team, and we already saw in the previous fight what Pure could do to him, so... It is really hard. And on top of all of that, let's say you get your items, how do you open the fight? Who do you go on? No matter who you jump, they can get Blink Snowball saved, and they will be able to pop BKB when they come out of that, except if they're the Gyro. So, picking your poison is really the name of the game here. Finding a clean engagement, maybe you can do some sort of poke and prod. Maybe the absolute best play is a Blink Tossback. I honestly think that's the highest probability play you have if you blink toss back into a dragon tail but already that is quite execution heavy you need to be in the right place at the right time on two heroes you need to see the right target and then you need to pull it off Radiant yeah it's the options are definitely starting to fade because the, the other way to do it is to play the fights a bit slower right and try to poke and prod right just don't think your line of wins that type of fight against bed boom right you don't really have the best poking abilities bed boom if you start poking and show a hero here or there, they're just going to jump you and kill you, right? You don't have the same defensive capabilities. You've got Frost Shield and you've got these two Solar Crests, but Bed Boom will just redirect their focus to another hero. If you pop all of this stuff on the guy you jump, Storm can jump another guy, Wind Ranger can continue wind running, Star has Sprint and Dagger. We saw that in the River fight earlier where they initially went on yep. the Tiny and then he just readjusted. He's going to be sneaky here. Get vision of immersion now. Uh, he's quick with the blink, but safe. So he is as well. They'll jump in under the tier two. They're not afraid to dive for this as they'll get immersion. GP's coming in. I mean, Pure just pops the BKB. Looks to chase down Whitemon. Whitemon will get back up to the safety of the high ground. Pure, he's going to have to use the rest of his BKB to TP out, and he'll make it away from there. He's able to escape. See if Tundra can punish Betboom at all. Looking towards Nightfall, but Nightfall pops the BKB. If they got any way to control him, it doesn't look like they do. Nightfall's able to continue to retreat. Save. It's going to have Blink back up again in five seconds. Have they got any way to cancel it inside Plasma Field? It's not going to reach him. Save. He's going to be out as well. Bet Boom, they're able to go full retreat and, and make sure the Tundra, they get nothing from that, even with them committing with the buyback from Immersion. And that's two Wisdom Runes as well. This whole play from Bet Boom was tailored to get the Wisdom Rune. They get there in time. They did get Immersion the first time around, but they got him the second one. And this is, well, Curse. Maybe saving the rune for someone? No, he will take it himself now. Almost level 20. It's going to bring him up to probably the Focus Fire talent, so he can lay into Monkey King even harder. Tundra. I don't know if they want to be around here. They've got to get get out of here, but Nightfall. He's in with a two-man crush. The backup's in from Bedroom Pure. We'll get the triple shot down on the brow. Tomato looking for the ultimate here to lay down over the walls. Nightfall around the strike. Well, not going to quite catch on the Nightfall. Nightfall gets away to the side. So Katia chase him. Kastani is trying to finish Nightfall, but he's not able to do so. Nightfall's able to escape through the tree line. He'll get away. It's only safe going down as uh, just once again, Bet Boom with their cause just proving to be unkillable. They're just avoiding each of these attempts, even then when sort of the, the entire duration of the BKB, Kasani heads in, tries to stay on top of the Slada, he, he can't finish him off. I'm actually really surprised that Betboom even chose that fight. That was their choice. The Slada went in for a two-man crush, but he didn't have BKB ready, and Windrainer didn't have hers either. So they're kind of forcing a fight without having all their tools, and yep. that almost came back to bite them with a little bit cleaner execution there from Tundra. Maybe they find a pick on that Slada and build something out of it, but... Yeah, he does manage to disengage, maybe a bit too strong there with the Scepter. I think he did have that in this fight. So maybe he why he had the he confidence did. to go in. Obviously, you're way stronger in those pools, but still an unnecessary risk, really, there for Bet Boom. That could have gone wrong. They, they do salvage it, only losing save in the process, but... 
Yeah, it would probably be wiser to just chill and wait until you have your BKBs for every single engagement when they're on your terms. Keep that safety. Slardar is now, if you thought he was unkillable before, he's rocking a shield rune for the next 45 seconds. Will definitely make it even harder, and he will have the BKB this time. But actually, just flat out, just not a target right now. I don't think they can do it. Yeah, they're just doing an incredible amount of damage. Especially with the, uh, the Parasma now done on GPK. I love that one. Increased uh, that extra magical damage they're able to do. So he's able to reduce their existences by 20% with that right click. Stupendous. Tundra also smoked up. But how on earth do they find a way to catch Bet Boom by surprise every single time? Even when, as we just discussed, Bet Boom don't have their cooldowns available, Bet Boom are just getting away with it every single time. Very scary for Tundra to be making this move, but at the same time, they have to look for something. Yeah, Ryle with the... At the very least, he can keep pushing out this wave with Fireball, right? So he doesn't... They don't need to expose any hero to keep the push going. And get some position here, maybe. Okay. Nightfall will show. They're going to try and jump over the walls. Nightfall. Tomato comes in as well with the boundless, but the BKB's there. Nightfall's away. They'll turn their attention now towards Toronto, Tokyo. The tree coming in towards him. Kasani will chase him out. They'll kill off the gyrocopter. If Kasani can turn for more. Plasma Field comes out of the three of them. Look for Zay, but it's damage coming in from Pure. And he focus fires down Kasani. And now the buybacks are coming in from Bet Boom. They're happy to keep this fight going. GPK zips over towards White Mon. He'll get tossed up here. He's falling low on mana, but he's still got enough to close in on towards Immersion. Immersion getting right clicked down by Nightfall. Bryo, the last one left alive. He's desperately trying to find GPK, but the Shackle Shot lockdown's there from Pure. GPK can keep his distance. The Bash is come in. It's going to be another team wipe here for Bet Boom. GPK, I think, in that fight, full-on solo Tomato off-screen. He jumped him in the bottom left in the tree line and just killed him with that magic damage, or magic damage amplification or resistance reduction, I should say, from Parasma, just obliterating the enemy carry. And that didn't necessarily look like the worst initiation from Tundra, but again, it's just kind of awkward, right? You're jumping the Stardar, he pops his BKB, disengages, your, your BKB start running low, the enemy team gets as much info as you do. Over the course of the fight, just slowly but steadily whittling them down from multiple angles. The only real quick assassination there was the GPK kill, but that was the biggest one. If Tomato doesn't get to play the fight, you just don't have enough in the tank. 18k down now. <laughs> Tundra. Aegis on Storm. I mean, GPK can honestly kind of just do whatever he wants, right? He can jump someone completely recklessly, try to kill them. If they turn around and kill him the once, he can BKB his second life, and they have no way of stopping it. And they can't kill him once he BKBs, so essentially a completely just has a free pass into the next fight to give his team all the information in the world. And really, when you think about it, the only thing Betboom's lineup needs is vision. As long as they see something, they can just pick that target and let the fight develop, so... Shouldn't be too difficult for them. They have so many good ways of acquiring that vision. Windrunner can walk, run in with her Aghanim Scepter. You have Storm that can jump to give vision. You can shard. Slardar can just, as we saw in the previous fight, just bait. Kasane. Oh, he's thinking about on GPK there. But this is obviously a lot of heroes here, but... I think if Pure was in the neighborhood, they might have just jumped that. Uh, for sure, yeah. GPK has not got a lot that he's scared of right now. I think we ended up just dying the once last game. So far here, 7, 1 of 10. It's looking like he's on track for a, a bit of a repeat level of performance in terms of his KDA. And he's about to complete an item we haven't seen yet today, I believe, the Bloodstone. I don't think that was bought in the first series either. Um, Every coin helps. So this item has been changed this patch to get a new ability. That is the only item in the game that has, which I find to be quite random and interesting to say the least. So plus 75 AOE radius increase. And this should affect all of his items and all of his skills. So he will have more AOE on static remnant explosion, I guess? Yeah. And, and I think on, on the, the overload prong? I think so. On the ball light thing with? Sort of the other, yeah. I think and it's on him pretty much at all. If you get Axe on him as well for the vortex, the radius of that should probably be bigger too. So all of his abilities can synergize with this interesting to see if it ends up playing much of a role in some fight where we could definitely say with confidence the extra 75 AOE was what did it. But I mean, one thing with it, without a doubt, when he's got that done, the amount of mana in it, he's going to have... Oh, not again, Tomato. Tomato's been caught. He'll try and get the BKB and the Wukong's off, but Nightfall's in on top of him. There's not a chance or a hope here for Tomato as he is out for 60. 
This has been a really hard game for him. I mean, it's also fair to say, you obviously, there was the first pick from Tundra in response to the Slardar, so he will get counterpicked, but man, the way they set up the lanes and the way especially GPK has been playing around the map has made the life of Monk really, really difficult. I mean, and this whole sort of like pivot of the Slardar into the carry position, it's just looked fantastic, yeah, right? As you said in the draft, there's a lot of ways that other teams may have played this game with the Slardar in their lineup, and against what Tundra has, could have been punished. But the way that Pet Boom have done it, it it's been flawless. He's 8-0-15. I'm, I'm really impressed with Nightfall being deathless this game. I think it's one thing to have a good start, but he's just really converted it so well, not overstepping the boundaries. He's been close to the limit, to be fair. He's tested it a couple of times, but... GPK, I yeah. mean, just does insane amounts of damage now with how farmed he is, that build. Prasma really just amping up how much he does solo. Nobody is uh, safe to come out on the map on their own here for Tundra. They won't have any sort of chance. They've got to be grouped up. At the same time, in doing so, it's really hindering their, their chance of just being able to get the farm on their cores. It's Kasani and Tomato in particular continue to sort of pull behind. Only really Brow that's keeping up at some sort of level because of that Midas that is rocking. Stop. Nightfall. And then we're finding Tomato here. Going it back with the Harpoon. I mean, Tomato will get the BKB off, but it's not really going to do a whole lot for him as Tomato gone again. He just can't breathe. That pet boom just again, literally crushing him here with Nightfall's play. At this point, the matchup, it's, it's just not one that you want to be in as a Monkey King. This Slardar is enormous. And it's the fact that despite, you know, we talked about the Slaughter lane uh, matchup being good in lane, he has no good core matchup. He's not good against Storm, and he's definitely not good against Windranger either. So it's understandable Tomato's having a rough one because it's just a tough game for his hero to play. Betboom really excellently planned for this Monkey King to be a pivotal part of Tundra's lineup and just never let it come online. I think Tomato's had one good fight in this 37-minute brawl of a game. He's never really got oh, there. Yeah. And he's tried to go pretty, pretty aggressive. He's going to have the backup and stay with the snowball. He was able to hook the BKB and win run away. He's actually going to get away with it. He's going to be able to live. He turns with the shackle of the pouch over towards Kasani. Kasani puts the BKB. Yeah, caught by the first round of bashes. Doesn't matter though. Still able to separate himself and get back up to the high ground. Nightfall now out of mana. So if they can continue to control him, they've got the Dragon Tail stun. Jump forward here from Bradley. Wants to continue to chase on towards Nightfall. It'll be a huge kill if they can get it. But the shackles there from Pure. He holds back the efforts from Brawl. They'll turn and settle towards Toronto, Tokyo. Toronto, Tokyo, the Ogre Seal Totem will be able to live a little longer, but finally does fall. White one able to finish him with the blast. They will manage to get the two supports. I mean, the cores survive from Betboom. Uh, but definitely a situation there where I think Pure, you know, he sort of uh, <laughs> baited his supports into death. I was just going like, to say this. Come on. This is going to be like a mandatory part of, of <laughs> Bet Boom this series. Pure has to... He has to go just go for that play. I don't know if I would call I mean, that yeah, limit testing. I don't know if I would call that limit testing. I think he knew that was too bad. And he did it anyway. I mean, that... And Save's like, here we go again. I've got a blink and save yeah. in my snowball. Yeah, I mean, they... Prosperol save his life. He did get saved, yeah. but it cost them too far. I think maybe they lost... Did they... Was that their own gem that dropped on the ground? I think it well, might have been. So. Yeah, save lost yeah, the gem there. Oh, no. Uh, it's mean, something. You've got a pretty big buffer here for Bedford. You have. But, I mean, don't make too many of those mistakes, or obviously Tundra can definitely find a way back. So, a little bit. I don't know if cocky is the right word there, but yeah, I'll stick with cocky. That was a little bit cocky. Yeah, pure. He'll, he'll wait until he has his Daedalus done before he goes for that sort of play. Because then once the Daedalus so is done, awesome. he'll probably be able to kill them quick enough that he can afford to dive into four heroes alone. Big talent here, by the way. As a side note, 225 heroes on the side of Bed Boom Starter, Undispellable Kuro's Haze, and the Storm with the Overload Attack Bones, which he also took last game. So, yeah, again, uh, Nightfall focusing way more uh, or way less on this Little Than Crush aspect of the hero. He built it differently in the start with the skills, and now he's choosing the Undispellable Haze talent, so cannot remove it with the Dragon Knight Manta. Can't remove it with. Do they have anything else? I guess they have the Yules on the Tiny. Maybe. Eh, they didn't really have that many dispels to begin with, but he's just protecting himself against it. Bet boom, they're charging over the map towards Tundra. See who they catch first. Immersion is out with a blink. Very quick reaction there. That may just be enough to save him. They'll check over towards the area that Tomato was playing in. This time round, Tomato's out in time. Be able to back away, get his next item done. Lincoln's Sphere now complete on the Monkey King. Feels it's like the first move that Bet boom have made in quite a while where they didn't find someone. So this time around, Tundra get the dodge but they don't get anything for it. They get to survive, but no presence on the map. Yeah. 
I think there's a good chance that Bedboom want to re-invade that area at minute 42. And have a look at this as well. I don't know if you've got the chance to talk about this, but we, we do have the new Shivas picked up on Kasani. True. So this has been changed so it uses Veil now. And I'm trying to remember everything. <laughs> this item is so different. Like, everything is different. So it reduces the attack speed of enemies as usual, and all heals and regeneration and lifesteal as usual as well. It's the active. But it also yeah. gives... It, get, it increases the... Is this specifically spell amp, right? Yeah, 15% yeah. more so damage. So 15% spell amp. Spells. And it's from all types of spells, so it should also affect physical damage spells that you have. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they... I guess they technically don't really have anything that was synergized with that directly, but... Yeah, just a new flavor on the Shivas that makes it better on certain heroes and certain lineups to have that spell amp part of the wave. And the build-up's different and all the stats are different, so... But it still does the same thing about giving vision and giving armor. That's, that's a constant. Smoke on smoke here. Who's going to be the one to be jumped first? Toronto Tokyo heading in to try and get some information here for Bet Boom. Tomato is into the trees. It's quickly off them there. Good reactions from Tomato to make sure that he isn't jumped here by that first attempt from Nightfall. And now Immersion. Look for the jump back, trying to look for the toss. He will get it on towards Toronto Tokyo. They focus the gyrocopter first. Toronto Tokyo able to pop the Ghost Scepter and able to get out. Toronto Tokyo is going to live. Immersion goes down. Nightfall, he's found his target. He's in on top of Tomato. Tomato will get the ultimate off, but Nightfall and GPK are able to easily take him out. They've found three. They'll find Kasani as well as they run him down through the BKB. They even catch Brow oh hiding my. in the corner of the map. They'll hunt him down, put a stop to his TP attempts, kick him out <laughs> of the server as the four or five of them taken out once again. Triple kill for GPK. <laughs> Bet Boom starting to lose count, really, at the amount of team wipes they've been finding this game. See? We actually had some temporary evidence of where he ended up landing because there was a little bit of a water pool out there. Uh, Toronto Tokyo with a fun reaction here. He walked into the Razor Old and died on his gyro. After getting a heroic escape, he just <laughs> basically just walked in to die. But I hope we get a replay of that kick. That looked pretty cool. He landed up all the way up on the grass. This is once again a fight as well in a situation where Roche, it's there waiting for them. Yeah. So Bet Boom into the pit they go. Nightfall, he'll be able to get his second, or his next item done with the upgrade to Blink, Swift Blink. This, this one's got a banner. It's on. got a Roshan's banner. Go, let's let, let, let them know what's going on with that one. Sid. Yeah, so you yeah. can place a banner anywhere on the map, and the creeps that pass by the banner get 45 seconds of 50% extra damage and 75% extra health. So it's a way of like buffing up your pushes on the creep wave. Um, GPK was fake denying it. I think he really doesn't think it's good. And here's the kick. All right, let's see it. Oh. So, it's coming in a sec. Don't worry. I promise. This is like a little water circle out there for the next 10 seconds, just randomly. I don't know. I thought that was fun. Anyway. Yep. Roshan banner. Uh, did they give it to anyone? Did they just straight up instantly use it? Where is it? Stupendous. Uh, where is it? It's in. Oh, he... Okay. They're oh, is there? They're pushing pod, guys. All right, he just dropped it down here. I think okay. it was a similar thing about in the secret game, right? They just, they just dropped it. All right, they so, didn't really care for so it. So to me, the way this just got but they, used... Yeah, it, this... To me, this is a protest, effectively, when I see this. It's like... This... <laughs> no, I mean, this isn't terrible, right? You're buffing up the um, three... This gonna, is effectively him like, saying, I would have rather had a refresher shard, is what I'm reading here. Sure, you're I mean, putting a little... Not, yeah, you're putting this extra pressure on bottom. You know, it's, it's an item that you lay down there and then you're going to keep sort of Tundra held in base. I, I feel like if you want to use this really effectively, you yeah. want to... Okay, the... Hang on. Yeah. Okay, I take back everything I said because I misunderstood how long it lasts. The banner lasts five minutes. Yes. It's the buff that lasts for you. So I think they're, they're, no, they're onto something good. with the placement here. It's not okay. bad at all. Mid lane immersion. He'll get caught. So what I thought was that the banner lasts 45 seconds and he was going to bump yeah, like buff. two waves. I'm like, okay, dude, at least use it while you're pushing another lane, right? No, this is but a good spot to have it. I get it now. I get it. It's new for everybody. And more so for me than anybody else. Because now they can put the pressure on themselves top. Uh, and indeed, these buffed up creeps are just going to keep that bottom creep wave pushed all the way in. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. And looking for the jump in. Save. He tried to get the kickback, but they're very quick with the grab there. They'll punish it. GPK. Oh my god, the damage. He's dragged back the two of them. Tomato's fully solo. He'll be able to put the BKB and get out of this. But Tomato will only just escape that effort. Toronto Tokyo just he didn't escape. This. Oh, he didn't. He ended up dying. And now outside of the base, Emotion's in trouble. He's tried to chase on four, but GPK's back in, drags the two of them back. Brown's oh. gonna get taken out, the three of them dead without buyback. Kasani's gonna get run down. He's trying to rely on this barrier to keep him alive, but he'll still end up popping triple kill for GPK. 
as this push it's coming up to the high ground they don't have much left to play here with Sin. Yeah, I think sort of the, in those moments as well, so just the, the ticks of damage from the, the Witchblade part of the Parasma, bringing these heroes down on their attempted escapes. They'll get the mid racks. They can go for go for the Megas. They can go for the Tier 4s. They've got a lot of options open here, Bet Boom. 38k, 39k lead. Oh my god, those are some chonky Siege Creeps down bottom. 1600 health on each of those bad boys, and they're really big which is just as intimidating. So here they come. Finally, a way to Siege Creeps to get those buffed up, right? Always like the thing with... Dude, what do you, you, what do you think sort of like the buffed up Mega Creeps look like? Even bigger. Oh, that's got to be insane. GPK, he's ready to do some fountain diving. I'm on. They can kind of bait GPK into any sort of dangerous play around the, the fountain. He still, of course, has the Aegis for a minute and 30 seconds. But boom, they're playing it safe. They're looking for the Megas. They'll be able to take down that bottom Rax. Take up the top, get the Mega Creeps. Tundra, they'll have everyone back up in 15 seconds. And well, again, trying to see if they can get someone up close towards the fountain. This time they can, they'll get safe. They'll be able to get him tossed back into the fountain. Mega Creeps are out. Merchant trying for a further catch on to Pure, but Pure's going to be able to step away. Bet boom. I mean, Nightfall and Toronto Tokyo, they're considering maybe jumping back in. We'll see how far Immersion looks to reach outside of the base. He's got to be cautious. GPK low on mana, still a minute left until that Aegis expires. I think we need a camera on the banner right now. Are oh, we going to get some big creeps? They're coming very yeah. soon, Owen. If this chase doesn't lead to anything, it's time for I the big I don't think it boys. is. Bet Boom's resetting. They're happy with the mega creeps. They're TPing out. The big boys are coming. How big can they get? Whoa. That's a chunker. Look at that. The mega, mega 2, creeps. 2,222 <laughs> health on the melee ones. It's pretty terrifying. The ranged one, 1776. Yeah. Now this this banner, it was, this was, it's done a lot. Great position for them to just slam it down straight away. GPK, he's still playing around with uh, Tundra here up top. As uh, yeah, he's able to even keep the Aegis safe. He'll TP back to base. It, regardless, he's going to time out here in the next 20 seconds. Oh shit, they're coming. They're going. Oh look at these poor old creeps just getting destroyed by the mega mega creeps. Now the good news for Tundra is. Well, there's not that many. There's not that much good news, you know. You're down 40k and you got mega, but the banner is about to expire. But they got all five minutes worth of push down here. I'm actually kind of curious to see how teams use this, because the obvious thing now that I understand how it works is to do this, right? Where you place it, it and you push the opposite side of the map with your heroes. It's essentially a free split push where the enemy team has to always go and deal with the bottom. It is pretty sure. I mean, that, are, are teams going to realize the banner's down and then go look for I it? I think or? for sure, right? You know which lane it's on. You, yeah. you probably are going to at least be, maybe getting a support to smoke up, try and get out to it. It's, I think, what, six hits, right, to kill. So if you find it, you will get it. But uh, yeah, you've got to be able to somehow find some way of getting one of your heroes out of the base to deal with it. Even so, it's finally come to an end. So. Do you remember how much radius it has when it gives the buff? Can you like place it and hide it in the trees and still hit the wave? I, think it, I want to say it's like a 900 radius. Because then they place it in the middle of the wave, right? They could have technically placed it in the trees off to the side. Okay, kick. Uh, there's the kick back on to Kastani. He'll be able to put the BKB, but the physical damage from Pure with a focus no, bar will back. destroy him. He is gone. Same to be said for Tomato. Okay. This looks to be the beginning of the end here as they're diving in beyond the tier fours. The remaining two members of Tundra desperately trying to get back towards the Fountain of Pure. He's ready to dive in with the BKB. They'll kick Pryl out of the Fountain. GG is called. Bet Boom here with the 2-0 knocking Tundra out of the competition. And I think it's just fair to say they were just better. No, they so were. They were just flat out better. In this game, we talked about it. It was going to be a big brawl. Tons of stuns, tons of rotations coming in. And GBK back to back. Awesome storm this performances. Storm? Yeah, it, this might have uh... to be something that teams are going to consider. By the way, he's playing it. I don't think it's necessarily practical. Of course, we're seeing the Parasma in the later stages of the game definitely amping up his offensive potential. But Parasma aside, this performance on the Storm Spirit, it's pretty insane. I think, well, 15, 1, and 10, game one, if my memory uh, does me correct. And then 15, 1, and 18 here. Uh, but all in all, of course, just a a around the board, right? Just yeah. bet boom as a team. Nightfall with this. Switch up to get the Slardar in the carry position. 11 0 25. He, he plays it perfectly soon. Yeah, I think one of the key differences when you look at the scoreboard here is that on the side of Tundra, all of their heroes died a lot. The least, the, the fewest deaths were on the Dragon Knight with six. So all across the board in these fights that are kind of skirmishy, Bed Boom are always the ones killing cores. Like, sure, Tundra might have a decent amount of kills with their 25, but 22 kills here 
are on the two supports on the night on the on the nightfall side. <laughs> it's Team Nightfall on the Bedroom side. Nah, I really nightfall zero, GPK one, and pure with the four. Just really, yeah, they just never really found the the big kills on the side of Tundra in the fights. They didn't. Just kept falling behind step by step. Lovely execution from Bedroom. As you said, cool to see the storm with a new build, right? It's one of the new some of the new tech here. Tundra tried their own take. Not the new double solar crest. Didn't find the same success. No, not at all. But yeah, I think Parasma on Storm, in any game that kind of goes past 30 minutes, we're going to see it picked up every single time. I think it's going to very quickly become a staple on the Storm Spirit. Well, there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Bet Boom today coming in with some ferocious Dota 2 as they give Tundra no chance of staying in the competition. They'll knock, knock Tundra out here. Bet Boom, 2 to 0. Absolutely. Thank you so much to our fantastic casters. Well done out there. And I am here with a fantastic player, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for Toronto, Tokyo! Good to have you back on the stage yet again. I've asked you this question once, and I will ask it again and again. Do you guys understand how the Tormentor works? Uh, our Slarder tipped it out, and we said, OK, we don't care anymore this game. And we will go suicide. Yeah. So you just left him to die? Uh, yeah. Uh, Slaughter should kill this Tormentor solo, but he took it out and we, were like, we didn't care this game anymore. Okay, okay. Very confident stuff there. And let me talk to you about the new patch, the banner. People want to know about this banner. Do you feel like it had any sort of impact? Were you guys excited when you got it, or is it just a random thing? Only say, say it. guys, it's banner, it's banner. It will change the game. Like, and he put the banner board, and I don't know, I didn't even watch on this banner once. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's fun to watch, I don't know. It was very fun to watch. You don't think it changed the game? Uh, effectively changed everything, this beautiful banner? Yeah, of course, it changed a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much for your honest answer. Maybe it will, if it will be Mega Creeps with spells, it will be more fun. Okay, okay. We'll tell Ice Frog. Thank you so much. All right, final question for you. Is there any hero that you guys are excited to still play with at this tournament that you haven't got a chance to test out? Phoenix was great. Gyro was impressive. Who do you really want to play? For me? Yeah. Uh, last days I'm practicing Puck. Uh, I, can pl I can play Puck post 5%. Okay, well, make sure that you ban Toronto's POS 5. Fuck, thank you so much for your time. Incredible game. And we'll throw back to the panel. Thank you very much, Slacks and Toronto Tokyo. As Betboom take this series 2 to 0, and they move forward here at ESL 1 Kuala Lumpur. And I do think, I mean, the banner was fun to watch. It did make a big difference, Kevin. I mean, he's busy doing stuff. He's not going to go look at the <laughs> enemy base where they're going to be like, oh, these creeps have 8,000 HP. So that big. seems pretty good. But I guarantee that the next time he plays a pub and somebody banners him yeah. and he's sitting there like trying to defend on A, he's like, oh my god, these creeps are killing me. Then yeah. he's going to feel it. Agreed. And I, I love the concept of putting the banner on a lane that you're not actually playing on and then playing on the opposing sides so just depending on the banner to keep that lane pushed out, making it so that the enemies don't have counterplay. Very, very creative stuff. He was up like 40k gold. You know, he doesn't have to care about it. But yeah, when it's reversed, he will he will feel it. He will feel the pain of the banner. Yeah. So let's talk about this game because they were up by a lot by the time that that banner was already placed. And to be honest, Kazu, this game wasn't very even. Yeah. Like Tundra had some good stuff going on like early on and perhaps in like the early mid game as well. But eventually, I feel like Bedboom. They. I mean, Sin was saying it too. They just played better. The way they moved to it, even in fights, like it happened one, two, three, four fights in a row, they survived with 10% HP, maybe 15%, you know, someone on Tundra isn't manning up enough, or Bad Boomer is just better at pressing the spells, force staffing out, using their gold scepters, so I think kind of from 50 minutes and onwards, I didn't really feel like Tundra were playing all that well together, if I'm going to be honest. Yeah, the, the laning stage for Tundra was really solid in the safe lane. The Lich was like very oppressive, tons <laughs> of damage. That paired with the uh, the Monkey King, they got first blood and some other kills. But then it felt like it took forever for Lich to hit six. There was a lot of examples of Lich would just be on the map, and then Bepum would find him and murder him, and it just kind of kept snowballing. And then it was like they kept finding Monkey King and jumping on him, yeah. and he put his ulti down, but it just he would still die. It just kind of meant that it was that rinse repeat. Yeah, Tundra played a really good early game, actually. I thought their laning stage was pretty infallible. Their bottom lane went much better than expected, and they made some really cool moves with their Monkey King. Yep. There was this one where they countered the Storm rotation with the Wukongs, and it looked perfect. 
But after that, it just kind of crumbled. It felt like they could only ever find pickoffs or kills on the gyrocopter. At some point, I was just watching gyrocopter get chain frosted over and over and over again. And I think Bat Boom played incredibly well. I want to shout out the GPK Storm. The casters already talked about it, of course. He played so incredibly well. It felt like he was everywhere. He did every kind of initiation you wanted, and he played until his very limits, especially that bottom fight near Roshan, where it looked like the DK was going to finish him off but he didn't. And of course, another special mention goes to Nightfall, who just delivered on that Slardar. He was the hero, constantly getting those kills on the Monkey King in the early game. Yeah, we can see the, the numbers here on our screens. Toronto Tokyo save. They both died 11 times each, which is a lot, but it's fine, because their supports. Nightfall never died. She only died four times. We got GPK only dying once. It felt like Purge, this, this game was very methodical towards the end for Bedboom. They knew exactly what to do. It was, and I mean, I had slight worries due to the, the Slardar carry. You're worried he's going to get out carried at some point, but they, they just all played so well together as a team. Save as well, setting up kills, buying them time, uh, not dying to Tormentor. He really excelled in that compared to the rest of the squad. And Toronto Tokyo also, despite being a gyrocopter in the late game, where sometimes you're a bit vulnerable, he just also felt very hard to kill. So every single player on this team did extremely well. I remember a stat from TI, not the exact specifics, but it was like halfway through the tournament, both GPK and Nightfall were in top five in terms of KDA, and that's on the same team. So, like, they just are so insanely good. It, it shows in the play, it shows in the stats. They just play so well. Yeah, and we didn't even mention Pure, who was also beyond <laughs> godlike that game and also had impact. Honestly, all three cores of Bet Boom just delivered today. Everyone played incredibly well. And I think in this game, it was just a matter of how well they were able to kite. Uh, Tundra's heroes, every time Razor BKB didn't run into a target, they were just able to get away and then turn on that Razor when that BKB was over. And that was just the story of the game. Tundra getting kited, Bedboom cleaning up afterwards. Yeah, and Tundra indeed on the receiving end of Bedboom's dominance means that they are eliminated hereby. And it was very nice hearing from Toronto Tokyo on the winning side, but uh, the flip side of the court is, of course, the losing side. And for that, we're heading over to Tsunami, who's standing by with Tomato. Thank you very much. Yes, I am joined by Tundra Esports at Tomato. Condolences on the result, but I have to imagine part of it is because this morning must have been very, very frantic for you. What happened when you woke up? What was the first thing you started doing? Uh, yeah, so uh, yesterday I slept like 16 hours. I've been very sick. And I woke up and I checked my Facebook. And then I see like Frostivus new event. And I'm like, there's no way there's new patch, right? And then I checked Dota too, and yeah, there was a new patch. And I messaged all my teammates on Discord. I'm like spamming at everyone, guys, new patch, new patch, new patch. Uh, yeah, pretty crazy. But I think it kind of favored us a little bit. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I prefer to play on this new patch than the old patch, because uh, we didn't have much time to prepare. Um, and and Bedmos are very like uh, systematic team. Yeah. So I think kind of freestyling favored us a little bit, but I think they just played better. I appreciate the optimism about the new energy of a patch being exciting for you. And then while we look forward to 2024 as we're wrapping up 2023, you have any Dota New Year's resolutions, something that you're hoping to develop as a player or as a teammate? Uh, I guess just uh, kind of believe more in my ability. I think I've always looked towards other players and I've always had like a bit of like a imposter syndrome, like I don't really deserve to be here. I'm not because I'm not as good as the others. And, I think when I believe in myself, I play better. So that's something I'm looking forward to change next year. Well, I can give you a start. Malaysia, does Tomato deserve to be here? You absolutely do, my man. Top eight result is still a hell of a finish. Thanks so much for joining us as we send it back to the panel. Thank you very much, Tsunami and Tomato. And yeah, Tomato definitely made a name for himself this event. He has played uh, the last 17 games that he has played, and this is even games that he played for the qualifiers for ESL on Kuala Lumpur. He played 16 different heroes, Purge, which is an incredible feat on it's itself. Good. Yeah, it's, I, I love that that's the pattern that we're seeing at more and more tournaments. Yotaro is the most obvious examples. The yeah. uh, first time they won TI. Uh, so it's it's just really cool to see Tomato also excel at that. I think he still played fantastic this tournament. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good for him. Yeah, he's just a really talented player. He's also been drafting for his team. So he's been doing a lot like behind the scenes and by way of just being creative. And it always makes me sad to see players as good as Tomato have imposter syndrome, but yeah. I, it's just so hard to feel good about yourself in an industry like this. But I think he's been playing incredibly well. He's been stable, he's been aggressive, and he's been the rock of his team. Yeah, I hope that his teammates and also Moon, their coach, that they can help him. I've been there. Like Confidence is something that's kind of really, you don't just like flip a switch and suddenly, oh, look at me, I'm the best player. 
it takes time, and I hope that he can get the help, you know, from his team and the structure around him to help him with it. Because, yeah, without confidence, you, you cannot win. It's impossible. Yeah, it's something that you have to build and work on, and I hope that yeah. Mado indeed can do that moving forward. Uh, but it's not going to be at ESO on Kuala Lumpur anymore, as we have the brackets in front of us. Tundra eliminated and earlier today already, Kezu. We saw Team Secret eliminated as well, and uh, that means uh, we've got some new match matchups ready. Yeah, we do. Honestly, every... I feel like every match that's coming, they're just gonna be bangers. They're gonna get better and better. And on this new patch, again, we don't know what the hell to expect. Like, there's some offline Wind Ranger running around. Our first pick carries Slardar. So I'm just looking forward to more games, new different items, whatever it may be. I'm I'm ready. Yeah, for uh, for Bedroom G2IG, you gotta have to wait a little bit. That will happen tomorrow. But Purge, there's still one more series to come. Are you ready for that one? Yeah, actually. I mean, every single team that's left is amazing, but this one especially, I'm really excited for. Any final words on Falcons versus Team Liquid, Effie? Uh, that one's going to be exciting. We just saw two really long games where there was a lot of farming going on, but I think with Liquid Falcons, there's just going to be a lot of brawling, a lot of aggression. And if you had asked me yesterday before I saw Liquid play today, I would have been very Falcon favored, but I'm feeling really confident in Liquid's ability to thrive in these chaotic patches. Yeah. Really confident. I feel like that's a hot take. I like it. Why is it a hot take? Because I, no, I perceive like Liquid, you know, they look good, but really thrive. I'm personally, I think Falcons have a slight edge, which I haven't seen them play today and on the new patch, so I don't really know. But um, they're, they're my choice. Well, they are, of course, a new squad, and they have not yet had to deal with the new patch as the squad. They also don't have a coach, so maybe not as big of a support system as we know that Team Liquid has. But we're going to have to find out what's going to happen in our final series of the day. It will be another elimination series. Team Falcons versus Team Liquid. Get yourself your snacks ready. We'll be right back. Hey everyone, it's John Xfire here along with Mike LaPhoenix. We're back again to present another 1xBet tier list together. Mike, what categories do we have this time around? The SCA players you run into in an SCA pub. Let's go, Jonathan. We've got teams to put in categories. Wawitas, who are these guys? Wawitas feels like a very... I'm going to be frank there, GG. Yeah, there is. Because it was easy, let me tell you. Falcons. Falcons, I feel like Amar is the kind of guy, well, he doesn't type GG easy, but mantlets of intelligence, you know? Okay, okay, okay. But he is not easy. Let me tell you that. No, no, but yeah. he's typing. No, 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 no. We're missing something. ATF is a Pinoy. He goes in the oh, Pinoy. Yes, of course. I love a Filipino. How do we forget? Team Secret. Team Secret, they give me a very ping vibe. Just on mid lane, perhaps. Last thing you see, well, when Puppy's doing the world. Yeah, he said the exclamation that's marks, that is a data. You know, there's some. I guarantee you. Game and Gladiators, here we go. I think there's a very, very specific category, Jonathan, on the board. You tell me which one it is. Think of Quinn. Thank you very that much. Is it. That is it. We all know <laughs> where Quinn's going. There's no two ways about that. LGD Gaming. They did not have I a great time. I hate Did not have a great time. I really do hate doing it to him. Sorry, LG. Joe, wait, please. If you see me in the lobby, do not punch me in the face. He doesn't know who you are. <laughs> Azura Ray. Azura Ray. They are probably two PMA to put in the list. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, GG easy in the sense that they are just literally making it. That easy. is true. They are the guys, guys typing out GGs. It. They are the ones typing yeah. it. Bet boom. Speaking of ease, where are they go? They give me the exclamation mark vibes. These are the Pinoys from the north, if you ask. That me. is fair. These that is a fair. Pinoys from the, these guys, they are literally Pinoys just up no, further north. Team Liquid. Team Liquid is, uh, feels like Boxy can do some support carrying. Sometimes Boxy does carry a lot of that, he, that he does. Speaking G2 of carrying, IG. G2IG. Now these guys are Giga Chats, Jonathan. They're insane. I will not have you meme about these guys. No. Oh, this guy's typed GGZ a couple times in his life. I guarantee <laughs> you that. Undying Fine. slash Tundra. Yeah. Oh, Moon Meander. Oh, what are we thinking? Exclamation mark. I think he may have been pinging a few times yeah. while watching his Yeah. Team. I'll tell you. Sure. I, maybe pinging in real life. Pinging someone's head with his, uh, with his hands, Jonathan. <laughs> Nine pandas. Like a... They look like they raged. I'm not going to lie. What? And mid? In mid, but I in the sense Do they that defend though, Jonathan? Because when, when we see uh, in mid and SEA, they defend like crazy. Yeah, they're, they're more like the end mid, and then you know we've seen them GG out before in different tournaments very early. I think the pings are maybe more characteristic. 
This has no answer. Ah, oh, here we go. <laughs> Where else? But the Pinoys, there you go. Blacklist rivalry, they go right in the, the middle section. Of course, right there where the rest of the Pinoys. And that is the team's closest to your average pub player in Southeast Asia tier list from 1xbet. It's John Xfar and Michael Phoenix. Thanks for joining us for whatever this is. for the DHL drop. Grab yourself a DHL drop sign and customize it with your message. Make sure we spot you in the crowd because if you're lucky, one of our special deliveries is coming your way. And for all of you watching at home, type DHL drop in the Twitch chat for a chance to win a 100 voucher. Hello, and for another DHL drop. We have got some fantastic prizes here. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there we go. Heck yeah. <laughs> but things are a little different this time, all right? Now, usually my cohort, Effiebot, is with us, but we have a very special guest this time. You guys might have noticed our videos that we made this year where we were getting a fantastic trip for someone to come down, full expenses paid, and a friend to come to the event and be my helper, my assistant. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please introduce the winner Kitty Paw, come on out, come down! Hello! Woo! Welcome, welcome, my friend! What is your name for everyone? My name is Poon, P-O-O-N. It's easier to pronounce. Hell yeah, Poon. Are you ready to do some work with me today? Hell yeah, let's go! All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got our man here. You've got our box, thank you. Yeah, full of things, random things for everyone up here. Everyone, wow, okay, we got one winner that we have to choose from their signs. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. that's bad for them. <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't worry, you'll help me out. Now, uh, I know in the advertisement I said, you know, you'd have some fun, you'd be around, but I am literally planning on giving you the entire experience. Yeah. Are I'm, you... re I'm ready for that. If you're going to give me entire experience, I'm waiting for it. Okay, well, let's start it off then. Uh, can you hype out the crowd a little bit? Can you tell them to get their signs ready for me? Can you have your signs up and scream? Woo! That's my boy right there. He's got it. All right, all right. Now, our camera is going to look for signs all over the arena. We'll see if anyone sticks out in our mind. Now, I need your help on this, my friend. You are now my assistant, as done by law in the contest. There is no escape. You have to, what do they say over there? Nigma undefeated. What do you think about that? They're not even here, so. Well, yeah, you can't be <laughs> defeated if you never play any games. Ah, huh, there you go. All right, that was good. Let's see from over here. Buff Meepo, you feel good about that? See crowd? Anyone stand out to you, my friend? You know what? For this one, because the last game says kind of nominating, uh -huh. let's go for Force CIS. Because like they came all the way here okay. for their team. Okay, that is definitely in the running. Let's look over here before we make our decision. Hello, Arteezy Baby Rage, a classic, a Gork fan. He came out from his basement all the way here. That's pretty hype. What's over here? Oh, yeah, a lot of Gork fans. Weeha Storm. Anything tickling your fancy, my friend? To be fair, that's one thing that like tickling me right now. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Secret, I'm done. The man comes up. He like. I think that. I mean, he has the bravery to come up and still represent Secret. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, like, I feel bad for him. Like after the first and the second game from that series, but yeah, you're doing a good. All right, get over there. You know what? Whoa. Win for my pregnant Whoa. wife at home. Let me hug you because that Thank series man. is like really. Yeah. Good. Pregnant wife at home? Yep. And you ditched for Dota? Yep. That's my boy right there! Give him the box! Heck yeah! Congratulations! There you are! Let's open it up! Woo! There you go! All right, all right show it! Yes, you. tap him for the pain. Now open your box, please. We must see what is inside. There we go. Oh, that's really packed. Yeah, it's really packed. All right, are you ready? Okay, we got Sniper Plushie! Very good. We got Crystal Maiden, beautiful figurine there. Make sure you don't drop that. A huge mouse pad. Wow. Some plush toy bag. Oh my Clothing for your child. <laughs> Everything for your family right And now. Queen of Pain for your child much later. Ooh. Very good. Any shout outs to the, uh, the, the baby for the future? Uh, I, I don't know, man. Uh, make, make Malaysia proud. There we go. All right, fantastic. Congratulations. Well done. Well done. And thank you, my assistant. Thank you. Yes, we have to prepare for our player interview now. We, we're going to put you on stage and make you interview the player for the first time. Really? Yeah, sure. We got a lot of work to do. So we're going to prep this man in the back. Let's send it back. But that's another DHL drop. You'll be seeing more. Don't go anywhere. Back to the panel. Come on. Stop trying to dodge your job responsibilities, Slacks. You have to do the interviews around here, and we have to do the analyzing. What's up, everyone? We're getting ready for our final series of the day. It's Team Liquid taking on Team Falcons with me, Tsunami, and BSJ, Winter, and Purge. Winter, what a pleasure to have you as our Southeast Asian authority for a MENA versus Western European showdown. Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> have you already had your, your dinner today? No, I haven't, actually, which is why I'm hoping that this goes late because that way we get to hit up the the stalls the food stalls here in kl yeah don't lie to me i know you just want to get your stuffed crust pizza i eat only local food whenever i'm traveling that's why i can't right. wait for some tatarik some nasi goreng some kaya toast <laughs> I can't name any other ones. Brian, what's the name? You did well, you did well. Name of Malaysian cuisine. I got nothing because he <laughs> took me to places and then ordered for me. So. Oh, okay. It was That's delicious, it. though. He Good liked, cop he liked salt lake. What's your oh, yeah, go-to perch when you're uh, down here? Uh, I, I've, been, I've been dabbling some breakfast. I eat normal, boring stuff. And okay. other ones, I'm like, all right, I'm going to eat some spice in the morning. It's, it's all really good. I'm just terrible with names, so I just like can't remember what the names are of anything. But I, I know what my mouth likes. And have, you, have you tried eating any birds? Have you tried maybe eating some falcons, perhaps? Because they are making their debut here on the main stage. And we were left here wondering, what is a falcon? Falcons. Falcons are birds of prey in the genus Falco, which includes about 40 species. Falcons are widely distributed on all continents of the world except Antarctica. 
are the Dota team. My bad. If you've never heard of a Dota team called Falcons, it's because they only just acquired a roster. And oh, what a roster it is. With TI winners snaking and Skeeter on hard support and hard carry respectively, old Creepwave teammates Malarine and ATF on position two and three. And finally, one of the most legendary position four players in the game, Crit to round out the roster. To attend DSL 1 Kuala Lumpur, they had to make it through the MENA qualifiers, which meant beating teams such as PSG Quest to take the hotly contested spot. A 3-1 scoreline for Team Falcons. This Saudi organization is off to a very strong start in Dota. Every player on this roster is hungry for victory and is looking forward to once again showing what they're capable of after some unfortunate rough patches. Let's see if they're hungry enough. Thank you, Owen Attenborough, for that well-narrated documentary as we get familiar with Falcons, because some people who are only just now tuning in, they were like, I don't really care about the group stage, I'm here for the arena days. Tell me, how did this team come to be, Brian? What should I be expecting out of two TI winners, ATF, who's been off the grid, Crit, who's been a legendary four position now, you heard, and Maureen, who's kind of a newcomer to the tier one scene. Yeah, we have a nice mixture of the uh, leadership and the supports coming out from Snaking, as well as Crit, but then you have the young guns with Maureen and ATF, and they, they've basically been talking about, like, we know we're gonna win the lanes, we're high skill, but we gotta make sure we don't do too crazy of stuff coming out of it, because I see pretty much every game, they're always gonna be aggressive, they're always gonna play high tempo, and it just comes down to whether or not they have those one or two sloppy mistakes in the mid game that happens in some of their losses, but the games where they're winning, it's convincing. I mean, overall, they have the right uh, mix of players, I would say. Like uh, you mentioned, they have the young players, they have the old players to tell them, all right, let's get your shit together, you know, we, we, need, we need to do this, you know. But then at the same time, you have the, the young players that will come up with some new ideas. I, I think during a situation like this, when you have a patch drop on you during the day of the tournament, having those young players are going to help you figure out the patch quickly. I, I'm really impressed by how clean they look in some of their games, though. Like, ATF had some faults as an offlaner. It's like people were for their team was, was forced to draft around him, but so far on this team, he's just been playing conventional offlaners and playing them all excellent. Crit, I think, has looked like a new bloomed player as well before. Mm -hmm. Felt like he's always playing these initiator fours. Now he's just playing like Weaver every game and having like incredible performances as well. So it kind of feels like them as a squad just complement each other so well and allow them to do new stuff that felt like stuff they didn't know how to do. Whereas in contrast, they will be facing off against Team Liquid, who's a team we already got to see perform earlier today. And to resounding success, they 2 0 Team Liquid, I mean, sorry, Team Secret, and they did it with basically like two hours to read the patch. Yeah, that series was hype because both these teams had to do their best theory crafting. And I think it showed the power of 33 being like the coaching slot effectively for mm -hmm. this tournament because he's one of the most not noteworthy theory crafters in the entire professional scene. And I love their creative items. The first game we saw Boxy, it's definitely like a guess the hero edition. Yeah. It was like a blink, Wraith Band, Ghost Scepter, Reaver mm -hmm. on support Lion. You know, that's the kind of stuff that new patch, new ideas, and they were definitely not afraid to do whip it out today. I mean, do you guys think he had the right skill build though? Yeah, the 1-1-4 one, one, and the 1-4-4. Four, four. That 15 minute timing <laughs> with the shard. The shard timing, I mean, my friend. The, the shard's cool if you think about it. I mean, look, we, we've all read the memes. Look, a lot of <laughs> armor with a lot of magic resistance means you're tanking. The fact that you're also doing damage. I don't know if you've had those games before with Lion where you're like, oh, I'm gonna jump in late game and mana suck them. And you click on them and they have 2,000 mana and you're like, oh, this isn't doing anything at all. But now it is, you're doing damage. So it, it's a cool thing. I think it's good from the four position, from the five uh, earlier today, we saw that as well. It wasn't as good. So four, I think Boxy's on top of it. And we've also been getting a chance to look at Saberlight's pool. We interviewed him on the stage after their win. He was saying that Visage is something that he's had his eye on now, and the new talent allowing three Soul Assumption targets is a pretty good buff. Uh, he also, despite his fantastic Slardar performance, wasn't saying that that other meme that we were reading was entirely accurate. He was saying that maybe that hero needs a little more time in the oven. Yeah, I feel like Saberlight's going to be prepared on a new patch. Mm -hmm. Like, this guy is willing to wing it and I don't think he's gonna be afraid to try new ideas, and he's also probably got things cooking that he's one of the players I think it's saying, when a new patch comes out, I think this hero is gonna be, have been slept on in the previous patch, and he's gonna be looking for those to be coming out. Yeah, I think it helps them a lot, you know, like you have a stand-in, and you don't really have much practice together, so now a new patch, boom, you know, everybody's zero. So it evens the playing field for them, and I feel like uh, maybe the patcher could open up a lot of like uh, greedier, polarizing offlaners. When I talk about Save Light, I feel like he's, He's like a greedy offlaner, and maybe this patch is going to unlock his playstyle with uh, Liquid. Yeah, because during the group stage, we were seeing some shortcomings of a Saberlight hero pool as opposed to 
a Zai hero pool or a 33 hero pool? And how do you think he's been slotting in after now, I guess, three and a half days of playing with them, officials? Well, yeah, a lot of data there to go on. Uh, no, he's been doing good, for <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, Zai is a very unique offlaner. Um, I think Blitz has described him as, like, he's the best player for doing a lot with very little. So in the way that he slots into the team, he gives all that space and farm and, like, you know, he, he'll be like, oh, I'll just tank the lane. And he says that every single game. Saberlight maybe needs a little bit more finesse or a little bit better lane matchups, but he does have a lot of skill as well. Yeah. So it's just like a different play style that, you know, maybe becomes those, like, long fights where he does 7,000 damage casting soul assumptions. So. I mean, it kind of affects the position fall the most. I think when you have an uh, offlaner that farms a lot more, so it means that your position fall has to be... Uh, less greedy, you have to play more for him. Whereas if you talk about, like, like you mentioned, that Zai is he's much more a team player. He doesn't really care about his farm. He, he cares about if the team can function well with the draft. And uh, that's kind of the thing that they have to adjust to right now with Sableye. That covers some of the side lanes, but Brian, not to put you under pressure here, is Nisha still the best mid laner? Because he's going up against Maureen, and Maureen has not been tested that much. So I would imagine on paper, Maureen's way out of his depth. But throughout group stage, Maureen has consistently impressed me with how he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with top-tier mid laners. Is Nisha another level for him, though? Well, I'd say specifically for Maureen, he's going to whip out some cool stuff. Like the Sniper, he was not afraid to pick that before the patch. He's got a lot of his signatures that are not necessarily traditional mids. So I'm going to be looking for Nisha to get out of the laning phase against these kind of cheesy blast picks that Maureen likes to go for. But Nisha was looking sick earlier today, especially in that Pango game. Like he absolutely demolished throughout the entire state. I think he was like 17 and two on Pango. And there was just some perfect spell casting in the mid game that I remember a clip of Insania on his stream having a teammate in the pub miss a bunch of spells. He's like, oh, yes. this is just oh, yeah. something that it's so weird to see because you're so used to playing with Nisha and he just doesn't miss. And that was kind of the vibes I got earlier today. I mean, talking about spellcasting, don't you feel like right now the mid lane heroes are kind of back to spellcasters instead yeah. of the strength heroes? I agree. I do, you think, think, do you think that might actually favor Nisha more? Oh, 100%. Than I, I hope he's one of the first players to whip out like the Ember Spirit or the Void Ooh. Spirit. Those heroes got some noteworthy buffs. And you got Veil on the Ember Spirit. It's an aura now. That's true. I mean, I, the, the, the only difference though is that Nisha did miss a little bit at TI. Like, he, he did not have his normal Misha level performance. It was still good. Like, they still had, like, a good placement, but it wasn't up to their normal standard where they get, like, top four. Looking but his minutes, normal so. standard is already still better than everybody else. Sure, but, and, he, and he has been playing better than his TI performance here, so it, it could be a, a brand, brand new level Nisha. Well, we got a lot of analysis on Liquid based off of years of data, but again, who are these Falcons that we're going to be witnessing? Well, we got Slacks to speak to them right now. Hello, hello. Hopefully you will succeed and we'll see how it goes. Most broken neutral item, go! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Quickening Charm is removed. Quickening Charm is removed. The most broken neutral item. Just tell us right now. We're all asking, please. Apex. Apex is still the most broken. Okay, you guys seem like you're prepared. Get in there. Have a fantastic game. Thank you so much. Crit, one word. Hi. Hi, let's go. Hi, everybody. We're about to get into that game. Thank you. Back to you guys. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a hi from Crit. What a way to go. Oh. Okay. I guess we're done. Ich 
Stolz auf meiner Fensterbank, die Nacht zieht vorbei. Ich blick über den Zellerrand, trinke Sekt auf euch. Ein Teufel und ein Engel tanzen auf dem Parkett. Vielleicht sind wir unsterblich, müssen nie wieder weg. Fadet auf den Wohnzimmer, der. Baby, sag, wieso sind wir hier? Kann sein, dass wir den Boden verlieren. today and it is sure to be a banger indeed one more elimination series someone will be going home liquid already with a fantastic performance so far but we have someone new coming to the stage and i am so excited to welcome them i've been thinking all day about the cringiest way i could get these guys on the stage and make them embarrassed and i think i have it ladies and gentlemen please put your feathers together Get those beaks open and let's welcome to the stage oh, the Falcons! <laughs> One guy did it, hell yeah. Thank you, welcome Falcons. Fantastic, they absolutely hated it. Thank you so much everybody, give it up for Falcons one more time. There you go. Because they are gonna need your applause. That is right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to welcome to the stage once again one of the most terrifying teams in all of Dota. They have already sent one team to the airport today and now we will see if they will make these Falcons also fly. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the unstoppable Team Liquid! There you have Team Liquid. They call them that because they make their enemies cry and then they drink their tears laughing. Unbelievable champions that we have seen so many times, but it appears that our teams are ready to go head to head. Folks at home and folks here, are you guys ready to see our last series of the day? Alrighty, righty dighty. looks like we're wide awake and we're ready for some Dota action. So let's go ahead and get over to it. We'll throw it back to our panel. Thank you very much, Slack. We are getting ready for our top six. We have now sent two teams home in our top eight as a Tundra and a Secret have bowed out of the competition. And now it's between Falcons and Liquid. As we get moving forward towards the draft, I want to go back to one thing that you alluded to earlier, Brian, although I'm going to specifically ask Winter. You were saying that Maureen has some cheese in his pocket, which he definitely does, but Winter, did we not see this man face tank playing Dragon Knight like four games straight. No mid player wants to have to do that, but Maureen did it. Why? It means he cares about winning more than having fun. <laughs> yes, he, I mean, he was working. He was winning regularly, and it was also a little bit of a flex pick because him and ATF have a lot of overlap between their heroes. Yeah, that's definitely good for their drafter, you know, when you have calls that can play multiple heroes. Uh, at the same time, so you can always think about different ways to trick your opponent mm -hmm. or sometimes trick yourself if you're unlucky. But it's definitely nice for the drafter, you know, when you have your core players like uh, the setup being like this, and you can always think about different drafts. And especially when you're on the first pick side, you can plan accordingly. And on second pick, what do you want to do? And for as much praise as we give Liquid about being able to adapt to a new patch with all of their different coaches and friends and buddies and all that, 
Purge, I feel like ATF's hero pool is ironclad. It doesn't matter what patch you put him into, he's just gonna play the same four, five, and now maybe at this tournament, six different heroes. I, I mean, Mars just got buffed yeah. this morning, so that's his, uh, his, his tried and true classic. Yeah, I, I think his hero pools look just straight up better this tournament. Uh, I, I think they're playing around him. He's playing decent variety, and he's looking good on all of them. Like, it, it, he's really showing that star power again, so he's definitely a player right here. Which one would you say is his best hero right now? Uh, his tournament. best? God, I don't know. Every single hero he plays is very effective to me. I don't know if I, if I have a best. Do you have any ideas? Probably be the Mars. <laughs> Probably. That's the easy one. Easy pick. <laughs> uh, here I'm looking out for for Malreen and ATF that they share. I don't want to get you guys too excited, but Viper. <gasps> I know Purge I'm loves excited. his. I love Purge. I know yeah. Purge loves his Viper as the, but the, ult now breaks you Correct. instead so of Nether the Toxin Nether used Toxin. to break and now Viper Strike breaks. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's a buff or a nerf. I think it's a huge buff okay. because in the mid to late game you just buy a four staff and, and get out of nothing. and get out of the break and, and it could be a teammate that did that for you. You know what's the well. biggest buff is that now when you farm mud golems they actually split so your that's GPM true. is going up too. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> so what's the build? What do you get on this hero right now? I think it's like the double wraith band uh, probably boots Manta's bot. I think that's what Malreen tends to always go for. Well, well XM the other day, the, the Viper special. Oh, the Axe. He went that fast Axe, Crown mm -hmm. Boots Axe, mm -hmm. to deal with the physical damage. He may not need that now, though, because Nether Toxin does do attack speed slow. So you could hypothetically fight in it with your corrosive, uh, your, with your passive. That's, it's like a lot of attack speed reduction. So there's, there's maybe some new Viper builds, builds that we'll see. I'd love to see this new Toggle Revenance brooch. Ah, yeah. Because, like, you turn Universal level 25, then. Universal Revenant Brooch. I mean, I, I don't really know if the toggle is useful because I feel like most of the time you're just going to use it on one person in a fight anyway. Yeah. The I concept. Yeah, yeah, I think any hero that's agility or universal is going to have mana issues with that item. Like, that's it, true. I think the 75 mana per hit will be an issue for most heroes in the game. But we are seeing, like, we're talking about Malreen, Viper. ATF does also play Viper, mm -hmm. but when we're looking at the bans from Team Liquid, they're once again also targeting ATF pretty hard with the Timber Saw, the Mars, and the Slardar. So we might be needing to see an ATF hero earlier on in the draft, just in case. I mean, there's still, a, there's still a Doom, though. I think Doom is still pretty strong uh, mm. in this current patch. He kind of got buffed, right? You can't he did. deny the Doom right now. Yes, and then they also made Infernal Blade better. Yeah, really. they lowered their cooldown. Yeah. I mean, Bench is also a hero that got buffed uh, pretty nicely, so now you don't have the damage reduction, but you do have the barrier, which blocks uh, uh, magic damage or physical damage once you swap uh, your target. And if it's an enemy hero, it does 150 damage, a level one. So it's either 150 damage or 150 barrier for your teammate. Yeah, mid-game, mid that's like a lot more damage for a hero that kind of operates on those thresholds. Mm -hmm. Like she has a limited amount of burst damage and giving her that extra 100 level one, extra 250 level 12 with the ulti. I think that's something that Venge would rather have. I think the save aspect of Venge is nice, but the, the, dis like the displacement of it is more important uh, for her teammates while the damage is better against enemies. Yeah, but you think about it, uh, what happened to the Disruptor in the past? He got a buff, Glimpse does damage, and the hero just became so good. Yeah, know? exactly. It can make a difference for sure. Uh, Liquid did play Venge earlier today. Uh, Falcon's grabbing that instead, and Liquid with the Muerta response. I think this is a decent response because if you are worried about like Avenge lowering your armor, you just don't care if your ult is active. Yeah, anyway. and it's also the silence. It's pretty annoying. The, yeah. the level 1 swap 800 range, more or less mm -hmm. you're going to get caught uh, by the calling most of the time. So it's yeah. pretty difficult to play against the Moeta if you're a support Venge. Yeah, you just put it in the place where your opponents are going to run through yeah. to save the guy that it, you're It's just very hard for the Venge. Just like, uh, you're so slow, you're running in, your cast yeah. range short. And you see, the, you see the ghosts running around in circles, and you're, you're just praying you don't run into the ghost, you know? Yeah, they're very spooky. <laughs> <laughs> I think the neutral items might be a significant buff for Moerta. Like, we see Boxy earlier today just go like Hurricane Pike Moonshard and then took the Ancient Defending item, mm -hmm. the one that gives you 50 mm -hmm. damage at, level thir at minute 37. Like, a hero in the support role that benefits from these damage items that they've released, I, I can't think of a better one than Moerta. And even though she's a support, people are just building her to scale still. So that part of the meta has not changed so much. Yeah, but then you feel like the game should be faster right now since they removed some of the economy from the creeps. So technically, those pushing heroes would be great if your enemy is trying to play a greedy position for supports that want to farm. Then you're gonna maybe be able to run something like a death Prophet, a Lash Rack. Those heroes got buffed uh, in the in the patch this morning, and and you have solar crest for those heroes, which is also really good now. It gives you a barrier, 
So you can just ball together and push down towers. But that's another reason that Muerta is kind of cool too, because if you flex it to carry, if everyone's buying something that gives you a 300 physical barrier, who cares? You're doing magic damage anyway. So in some ways, and I feel like I saw this in some of the games throughout mm -hmm. the day, it's, it, Solar Crest seems really good. But if you're just doing magic damage instead, it's not nearly as effective. I mean, do you think you should buy it on the call or you should buy it on a support right now? I mean, it seems valuable. A lot of offlaners are buying it. Supports are buying it as well. Yeah, we see two on the same team sometimes. Yeah, that, that's very different than old Solar Crest, right? They so don't stack, right? You, you can't use two on the same guy, right? Yeah, but you can refresh the barrier if it, the first one goes away, probably. Yeah, so. it's not 100% uptime, so mm. it probably is if you have two of them. But it seems good. It's it's HP and mana, and then mm. uh, movement speed, attack speed, and... Armor as well. Even, and armor, right. and lots of mana regen. It kind of just gives you a little bit of everything. Makes your heroes very tanky, very fast, for pretty low cost. It kind of gives you an idea of how much these players think about the game when it comes... like It's like six hours into this new patch, and they're already like, yeah, this item seems clearly better than all the other ones. They change so much in the game that there's going to be a little bit of... Yeah, my imbalance. favorite part about that is first game, straight away. Lion, let's go, man. <laughs> <laughs> That was the first thing that came to my mind when I was scrolling through the, the change song. I'm like, hmm, this sounds fun. Yeah, it's one of those where you don't know necessarily until you play it in the game. It's always about theory crafting and then what's the reality actually look like. But I like the fact that it happens so quickly and yet every day we're going to see something new. Yep, so they have like a bench razor. And every time you have bench, you want cause that can abuse the, the minus armor, raises, uh, raises one of those heroes. And he did get like a. He got a slight buff, right? Cooldown. Wait, the drain the is. The duration longer. on the drain, yeah. The uh, downside he can't uh, torment her as easily now. He's one of the heroes that really abused minus armor, so mm -hmm. it can't go below zero, so you can't necessarily solo torment her anymore, but still a fantastic hero. Um, so basically now you always need like three, pe three people to get the torment. Razor could probably do with just one, especially if it's Venge. Like, like one extra, yeah. Razor can it. like easily solo mm -hmm. torment her. You get down to maybe like 30% HP yeah. at the lowest, so if you have a wave of terror on top of that, yeah, I, guess this... it, I guess it's not more minus armor, but... You just needed some body to tank, basically. Yeah. This is already very scary. A lot of physical damage. Bench, Razor, and Tuscar. I mean, you would expect a more magic-heavy draft with the patch, you know, but the Falcons think that the minus armor strat is still, still a viable thing. I think you as a carry player, if you see this kind of minus armor strat, would you just straight up want to play the Moeta as a carry? I, I'm going to be Terrorblade here if I was in this game. I think you want like a high armor illusion hero. It's good against both of these supports and Razor. So I would be pretty mm -hmm. surprised if they don't pick one of the illusion heroes here. Um, and I think out of all the ones Mickey likes playing the most is that is Terrorblade. Do you like PL though? I, I couldn't believe they nerfed PL, man. He's one of my boys. <laughs> oh, and did he, he, wasn't did he even, get nerfed? Yeah, he got nerfed. He wasn't even getting picked. Oh, poor, poor, yeah, I'm biased poor. though, so I can't be too salty. But he did get the Diffusal upgrade. That That's better though, too. Oh, yeah. That's, that's true. true. So he did get a buff. I mean, the, the nerfs were more not big. They changed his 10 talent, I think, and they made the Axe. Spirit Lance slow a little bit worse, yeah. so it's like yeah. it's pretty small if his Diffusal Blade is, is better. It's more agility, so just straight up. So at the end of the day, do you think he's happier? <laughs> yeah, happy. I would assume so. Yeah, seems good. So they go for the Visage that they used earlier. It's not an Illusion hero, but it is a Summons hero, and since the Falcon Falcons is all like single target yep. burst, that Gravekeeper Cloak is nice. The supports can't really do much uh, to the family. So, like as Bench and Tusk, you see the birds, you, you, you gotta run, you know, you have to buy Go Scepters, you have to buy four stuffs. You just need to make sure you, you stay alive in the team fights long enough to cast your spells. And it's natural Vlad's fire, so that's a lot of armor for your team to help offset what Razor oh, yeah, that's rude. and Venge are doing. I mean, we've seen Vlad's a lot today, despite the fact that it effectively got nerfed by that it's not in the Helm of the Overlord anyway, mm. anymore. They just buy it anyways. Uh, I think the, the armor's up to, what, four now, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, that's it. Yeah, it so four. That's a huge amount for your squad. It really offsets the kill potential of the Razor and the, the Venge Wave of Terror. And Soul Assumption stacks now calculate pre-reduction. And so if you have a big minus armor draft on the enemy team and you build a lot of armor, then theoretically you should be able to build a lot of Soul Assumption stacks without going down to low HP. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, this is pretty ballsy, I would say, like picking the Void without seeing the lane. You don't know what's your lane. I mean, he's kind of okay against Razor. I guess if Razor's an awful thing, you can always jump away from the static lane. I mean, it is the ATF special. That's one of those heroes that he would play often in the offlane. It was like the, that Razor yeah, but, Viper offlane. But meta, I, kind of, so. I kind of feel like they probably should uh, try to pick a matchup that wins for, for him, you know. I, if, if I have uh, ATF on my team, I don't want to give him like a, a losing lane matchup. You know? I always want him to have that higher priority in the draft. And he's just built different. He still wins him, even if the, the matchup's not good. Yeah, why not give him an easier time, you know? <laughs> Who's putting damage into this Chrono, though? Because... Well, I guess Boxy, the way that he gets farmed on Muerta, he's going to be 
basically a core at a certain point. I mean, you mentioned Soul Assumption. That's true. Mm -hmm. Also that one. I'm really liking this Naga pick. I think this Void uh, is already going to have a tough time with the Chronospheres mm -hmm. because the only follow-up damage they have so far is coming from supports. Like, I don't think Visage is going to do meaningful damage unless his teammates are doing damage with yep. Soul Assumption. So Naga matches up well against Visage. Like, Illusion Heroes always do well against him because he's a single target. Physical damage summons hero, so illusions are always good against those. And then at the same time, you have the Naga Sleep against the Chrono, Natural Manta Buyer against the Global. Like, it's just going to break Team Liquid's combo, and I think Team Falcon's uh, sustained damage throughout the course of the fight is going to be much better. And so as long as this Naga doesn't get caught in the Chronosphere, and even then they have a swab, I just I think it's going to be very difficult for Team Liquid to execute fights in this game. I mean, he's going to need Lotus if he wants to use the swap against the Global Silence. Well, then just buy a Lotus. Yeah, buy a Lotus, sure. You know, bench support, you can easily <laughs> afford that Lotus. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good point, though. I mean, the Void is sort of already countered a bit between Song mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Venge. I mean, you, you pick it blind, you know, he's going to get countered. Yeah, yeah but the yeah. Venge, I, I feel like he kind of thinks that because he has Silencer, he doesn't care about the swap. I do kind of like time dilation, though. And it, based on how Team Liquid played earlier today, which mm -hmm. was like very low cooldown, constantly fighting, Time Dilation is one of the spells that gives you a massive advantage in those circumstances. The talents got buffed a little bit. I don't expect they'll necessarily grab them, but that skill is like sleeper OP in some teamfight circumstances. Yeah, especially that you're playing against uh, like something like a bench can be very annoying. Mm -hmm. A bad rider comes to mind, you know, if you're playing bad rider, you get time dilated, you just want to leave the game. I would love to see him potentially on Faces Void on Mickey go for like the Maelstrom Ags mm -hmm. build, because that's more that's less reliant on the Chronosphere and better against these illusion heroes and longer fights. So that might be something we can look out for during this game. And then uh, my question is, is since Void is, other than Ned, they don't have reliable lockdown for him. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see that come out of the mid lane uh, for Malreen here. He is going to be puck. line picking. Something but they like might puck. Do puck, DK, yeah. that he picked a bunch of times in a row. He has been playing a lot of DK. And mid laners are on the agenda. Lina gets banned out, Hango gets banned out, Dazzle gets banned out. And I don't know, I'd be a little bit of afraid of a Nisha Invoker plus a Faceless Void, but we'll see what Falcons choose as their final ban. Does that fit the budget, Neil? Invoker mid? I Visage. think Saberlight can play Visage cheaper than he did previously, and so then I think he can fit in the budget. That's screaming a melee hero since they banned Dazzle and Necro. <laughs> yeah, that's true. DK, probably. I just assume the Dazzle is because to protect the Nago illusions, so yeah, they do end up picking the DK. So what's left for Mickey or for uh, Nisha here? Is Huskar in the pool? He is. Huskar is in the pool. Never really thought of him as a Huskar player, though. You do what you gotta do, Brian, to win the no, game. No, no, Nisha's pro. honorable. He would never do such no, a thing. No, he just wants to win. I would like his hero to deal with Naga, so maybe Leshrac. I would Le actually like. Oh Leshrac yeah, Leshrac got a pretty nice buff uh, today. The attack speed. Yeah, yeah. yeah attack yeah. slow on the lightning now. So the laning phase is much stronger. Plus Bloodstone does more AoE, which is literally... Oh, perfect. they actually win Huskar. Wow. Okay. Filthy. I don't think I've ever seen a Nisha Huskar. I'm excited. Well, now you do, Brian. Now you do. Let's go. Okay, but we've seen Huskar to mixed success. I suppose whenever he's able to abuse the mid lane, life is good. And if he gets railroaded into being a side laner... They're changing lanes though, Neil. Sorry. <laughs> DK's going off lane. You're right. And it's going to be Razor mid. Good okay. choice, good choice. So the one thing about this Huskar is I was worried about how Mickey was going to enter the fights for getting the good Chronospheres off, but now you're making it so you can kind of just barrel down lanes with that Vlad's drums timing from the Visage, the first or second Roche mm -hmm. from the Huskar. So now it's more so Mickey can play a counter initiation game rather than having to initiate for his team and he can wait for them to go on the Huskar or the Visage. So that makes it a little bit easier for them and I think Liquid has a clear timing, but at the same time, I'm worried about their laning phase. Like I think the Huskar Got swapped lanes on, Razor yeah. does fine. I don't think Void's gonna be able to bully DK, he's gonna lose his tower. Yeah. Are they gonna have that momentum? And what, what are they gonna do, you know, if they lose their lanes with the Huskar, you know? Like, that's, that's a worrisome part for me. You have, uh, you have a Visage, you have, and you have a, a Faces Void on side lanes. Both of those heroes don't really like to fight too much, you know? They like to fight when they are strong, or when you have Chronosphere. The damage on the Radiant side is a little one-dimensional, the Falcons. It's like a lot of physical. Dragonite has some mixed or whatever with Breathe Fire and his little corrosive poison, but like uh, I just feel like the Solar Crest is going to help offset some fights. It's going to be about keeping the Huskar alive when mm -hmm. he does get gone on between the Vlad's auras and uh, the defensive items. So if they can do that and keep him getting kills and snowballing a little bit, that could be the momentum that they need to clear Naga Illusions and you know take the Roche banner to help offset the Naga and all that good stuff. Oh, the Roche banner. 
That's right. We saw it used to great success in that previous series, and we'll see if this game is going to go that late. And let's get more 7.35 games underway with the boys. It's Mike and John. Thank you so much, Tsunami. We do get into it. Game number one between Team Liquid and, of course, the side of Falcons. Jonathan, we've got a new pack on day one of the main stage for these two teams. How the hell are you feeling? Feeling great. You know, uh, it's, we've had a couple of series already with a patch. It's not much time still. You know, there's, there's still a lot to figure out with this patch, and I'm keen to see how it affects these teams. Uh, highly based from Valve, by the way, Jonathan. Who cares about the pro players and how they feel? Let's throw the new patch in. Let's see what the hell they do for the, here for day number one. And it's going to be a very exciting day of Dota. Of course, one of these teams goes to top six straight away. The other sadly has to go home, Jonathan. Yeah, that's the tough reality once we're here in the arena. Starting off with the lower bracket matches and at the least we're one round in at this point. You know, Liquid has managed to take one team away first. Falcons being knocked out from our last day of groups, as we've seen before. One thing with this game and one thing with this rap coming out from Falcons is in that series, or one of the series we saw of Falcons before, we did see Amar play the DK. And it, it, one of those series, it, it just felt like Amar was a little bit slower on the DK. I'm keen to see if he's adjusted, perhaps, learned from that last game we saw him bring out the DK, maybe play to the tempo that Malreen tends to do so just from the off lane, go for less farm intensive builds up, build ups and go for more of that pressure, more so, of that push. Somehow I doubt it, Jonathan. Well, we know AT, Probably not. but the man likes his goal, Jonathan. I don't think he's going to be changing for anyone, but we'll, we'll have a look and see if he has indeed adjusted here for this game number one between themselves and Liquid. Just for now, it seems like Falcons and Liquid are just going to stick around the mid lane, hoping for perhaps an early team fight. Of course, speaking of Liquid, Jonathan, uh, the Dirty Husker last pick did come mm. out. How do you feel about that? We don't get to see Nisha playing this too often. We don't get to see him play too often. Uh, I feel like you know what to expect out of the Husker. I like the lane swap from Falcons. I feel like the Razor should be able to manage it in the first few levels, and then it becomes kind of a really tough time either way. But you, you can always protect yourself with a static link. So you have that to play with. You've got Grit with his threat of rotation as well, which can open up that tempo on the mid. I think the one difference is we tend to see Malrin go for the push. Oh, bottom. Faking. Oh, oh, he's already gone. First blood to go the way of Sableite. And something we've been seeing quite a bit here from Sableite already on this new patch, this Visage, uh, seeming very, very strong. Yeah, this, the, the change to Soul Assumption is pretty big. It, it's just, you fill up your Soul Assumption charges a lot quicker with those changes, and it just allows that output to sustain itself. Taking a look at that mid lane, again, Malreen on the Razor, up against Nisha on the Husker. Not a fun time for the Husker in the first level. And you can't really shove Malreen away. It's going to take some levels for you to push back. He does start with the inner fire value point for a little bit of pushback and lane shoving. But as long as Malreen has the static link up, he's going to be able to charge for it. In that interim period, he can trade a little bit better. I'm keen to see Falcons kind of commit onto the mid. It's a little bit trickier this game, because again, when, whenever we see Malreen, for the most part, he's on that DK, rotation onto mid, forces the push out. Razor doesn't quite achieve that same tempo. Yeah, he might be the one to need to, to rotate over to the top, perhaps here with ATF. But you are seeing Malreen having a pretty tough time against that mid husk. Still top lane. Uh, Mikkei, of course, with Insania against Crit and ATF. Uh, the Dragon Knight Tusk combination, not too bad. We have seen this before from Crit and ATF. You do have plenty of kill potential here on Insania with the double stunts to fly out, but we do have to wait for those levels to come up. With. Yeah, it, it's a hard lane to really pierce through as well. Like, the Faces Void can dodge out a lot of damage. I like this combination of Time Dilation plus Arcane Chris. It's just a really good feedback loop to get some aggression out on the side of Liquid and just holds off any sort of movement out from Crit. Makes it a little bit riskier for the Tusk to push into that lane, and it should provide enough space for Mika to juggle around that use of Time Walk if need be. Yeah, and there's that final lane, of course, Skidder and Snaking against Boxy and Sableye. Of course, Sableye, we talked about his Visage already, but we saw this a lot during the NADPC from the guy. Like, he really, really likes his hero. So when the, when the patch came out and I saw the changes, I'm like, oh, Sableye's going to have a very good time. And that he, that he is, and that is something we have already seen today for the previous series of Liquid. So far, lane going fairly stable. This is, uh, it's an all right lane for Skidder. You know, it, it's still a Nagas Iron. It can be a little bit harder to shove away. And I think the big thing is contesting into that push, right? You push that mid-tier one or bot-tier one, contest the jungle. Because if you do leave this Naga alone, a couple of those new items, you know, like the change disperser, could feel pretty good for Naga to hit some early tempo. That's the, uh, the fun of the new patch. You, you just never know what's going to come out, but I can't wait to see. For now, only one kill going the way of Liquid. Neither side really getting too aggressive. Seems like both sides just happy to sit in their laning stage and just farm up. Of course, Skidder is having the best time on the map right now. 13 and 1 on the Naga Sara. 
even with that kind of broken wet uh, visage combination, Skidder has not been threatened too much, but they are going to try and jump in now. But Snaking going to ensure the Boxy cannot go for the dead shot or the calling, though Snaking could find himself in a bit of danger trying to go for that three minute timing on the Lotus. He does not end up getting away with it. Snaking in huge trouble, but Boxy now being turned on. And both of them will go down at the same time as Skidder. Gonna try and go after Saberlight for a bit more damage. Skidder cutting through the tree line. Saberlight taking a fair bit of damage. One more hit will do it. There he does go. find it. Very nice here from the bot lane of Falcons. I, I like this realization from a lot of carry players and Skidder as well. Going for the end snare. In fact, going for two points in the end snare. Mm. Recognizing the value in just this chain stun. You've got the Venge, you've got the minus armor. You can still farm with lower level illusions. Not gonna be as quick. But you have a lot of potential of just bullying out this Visage. While his Soul Assumption is stuck at level 1, while his Grave Chill isn't that big of a threat at level 2, it, it gives you much more to play with to, again, set up for that tempo from your Naga and also prevent Saberlight from hitting Critical Mass a lot faster. You know, just prevent what we saw from that last series. This is not the same start for Saberlight. Speaking of Critical Mass, ATF having a real good time to turn the CS department as bottom lane snaking and Boxy now going to go at it. Now, Boxy's still messing around here with Snaking. Deadshot not going to be on the mark this time around. So still running. Snaking, he's got another stun in five. He really wants to kill him. Boxy, he may have overstayed his welcome. If Snaking can get within range for this, he, I believe he's barely there. He just needs the vision. And Boxy, he'll cop the stun. One more hit might do it. Still running. Deadshot is going to land. And Snaking wants to continue the chase, but Boxy does have the salvo. Bit of an awkward scenario positioning here for Boxy, but looks like he's going to be fine. He bails out, he doesn't quite have a TP for a few more seconds, so overall you're still kind of happy with this kind of skirmish coming out for Snaking. He's in position to steal away this Water Rune. Boxy yeah, could try to sneak around, but it, it's a little bit tougher. You've already gotten what you've asked for here on Falcons. You've still got this really stable mid lane starting up from all green, although you've built up quite a lot now in Nisha, which again, after you go past the first two, three levels, the Husker starts to feel better. And Falcons, well, they're starting to send some heroes in. It's making his way forward. So much pressure into the mid lane. Nisha, realizing they are around, will retreat for now. Snaking trying to wrap around, so will crit, but Insania is already prepped for this. So they know they're coming around this timing, and they will continue to keep Nisha safe. The calling will be dropped here from Boxy. Snaking was spotted on the Venge, but it looks like he's looking to retreat, though a nice dead shot gonna drag him back into the loving arms of Nisha. And Snaking, where well, he's gonna continue the run. Nisha, one more hit will do it. Snaking looking for a deny attempt, is not gonna find. Nisha will be able to secure the kill. It's a decent attempt coming out there from Snaking, but a great read from Team Liquid. This is what we've seen from Falcons time and time again. Just collapsing mid, playing with Malreen, getting an early kill into a bit of a shove on the mid-tier one, and opening up the side lanes. The side lanes still open up off the back of that movement. So again, you're still getting basically a solo lane for Skitter, a solo lane for Amar, no threat to kill off either the Naga and the DK. And then that normally plays into what Falcon wants anyway. Like, they just want Amar and Skidder to farm up as much as possible until they're ready to go, until they're ready to take some of these Tier 1s. Maybe on the top with Amar this time. Yeah, absolutely. You saw Boxy go Got for that 6-minute Invis rune. Does manage to pick it up for himself here on the Muerta, and we'll just move back towards the, uh, the bottom lane. Three heroes here from Falcons, though. They might be able to set up on Boxy or Saberlight. Sableight obviously the primary target, and in fact they are going to move in. It's now will lock him down. They'll drop the calling for the silence, but I do not believe it is going to help. Sableight is down. It's Boxy. Oh, oh he's not going to make it. That is unfortunate. That is just so much to bleed out on the skitter. And again, this slower start for the Visage, this timing into the Solar Crest, into, his, into the Vlads that we've seen, it's not going to be at the moment that you'd want it to launch off. We heard the panel, they need a launching point for the Visage and the Husker to buy space for Mickey to kind of just build up and get that map control going your way. You've got a lot more to play with on Falcons in comparison. And they're already applying some decent pressure with Skitter down bot. Our Naga has already taken up the Manta. Look at this, they're just cutting him off as well. They're not letting him get towards the T1 tower to try and defend. I, I love this play from Falcons. They know how important this Visage is to the side of Liquid as they do jump in again. Crit is going to get the shards off to lock him in, but the TPs are coming. Crit dropping low, but Sableight is gone. Now Mikkei trying to move in, but no. he does not have level 6. Mikkei's in trouble. Mikkei is looking pretty dead to me as he does go down. He moves in without level 6, so Chrono was not available for Liquid. I mean, he, he makes that move. I'm really surprised that he went in with his laning build. One level in time walk, three levels in time lock. Mm. Because he's trading with a DK, that doesn't make it safe for you to leave that lane. We have to sit back and form. They wanted to punish the movement, 
Instead, this is that tier 1 tower timing we were talking about. Skitter already ripping that bot went to shreds. Leads to an access point into the wisdom runes down the line. Leads into access into the triangle. And the Naga can just steal away a lot of that farm later on. That's a fantastic start for Falcon. 6-3 to three with a 2k advantage going their way. And the, the one saving grace here for Liquid is Nisha has had a very good time in the mid lane in terms of the CS game. But well, we are going to finally see some movement coming up from the man. Up toward the top lane he goes. ATF is by himself at the moment of the DK, trying to push out the top tier one tower. Mick A gonna pop the time dilation, in goes Nisha, Dragon Tower will be there, but it should not help ATF that much. ATF surely is just gonna die, as Nisha will finish up the kill. It's an important kill to find, it relieves some of that pressure on the top tier one, already less than half HP. So in terms of just setting up the tone, setting up for Falcon's next move for the objective, Amara still has done the job. Again, you're freeing up space for the Naga. You are relieving some of that pressure that you're experiencing on Mika and starting to launch Nisha off. But you have to watch Falcons. They know you've committed a couple of spells. They know that you've just rotated your Oscar. You might not be too keen for the next move. They've smoked up with Crit and Snaking looking for their own move now. Certainly have Mika. Big, big target if they could catch him. Crit, looking for a snowball attempt, will not have the vision. Snaking will not see him either, so Mikke backing off at the right time here will remain safe for now. Problem is, you can set up with a tier 1 top tower push anyway, just with these supports being around. It'll allow ATF, once he does have the dragon form up, to, to start that push once again. Mind you, ATF is still about 30 seconds away from that, so it's going to take a little bit of time here for the support to just kind of sit back and relax and ensure he does remain safe. It doesn't really seem like Liquid's going to be prepped to, to try and defend that top tier 1. They'll, they'll probably just allow it to go down. They can't really defend it all too well. You don't even have level 6 up on Insania to help you with some wider team fight control. You do have a Chrono, but damage inside, it's mainly off of Nisha at the moment. And it remains to be seen if they will really have enough as we start to approach closer 6 marks for Snaking with a swap available. I think the big issue for Liquid is really just that they're looking up top, they're leaving bot just all the way alone. And this pressure coming up top is mainly just from Mar and the support showing their faces. No one else is keeping Skitter safe. No, no one's scouting down bot. Uh, Saberlight's not even playing the lane, which is understandable after the threat from Skitter, just having that early control within Snare. Probably forced them to play more conservatively. Chrono, Although, top lane, they are going to try and defend. ATF going to cop the Chrono as now Nisha, Nisha does move in, and it seems as though ATF once again will be punished for sticking around. So Liquid do indeed decide they will defend. And it seems as though the rest of uh, Falcons, they're okay with this. I mean, they do rotate four heroes up to make that, that kill happen. It takes a lot of effort. It opens up this push now for mid, just a little bit of a shove. Not the quickest. Again, they're not connecting with Amar onto that tier one. Instead, they're just allowing Amar to soak all the attention, open up the mid lane, open up their bot jungle and bot lane for Skitter to free farm. And this investment is paying off. Like, this Manta for Skitter is going to be online in 1,200 gold. He's going to be able to dispel off the gold, the, the global silence. He's not going to be caring about that too much. They've got some good stacks built up here as well for Malarine, who's going into his own Yasha for a little bit more chase potential as well. And Liquid, I mean, they're, they're getting space out as well. You've got the full Solar Crest for Saberlight. They're grouping up mid. They need to find some of these objectives, open up the map so they can move across the river to make these moves. So the T1 tower would be very valuable. TPs are coming in. There's your jump in from Nisha onto the vent. So that'll be one door down already. Snaking, not going to quite make it. In comes Crit with the snowball, but Nisha, he's more than happy to just man up here against the side of Falcons. But they do ensnare him up, but the armlet toggles are keeping Nisha alive for now. He will not drop, as it seems as though Skidder does need to retreat, but the stuns are coming in from Saberlight. Just will not amount to much. They will get away with the Venge kill. The Liquid turning back around towards the mid T1 tower do not seem done quite yet. They want that tower down, and Nisha looks like he's just prepped for a team fight. He's ready whenever. They've got to open up that mid. Now they can invade down bot. They can make it a little bit less comfy for Skitter to play this farming game, get some forward vision, buy some space out for Mike to maybe shove Amar away. Although Amar will find that top tier one in the end, as the DK tends to do when left alone. Overall, a very even game. Map state would be slightly favored for Falcons in terms of just the objectives. Only the mid-tier one standing for Liquid is keeping Falcons' access across a little bit rougher. At the same time, again, this buildup coming out from Falcons is lining up. You do see Amar. He's gone for the Midas, as he tends to go for. And I just really want to see Amar take more activity. He's dragging attention in, but 
Once he has a blink, the BKB has got to go. On to ATF, Nisha, he's alone for now, but the help is incoming. Sees Crit, Crit trying to tank the gank here for his off lane, and it seems as though he successfully will. Crit does get a snowball off, but does not have anything like a blink to try and get away, though he will try and use the Pavise. His team is not coming, so they are just going to let Crit go down. At least he does save ATF, though, so well worth his life. Yeah, I, you need the gold to start flowing into Amar now as well. You know, to just hit again that blink or the Manta timing, or maybe possibly the BKB here for Amar in this specific game. Liquid, they've got, they've got some good timings. They've got the full Sanj up and running on Nisha. A little bit more durability coming out on our Husker will allow him to base tank that control. He's not going to be as worried about just the chain stuns from snaking and from potentially Skitter when he, if he does join in. And they'll smoke off the back of that. Snaking looking for a swap on Boxy. Does catch him. Boxy going to pop the ulti straight away, move in onto snaking and try to get some damage off. Not only much being dogged quite yet, though it seems as though he might have his way with this Venger. Snaking still trying to back his way out. There's a magic missile thrown. It's like Skitter in trouble with the familiars. He just wants to get up, pops the song. In comes Nisha now. He'll be put to sleep to boot. Snaking will be able to TP away, but Skidder, how does he get out of this? He's got no TP available, so the chase will continue. He will not try for the Twin Gate instead, running towards the west of the map, but Sableite still chasing, will not be able to catch him. The song does pan out. Yeah, buys them space. It will allow this tier one push to come in from Liquid, but they're using the space wisely on side of Falcon, shoving in mid, getting a more again, uh, a little bit more farm in the triangle, and just playing the build-up game. So Liquid take the opportunity. Don't find too much for their trouble. Tower take does even out map control a little bit more, but they don't have the vision to back up all these objectives just yet. Uh, they don't have forward vision. A mid tier one will fall to Malrin, and. With the forward vision that Falcon has, in comparison, it can lead to some opportunities down the line. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're taking Roshan right now. They'll sacrifice the T1 mid tower and just say, screw it, we want the Roshan. It's just more important here for Nisha. And that certainly will allow a, a momentum now from Liquid to start just moving in onto the side of Falcons very aggressively. Because Nisha already queuing up the Aghanim Scepter to boot. And once you've got that up, life does become extremely hard if you are Falcons in terms of dealing with this guy. Well, at least for another four and a half minutes, it seems like Nisha is going to be relatively safe as he does TP into the mid tier 2 tower. Seeing Maureen there for a moment, they wanted the fight, but instead they're going to have to settle with Snaking on the Venge. Snaking, no way out for him. He is going to tank the game. It's uh, a small, little, small little take, just taking back control as well in the jungle. Uh, Snaking did take the opportunity to try and drop a sentry, figuring they were scouted out, doesn't find anything for their trouble. And Liquid, with his spike on the Aegis, should be able to apply more pressure on the map. You know, they can start hunting with confidence, maybe, again, waiting for that Axe that you mentioned here, for Nisha to truly have that big jump in with Life Break. You've start, you're starting to get some damage pouring in as well for Mika in that Chrono. At least the Maelstrom, almost done. Well, maybe around 500 gold left. But the key things for Falcons are coming out now as well. Blink for Amar is flying out. So the initiation is lining up on Falcons uh, outside of just trying to catch out with a Magic Missile and the snowball here, so relieving some of the pressure on the supports as well, holding on to perhaps make a counter play in Chrono if the positioning's just right. Again, we've seen him more on this DK offlane before, where they okay. hand it to him. Bottom lane, Mikkei, does he know? It doesn't seem like he does, though. He is trying to look towards retreating towards the tissue tower. Ooh. Swap is there. Morris punch out as well. Mikkei, Ooh. he'll pop the Chrono. He does find three targets with that. The team is incoming. Mikkei, they weren't too fast to begin with. Mikkei still alive, is no. eventually going to go down. But Nisha, he's going to try and trade, see if they can find an effective team fight as they do take two for their drop. Uh, I'm not sure if you really want to call that worth here. Two supports for the sake of a carry, but uh, I suppose in this kind of game, Nisha might just be the real carry anyway. That is fair. Like, the tempo of the Husker is much more important. The Faces Void can just catch up later on when space is created. It's still not the best trade. I'm sure Falcons are going to be more than happy about that. They don't lose anything on Skitter. The Chrono is very forced coming out from Nikkei, which is understandable. It's, it's a panic situation. Chain stuns are coming in. You tell your teammates to come over, but Damage risk is it's too lacking when you're already halfway through your chrono duration when the TP's come. So missed opportunity for Liquid. Falcons, you lose two, but it's two, it's the two heroes you don't really mind sacrificing. You're still playing this greedy game. You've still got Amar just sitting back, building up. They will group up with that with that full blink up on Amar though. Yeah, it's a question as well of whether Skidder actually wants to get involved as he pops the song. Nisha right out of range of that. He's gonna avoid them completely. 
Something unfortunate here for Skidder. Just Song now on cooldown. It seems like Nisha is still a man on the run, though, snaking right behind him. Nisha will be able to move towards the east of the map and get to that high ground. It seems like Falcon's going to move into that die triangle, maybe finding Saberlight. The Saberlight backs out in time. So Falcons getting nothing for their trouble. We'll draw a line up towards the top lane. But by the time they get there, the smoke probably will just wear off anyway. It doesn't really seem like they're going to find anything out of this movement. No, nothing big. Falling down south when their vision's up north was maybe a bit optimistic. Amar? Yeah, they will catch Insania. Insania getting caught, trying to take the Watcher for himself. Does four stuff, but will not get to the low ground. So Insania will end up going down. ATF, he'll take himself a free position five. Now he'll take the freebie. And he should be able to get some D wards as well. It's a good control. Just completely taking over the top area as much as possible. And maybe start to look at chipping at these tier twos. They've, they've got control in the area. They're already invading the top area as well, with Skitter clearing out the camps. The side of Liquid, though, they're actually in mid. They're not occupying bot. They're not trying to sneak more from map away. They're looking perhaps for an opportunity with Nisha with the full Ags up here. Yeah, certainly Sony. Even goes for the Eye of the Vizier, just wanting that full cast range for the life break, just being able to go from a mile away. As Fritz going to find out the hard way, he will be the first target of Nisha here. And he will eventually go down. Nisha looking for a little bit more, does head north. But it seems though everyone just here being away. They aren't going to really find anyone else with just the Tusk to go down. But if you are Team Liquid now, you can look towards the top tier one tower. They've got the opportunity to do so. That movement does fully reveal Nisha's eggs. That should allow maybe some adjustments on Falcons with positioning, with how they scout out to look for these openings, to keep their saves on hand, to try to, to, try to drag their cores away from trouble. They have invaded the triangle now on Falcons. Again, they've got forward vision still standing with a sneaky ward up top, so they can see some movement across if need, if, if, they're, if the Liquid are trying to sneak across the map at all. AT11, net where it's still tied up rather evenly. And Amara is about to hit a BKB timing, so... Again, just all the tools getting ready here on the side of Liquid to start to open up this map. You've got the BKB being built up by Malarin as well. So the double BKB timing is going to be a big part in Falcons taking a more active position in these fights. Liquid, and they've been trying, right? Like, they understand that Nisha is the launching point for this mid-game. The Aegis, they probably did, they, it feels like they didn't get the full value out of the Aegis at all. Like, they don't find any further objectives. They don't take fights that lead into the objectives. The forward vision from Liquid is still not really there. So they're not able to cross the river. And that kind of situation just favors Falcons. Like, they'll play the stall game. They've got a greedy offlaner in form of Omar at most times. They've got Skitter just being efficient. I mean, you'll take this kind of farm game every single time, and Falcons? No, they, they are going to smoke up. Three heroes will head towards the north. Nobody really around, though, from Team Liquid. The Dire Jungle is not quite occupied. Nisha, he is at the top lane, but they're not running towards the, the right direction. Nisha looks like he'll be just fine. You do also have the option for Mickey on the far, far east of the, uh, the top lane, if you want, and they might actually check this. Falcons, can they head that way? Check the corner of the map, see if they can find Mickey, though Mickey now running towards the south. Might actually run for the next camp, but does decide better off. And that's a, a smart choice. The spidey senses were tingling there for Mickey. He'll be able to avoid the gank that wasn't coming here from Falcons. And it seems like Falcons, they're just going to settle for the top tier 2 tower anyway. They're not too, too stressed in trying to find this one. Yeah, they're in position to do so. Bot lane's not really shoving in. Mid shoved in her favor. No information coming out from Liquid. They're just kind of hugging the other sides of the map, so... Oh, They've got go. the opportunity to go for it. There is a two-man smoke. Team Liquid, they'll head up top lane. Lions are drawn out. They want the fight. Save line's going to connect as well. You've got the TPs incoming from Insania and Nisha. This could be a big one if they could find the initiation. Is all they really need. Mickey is going to have a look around. In goes Boxy as well, trying to get a bit of vision for his team. But it seems as though Falcons for now retreating, but they're under vision. Oh, they are under vision of Team Liquid. This could be a very, very nasty team fight as Mickey does jump in, finds a two-man corner with a nice swap out. Snaking will save at least one, but he cannot save ATF. In fact, he can't even save himself because he's been caught by Nisha. That'll be a two for nothing trade here for the side of Team Liquid. All off the back of a very nice ward on the Twin Gate high ground. Just a clever little play out from Liquid. And they're using the new changes to those uh, teleport durations really well. The outpost teleports are not as long. They can get in position much faster to contest. And that, that actually makes a difference. In the last patch, this kind of movement probably would have been slower. But they get into position nicely. Get that nice wrap, okay. that smoke. 
Bottom lane, they are having a look. The silence is there. They've got the Void silence up for now. The Snowball, though, not going to be within range in the Ensnare. It does barely make it in time. In goes Nisha. Nisha wants to go for the fight. He's onto the Razor. Still Maureen fighting back for now. The Walrus Punch out Nisha. He does go down. There is no armlet toggling when you're surrounded by that many units. Uh, certainly not. Really great song coming out. Really great chase to find that big target. And Senya, not too safe here. Certainly not. And Snare will land. Snowball is going to connect as well. And it seems as though Insania will be a, a bit of a freebie right after the Nisha kill. Bit of a cherry on top. I mean, that, that was a really nice move out from Liquid. And they, they chase down. They understand where Malgreen will want to go after that fight up top. But they overextend. You know, they don't have Chrono, they don't have Mickey around as well to try to help, even with just a couple of bashes or the time dilation. And they don't even have Saber Light in that area to play with the Auras. So just going in with not the full toolkit, not respecting oh, that. Oh, they've got Saber Light. The Visage has been caught. Skidder, he's a real problem moving in for the damage. And it seems as though the Visage just has no play. He will also drop Liquid. One after the other, just giving more kills back the way of Falcons as they do secure the bottom tier 2 tower. Falcons well and truly see him online now with a 4k advantage, but more importantly, this Naga Siren is slowly getting out of control. That it is. Heart not too far off. Going for that Ring of Tarrasque into the Heart Forest when you build up. Uh, Falcons, they've, they've got control of the map now. They've got a really good access point for a bot Roshan span. Uh, although it will switch over into nighttime, so they won't have too much control for long. But they can just gun for the Roshan next. The, the scary thing about fighting into Falcons is if you do force yourself into a big fight, it just doesn't take that long for Falcons to rip into the high ground. Let and you can't afford again. to let this Rosh go. They are, gonna, they are going to go again. Falcons, they smoke up as four. They're heading right towards the side of Liquid. Though Liquid do back off. I said four. It was actually five here from Falcons. Now Liquid will move to the opposite side of the map. Not interested in the team fight, even with the Chrono up. They are just not feeling confident at the moment. Just leave them be for now. Roshan will respawn indeed in five seconds. Falcons, they're going through the Toon Gates. They still want the team fight. They are not going to take no for an answer. The Vision, I uh, should see the, the Twin Gates being used, so they should be very well aware that Falcons are here in Liquid. They smoke up on their own terms, looking for the fight perhaps, looking for that big initiation from Mika. Not going to come out quite yet. They'll deal with the Naga Illusions for now. Roshan is officially available on the Dire side. So you do have the option to try and start that if you are Falcons, but you, you don't exactly have the fastest Roshan timing. Suppose with, with Skidder around, perhaps you could try, though. Still Liquid, not going to allow this one to go for free. Mika going to move back in, trying to bait for his team. Is now Foxy moving forward, getting the vision. Starting out from ATF. They do want them when it's a dead. Silence is committed by Insania, but they do lose Boxy. That's a start here for Falcons. The buyback is out from Boxy, looking to come back towards his team. As they do not want to allow Roshan to go the way of the Falcons for free, but the swap is out. Nisha forced to go for the fight. They go onto the bench, snaking in huge trouble for Nisha. He's dropping low. He can't toggle. Chrono is out. They've caught the tusk at the very least in snaking, but it's only oh, support. Song? And now the song comes out. Oh, Skidder. He's going to turn back around with the Saber Light, looking for the Visage, and it seems as though Saber Light, he'll go for the stuns, but how do you get out of this? You do not. Boxy, he will follow. That is a dieback on the Muerta. And Falcons, are they are just not flinching. No, they aren't. They take this really good position out. They just hug the gate and Liquid. Now they're forced to show first. You know, Mickey goes into the lane, tries to farm up, and then they just see that squishy support. Like, they just find this angling out from Amar. They pop the song. There's no opportunity for a big chrono until towards the end. And the fight was just way too fragmented. You're getting so much value out with how much time your Razor has to just stand in the center with the Eye of the Storm. The minus armor starts to pile in. And just the lack of great burst outside of the Husker just causes so many issues for Liquid. You can't, you can't burst down any of these heroes. You absolutely cannot. And if you don't catch Skidder in that Chrono, it just the song coming out that makes it so you can't really do anything. A real, real disastrous fight here for Liquid. Roshan does go the way now of the Falcons, and Maureen does take it for himself on the Razor. An 8k advantage going their way. I mean, it, it's still a relatively close game, all things being said and done, but if you're Liquid, you might just want to sit back and relax for a few minutes. Just, just give a little bit of time, try to get some, get some vision going in your side of the map. Uh, try to scout out that movement that Falcons would want to take in setting up onto the last tier two into the high ground. You've got the Amplify Damage Rune on Malreen, as is tradition after a Roshan take, of course. So, 
That's going to make this push a lot faster as well. Maybe even sweeten up that next fight. 8k lead standing for Falcons. They know there's no Chrono. They know Global Silence is back up at the very least. One additional tool here for the side of Liquid. But <sighs> Falcons, they're under no pressure. Full heart up and running on Skitter. Can just start to send these illusions out to keep every wave shoved in their favor. <laughs> and we're <laughs> Here we go. Oh, yeah, save lights getting done. Yeah, I'm not sure what ATFs are seeing, but he's seen something. It's Amar. Yeah. You know, he's, uh, as he's known, Amar the Filipino. And, you know, as we've sorted in our tier list, very Filipino indeed. He certainly is. how he plays his box. Oh, Liquid's still playing the avoid game. 10k advantage going the way of Falcons. Smoke is up from Falcons. They're going to try and find somebody on the side of Liquid. They know that they're south somewhere, and it is Mickey who is farming that Radiant jungle area. That's a huge kill if you can catch him. TP away though, Mickey seems to know something is a little bit awry and does just leave the area. Nisha will do the exact same. Do they go through the Twin Gates again? There's no vision to scout them into the gates here. They wanted to take that risk. Why TP out over instead? ATF's gonna go through the gates instead. The others will TP towards the top lane. Insania, hanging around this area. He's going to run towards the south, trying to avoid the side of Falcons, and it seems as though for now, he's going to be just fine. TP away, does he make it? Maureen going to get the vision and Insania. <laughs> oh, that's so unlucky. What can you do? It happens. It's a lot of space, though. Like, that's a lot of heroes rotating up top, only finding the silencer. Top You've lane. You've got some safe room to Top point. lane, Mickey. Oh, he's going to be able to time walk away. Now, this is where things get a little bit spicy, because Falcons, they want a little bit more. They know Liquid are hanging around this area. Nisha going to back his way out to boot. Mickey just going to go right into the corner and just hide in that area of Skitter. Still going to have a look through the northern side of the jungle, realizing that the camps have been farmed. And Mickey, he may just get caught. Ooh. He runs right into the Naga, and they do just silence him up. The Void, Mickey, he's looking like he has no chance to escape. It's the side of Falcons just getting so much value out of these rotations. And they move on to the top T3 tower. I mean, why the hell not? There's not much threat stopping them. No Chrono. Global Silence is back up with Insania spawning in, but what are you going to do with that without the additional control that you'd need from this Faceless Void? Nisha alone can't get this done. Does have his fresh BKB up, but this tower just melts. Jump in ATF, right onto Insania, getting the damage off with that Ancient Black Dragon form, but we'll back off, looking for the T3 once again. They just want the safer objectives. Liquid, not looking to defend the top racks. You kind of ask yourself the question now, Falcons, do they have an opportunity to go for the mid-T3 tower? Just force the defense out from Liquid. It seems as though they might. In fact, they jump in. Nisha getting caught by ATF, but has the BKB available? We'll have to turn around underneath these T4 towers. He'll find at least the Tusk for now. The Tusk, though, still surviving a little bit, but will go down. Crit is gone. Still, they move in onto Boxy. In fact, the T4 tower is even being targeted here by ATF, but Boxy eventually will drop. It's Nisha. That, that was his BKB committed, and he really just only finds a support task for that. It's, it's not the best feeling in the world for Liquid. They have stalled for Mika to be back up here, so they've got the Chrono to play with. They've still got the Fortify here as well. But the Aegis is still up for a minute, and there's nothing to fear here for Mongren. They've got the Cheese go ready to go. They've got the Song to bail them out as well. Uh, your tools on Liquid, it just feels like it's lacking. It certainly does. Maureen continuing, just draining the damage away from these familiars now as the tier 3 mid tower are going to go down, but it seems as though Falcons, they have probably seen enough. Aegis is expiring in 32, so they do not want to risk handing over the life of the Razor. It's just very clean gameplay overall, I want to say, from Falcons. Like, they are really not pushing, pushing the limits too far. They're just taking what they can safely get and playing very conservatively. I, I don't know how safe it was to dive into the tier fours. It's very confident. <laughs> confident and controlled for ATF, itself. it's just another day. Uh, it's, it's, it's Amar. You know, he, he's feeling himself when he feels himself after a little bit of farming. You know, his team buys him space. Yeah. He's set to go. Liquid, it, it's a weird situation to be in when you don't get that opening you'd want with a lineup that's trying to buy space for your face's void. Yet at the same time, you're starting to approach, you know, into the 40-minute mark, that point where Chrono is going to be this be-all and all spell. I just don't see the damage coming in for Mika just yet. You know, Njolnir's gonna be farmed up next. I don't know, there's so much he has to worry about. He has to worry about Snowballer, he has to worry about a punch from the outside if it's just on the edge, the swaps there, the songs there. He's basically asking for at least like three heroes, three specific heroes to be caught in Chrono, and that, that just feels like a near impossibility with how Falcons positions themselves here. Situation for the side of Liquid Falcons. 
18k advantage now, perhaps just waiting for that next Roshan respawn. Liquid, they'll happily take the time to keep that farm going. Just remaining grouped up here is Mike. Sadly, time walking into a, into a bit of a tree line there, getting stuck, but we'll be able to get out eventually. Mjolnir almost available here for the Voiders. They will take back their Dire Triangle. I mean, like you, you look at the, the other side of the map, it's just completely controlled here by the side of Falcons, and they are just moving very confidently on their own. Understanding Liquid will not go for any kind of a gank attempt at the moment. No. Like, everything's under their control. Every lane shoved out. Even this bop lane that they're trying to correct on Liquid is barely crossing the river. So you've got all the room for Falcon to just do what they want. They've got fresh buildup coming in. Uh, the Satanic Disassembly for Malreen is ready if he wants to with the Mask oh. of Madness. So. Post call there on the Tormentor of the Tire. Nisha will be able to pick up the Shards though, so happy days for him. It's gonna have help having that, that stronger inner fire as a liquid. They, they do need everything they can get right now. It seems like they'll hang around their die base once again as we're even gonna start seeing the Ags of Crit coming out. So you've got the Warriors kick online and that's when things get even scarier because now Crit can just set up every single time for his team and but that kick, it, 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 it's, a bit, it's a pretty big range. It really is and it just relieves pressure as well for Amar to kind of play forward. Crit can start to play forward and just safely reposition someone out, take care of the silencer before Global Silence is on. And that's just one half of the team fight of Team Liquid taken out of the equation. I mean, there's some timings here for Liquid if they want to stall out. This might be a little bit of a cope, but you know, you've got like, you've got like Husker 25, right? With Burning Spears, pure damage. That can be nice. You can start to hope Boxy gets that build up. We always see on support Muertos going into damage as well, but we're nowhere near that. Uh, it's, it's been pretty stark for Liquid. ATF, he's going to find Nisha. Nisha going to just try and jump away, but still is in oh, danger as the shot. It's going to lock them in. They the still are away. okay, Nisha. Forced to go for the fight. Does pop the BKB, but the Walrus Punch is out, and Nisha is down. <laughs> just complete control over the Husker. Is ATF going to have a little bit, uh, look for a little bit more? Not going to find quite anything yet, but can just move into the mid racks again. Start to poke into those objectives. Uh, it's a little bit funny, you know, Crit decided to kick Antania away just to save him, just to maybe save that treat for later as they start to threaten onto the high ground. Buyback is still available for Nisha. They've got to find an angle in the chrono, somehow. Here we go, ATF. I mean, he was being targeted for a moment. He is a Dragonite though, so I would not necessarily recommend it. That mid racks. Slowly but surely, we'll go down to the side of Falcons. Mickey still trying to find a, a decent chrono opportunity, but ATF is the one frontlining for his team, so it's very hard to know who to actually jump. You can't see anyone else but the Dragon Knight and the Razor, and neither option is really the option you want. It seems though Liquid, they'll accept the fact they are going to be two Raxes down here in this game one. They are still within this game, but it is looking harder and harder as time does proceed. Yeah, this game doesn't simplify in the way you'd want it to for Liquid as time goes on. Again, the threat of Chrono being the be-all and all, it isn't really felt because you're, you're worrying about three heroes and catching out to just get an effective Chrono in the first place. You're scaling on the Husker. It's still somewhat there to an extent, but you, it feels like you, you need more levels now. You need to even consider that level 25 brings your pure damage, if at all, is something you want. And you don't have control outside your base, so the next Roshan just goes for free here. Four Falcons into that pit. They've got the Ag's Blessing ready to go here as well. And that's just going to be more issues. Like, Ensnare True, Spell Immunity is going to be massive. Real in a little bit of a meme, but it has its utility here as well if they want it to. Oh, they'll get the Aegis yeah. basically for free here. The Liquid kind of just stuck on their, their high ground. They will move a little bit south and try to get that farm going. But now 29k behind is this dire side. And of course, Falcons understanding how far ahead they are. They might just move into the high ground. Go for the jugular. Steam Liquid. It's about time to prepare for this, perhaps this final team fight. They're going to maybe go for a bit of a smoke, and they do. Four man smoke up. Looking through the mid lane. Skidder is around the corner. But then again, so is the whole side of Falcons. Snaking, he'll be the one to break the smoke. Mickey jumping in immediately. They just want to blow up one. The Venge is dead immediately as now. They'll go for more. It seems like Crit is going to be the secondary target. Crit, he will eventually go down the snaking with the remnant swapping him out. Crit, he will survive. He'll eat the cheese up. It's that ATF now moving in onto Nisha. There's your chrono committed. But do they have the damage? It seems like they just made, but no, the song oh, comes no. out. And everything just stops as it seems as though the side of Liquid, they are out of gas here, John. 
They will try to continue the fight, but it is not looking too good for them. Maureen, he is taking a bit of damage here from Mike. Perhaps he is set to fall. That is one life. Liquid, can they keep the fight up? Back onto the Razor they go, and it seems the Falcons are going to let the Razor go down. Okay. That's a pretty strong fight from Liquid. That is. It just cost them a buyback onto Nisha. When you can see the issues again, when it comes down to these fights, you can't bank on the faces for it to kind of carry through. You have to have Nisha finding these openings, jumping in with the damage, being sustainable up front. And honestly, you have to have Saberlight in a really good position to try to get as much from his sole assumption as possible. Spamming that out, getting good usage out from the Shiva's Guard to burn through those illusions. They hold on. They remove the Aegis threat here from the side of Falcons. And Falcons takes that fight pretty far away from the objective. So they're not able to get much out of that space. And this is where Liquid can start to try to find solutions to these problems. You've got these Shadow Blade coming out for Boxy. He's going into the Ags next on the Muerta for a little bit of that parting shot, which I suppose can be useful in trying to kite heroes around or trying to save someone with the 50% damage reduction it does provide onto the physical body or 35%. There is some utility that can come in and the gold is being saved up, although he does buy out something else. Uh, it is just the full Shadow Blade. Falcons for their part. I mean, again, they, nothing's changed on map state. They still got map control. They might be a little bit more cautious going into those fights. Like, they pop swap really early on. You don't have the swap spam just yet on snaking. That's a little bit further away at level 25. So you're not always going to have that up when Chrono comes in. And that does lead to, again, openings. You're not able to just spam that damage reduction that spam swap can provide you as well. And for Liquid, I mean, they, they still have to hug their base. It, it, it looks difficult for them to just pop out. It gets some forward vision out, perhaps in their own jungle, to just expand this farming area, watch some entry points, and kind of just preempt Liquid. Pl play very conservatively, wait for Lur Falcons to kind of try to make a mistake, and capitalize on that as best you can. Heck, at this point, if you find one alone, and just catch them with a Chrono, you're pretty happy with that, if it's yeah. core. I mean, you really can't underestimate the, uh, the damage Nisha was dealing with that mm. last team fight as well. Like, he did 10k plus on that Husker in that last team fight, and it really is a matter of if he can stay alive, if Mikke can get a huge Chrono off, the damage is not the problem. Obviously, your songs coming out from Skidder are causing a lot of headaches here for, for the side of Liquid, but as the BKBs do come up, especially on Mikke, that will not be such an issue very, very soon as well, Falcons now, the ones that are playing a little bit slower, they are going to sit back, they're going to relax, they do not want a fight like that to happen again. Because if it does, Team Liquid, they might just have a comeback on their hands. And possibly, and never say never in Dota 2, especially with his patch and how wild it can be. And Falcons, they're, they're, they're just going to wait until that next rush. I mean, they lost that fight with Aegis. They're probably thinking they can't do it again without Aegis. And Liquid now, are the ones to try to tempt fate here. I believe they saw Skidder there for a moment. ATF also showing. They do retreat towards the east of the map. Looks like Crit will TP out. Skidder and ATF doing the exact same. They will not risk. Losing this game one. Look at that North Push Way. Is, well, yeah, the, the push is up. The DK illusions are also a pretty big problem for these towers. And I'll say ATF just being a real nuisance, forcing Liquid to defend those to boot. And sadly for Liquid, they will not find anything with that smoke rotation. They do, at the very least, force Falcons towards the other side of the map. And you are the ones behind us, Liquid, at the moment. So you do appreciate the space to farm. But that is about all you get. Just, just more time to stall. Try to find breeding room. Instead of Falcons, I'm, I'm actually thinking if teams would start to consider waiting for a leader Roche to get, say, the Roche banner if you want to push instead. Right? Like, there's always that utility with daytime Roche, I suppose. I'm, I'm wondering if that's something Falcons will hope for. Either a very fast Roche or a very long one that it rolls into daytime. That could be one way to just guarantee that shove in on the bot, set a tower and racks for Liquid in their part. I mean, it's inching up, right? Like, it, it's, the damage is starting to come true. <sighs> you mentioned Nisha having enough damage in the last fight, really because he bought back uh, with two lives. Uh, you're not going to be able to replicate that, which makes that process for Liquid to go outside and hunt a risky prospect. Or, again, just no one's willing to take that risk. So it's just going to be down to farm, and Falcons are going to be happy with a farm game. Eventually, you're going to have perhaps this full Ags coming out onto Skitter with a Blessing. 
just free up the slot space, get it down, get something to control through the spell immunity, which would solve a lot of your issues in some of these openings Liquid are finding. Uh, for the side of Liquid, you're working towards the site of Vice here for Saberlight, which is a huge piece of utility that will help them try to catch these big heroes on Falcons. Like, try to pin down Skitter when you find a real one. That has been the issue. Well, smoke up in Falcons now, though. Yeah, five man smoke here from Falcons. They're trying to move into that die triangle. Liquid reading the movement quite well for now. We'll back off. Mickey, though, shining on a Naga illusion. This could be very, very dangerous, but. They were not within range to make the jump in, so the Void will be able to make it out. Though Saberlight, not quite so lucky yet. Crit, he'll kick him back. The Visage, in huge trouble. They'll force the fight. Anyway, Nisha, trying to go for the fight, does get oh. the now the Chrono. Mickey, he'll find two targets. They'll take Crit down. The song does come out. Nisha, he will drop for this. Meanwhile, Maureen, he's gonna Satanic up a Mickey. Forced to just retreat immediately as now the chase is on Falcon. They want to hunt this prey down. Insania goes to will allow him to get away, but Mickey getting caught out and the Void is gone. No buyback. He's got no buyback available. It's Falcons now smothering the side of Team Liquid. Looking to go for the jugular. Saberlight just going down slowly but surely. ATF looking for his next target. Might find Boxy, but Boxy at least able to TP away. But it's a 3v4 scenario. How do you defend? The tier fours are basically gone. There's only one left and the Ancient will be exposed. And I think for Liquid, I mean, it's looking pretty rough. That it is. Um, a full minute. It's not enough time. It certainly is not. They are going to try one last time, but they've already caught Boxy out. The Muerta is down. Boxy, he'll fight back. The Ancient exposed. Under siege. It's Liquid. Moving in. It seems as though Falcons, they are going to play conservatively. Maybe assuming the Bimax were available, they will not risk it. And back Skidder, he's still thinking about it. They do have Megas up, so there's no need to risk it. They'll jump in for the kickback onto Boxy and Boxy. Well, that'll be a tieback immediately from the Muerta. Still 30 seconds without your Void and your Huska. Saberlight at least finding Snaking here in the Visage. That's one down, but that's not really the big problem. And GG is called. GG is called. Falcons, they will be able to successfully take game number one. And I'll tell you what, it was quite a smooth ride for them. John Liquid, I mean, it, there was a couple of great moments for him, but ultimately just not quite enough. Not quite enough. It did feel like the tempo that you expect Liquid's draft to have didn't really kick in. Like that mid lane for Malreen, for the Razor versus the Husker. Sure, you were finding a little bit more for Nisha. It didn't really translate to early movement out for Nisha anyway. He'd bully out Amar up top, but everyone else was just focusing on Skitter, you know, the side of Falcons ensuring the Naga hit that timing. And Saberlight didn't have that same impact that we saw him have with the Visage before. Like his lane just felt really slow. Malreen, uh, Skitter recognized this really great build by going two points in Ensnare at level four. Yeah. And just playing with that double stun, like it, it felt it impossible for Saberlight to try to bully and control that lane and hit that tempo the team really needed him to find here. Oh, well, with that, Jonathan, we do have our lovely panel on hands. Let's throw to them and see exactly what they have to say about this game, number one. Looks like Falcons are starting to figure some things out because previously when these two teams faced off in the group stage, it was a 2-0 in Liquid's favor and it seems like the tides are turning. But I don't know how much of it was Liquid kind of handing it to them because we were kind of skeptical about the Faceless Void pick even from the draft and whatever it was trying to solve seemed like he already had issues. The Venge was already in the game and then eventually the Naga came out seems like that Chrono was not able to have the impact that they were hoping for. I think what they were thinking with the Void is that you have the Tusk Snowball shards and then you have the Razor Static Link and he's a carry that can reliably get away from that combo. So there's no kill combo, it's going to lane well against Razor. They were planning on giving Razor multiple bad matchups in lane so that he didn't have a place to go. And that ended up happening in the game in the sense that Razor in the mid lane really struggled against the Huskar. So they did what they did against the Razor, but they might have focused too much on that aspect of the game because then they gave just a perfect Naga pick that was a good against Visage, good against Void, and then I feel like Skeeter just played that to a T. I I mean, on top of that, I felt like uh, Crit did amazing in the early game. Like, he was the reason why Sableight was so poor, you know. Uh, as soon as he made the top pull, the wave was near Amar's tower, he could just free farm, he went bot, he killed the Visage one time, and he waited. Moment Sableight TP'd after dying, he dies, he dies again, you know. That's really, really bad news as a Visage. And that kind of ruined his whole game. Yeah, it's very tough to play into that. And if you don't have solutions against the Naga, then taking a good team fight with Chronosphere is uh, limited on the fact that you have to get past all these Naga illusions who are also split pushing lanes. So a lot of the fights that happen around Roshan where everyone's standing in trees 
it's like you just always have to deal with these illusions being on top of your heroes and scouting things out so you got the fast uh, heart bloodthorn the, they use the bloodthorn to like crush roshan and give them good disables which uh makes the void now vulnerable it's something we talked about in the draft it's like oh there's not many solutions but like every carry is buying bloodthorn right now it gives them uh easy build up good kill potential uh true strike things like that so yeah i just felt like falcons was definitely better that game with their draft and how about that final pick, Huskar? We thought it was a little bit of a gotcha pick, but we had alluded to the fact that Maureen and ATF have a lot of overlap. So just because you see a DK doesn't mean it's going to go mid. It can easily go offlane, and it did. Ended up picking into a Razor. Yeah, I think the Razor did worse in lane than I would have expected. Like, I think Razor's been nerfed over the years in the early stages, so maybe Huskar wins that lane now. But mm. the way you beat Huskar is single target physical. Like, that's what that hero's always struggled against. So even though he had a really good start on Nisha, they have Venge minus armor, they have the Razor minus armor, they have the Tusk tag team. Like, they had a lot of tools to burst Nisha. We saw him go in a few times when he was really far ahead. We thought we had, he had Aegis that one time, and yeah. he just didn't, and then he died instantly. And I think that's something where they really... I think they just focused too much on the lanes, on Liquid. I think they had a good plan for the first like 10 or 15 minutes. It was clear they were off to a good start, except for the bottom lane for, for Saberlight. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how they plan to deal with Naga. Yeah, the, the two blind picks uh, at 16, 17, they, they chose to pick the faces for, uh, sorry, the Visage uh, and I think Moeta was yeah, it? Same time. Uh, the 16, 17. Uh, I didn't really like that as much because I, I felt like Visage is not a off lane hero where you can afford a bad game, right? So you don't see your lane. I mean, sure, you, you see a Razor, but the Razor could, could have been anywhere. You know, you, you can't say that, oh, I'm just going to have a good lane based on that Razor, you know. But you, you just kind of assume that. And you kind of needed a more neutral hero, I felt, at that point, to enable the whole draft because they already had a faces point. So you need, you need something like, like a Centaur, probably, like, or Doom, you know, for example. You know, so, somebody who doesn't really care about getting countered in a lane, or if he runs into a bad lane, he can recover. Research is just not that hero. So in order for their draft to work, it can only work with the Huskar just snowballing out of control. Sure, he won his lane, but it just wasn't enough because the other four heroes didn't provide enough value in the draft. Yeah, in game number one against Secret, when Liquid did previously pick this Visage, it was a second to last pick Visage. He didn't know his carry matchup because Secret ended up picking the Faceless Void, but it was still later on enough in the draft that you could tell that your Visage was protected and it would be able to contribute a little yeah. bit more in this game. It's really, really important to understand which uh, the, the value of which offlaner at a different pick, you know, a first pick or second pick, you know. For example, if you're picking on 18, you see an extra hero, then I, I think that you have more information to decide whether you can pick a polarizing hero like, uh, for Sabler, you know. That's why I was talking about Sabler is a offlaner, he's greedier, he needs to be given a lot more attention in the draft, and, and sometimes it's difficult to balance it out in a draft for him. And it's even harder because uh, the Visage does do a lot of magic nuke right now, but if you look at the cores on the enemy squad, he's, he's trying to nuke down a Nago with a heart, mm. he's trying to kill a Razor who's going to have a lot of HP, and a Dragonite. And uh, the Snaking, he, he grabbed a pipe, so all of a sudden all this yeah. damage is just mitigated that was really smart, though. in, in small, small or moderate ways, just to make it even harder for him to get kills and actually catch up into the game. I mean, on, just... on top of that, you, if you look at their heroes, so Silencer, Faces Void, Visage, they're all afraid of the same type of hero, you know, the Illusion hero. Okay, yeah. And they all, pick, they all pick it all together. I mean, for sure they pick it for a reason. It was Venge or Rafa's pick. They decided Silencer would counter it with the Global. But I, I felt like they were really thinking too much on uh, countering the opponent's lineup. And then you, at the end of the day, you need to have a lineup that functions. And I felt like it kind of didn't really function at the end of the day. Especially because we've kind of learned that Falcons excel in the 15 to 30 minute range. And so I can kind of see Liquid's logic where it's like, okay, if we're able to make team fights uncomfortable for them with our Muerta tossing out things, with our silence or global silence, then once we go past the 35 minute mark, then Falcons typically kind of falls apart to pieces. And we actually came to this panel because it looked like Falcons were about to end the game, but Liquid were able to hold on for a little bit longer. So for as successful as this game was, I'm still kind of iffy on Falcons past 40 minutes these days. Yeah, I think the reason why I don't think this game is a strong indication of what will happen in game two is in these drafts, the way I, th I view a draft being advantageous is how many fights do they have to win to take crucial objectives and end the game. And it felt like every time Liquid won fights, other than the first Roshan, they were kind of just stuck on their own side of the map because Naga was constantly clearing waves. Mm -hmm. And if they ever lost one or two heroes on Liquid, they're losing Elena Rax. They're being forced to go back into their base and turtle. And we see here Skeeter versus Mickey. The Naga, 12, 0, and 10, <laughs> 1, 4, and 11. That just, 
That's about the most one-to-one -one counter in the carry roll, Naga versus Void. I don't think there's very many matchups in the game that are worse, mm -hmm. uh, just in the carry-to-carry. -carry. And so you're seeing it here. Like it, But we have to give credit to Skeeter that you have to play the Naga flawlessly. And his, he was always at fights. Winter was even saying, like, oh, look at this Naga, <laughs> TPing to the mid-fight as a carry at 10 minutes into the game. That's what I want to see. And he may or may not have called me yeah, out. Yeah, to, to go back to that point, um, I, I felt like Mekke was also he had to do a lot, right? He TP'd when they were they were going on Sableye, uh, when before he got level 6, it was the level 5 faces void, oh, TP'ing yeah. into the, the Visage lane, because he felt like, oh my god, my offlaner is getting dumpstered, you know, I, I need to do something to help him, but he TP'd down, and it was a buy one, free one after that, one plus one. Both of the calls went down. But he had uh, he had the idea that he needed the Visage to have a, a good game, you know, otherwise he, he, would be able to, he wouldn't be able to do much in the game. Any new information on the heroes that we're seeing here, Purge, because this is basically our third series of 7.35 Dota that we've discovered. Uh, it seems like some previous trends are still carrying on. Like, if you showed me this draft, I wouldn't have been shocked if it was a previous match draft. But anything else strike your fancy? I mean, I think items are still the part that I am obsessively thinking about. Okay. Uh, when I sleep, uh, when I dream, everything. Well, uh, I, can I can give you something to think about in that topic then. There were two rattle cages <laughs> on the side of Radiant. DK yeah. picked up a rattle cage. So, and I thought for a high armor hero, why would you do that? Well, uh, you are taking damage from birds, whatever else. It's more damage basically while being tanky uh, mm -hmm. is good, uh, basically. And I think the neutral items actually, there was an abundance of armor items in this patch yep. uh, thrown through neutral items. So could mean that like magic damage is a little bit better in some cases, but uh, either way, uh, it made sense on the dire side to grab all the armor. You know, they've got a Avenge and a Razor, but um, yeah, HP is uh, is already really good in the past patch. So if you're just slapping like 12 armor on top of that, it's a huge amount of EHP. So it's just worth it to get it in a lot of cases. I like your idea. I think that this patch definitely geared things towards more defensive items. Shout out to the Craggy Coat returning. Can't wait to start using that. And I can't wait to get to a game number two. So stick around, everyone, and we'll be right back with Falcons versus Liquid after a commercial break. Twenty twenty three. Aliens are real. Valve is listening to the community and improving Dota. People are playing Artifact. The paranormal is real. To ensure perfect package deliveries in these paranormal times, DHL has created a new subdivision to investigate mysterious happenings in Dota 2 and beyond. They call it the DHL Dark Division. Okay. Take your time. Attention DHL Dark. This is the director. You better listen to me, boy. The Force 50%, the Shadow Pool, High Variance Behavior Score, it's all real, it's all there. You just gotta believe. believe. Man, forget about all that now. Mysterious happenings are going on in Malaysia. Nah, I ain't talking like nobody picking support in the last 15 years in sea servers. I'm talking, you know, about paranormal packages being delivered by couriers and stuff in Dota from our on-site facility. Now get your team, get in that facility, and figure out what the hell's going on down there. Bring Sheever too, she's bored. Sheever! Yes? We gotta get to the bottom of this. We have to uncover the truth. This is big, Sheever. This is bigger than the mystery behind who thought the immortal matchmaking party system was a good idea. The KO facility is heavily guarded and by all accounts perfectly functioning but we know that it's the source of these mystery packages. We will have to get in undetected. Yeah. We do not know who to trust. We don't. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, if we want to get in there, we got to go off the book, Sheever. We need to do IRL smurfing. I'm sorry, Bobo. All right, Sheever, you ready for this? Yes. Let's do it. Our mission is simple. Get in, find the person responsible for the mystery packages, and get out. 
It could be anybody, Sheever. Ice Frog, Purge for the hundredth time. Really anyone.
Welcome back, everyone, to game number two of a Team Falcons versus Team Liquid, where we have shipped in the DHL Dark Division to figure out what strange happenings are going on here in KL, such as Nisha playing a Huskar? I thought he was more honorable than that, and you saw he got punished for it. That, that kind of behavior should not go rewarded. Team Falcons put him in his place. That's a that's a lump of coal. Losing that's game the one. lump of coal right there. <laughs> what a frost of his gift it was. I have to assume that we'll see something more traditional coming out of Team Liquid here in game number two. But the bands stay very typical, although this time they don't ban the Chen. Falcons do. Instead, Liquid just heavily target Amar and I guess Malrine heroes with Mars, Timber, Razor. Falcons take out the Primal, the Slardar, the Chen, and the Venge. And they are also first pick this time. So that might help them adjust uh, and try to create a new strategy around a new hero. Like I, I feel like at, at the moment, having first, first pick means uh, a lot in... Uh, you can always use the seventh band to protect your overall first pick, which I feel like it's a, it's a big value for the draft. And you always have that 18 pick to pick your win condition hero, kind of. And if you don't build your draft uh, in, uh, well initially, sometimes having the overall last pick doesn't really matter as much, you know. I'm interested that they banned Razor on the side of Team Liquid. That's just a lot of respect for Falcons because I think Nature's Prophet's really good against Razor, just in lane, as well as like the Sprout later game, and usually can buy utility items to like Force Staff and the Ags to control the Razor and disengage from the from the Static Link for his teammates. But they go for the Gyrocopter, most likely gonna be a support. But they have run Io Gyro earlier on in this tournament. That was obviously a different patch on the side of Team Falcons, so potentially a flex pick. It is, um, and I think that was the big threat of the, the Razor. It maybe put them into too weird of a spot in the last game um, with mm -hmm. Mickey drafting here. Uh, maybe his priorities are a little different, or maybe he's adapting to the role a bit, but I could see that uh, yeah, the, worrying about the Razor matchup that much, especially when it's Amar playing it potentially, it just got things too wonky. Like, just go back to basics kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, the Nature's Prophet gives them lots of flex as well. Both teams have flex here. Inja Arrow makes a lot of sense as an opening too in that same vein. Yeah, I think that's a very important thing, you know, whenever you lose the first game and then you, you are trying to counter the enemy lineup way too much and then second game, you just need to keep, keep in mind that you, you have to have a functioning draft, you know, maybe you just try to focus on what you're trying to do, build a draft around your carry, your off laner, uh, or, or your mid play, you know. The last game, I felt like that draft, it was kind of all over the place, you know. You have a Void and then you have an off lane Visage, then you have a Huska, the draft just doesn't come together. And hopefully with this Nietzsche's Prophet opening, Flex pick, they're going to be able to build on it onto something, you know, maybe, maybe play more on the early game, try to get uh, lane dominators. Since Nature's Prophet, he doesn't really care about the 75 mana, Pin Gate, I can just TV over. Yeah. Sounds like you, you were describing their winter. Would you say that Team Liquid were experiencing a little bit of tunnel vision? Yeah. Okay, pop quiz panelists. Which neutral item has the passive called <laughs> tunnel vision now? Okay. It's a tier two uh, neutral It would be the one that restricts your night and day vision. I don't know what it's called. Though. That's what the passive does? Yeah, it's the 10% spell amp, but I don't know what Purge. it's called. I don't know. <laughs> I could pick the image out of a lineup. I don't think you could, time. actually. Whisper of the Dread. Whisper of the Dread as you rapidly scrolled through oh, the changelog. <laughs> yep, I've gotten that wrong. <laughs> How can you be wrong, Kevin? Happens all the time. He, he's only, he has to be at home to go in full changelog <laughs> mode. That one's good. I'm surprised we haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I know. Yeah, 10% spell amps. Not, nothing to scoff at. For a tier two, it's pretty good. Anyway, meanwhile, the bands continue filtering in. Kanka gets taken out. Pango gets taken out. And Venge was already banned, and Falcons are kind of agonizing over this first, second phase ban. Yeah, Venge is uh, kind of feeling like a, a strong hero right now, very, very strong hero. I and mean, he was kind of a decent hero before, but now he feels like he's a, he's a threat in draft, you know. It's kind of like a, a very flexible hero, which allows a lot of uh, other picks to be very stronger, like amplifying a lot of the physical damage, the save, which is really good right now. And they have another save, us, the snowball. Maybe uh, the uh, tell of uh, the value of the faces void in the last game. Um, the ban void instant pick tusk kind of guarantees that whoever the carry is, they have kill threat on them. Whereas void kind of just gets out of all that danger. Mm -hmm. I mean, you always have anti mage. Anti -mage. built in blink. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Are you a fan of anti mage, Brian? Oh, that hero is so strong. You can I love <laughs> having anti mage on my Ooh. Ears, especially. All right, anti mage time. Now this Ooh. is extra. Now they're going the circle strat. They're like, we are not getting Naga Sire in two games in a row. There's no Naga yet on right, Team Falcon, I, but it will not be coming up. Can I rant about the CM shard briefly? Look, Go to it, town. This, what if we say no? This shard, I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> okay. The shard before this patch was pretty good. Like, okay. the, the undervalued aspect of it is if somebody has AoE damage, 
they blow it up and it triggers faster. Just describe it to the people. Crystal clone, you make it, and what does it do? You do a reverse. It's like you're, you jump backwards. Sprank. About 300 of them people. I don't want to have to explain Sprank as five, well. Five, That's five, not true, very true, clear. Fair. Uh, make a little clone. After five seconds, it explodes in an AoE uh, frostbite. But if it just dies earlier, then it can uh, line it up like instantly. So this is pretty broken now because, in my opinion, it's potentially broken because you can break it now with Nova. So hypothetically, if you get, let's say, a Blink Dagger with a Shard. Okay. You blink in, you do the the thingy, the crystal clone. You instantly. <laughs> Wait, you're Nova. not gonna you're gonna not, you're not gonna start with your own frostbite. You could potentially. Okay. And in some ways that's better because then they're more layerable to do. Three Agreed. Bites. But regardless, <laughs> blink in, cast it, Nova. They're instantly frostbite, and after that three seconds is up, you hit them with the second frostbite. Okay. We're talking a six second route if you have blink and shard potentially. So are you saying you should always rush the shard right now? No, not necessarily. But I think it's pretty solid. Because it's another way to move up and down cliffs and things like that. And you can layer disables, you can push creep waves with it. I'm not saying it's amazing. Also, disjoints. So I'm not saying it's I mean, like the most amazing thing. Hey, you get ice shard, you're like, oh, see ya, dude. So you're saying the support Crystal Maiden's gonna <laughs> blink into the middle of the fight? I'm just saying that if you are ganking on the map somewhere, oh, you have a, a very layerable, like, six okay. seconds of root. That's okay. all I'm saying. She's just saying the support Crystal Maiden is gonna be really farmed. Yeah, okay, okay. She's gonna have a plate mail. She's, she's gonna have a Midas first. <gasps> I will always advocate Throwing for... Throwing an axe, whatever, who cares? <laughs> Battle Maiden Good. builds. Okay, yeah. so we talked about the Viper before game one. Yep. This is another, like, Razor-esque hero for Falcons, where both Malreen as well as ATF specialize in this hero. So, a little bit of flex potential there, going into the absolute last pick. Could be Viper mid, could be Viper off lane. They go for the Alchemist. What's most important for me about Alchemist is you can blind pick him if you have kill supports. Because Alchemist doesn't trade all that well in lane, mm -hmm. but he's one of the best carries at all inning for kills with the Concoction plus the Acid Spray. So they have Gyro in lane, and then we're probably going to likely see that same or a similar rotation from crit on the tusk as we did in game one. So we've got to be very careful of that on the side of Team Liquid. And they go for an elusive potential offlaner here, like we saw offlane Windranger I mean, here you feel, earlier. Don't you feel like they're trying to pick it for the lane in Viper? Yeah. Because the Viper was picked to counter the Lash in the lane, right? So they are trying to switch things up and move the Lash to the offlane. Mm, it could also be like Windranger goes midder safe lane. It could be like a flex between those two. It, to mirror Too the Too much Viper? flexing, Brian. Uh, like they go to the gym recently. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Nisha, man? He's bulked up. I've seen you yeah, oh, at thanks, the gym. That's, that's really nice. We didn't touch too much on the last strike in general, but previous draft you guys were mentioning you got buffs. The attack speed slow on Lightning Storm. Mm -hmm. Is that's, that that's enough to make it relevant? Because it's not even being picked against any illusion heroes, which is usually Lesh like signature. Yeah, and Lesh kind of needs like a... Uh, a lot of things, you, know, you, you need your team to buy Solar Crest, you need your team to buy Glimmer, you need your team to buy Force Stuff. I think in this game, I could see them needing everything <laughs> for the Lash. At least he has a mana battery with Maiden. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. I, I, don't, I don't know if he wants the Maiden in his lane, you know? No, she's going 4-4-0 and Blink kind of. <laughs> right, right. The Purge build. I mean, I would say that the Solar Crest is like far better on uh, with the Lash Track on your team than it was before, because what he really needed was raw health, mm -hmm. not so much. And maybe a little armor, of course, the, the Solar Crest doesn't do that to him anymore, I believe. You just get armor and HP. Barrier. Yeah, you just get the physical barrier. But it's still the weakness to Lesh is single target physical damage. So I think it, it, it could definitely be made to work here. So the other thing that got buff about Lesh is the Bloodstone right here. Some um, cast range. Bonus it cost makes range. his AoE abilities more AoE. His <laughs> so like his Pulse Nova hits a wider radius and then his stun is also a wider ah. radius. So it's all bigger circles. It's actually pretty relevant on Lesh Rack specifically. Would Edict catch a further radius? I don't think so. Why not? If Pulse Nova gets a bigger radius, why wouldn't Edict? Oh, Kevin would know. Kevin, no, Kevin? Kevin wouldn't. <laughs> Neil would literally know this answer better than me. I will. <laughs> I, I have not tested, but I'm inclined to believe that Edict would be increased. We did test Pulse Nova. The only reason I find that relevant is because if you're pushing tier three towers, now your left strike can stand a little bit further back and munch away at towers. The, four, being, the 45 range. It's going to make all the difference. It's 75 <laughs> range. And then you just get kicked back and you're like, oh, that 45 really <laughs> helps. True. Tusk is in the game. Yep. That's why the Lash needs a, a meat shield in front right now. They have too many backline heroes. They need like a, a tanky, beefy boy in front. Well, Falcons are expecting a tanky, beefy boy. They ban out the Magnus and the Brewmaster, which leads me to believe that Falcons expect this Windranger to be a side laner. Hmm. If it's hmm. a sign lane, uh, what other mid heroes that can be a tanky boy right now? There's no primal. I guess that's what Kanka. 
But Kanka doesn't like laning against Viper. You need a hero that can lane against Viper, and you need a hero that can be a tank for your team. I still think Terra Blade's nice. Terra Blade? You want to it's, carry? You're yeah, gonna send, like, uh, I, I, think, I think any side lane... Like, I think it matches up really well against Viper. Matches budget really not well approved, Alf. Brian. <sighs> Too much budget. Well, where, where are you expecting this Viper to go right now? At mid or safe lane. But okay. I, if you have Wind Ranger mid, and then... Wait, mid or, mid, mid or off? I, I'm sorry, you guys are, I don't know what you're saying. They're, these are all flex picks, right? Oh. Holy. Okay. That's not a flex pick. That's not a pick I ever see. No, he definitely is flexing. <laughs> Nisha's flexing his smile muscles no. right now. No, Guardian no. Angel was changed. Now it's a single target ulti with charges. Yeah, who's the carry? It's, I mean, it's cool you save whoever Alchemist goes on. Um, this is probably... It's probably Omni Knight. Omni does a Om lot Omni's, of bursts. Omni's the carry? It, I'm pretty sure they're putting Wind Ranger against Viper, regardless okay, yeah. of whatever lane right. Viper goes yep. to. So okay. Falcons are going to dictate. No, let, can, can Lash be the carry? Omni's a core somewhere. They're all cores. And Omni is. Crystal Maiden also. Oh, oh, <laughs> Omni's laning against the Elk, maybe? Yeah, Omni would I do think, well. I think that makes Elk. a lot yeah. more sense. He's hard to gank with the Tuscar rotations, too, so that's probably the idea behind it. Well, what do you build on this hero now? Do you go Echo still? Yeah, probably the Echo Shard build. Very sharp. Harpoon, potentially. This also makes it really difficult. You were mentioning the armor for Lush being an issue. Lush is definitely one of the best heroes to have the uh, Guardian oh. Angel on top of. Yeah. But that's immediately countered by the Shadow Demon yeah. coming out from Chris. So they actually rotate the Dude. Tusk to a core role in order to get this gotcha. Shadow pick. Demon counters like Lush, Wind Ranger, and Omni Knight. This is but probably the sickest calls. Shadow Demon pick I've ever seen. That is seen. all three calls right there. Wow. No, I think somebody just mentioned uh, if you use Omni's second skill first, then the dispel doesn't. No, but Shadow Demon's through. the only dispel in the game that goes through BKB. So, oh, okay. or through magic. Spell it in. It'll, yeah. it'll dispel through. It'll dispel everything that Omni Knight has, yeah. That's so, a counter. Yeah, so is this a GG, Brian? Uh, uh, Demon counter. I would say calls? if crit's on point this game, then, which he usually is, <laughs> this is probably the best support pick I think I've ever seen in a draft. So, yeah, I'm going to have to hand it to. I, I want to hand it to Liquid for picking weird stuff. I'm into that. On patch day, come on, Mike. <laughs> yeah, but they give it to Saberlight. This man knows that he's not destined to be on this team much longer, so he's like, guys, how do you feel about me playing Omni Knight in front of a crowd? Who knows? Crowd, are you excited for an Omni Knight? <laughs> give the people what they want, I guess. Is it going to win for them? We'll have to find out. Let's get ready for game number two with Mike and John. Thank you so much, Tsunami. We are going to get into it. Game number two here between Team Liquid and Team Falcon set to get underway. Jonathan, I am very excited too. We've got, a, we've got an offlane Omni Knight going on. We've got a mid tusk coming up. What are you thinking? Are we going to a game number three between these two? I mean, if there's a draft to do it, well, this is it for Liquid, right? Like something this unique on this new patch is going to be interesting to watch it's out weird. for. I love this last pick, Shadow Demon, though, for all the reasons that BSJ has mentioned as well. It's just, it clears out everything, yeah. especially with the changes to Omni Knight, where you're probably going to be able to dispel that one hero that's being jumped on every single time if your position is right. So it's, it's going to be easier to manage. I think it's going to be interesting to see new Omni Knight work, especially from the offlane, and how well that save works. Uh, it's going to be cool. You know, we were looking for some of those fresh changes in the last match. We didn't see that many new items kick in in our own game, but maybe now we will. Yeah, can I just say I was absolutely revolted. Crystal Maiden did not get nerfed in the movement speed department again. Uh, very, very sad to see. Hopefully next up patch though, Ice Rock will <laughs> rectify that mistake, Jonathan. We, can, we cannot have this hero moving. Yeah. That upsets me. Should be a turret. Uh, it, basically her shard should be her actual default state. <laughs> and she, her spells will hurt herself. Uh, the player will end up just not wanting to play the game, but you know, that's what you, that's what you want yeah. with Crystal Maiden nowadays. It certainly is. It looks like we are going to be heading into game number two rather soon. Looks like we do have a, a quick pause coming out here, uh, as we do have a, maybe a technical issue. We'll find out and see. Uh, apart from that, though, Jonathan, we did not get to see many new items last game, which is no. a little bit disappointing. And the only item I think that was super changed last game that we got to saw was the was Solar Crest, which has been extremely popular anyway, so it's kind of expected. Yeah. But the other, the other items, they weren't really, they weren't really picked up. Yeah, I'd like to see Parasma picked up. Mm. I'd like to see Bloodstone picked up. This is a game that could have that, with Lush Rack on hand, the tier E crafting around that. We'll see down the line as this is going to be a fun game, either way, right? Like the drafts are very unique from both but, sides. I mean, there's a Viper in Alchemist in exactly. my game, Jonathan. I'm not sure how fun this exactly. is really going to be. It's going to be fun for one of the teams, I suppose, and the other team is going to be suffering either way. And that, that's the way these drafts kind of work out. I am keen on seeing just Amar back on Viper. I think it's going to be really a, a bit of a troublesome lane for Mike. It, it's just not fun. You're, you're still ending up with a Viper 
versus Lesh, depending on where Mika does decide to go. There are some really good forward wards here from Liquid, like a very sneaky one behind the tier one tower mid, and one by the ramp. They could, tr they could try to chase down, but they're just hugging their tier one, preempting any movement out from Falcon. Still, this forward vision should open up movements into the four minute rune, the six minute rune is going to be a big one, and try to apply that pressure onto this tusk if at all possible. Absolutely. We, we do see a lot of pressure being applied by both these sides into the mid lane. Like, it seems like there's a lot of emphasis being placed around that five, six minute mark. Of course, you do have the power rune timings as well coming out around that mark. So, this ward surely going to be able to pay off here for Liquid, but we'll have to wait and see. As Falcon's still being very, very patient on their side of the map, seems like Liquid also going to prepare for perhaps an engagement by the river. But now, Falcon's going to move in. See if Liquid want to try and oblige by this fight. Foxy will reveal himself for a moment. Maureen could go for the shards if he really wants, but he'll hold out for now. They'll move in onto Crit, but Crit is going to be just fine. It seems as though there is going to be no real chase. There, there was a Blood Grenade also thrown out, I believe, by Boxy, which will really amount to nothing. Yeah. Bounty? Oh, they don't get it. Very nice deny from Crit. Right on point with that level of one disruption. And that should set a good tone to kick off here for the side of Falcons. Just having a little bit of a lead coming out. Taking a look at that mid lane here for Malreen up against Nisha. We don't tend to see that mid Tusk too often nowadays. The matchup against the Wind Ranger shouldn't be the oh, best lane. top. Yeah, Crit already being punished here by the side of Liquid as Boxy moving in early on. Crit trying to survive the best he can, but no, he is gone. Liquid, a surprising initiation coming out. ATF though, looking for a trade. Already onto Insanium. Just look at the damage output. However, now ATF, oh. he's also going to find himself in trouble and he's gone. Boxy with a double kill to get the game started. ATF, he thought he had his way with Insania, but not quite. All right. It's a rough level one to go into when you've got that Nature's Prophet with the teleportation ready and just the Blightstone to enable those right clicks. You've got the best chain stun set up with just the Frostbite coming in and the Split Earth. And Crit, he can't do much with Disruption. It, it, it was handy for the Ruin. It's not that handy for the save here with its significant cooldown coming in, so it didn't even have that to try to spam out. And they capitalized that on that very nicely on Liquid. This is a good change of tone in comparison to how maybe passive the last game was for Liquid. Already getting that early activity out, getting that early pressure onto Amar, it's going to feel great. And we're taking a look at the bot lane as well, where you are getting Saber Light on that Omni Knight up against Skitter on the Alk. This is a pretty interesting lane. We just haven't seen too much of that poor Omni Knight in recent time. And again, this hero got pretty significantly changed with the Guardian Angel, which is probably not going to be the biggest factor for this hero in the off lane. Anyway, I am keen to see what Saber Light will go for in the build, more than likely just the usual Echo Saber, and how much he can really stop Skitter from farming. Because despite that activity top, it's not, you know, you're, you're leaving your bot lane alone. Omni Knight solo up against Alchemist Gyro doesn't do anything, so you're just farming as a oh, hard yet. Yeah. Top lane just being completely targeted here from Boxy's. Boxy with another great rotation, able to secure the Viper. And I'll tell you what, John, as a, as a person who has played a couple games of Viper in my lifetime, you, you generally don't enjoy not dominating the lane like this. And well, Crit, he is still being chased down by Boxy. Boxy, for a sprout, kind of out of range, may just find it eventually as Crit does have to take it. Boxy, though, still chasing him down, can't quite finish the kill. Won't really matter, though, because you, you got ATF, and that's the big target you really wanted as bottom lane. They're going to try after Saber Light. Saber Light taking a fair bit of damage on the way out, but he's not going to die. Yeah, just a really durable here on that Omni Knight. You've got the Repel up to regen through. You're still copying a lot of damage, and you're not stopping Skitter from farming, but... At the least, you're getting that space to get some EXP, and this allows, again, this aggressive movement coming out here from Boxy. He's just camping top, basically. He's ensuring that Mika is not going to be slowing down. He's ensuring that we will see the Slush Rack have some nice early impact, perhaps threatening for that push onto the mid-tier one, maybe rotating or just staying top and just clearing that out as well if the space is favorable. And that's, that's a big shift for Liquid in comparison to the last game, where, again, the early game just didn't go off to the start they were looking for. Boxy, again, bottom lane now, snaking the one being targeted, snaking, trying to get away. Those save lights still chasing him down, unable to quite finish the kill. They did run out of spells, but this threat of the Prophet from Boxy, like, this guy has been an absolute menace already with this teleportation. It just feels like these side lanes are, are never really safe when Boxy's missing off the map. No, they certainly aren't. And just, this is a little bit of a relief out for Falcons at the least. You know, Amar can start to play his lane a little bit more, but the damage has been done. Uh, Liquid with a start onto a fantastic 
time here for Mika. The mid lane as well has been going fairly decently for Nisha. I think that's one lane we haven't really looked at uh, with all the action across the map. Malrin isn't able to do as much to try to stop that farm. He's still kept keeping up, but he's not getting that matchup that we normally see with Crush in, although... Sableyne so actually the one running towards the boundary rune rather than staying within the lane, and but to be fair, the, the creep wave was not there anyway, so he's just trying to find some value for his time. Nice little pull there from Boxy, gonna drag the wave back, but... Oh, Sableyne. Almost taking down Snaking. Snaking still perfectly alive, though, for now. Is there's going to be a, a nice creep wave coming in for the Omni Knight, so he won't have to worry about this pesky gyrocopter, at least for a little bit. Yeah, but Snaking's doing his job, just again, providing zoning to allow a skitter to focus on that farm. Amar up top. Oh, again, Amar being caught. The Sprout a little bit off the mark, but blocking the way. His ATF is just not being allowed a game here in game number two, already onto his third death. And it is literally just Boxy rotating every single time to set up as now Crit also being caught here by Mikke. Gonna be chased down and that'll be a double out for the left track now. Zero to five from Team Liquid. What a turnaround here in game two. It's perfection in the laning phase. It's just all of this aggression coming in. The fact that they're not able to really collapse onto mid for Malrin as well. So they're the ones forcing the issue on Liquid to get this attention up top, which means the usual movement of Falcons onto the mid to play off the back of Malrin, it's not there. And we've seen this from Amar. His early game tends to be a little bit slower. He goes back, he needs some farm, he needs some EXP. He's not a threat until those resources are poured in, even on something like the Viper. And Liquid recognized that after the first game. Course correct really nicely. Oh, top. They're pinging out at ATF again. This time, though, Insania may have gone a little bit too early. Boxy is around the corner to help out if they wish, but Insania is dropping very little. No, here comes Mikke. ATF just trying for the kill. Does get it, but it's going to cost his own life again. Four deaths here for the Viper. And I think Insania, while he does feed a bit of kill, a bit of gold back the way of the Viper, he's still going to be very happy with that. He's more than happy. He's, again, taking this attention up top, giving some really big kills out onto Mikke, onto this lane, opening up the potential for a very fast push across the map if they wished so on Liquid, and ensuring Crit can actually stack, right? Like, Crit's having to play the lane. He's not able to stand back, shadow poison up, build up these camps, have some catapult ready for the rest of the team, or just some flash farming ready for our Alcon Skitter. You don't have those resources. The aggression from Liquid early on is just way too much. And again, throwing off this tempo, although we'll try a little bit, but Sableye's pretty damn tanky. It feels like you're at the stage for the Omni Knight where you just can't really deal with it. As now Foxy moves in with the Sprout again. The Snakey able to run out for now. As now Skitter continuing onto the Omni. They really want the kill, but Sableye, he's just oh. such a tanky boy. And they'll find a double. Snaking and Skitter both dropping as. Team Liquid, they are giving nothing back the way of Falcons. Oh, just no openings. They collapse in the right part of the map. Malarine's nowhere near to try to help save. They're still Skittle. trying. They are still trying. Malarine does rotate and he does get the Omni Knight kill. But in the meantime, ATF ends up dying at the top lane. His fifth death of the game. I mean, this is a complete stomp from Liquid early on. Just abusing this teleportation coming out from Boxy. Bringing out the guns with Nisha, who they don't really have clear answers. Like, yes, the Shadow Demon last pick is great. It needs level 6 to be great up against these heroes, and we're, we're a long ways off from that for crit. They'll try to smoke around here down bottom, Falcon. Smoke broken on Boxy. Malreen. Oh, the shot! Oh, a little bit off the mark. Very unfortunate for Malreen. And that'll be a, a three-man smoke just amounting to nothing, really. They'll try it maybe into the mid lane or maybe into the dire triangle here, but nobody really showing apart from Nisha in the mid lane, and that is not going to be the easiest of targets. Not an easy one to pin down at the I moment. I tell you that, yeah. he's got a double damage now. So Nisha, he wants to move in with the focus fire. Snowball will come out from Maureen. Nisha in a very awkward position. Is going to get caught out by Whoa. the looks of it as he does go down. Getting baited by the amplification rune. Zinsania also getting caught. Four heroes in the mid lane to ensure they win that engagement. That's exactly what Falcons needed to correct on. They finally match that aggression. They catch Liquid, overextended and without their full toolkit in. You know, Voxy. Couldn't teleport in, tried to sprout, tried to provide that angle to get a successful uh, shackle off. And now that's the opportunity for Falcons to get some more going for themselves. Not the fastest push on the mid. That's not an amazing pusher at all. And you don't have great illusions to play with. But you're getting some room out. You know, it's, um, it's activity for Amar. Amar probably just expressing joy that he's finally done something this game. I Thank you. 
He's holding onto these bounty runes. Three bounties just standing there for staking because he will take all three of them. He's very, very patient with the takers. Knee shot. Gonna move in, see if he can find himself a gyrocopter kill. He does have the level two power shot. If he can get enough damage out first and snaking, well, he does have the raindrop, so we'll still remain safe, but here comes Mickey. That's one down. Mickey wants more. He's onto a mega kill streak already. Onto ATF they go. The Viper really has no way out of this fight, it seems, as he will try onto Mickey. Can they take him down? Mickey! Oh, he's oh. not. ATF will be happy about that, I believe. That is a lot of gold to go back his way. That's a ton of gold to go to way of Mar. Even though he's not around for the EXP, which at, at level 5 he'd really appreciate, the gold is still a godsend right now for the side of Falcons. 5 to 11 Liquid, despite all this activity, not maintaining that big of an effort lead, less than 1k. At the same time, it's arguable that you're not getting the most sure as Another great kill here for Falcons if they can secure, but here comes the big fella. Here comes Saberlight, around to save the day. Nisha, he'll be fine for now. Snaking and Maureen, though, looking like they might be in a little bit of danger of snaking. Will at least go down. Maureen able to walk his way up. So you don't lose Nisha again. They'll make sure the Wind Ranger does remain alive. They're pouring the resources down mid. They know the way Falcons likes to play. They collapse onto that mid, force all attention there, and then just try to take that tier one. We're not seeing Falcons be consistently successful. That movement will try again, but Nisha is fairly slippery. And again, you're, you're still waiting for Crit to hit that level six with the Demonic Purge. Almost there, just needs to soak a little bit more. Great defensive wards coming out here from Falcons at the least to watch these entrances. Even one behind that mid-tier one that they've planted themselves. So they've got some info as to where Liquid might want to bring their forces to bear. And they're getting space out for Skitter, who is slowly starting to pull ahead. The Radiance is almost there. One more part away, just needs more time. I would say, though, like, Mika's timings are not that far behind. This Alchemist, normally when you have that Alc, you'd want to be a good 2k up, 3k up with lots of stacks. You don't have that in this game. You certainly don't, and Snaking right now, he won't have a life in this game, as he is gone. Nisha with a nice rotation. In comes Maori, but the Shackle is out. They'll hold the Tusk down. Snowball is there, backing onto the Wind Ranger. Here comes ATM, looking for some revenge against Liquid. It looks like they'll have the Wind Ranger, but they won't find anyone quite else. But I think they'll be more than happy with that trade, as Skitter will be the one to take the kill. And a, a very successful trade here for Falk. That's, uh, again, another big one to find with that movement out from Nisha. It's... I get what Nisha's trying to do. Just, again, trying to play tempo, trying to play pickoffs. Uh, has the damage, at least a little bit of damage, with the Javelin coming in. And providing that space for this Lesh to just finish up this Bloodstone. Once this Bloodstone's done on Liquid, we've got to see a bigger connect. We need to see some play out from Mike. Join in, either for the top or the mid-tier one. And try to leverage some of that damage in teamfights. That damage, that added radius, although marginal, is still substantial enough to have some impact. They'll go early, actually, with Smoke here. They will. Into the mid lane they go. Some liquid. Some snaking and Malrean. Obviously, you, you want the task much, much more. Marine still very patiently by the tier one tower. It's a, a great rotation point here for Falcons if they do need it. And Marine remaining very, very safe, just on the, the right side of that tower. Clear out the creep wave, and it seems as though Liquid, never really gonna find the opening for that fight. Will retreat now, understanding that they have to look somewhere else, and they'll look top lane perhaps, because Mickey is on the chase here with Crit. But it's not really gonna be able to break the gap and doesn't really want to risk running into the Viper. ATF has somewhat recovered and at level 7, that poison attack, even without any items up, it is still going to do a hell of a lot of damage. And this vision game from Falcons, again, this vision that they've set up, watching these entrances, spots that smoke fading away. Like, they can't reflank onto top. They, it, it's, it looks really optimistic from Liquid as well to hit this right before Bloodstone's done. Like, you're almost, you're around 150 gold away from Mickey at this point. You don't even have the levels in the Edict to directly translate into a very fast push here. Smoke doesn't pan out, but at the same time, I don't know if it, it was ever going to pan out at this game state. Certainly so. 6 to 13 now, 2k advantage the way of Falcons. I mean, Liquid still in control, it feels, of Falcons. Definitely having a, a bit of a better time ever since that laning stage ended, because it was a pretty, pretty rough affair. Bottom lane, looks like they are going to find themselves a gyrocopter, so snaking. Gonna have to fall. Nice twin gate usage here from the side of Liquid, and of course, that bottom tier 1 tower. Is going to be under siege, and I don't believe Falcons are necessarily going to be interested in trying to defend that.
No, it's, it's the objective that they need on Liquid to start opening up the map more and you know, start to get some movement across. They've slowed down in the aggression since the laning phase. You know, we were seeing all of those rotations out from Boxy. Now they've settled into a farming pattern. They've expanded map control a little bit more onto Bot, tried to cut off the areas where Skitter would want to build up with his Radiance. They've got some Ford Vision to back that up as well, planting a pretty deep ward on the Bot jungle. So they can start to play aggressive if they wanted to. The side of Falcons, it's almost similar to game one in their pacing, where they're more than willing to just play farm on all heroes if they can afford to. Uh, we'll see if Liquid will want to push that envelope. They've got that full Bloodstone ready in Mika. This, this Leshrac can start to take point for the team. And, you know, if, if one good fight for the side of Liquid, a little poking and prodding onto those tier ones, but a value point in the Edict should be too hard to get some of those towers down to expand control again and try to cut off this out. This lead Skitter's building up is starting to expand to an astonishing rate. On well, top lane, Viper Strike was committed onto Insania. He will not die to that though. Plenty of damage being dealt, but not quite enough to take his life as there is going to be a three-man smoke now coming out from the side of Falcons. They'll head down towards the bottom lane, see if they can catch Saberlight with his pants down. Though Saberlight, again, he's a pretty tanky target to try and go for, but they will jump in with the Warriors punch. Saberlight taking about half his HP and worth of damage, and Saberlight is gone. Tanky or not, cannot sustain the damage output that came out from Falcons. Is now Liquid, trying to punish as best they possibly can. They'll find crit first, but here comes Skidder. Skidder going to join the fray. They take down Boxy. They'll lose crit, at okay. least on the Shadow Demon. But Mikke trying to tank through it. Skidder, he's taking way too much damage. The shards are going to block the way from Nisha with the power shot. It's going to fly through Skidder. He's still going to go for a run. Looks like he will make it out as Mikke is the one to go down. Meanwhile, Nisha gets stunned up. Still sticking around by the Twin Gates. Will go for the Shackle, but he's going to be so careful, Maori. He's going to survive another day. Nisha really playing with fine hours. The shards. It'll block the way. He has to go the other no way, way out towards the west. And Nisha's been caught. Nisha still trying, but he is down. Meanwhile, Insania will go for the freezing field. Is it going to be quite enough? It doesn't really seem like it. Though ATF, ATF might drop. Still trying to retreat Saberlight. He'll take him down. Skitter still around towards the Roshan pit. He goes, but Roshan is on the other side of the map right now. So Skitter, he's got a deny point. Back. Saberlight now, Saberlight might be the one in trouble. He'll heal up though, but in comes Crit. Crit's the real carry now, it seems as Crit. No. He's getting so many no. Shadow Boys and Stacks. He will take him down. Who even won the team fight? I would say it still feels better for Falcons, but the Liquid aren't too bad off. They just traded a lot more cores than you'd probably want to there. And just by virtue of having Skitter kite around that long, you're really happy with the presence of the Elk here. You're seeing the effect of that Radiance timing kicking in when you're trying to chase down the Elk. The missed chance starts to pile up. And Mika is taking point. He's trying to do damage with that Bloodstone, trying to be durable. The saves were just kicking in here from the side of Falcons. Like all these great disruptions, snowballs, the shards, every single thing having to line up perfectly to give Skitter that space. And for Skitter to see these opportunities to play with the vision, going up and down the ramp, getting these nice unstable concoctions and dragging this fight to be longer than it should have been for Liquid. Well, like the BKB flying in right in time as well. Getting caught live. He does have his help, help behind him if he needs it. Shackle not going to quite latch. Mikke maybe going a little bit too far. The punch is there and Mikke is just the leader. Just Nisha oh. will follow right afterwards and there goes Boxy. Falcons. And they'll give up their gyro but who the hell cares? You get three in return and two of those are going to be cores. That is huge for Falcons. That's just massive for Falcons. After what was a very, very slow start with Liquid taking control, Liquid, they just let off the gas a little bit, allow Falcons to play that mid, early to mid farming game that they love to take at around minute 15, minute 10, and Falcons come out of it. You know, they've got the investment all done on Skitter with Radiance BKB in the blink. He's ready to take point for the team. There's not enough damage to kill him off. Like, you can with the Focus Fire. It just isn't fast enough. And you've got to expand so much to just try to keep Skitter down that it will provide openings for Amar to come in. It will provide openings for the saves from Crit and for some angles here from Malreen that it, it just becomes way too difficult for Liquid. Falcons, find that Tier 1 up top, starting to again, take control of the map where they can and the side of Liquid, they're waiting for more. And again, the Bloodstone from Mika shows up. It 
doesn't achieve as much as they'd want it to. You don't have additional protection. Uh, the big factor in that last fight is really the fact that Saber Light just got blown apart. So you couldn't rely on like a repel on this flash rack up front. You didn't even have Guardian Angel come into play. And you've, you've got to be able to angle yourself here on Saber Light. He needs to play forward enough for the team. At the same time, not put himself in direct danger that he's the one blown up first. Maybe another big smoke up Falcons. Looking towards the bottom lane. You've got Insania around that area. You've also got Nisha. Sableite will leave. Seems like Insania is the one who could be in a spot of danger. Falcons having a look around. They'll run directly south with Insania. Still not showing quite under vision. Skidder going to reveal himself now. The acid spray, and that'll be enough for everybody to back out of there from Team Liquid. They are going to be perfectly fine. If you look at the vision game coming out from Falcons. Very protective of that bot area right now. They've got some good boards watching the entrances. This tier one's the last outer, really outer tower, like further out. Tier one tower here for Liquid. So that's their one launching point in trying to run down bot with this uh, asymmetry that they've created for themselves. And just, they're just ensuring that these movements from Liquid just won't pan out. Again, they're happy to farm here on Falcons. They've got that 15k net worth on the Alchemist for Skitter, 5k ahead of the next hero here from Liquid, which is Nisha. And they're just taking their time. It's, it's on Liquid to try to, try to do some. Bottom lane, stun was out, Maureen. It's the shards off, maybe looking for the sniper. Of course, nobody rotating for Insania. He will just go down as Skitter will take himself a, a very free kill. Top lane in the meantime, Boxy forced to teleport away, but the disruption is there from Krypta. Ensure he remains locked down. The Liquid, they will lose their support duo once again. It's Falcons just across the map, finding these little value plays. At the very least, you don't lose any cores on Liquid, but it, it's still looking like an extremely tough game for him. That it does. Would want to point out, Amar did pick up the Whisper of the Dread that our panel was talking about. So you do have that tunnel vision, that 10% increased spell damage yeah. on the Viper. It's just a, it's a great delicious life. little thing to have on a tier two. It's a great feeling. And it's a great feeling for Falcons now as well. Taking point around her Tormentor. And they've got this 6k lead, most of it on the Elf. So you could argue Falcons will want to get more done on the map. As that net worth advantage starts to hold less weight as the, the game drags on to say a long ways off. That's there, There's still time here for Falcons to push this advantage. And for Liquid to try to brave the storm. They're still hanging on to their tier twos. No movement forward from Falcons. They would want to set up some vision by Roche, which they do have down bot, at least uh, on the outside area in the lane, nothing too far in. They've got to keep an eye out for whenever Falcons actually might want to go into that objective. Like one pick off into Roche is a danger point for Liquid. And their chances are they're just waiting for this AC to be done on Skitter to speed up that process into the eventual Roche on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Skid has had the, the freest Alchemist game of his life. Here in this game, number two, just absolutely no contest. Dying once, but that's really about it. You are seeing him enjoy some more ancient stacks for himself. Well and truly, the leader in terms of the net worth board. There's just no stopping him, it seems, as the AC will certainly come out very, very soon. But Liquid, they understand they are behind. They've got to hit them some, some item timings themselves. Mostly, I think, the BKB is probably what they're going to be uh, looking for here in this game. And perhaps once the BKBs are up, you could try and Try and move back in towards Falcons. As speaking of, Falcons, they are going to get a very nice scan off onto the side of Liquid. But Boxy, Saberlight, feeling like something is a little bit awry here, we'll leave the area. Keeping it safe on Liquid up top. I have to sneak with a smoke here. Amar. But now he's okay. Okay, oh, or Nisha gonna find it. ATF, he could bait for his team though. He's by the T1 tower. Problem is ATF is dropping rather quickly, so he is down. Now the gyrocopter snaking. He is gone to food by the looks of it, but he will survive a little bit longer. But it seems like he is down. However, Mikkei is being controlled up by Skitter. Skitter oh. will take him down as well. To Saber Light. They will leave. It's still a 3 for 1 trade in the favor of Liquid and a, a, a very nice team fight for Liquid. Something they desperately need. That's the opening they're looking for, forcing a movement out from the side of Falcons. A little bit awkward on the right side for Boxe, who he did end up trapping himself early, but doesn't matter in the end. They just bring their forces to bear. They've got some of those early BKBs that they've been looking for, and they can leverage that damage. There's enough sustain here to play with for Mika for the most part. 
And this time around, you see the difference when Saberlight is allowed to play his game. When he's allowed to use the Repel, allowed to, allowed to use the Guardian Angel, and when they can take care of Crit. You remove that Shadow Demon from the equation, this Omni Knight becomes a beast when he's playing with something like the Lash Rack up front. They're going to find that Amplified Damage Rune as well. TF. Go ahead and protect that for Malreen. Because obviously you really cannot afford to give too many fights like that away back towards Liquid. It only takes one or two to, to make the comeback happen. And Skidder, while he is top of the net worth board, he does not want to be seen dying like that as they are going to go for a four-man smoke now. Falcon heading towards the north, understanding they are still the much stronger team. And BKB up now on ATF to boot. Towards the north they go, but Liquid playing the avoid game very, very well. Not really giving the position out here for Falcons to abuse. And well, Falcons, they are going to have a search around, but this does mostly seem like wasted time. And they've had some good defensive wards on Falcon Sand, a little bit dark in the forward parts of the map. They could try to maybe take this gate across into Roche if they want, but they're just setting a trap here. No one taking the bait on the side of Liquid, as they've got some pretty good forward wards themselves, some good defensive wards, actually, on Liquid's end to kind of get a sense as to whenever anyone's missing. Heck, even Boxy acting like a little bit of a station here, watching this area to break smokes. They get a breed. Roshan will still begin. Falcons are getting to it, but Liquid knows it's happening. There is this ward to watch Liquid in the window. This could be a massive Roshan fight for Liquid. It's not here at the, the right time. Problem is, Falcons, they do have the high ground. What? Up is there, Skidder. He's going to find himself in the here, but they will save him now. The Shackle comes out. Skidder! Oh, he's pretty deep at the moment. Skidder's going to find a way out of this. He'll pump his BKB and just walk back towards Boxy. Meanwhile, the rest of Falcons have been pincered in. This is not the fight they were looking for. They'll lose Maureen by the looks of it. A snaking goes down. Mickey's still chasing Maureen. Maureen is gone now on the side of Falcons. Just need to get the hell out of there. It's ATF trying for the team of Anisha. He's going to cancel it off. ATF's got no choice but to man up and try to fight back. There's a buyback out from Snaking. In comes Skidder again. Mickey being targeted by Anisha. Gonna lock him down and Skidder is gone! Oh my goodness, they'll continue to fight as Crit, Crit will follow and Snaking. Snaking, all he can do is run. They force the fight. They're hoping for the Roshan play, but now it's a guaranteed Roshan to go the way of Liquid. Nothing Falcons can do about it. They, they had a forward vision. They had a good sense for that smoke. They tried to find an angle out of oh the boy. He jumps in without popping the BKB first, and the chain control from Liquid was perfect. It's just, they need to be able to get that pick off fast on Falcons. Instead, Liquid are the one to find it. This is a problem. And this is going to be a massive issue going forward. As that entire fight, again, they, they had that forward board and Falcons watching by the ramp. And just, they jump in with Skitter first. I love the confidence coming out from him, but it's such a risk when you lose this out early. Absolutely, and of course Skidder did not have buyback available in, uh, in that team fight to rejoin, even if he wanted to. And well, now you're, you're only less than 1k ahead of your Falcons. That whole Alchemist lead that you had is just basically naught. And Skidder, if he's not allowed to just stand there and hit people throughout these fights, it, all that farm means nothing. We, we kind of saw that in that last engagement, and suddenly Liquid, momentum behind them now, could have a great way of coming back into this game. Number two is Maureen gets aggressive mid lane. Is forced to snowboard back towards the creep wave. Is oh. He's gonna try and jump in on Mickey. Mickey though does get healed up here by Saber Life. They want that hey. five. ATF needs to run. Skidder, I'm not sure this is what you wanted, sir. He'll try to back his way out of there with the stun being channeled up. Skidder is still on the run, but the stun what? lands. Oh my goodness. Mickey to take him down. Snaking, he'll be the next target. They might just lose three, they might even lose four. ATF oh, still trying to get out of the teleportation. Boxy will ensure there is no way out. And Liquid, they lose nothing. Oh, Falcons just trying so hard to jump in aggressively. It's so public. forced. It, it, it just feels too forced just from, too from Falcons. I, I get the confidence coming out from Falcons. They've got the Nullifier, you know, they've got the Monic Cleanse, they've got the Monic Purge. They feel like they can start to find these targets, but. There's, there's just too much durability. The Kai and Sanj being out on Mika, all, this, all the sustained bloodstones providing him on this flesh. That and the fact that you also have to just instantly pin down Zabalet. They're just way too tanky. You don't have that quick burst on the side of Falcons. You do have ways of repositioning. And I'm, I'm just surprised Falcons aren't just going for the safe bet. Going in, 
getting the Walrus kick out with Malreen, and looking for that pickoff first before translating that into a wider fight where a 4v5, if you find the right one, say, if you find Saberlight kick back, and you somehow take control from him, that's where it's going to open up. Malreen, he denies a ward, but they know he's there. Liquid, they've made their, mo they've made their move down towards the south, hoping to find themselves a tusk, but Malreen will be able to escape. He is okay. Liquid now, the one smelling the blood in the water, really want every single team fight they can take. Falcons, they've got to be the ones to, to, to maybe allow Liquid to initiate first and just find a good count initiation for themselves. Radiant are scanning. It's Falcons, they'll go back into that Radiant Triangle. Some sort, they'll support themselves around that area. Team Liquid will go through the bottom lane. You see a crit, uh, an Ags being built up on crit now, so crit gonna have those multiple uh, charges of the Demonic Purge and, and the Demonic Cleanse, of course, is well, mid lane. Bit of an attempt onto Boxy, not really gonna work out, and now the bottom tier 2 tower is gonna be focused Radiant's by Liquid. Is this is where their push can really kick in. Maxed out Edict, towers just melt. Can even threaten onto the high ground. And they've got the BKB still ready to go. Age is still up for a minute 40 for Mika. Nothing to scare them off. And it, with this high ground kind of movement, Saberlight, he can just take the rear position with how tanky Mika is and just, just ensure the Leshrac can get that job done. They will play it safe. They will just back off and try to apply pressure elsewhere. Amar would be a great target if they could pin him down. Oh, Amar's going to be so careful. They'll see him. They'll jump in. They'll try for the Viper. Amar forced the BKB and back away. He'll be fine for now. Skidder, though, is channeling a stun. Oh. He's going to jump in aggressively. There's no BKB available, though, for ATF. I don't think he wanted the fight. Meanwhile, Fred also getting caught for a moment. Snaking, just trying to retreat as Malreen will save him. But Malreen, you're the myth tusk. He will be fine, though. He will barely get away as Skidder again going to jump in aggressively, but Nisha had the BKB and now Skidder is trapped, oh but God. will be all right. Liquid will not commit for the fight. Very risky plays from this Alchemist, but I suppose with, this, with the state of the game the way it is, you've got to take some risk. And Skidder's been taking a lot of risk for his team, especially since that rush fight. Again, he's the guy taking point. There's a, maybe a lack of clear initiation and some just disjointedness with how they're moving. Again, they've got this really safe initiation with just blink in, snowball, kick back, and try to blow someone up. Except, who do you blow up? Saberlight's tough to pin down. Uh, we see Mika kicked in. He's just going to regen right through, and Saberlight's going to be there at some point to provide even more sustain. At this point, for the side of Falcons, it feels like maybe you have to consider getting something to stop this side. regen. Maybe they can intervene. Oh. They've got Saberlight with the kickback. He was trying to go after the Tormentors for Saberlight. Taking a fair bit of damage for now, but he's still a very tanky target. The Shards will lock him in, though, and Saberlight, no way out of that one. Falcons, they will fight back. They'll protect their own Tormentor. That is a huge opening for Falcons. Like just having Saberlight sit alone like that, get kicked back, not respecting how close that is to the Tier 2, how close it is to TP points for Falcons. Some decent punishment out for the side of Falcons. And well, that's, that's sort of what we need to see, except you're not going to see that situation where Saberlight's all by himself all too often. But if you can isolate this Omni Knight by himself, by all his lonesome for some reason around the map, then that's when the game opens up. Set up some vision around in some cheeky areas. We've seen Falcons do this before. Stuff like the ramp by Roche or behind closer to the wells up top. And you can start to make it work for you, or at least make these, find these opportunities to make it work for you here as Liquid. Despite that loss, they're still in control. 7k up, up against an Alchemist. They've got two heroes with equal net worth to Skitter. You don't have that item advantage to leverage on your Alc any longer. So they will try hey, onto him. Skitter. Skitter's been caught. Disruption will save from Crit, but Mike looks like he wants to commit. Skitter, he's dropping so oh. down low. Oh. Skitter is gone. Mike will go for more ATF, barely able to TP away. But you've lost the Alchemist. I'll tell you, oh, and Snaking now. Oh, Snaking. He could not get away either. Team Liquid finding even more value. And I'll tell you what, John, I, I don't think anyone else from Falcons is carrying this game. You are heavily reliant on this out. That you are. Like, there's, there's no gold on anyone else. There is scaling on the others, but that is item reliant. And the side of Liquid, they can just show us how vulnerable Falcons is. They only really have, like, Temporary oh, saves, they don't yeah, have bugs here. Has been caught on the Viper and he is just melting. Crit will save the kickback as well, just ensuring there is no help to come. Mickey trying to at least take down Maureen with him, but 
Oh, it's Mickey. Getting a little bit lower, but oh, Skitter. Skitter has gone another time. That was a dieback, I believe, on the Alchemist. And well, at three down, another buyback from ATF. But this game is looking harder and harder as Team Liquid should be able to start looking towards that high ground. Nisha, Shackle, not going to latch. Maureen will be okay in Liquid. They are still going to play safely. They are all quite low. And even without the Alchemist, they don't want to risk it against this Viper. They take a conservative approach. They've found a lot off the back of these fights. Just all this burst damage starting to come in is insane. Having that Nemesis curse apply onto the Elk, just having even more amplification. And there's, there's nothing to easily dispel any of this if the BKB's down. You don't have anything on hand. You don't have something like your own Omni Knight. You're just reliant on either getting a snowball save or disruption to stall for time. And even that has just fallen short here for the side of Falcons. Liquid playing very cleanly since taking their time, uh, you know, slowing down the game a bit past that laning phase. The investment for them now is kicking into full gear. And for Falcons, this high speed tempo that you're looking for with the Elk, it's, it's tapering off. Skitter isn't even the highest network hero. And they're not able to really dis redistribute this farm elsewhere. Like, Amar's not getting as much farm as you'd want him to on this Viper. You know, stuff like his shard, which would be really nice if they were sieging, is it's not there. It's not a priority as well, considering this game. Malreen, he's been doing his best with some kickbacks, but it, it just feels disjointed. Like, they're jumping in, and it, Skitter, it seems like, just feels the pressure to start these for his team, but it just there's no one there to help make these fights easier for him. Tell you what, I love this new item as well here on Nisha, like the Nemesis Curse. It, yeah. it really is the perfect item on this Wind Ranger, right? Like just the extra damage, the, the damage amp as well. It, it's just really, really perfect. It just, it just makes Skitter so squishy. Like that's, that's the main thing. They focus fire him down, and then just having all of this AoE coming out from Mika. Oh, just Amar, doesn't feel Amar, like he fought back. He cannot afford this. He will try for the TP away. Do they have the damage? They do not. Ooh. That's his BKB down for 80 seconds, though. Team Liquid, they could try and force an opening out of this. And, well, the opening, Jonathan, is Roshan because it's up in 20 seconds. Now they've got control over the area. There's no forward vision from Falcons to watch that spot any longer. And being down one BKB in, on one of your cores, it takes away a lot of your confidence in trying to contest an objective like that. We'll force in the Tier 2 first. The Pinks are coming out. They should get a read onto Rosh. Boxy already set the scout out. And at Roshan, that, that's going to open up high ground. That's the only objectives left here for Liquid. This is not something Falcons can afford to give away, but again, the information is just not there for Falcons. They're hugging the other side of the map. And there goes Roshan. Team Liquid, they'll get it started. The Falcons showing absolutely no will to try and fight this one out. They'll, of course, know about it because the, the Roshan Rory is going to be there, but it won't back. It is lost. Very, very quickly here to Team Liquid. Of course, Mikkei to take the Aegis niche to pick up the cheese. And it seems like they are ready well and truly to go for another fight. Uh, they've got control. They've got the tempo on the side of Liquid. It's down to Falcons now to maybe play a little bit of split push, try to get some, get some leans in their favor, get some shove out. It's really difficult when you're up against the Nature's Prophet, though. Boxy doing a great job of just using that Nature's Call to reinst just constantly ensure that their lanes are at least at equilibrium. You know, you're not allowing any sort of sneaky openings for Falcons to lay onto any tier twos, to sneak away any extra farm, and just choke them out. The wards from Falcons, again, they've been great defensively. They're not able to find any openings off the back of them. At best, just avoid as much as possible. But at this point, there's only so long you can avoid liquid with the Sages. Like, they are going to be set to go. And that Mika is trying to hunt fairly deep. Again, no deep vision as well for the side of Liquid. So just a little bit of a shot in the dark, but crit. Bottom lane. A shot. Oh, crit is going to be left behind. Crit is down. Snake King coming in as well. Has also been caught out. Boxy will just trap him in with the creeps. And there is no way out of that situation. Two supports dropping once again for Falcons. Mika. Can, oh, Mika. Mid lane. He's going in by himself onto the Alchemist, but will have to retreat. Not feeling safe against ATF's Viper on top. That, that's really confident out for Mike. He's going on to two cores by himself, the rest of his team across the map, and still managing to force them back. Is getting some good pressure onto that mid. I do love as well how Boxy's playing this game. Like, he gets the dream talent, 
and then he just pops that crispy old brute with all those screens around one hero. So much damage, so much control. Makes it difficult for him to try to find a way out and just makes it easier for the side of Liquid to keep this ball rolling. Got the Amplified Damage Rune here as well, which is spotted by Saberlight, so a little bit more to add onto that spice for this eventual high ground push with the Aegis, which still has three minutes. Falcon's options are growing limited. It's down to what they've been finding some limited success with earlier, which is just Malarine finding a nice solo pickoff somehow. They don't have the vision to sustain that. Like Even some closer defensive wards would, pro would make a huge difference here. It's just really far out vision right now. It's, it's not just the damage amp rune that you've got as well for Nisha, by the way. He did pick up a full Daedalus now, so this could be a very scary fight as ATF being dragged back does go for the BKB. There will be no cancel for that, but you're now losing a BKB for 80 seconds. If you want to go high ground, you know this Viper is going to be feeling very susceptible. It's your opening on the side of Liquid. And the high ground hold of Falcons, it's, it's not amazing. It's just down to how, how well can Malreen kick back? How well can he find some targets? They do see Boxy. Malreen is smoked up. Mickey into three heroes. He's still going to move in, though. ATF, he will get stunned up. Mickey feeling like a bit of a giga chat, though. He's taking a fair bit of damage, but Sableye's right behind him. That's where the confidence comes from, because ATF, he's got no one to save him. He is without a BKB. Hell. He needs to save himself, but he looks like he is just dead. That is your Viper down. 90 seconds without buyback. On they go into the T3 bottom tower. They need a creep wave, though. The creep wave currently is non-existent. Instead, though, Crit has been caught on the Shadow Demon, or at least spotted. Sableye will chase him down. Crit will be able to barely blink away. Meanwhile, Nisha looking towards snaking in the Radiant base. Crit still running, but Boxy right behind him does get the spread up. So Crit is down, tips out from Sableye. <laughs> does stall for time. And Malreen, while all of that breaks out, he teeped it out into the outpost. That did give him a chance to cut the creep wave. At the same time, you, you just removed your biggest tool in these fights. You didn't have the kickback. You didn't have a way of just trying to drag that control back your way. And here goes the high ground without those buybacks. Doesn't take too long for Mika to melt through it. Oh, it definitely does not. Mika will make very short work of it. Nisha there to back him up. and It's, it's so hard when you know the Omni Knight's right behind the left. It's like, how do you actually kill this guy? The answer is yet to be found here by Falcons. Still three versus five, so it's not a fight they're gonna try and force. They're at least gonna try and wait for Crit and ATF to be back up. They'll chip away at Mikke, but Mikke has his, his fountain right behind him in Saberlight. Gale forces out Nisha. Oh, that's a shackles oh. flying out from Nisha! But it won't matter yet, the snowball does save. No, in fact it does not. Skitter is gone, no and so is snaking. No buyback available. What a setup from Nisha! Liquid are just so terrifying now at this point with all the control, with how well they can sustain up front, but how confident they are with Nisha and, and Mikke. There they go. Maureen, he'll go for oh. the kick back into the T4 towers. Mikke, he has his BKB. He could not give a crap. It's the side of Falcons that are burning to the damage. Oh, Maureen is gone. Mikke and Nisha moving back into the fountain. They are just fountain farming him now. Mikke oh, getting kicked in. God. Can he survive? Nisha will take the hits from the fountain. Mikke just going to TP away as Maureen is gone. And GG is called. Oh, what a way to finish here for Liquid. We are going to a game three. And what a spectacular fashion to go into that game three as well. Falcons. They were getting crushed in lanes, you know, they were getting some early rotations out from Liquid. Liquid, Boxy just being a maniac on that Nature's Prophet. They slow down a bit, you hit that timing on Skitter, he starts to play around with the Alchemist, but then he just starts going really far forward. You know, there's so much pressure on the Alchemist to try to clean up, and Liquid have so many tools. Like, they have the Omni Knight, there's, there's only so much your Shadow Demon at that point could try to control, and Liquid just managed to clinch it out. We do have a lovely panel ready on hand to discuss this game number two, so let's throw to them and see what they have to say. I got to think about how Liquid pulled it together from the brink of elimination, and what a weird way to do it with a final pick on the night, a West Track who we've only seen one other time in the tournament, which was a loss, and yet it looks so beautiful in motion. Yeah, that's the change to Guardian Angel being a single target spell uh, with two charges. And we thought it was countered by the Shadow Demon, but Leshrac, probably one of the best heroes in the game to give, like, invincibility to for 8 to 10 seconds. That Shiva's 
probably the best carrier of Shivas in the entire game with yep. the new Shivas, the Veil, plus the same active as Shivas before. So really Sounds cool strap like from Liquid. Sounds like you're Lesh is the best hero. Yeah, I think I think Lesh, Bloodstone, Shivas is insane just from watching one game of it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have to agree in some of the ways. Like Lesh early game kind of sucks a little bit. Like the level one Pulse Nova only does like 70 or 80 damage per tick, which is not a lot. But uh, once you get to level 12 and onwards, you're doing a lot of damage. And the, the reason Shiva's is just kind of broken now is because it's better in almost always. Gives you six more armor, gives you eight agility and an extra five. And then it's amplifying all the damage you do by 15%. Now people buy Sanj Kaya for about 16% spell amp. Shiva's just does that on top of what it did before now. So if he has Sanj Kaya and a Shiva's, he's basically doing like 30, 35% more magic damage than his base level. So those items together are just sick good and just straight up better than it was before. I mean, should they have gone like a Pipe and Mage Slayer to deal with the Lash then? That would also provide some solution, yes. Pipe would offset some of that damage, of course. Mage Slayer only works if he's not magic immune, of course, which in a lot of cases he was in the crucial moments, but those are options, and that's why Tundra 1TI, for example, Mage Slayer against uh, Lash and Pipe, that kind of thing. It's a good way to undercut it. And by the way, all this extra damage he's doing, Gives him more life steal with the Bloodstone, and the OE's bigger, so he's getting True. more, more stuff. All of this stuff like works together. The numbers might be cracked, yeah. And Leshrac finally gets uh, an offensive buildup because I remember way, way back in the day he used to be rush Yules, and then I can start playing the game. I can kind of argue that Veil vale makes his mid-game timing much stronger than it used to be. Well, yeah, this game he elected to go for the Veil vale super late, like it just as a part of the Shiva's buildup. I think he had to itemize for survivability more so than anything else, but. Once they, that one fight top, I think it was, where I thought Liquid was just, yeah. I looked away for like 10 seconds, I'm like, seven, down 7K. It was 7K behind, but it's actually not that bad, because it's all, all on the Elk. Everyone else is like, even in the network. Elk was the only one carrying the lead. Yeah, and then after that fight, they were just up 3K. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, I guess they won. And they did. Especially uh, after the laning phase went so well for Liquid, I thought that they had it in the bag. <laughs> and then I will give credit to Falcons because they actually made the mid game seem a little bit 50 50. Yeah, they did a really good job at shutting down the Viper with the Nature's Prophet constantly making, <laughs> TPing over, ganking him. That's what uh, you don't want to have as Viper, you know, in an early game. Like, what, four deaths in a lane of five? I mean, it's rough, you know, but he, he still made a comeback uh, later in the. Later in the game, he was able to contribute in the team fights, but they just ran out of damage against the uh, the Lash. And if uh, Viper had a better early game, um, then their mid game against Lash Rack, they would have had a better solution. Because mm. once he gets Shiva's guard, his armor's so high, plus the Omni and on top of that, they just didn't have good magic damage solutions. It's That was basically it. Uh, Malreen could like knock him back, they went for some kills here and there, but once they got BKBs on the, the Liquid side, they just weren't dying. So, so is the conclusion Shadow Demon not the counter to Lash Omni? Well, it's not as strong to Omni, because that, that was the main thing that we were looking at. And then Lesh, I suppose, he didn't really go for Nihilism, and that's like the hard, hard counter to him. But the synergies between Leshrac and like the Wind Ranger, I, Liquid oh, were Gale Force, Gale Force plus yeah. Shard Stun. Yeah, there's no running away from that. And we, you, okay, so we say there's no running away from that. I didn't notice this during the game, but there were four Four Staffs on Team Falcons. It did which not is, feel like it. It's all about the Gale Force and I guess the Sprout. Mm -hmm. That might be worth what they did for, like, they maybe have to ban out Nature's Prophet if you're going to itemize four. Lesh? Steps. Ban out Lesh, maybe? I, I, I don't know. What, which one was a more crucial component of this? Like, if you're prepared for the Lesh rack, would it be any different? Or maybe they had uh, the wrong idea against Lesh. The Shadow of Demon might not be, like, that good, you know? They might be overvaluing how strong the Shadow Demon purchase. I mean, the Shadow Demon was there to counter the Omni Knight, it is what it looked like, because it's, it's going to keep the Lesh alive. If uh, Omni's not, I'm not saying ban Omni Knight, but if Omni's <laughs> not there, they just don't pick SD, I think. They pick something else. Like, they, they pick a higher physical damage single target mid-hero rather than Tusk. Or you could play Tusk and go more damage, like maybe, Deso. is yeah. an option. If you went Deso, they would have been crushing Lesh in those yeah. big-game fights, especially on top of the Alchemist. Yeah, you could be onto something as well. Maybe Lesh is just that strong. So I freaking series number three, Winter. Let's calm down. They've got 10 minutes to figure They've it out. They've got 10 minutes to figure it out. <laughs> I, but it does seem like you guys are all concluding that it wasn't necessarily the carry-to-carry -carry matchup, or I guess like the highest net worth, the highest net worth matchup. It wasn't Alk versus Leshrac that was an issue. Yeah, no. It was kind of all the other side pieces. Yeah, yeah, I feel like in the first game it was a strategical advantage for Falcons. In this game, I think it was like Liquid brought such a weird draft that it seemed like Falcons had one over extension. And there's something to be said for these players just being unfamiliar with the situation yeah. they were just playing against. Both teams are valuing different heroes. And I feel like after this game, it, it kind of will give them a better gauge on what is actually strong, what is not strong. And I think the third game is going to be uh, very, very 
hot game for both teams uh, to win. And if I keep going back to what I consider to be Falcon's weak spot, which is venturing into late game, do you think that they repaired anything in this direction, Purge? Or is this something that they're not even interested in, that they're just, we're going to win mid-game every time, and if we don't win at 35 minutes, whatever? I mean, it's it's hard to say. I think they had late game potential with their heroes. It's just the, the Viper is too far behind to contribute meaningfully in the mid game, and the Lesh, without a doubt, was hitting harder than expected. Uh, so Lesh staying alive in a lot of those fights really did change things. So maybe if the fight circumstances were different, if it wasn't like ATF dying at the start of the fights, into Lesh trying to tank like four heroes, and the enemy team being like, yeah, we can kill him, <laughs> and they just didn't die, and they're like, oh, we just lost a whole team fight. And then they did that again, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, Liquid's winning. If they, if they remove those, uh, those things from happening, don't lose those fights twice in a row, then the game's different. Maybe they just smash over, and then life steal's not enough, and Lesh looks bad. So uh, yeah, maybe just take better fights after, after they, they uh, came back in the mid game. I'm not sure. I mean, or they could just get first pick. You know, so far both teams won with first pick. Well, we'll just have to find out how the draft and the coin flip go for game number three. We got our first game three of the night. So let's go to a quick break and we'll return with more Falcons versus Liquid.
Oh, hey, dude, what up? Hello. How you been, man? How's the team? It's been great. Uh, I'm jet lagged though, but the, the new guys have been a breath of fresh air. Yeah? How did the team come together? Well... You know, Chris said he liked how you play PA. Nice play. Oh, really? He said that? Yeah. So, I found Ace. So you know how you are Danish and also Chris Danish. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think is the best way to start a conversation with him? Well, you could give him some Marissa Lama. Hmm, that's a great idea. So, did you get it? No, they didn't have it. So I got him at... What the hell is that? It's at Danish. Thanks. Cool, but you didn't really explain how the team was formed, dude. Oh yeah, uh, Maureen put it all together. He's surprisingly very well connected. Maureen, huh? Well, yeah. Um, good luck with that, dude. That'll be great. Thanks. What's up, big man? There you go. That is true documentary footage of what happens at TI after parties. Cultural exchanges, pastry exchanges, swag exchanges, and then a magical thing like Team Falcons comes to form. It's something the live reenactment of the actual characters <laughs> doing it. Yeah, Maureen is honestly, that, that's his truest form. When he shows on stage, this is him trying to tone things down. Yeah, trying to be relatable. Exactly. To, to the viewers. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? It used to be in the hotel lobby, if you know. All of that used to happen in the hotel lobby. It used to, but we've stepped up now. Now we go to clubs here in KL. But he's not jet lagged anymore, that's for sure, because Falcons have pushed it to a three game series as opposed to getting stomped in the group stage by Liquid 2-0. And now we're rounding out the series, Purge. But I will say that despite it being a new patch, Liquid seems to be going off script and giving us 7.35 flavor. Do you feel like Falcons are? Or could I show you these Falcons drafts and you'd be like, yeah, I can see that last match. They're not really going too imaginative, I That's gotta say. I think they're drafting great, they're playing great. They are. Uh, but, you know, just picking some of the old staples. Maybe they're adjusting a bit based on uh, how they expect the meta to shift. You know, that, that Vengeful Spirit is the best example. Not really that different slightly better due to the change, so... Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see what gets attacked in this game number three, but one thing remains consistent. Amar is not allowed to have Mars. And the other consistent bands have been the Timbersaw and the Slardar, so we'll see if Liquid want to replicate that. Meanwhile, Falcons start out taking out the Chen. I mean, are we going to see a consistent team? The first pick team always wins. Liquid's first pick again. Has that been oh, a statistic even, even previous? No, just, just this series. Oh, just this series, yeah. okay. I mean, I think uh, they did show the team priority earlier, and the Falcons like exclusively picked either, I think, Radiant or first pick, whereas Team Liquid was all over the place. They, they were dabbling with it all. So, uh, isn't it like Radiant just in general better? Yeah, yeah. Than it, Dyer? it has been for, you know, the entire existence of Dota, with <laughs> a couple uh, exceptions, I think. I was thinking. Do you think Amar messed up, like, with his name being Amar and then having his best hero be Mars? <laughs> like, it's like when you go into a pub and somebody says, like, their hero in their Steam name. Yeah, but how do you know it wasn't the other way around? How do you know when he wasn't born, his parents, like, one day, 15 years from now... There's gonna be a game called Dota 2. <laughs> and a... my child will be the best at an obscure offlaner that is rarely ever good. Nailed it. <laughs> Okay, so what's the final ban? Is it the Razor? Is it probably not the Viper? That wasn't too impressive. But the no, okay, it is the Razor. Pick last year, Brian. That's no, no, no. Go, I, I like the Nature's Prophet again. Yeah, that, it felt really good. Boxy was just getting stuff done all over okay, the place. If if you first pick the Nature's Prophet, I pick the Lesh. Mm. Lesh is Lesh shot up that much for you. Yes. Wow. Okay. I mean, Brian convinced me. <laughs> I, I, I'm saying like you only have ten minutes to figure out. Yeah, what some, you would do if the other team picks it. Yeah, sometimes stuff is just that simple. You know, Lesh is just strong, pick Lesh. Yeah. Is it a flex, though? Because we are seeing Maureen and ATF flex their picks quite a bit. Are you saying that offlane Lesh Shrek is even viable? Why not? It? Okay, okay. So they, just, they just ran a carry. They so. just ran a carry, that is true. Why not? Why stop there? Okay, they go nature. Okay, come on, Lesh. Lesh. I don't think it's a Falcon's hero. That may be to the advantage of Liquid going into a new patch, because you mentioned, like, no matter what the patch is, Neil, they pick the same they'll things. just pick the same I mean, stuff. Is, is this the Shiki scenario? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, <laughs> they they come to play Lesh. It, it kind of is. I mean, Lesh was the, the hero that uh, of the tournament when uh, Skeeter won TI, and they didn't pick it one time the whole tournament, so it's not his hero. 
Does Malreen play? It's not an ATF hero. Now, what do you guys think the value is of... So Skeeter plays illusion heroes a lot. Like, that's probably his most staple heroes, and that's how they won TI. Mm -hmm. What's the importance of being able to play the heroes that are good against your heroes? Like, in this case, Lesh, right? Don't you think that would add a lot to his potency as a so you're saying coach? you should be able to play your own counters? Yes. yes. Yeah, especially in drafts, because then once you see something that you're good at, then you've played the opposite of it so many times, you're like, oh, I also yeah, know what it's bad. people might try to deny pick you, right? I mean, what if it's a different rule? You really like slot, and so you have to be able to play the Doom as well, or, or the any, the any off laner that counters you? Uh, probably need like 10 years <laughs> in professional <laughs> Dota to, to rack up enough experience there. So, okay, rabbit hole, we don't need to keep going. Let's see, so the Gyrocopter draft is the same so far. Same rabbit hole. Mm. Is the, the, the bands, everything is... Like, Everything's the same. same right? It was also the Primal, the Slardar, the Venge, and the Chen bands as well. Uh, previously, Liquid had followed it up with a Kunkka and a Pango, and Falcons took the second phase to take out a Faceless Void. So DK's new. So the, the theory is you, you have to kill Lash with single target burst. Yes. Because you don't have enough spread damage to kill him, and he keeps healing. I think if they go Lesh again, I'd like to see Monkey King potentially for Falcons because he's really good against Natures and we saw like the burst damage that they had on Liquid from it. Yeah, he how about Cardell? <laughs> the Sniper. Ooh, that is a Maureen special. Is that a counter? It's a bit tough against Natures though because in the mid lane, Sniper suffers if he can get Dove or ganked. Let's go. Another Southeast Asian TI. Is this a spoiler? Or? <laughs> this guy has inside information. Valve's new announcement. We'll just have a guy in the uh, <laughs> right on a piece of paper with a pen. Well, the bands change up for Liquid. This time they actually target out things that have been picked earlier by Falcons in the, the series. They take out the DK, they take out the Tusk. And like I said, Falcons previously banned out the Faceless Void at this point, but probably not a concern. I mean, you can still ban Lash. Unless they really think they have a plan uh, for it. They definitely are thinking about it. They're taking up reserve time for this ban. It's a very, very crucial junction here. You ban a hero and then you have to decide what you're going to pick next. And you have to make sure that the, the hero that you pick next is going to counter whatever you didn't ban. You know? The thing is, I read a book recently, first time ever, <laughs> and it talks about minimizing regret. You know, Wouldn't you regret the most losing to the same hero twice in a row to get knocked out of this tournament? Yes. So I'm surprised they didn't ban the Lash, because that, that's just, that would just suck to go out like that. Well, here's a good way to amplify the physical damage you do. You pick Weaver and you have crit play, and you're going to throw bugs on the Lash. He's not going to want to stand still attacking that. Wait, what is this? It says 0-1. Unbelievable. Oh, <laughs> good catch, Brian. The Thank numbers you. have not been crunched. Oh, I love the run the back. The game was All too right. fast. And yeah, it's the run back. Same heroes. Except for the Weaver. Except for the Weaver, and that you said that you're preferring crit to be on it. So then are we giving this gyro again to snaking? Are we... Yeah, sure. Give it, to, give it to the five. I mean, Crit's played Weaver so many times in the group stage. He looked fantastic on all of them. Uh, transition in some games to carry. He got Deso sometimes. These are... That's, a, that's the way to deal with the Lesh. Uh, you know, Tusk can do that a little bit with tag team with physical damage, but the minus armor coming from the hero is just better. Okay, Pangolier is really nice uh, against Lesh. Magic and immunity. And also very good with the Weaver, because all his spells are physical now. True. It's just a hero that gets up in... It's one of the heroes that's going to be point-blank range to the Lesh, but he's not going to be life-stealing off of you in a meaningful way, because you have all that magic resistance built in from the Rolling Thunder. So the Mana Burn also, heard you were mentioning, like the Mana Boots early, Bloodstone. Like, until you get multiple spell damage items, they don't really give you all the mana you need, so that Diffusal will significantly reduce the damage output that Lesh can do in the mid-game. Yeah. Could be a big deal. Tango received some minor changes in the patch. His old level 15 talent with a three second shield crash no longer exists, and now it's kind of built into shield crash. So depending on what level your ulti is, your shield crash will be nine seconds, six seconds, and then three seconds. Yeah, I, I thought that Pango would be worse with this patch due to the to a semi change of Orb of Corrosion. That's something that Pango would buy every game, but oh, yeah. uh, Mira pointed out backstage, well, they just buy Blightstone, and that's two thirds of the minus armor that you wanted from it. So, yeah, you don't get that slow built in, but you're effectively getting to Diffusal plus minus armor faster in some ways. So, it works just fine. And then you buy Ags quick, and now you get that instant three second shield crash without having to get to level 15. So, in some ways, it's like mid game timing is just better. Okay, so they were, we were talking about how the Pango's job is to mitigate the Lesh's impact. So Liquid's way of enabling Lesh instead of the Omni Knight is to 
disable the guy that's disabling the Leshrac. Mm -hmm. Nice time, Brian. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> so and the spell amp from the Q on the, yeah, uh, on yeah, the yeah, Bloodseeker. Yeah. Put yeah, that on Leshrac as well. I mean, so the Brewmaster has to dis disable the guy that's disabling the Pango. So he has to toss the Bloodseeker up. That's his job. Before he casts Rupture. It's too late for this. Just <laughs> yeah. So he disables the guy who's disabling the other guy who's disabled. <laughs> and then what happens is someone makes a mistake and dies. And it just doesn't it, there's matter. There's going to be a chain reaction where the yeah. first guy in the chain dies, and then <laughs> everything else goes haywire. Uh, OK, so what do we need on Liquid? They probably need an offlaner for Saber. It's going to be a blind pick into what is likely not revealed. And teammates. Uh, Offline anti mage? No, maybe not. No, I'm thinking about AM. Just because you're still worried about Leshrac? Yeah, maybe. But then I see the Bloodseeker, then I'm like, oh, probably not. Yeah, that's true. And then we counter two of their heroes. How about a Mage Slayer, Byron? That's what you were hoping for in the last game. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Get a pipe, get a Mage Slayer. Brew is not a pipe hero, so. But Snaking has been building pipes on their games mostly, on his position five. Brian, carry enthusiast. You see a Leshrac, what would you like to play? As a Dawn, carry. Dawnbreaker. Oh, no, as, as a, a carry. carry. I think it's a pretty decent looking PA game as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. A lot of minus armor. Against Rupture? PA against Rupture? Well, he's sure he's already rupturing the Pango. But then he could, have, he could rupture the PA so get an egg. But then the Pango's going to own. All right, this is never going to end. Can Pango kill Leshrac, though? Because ultimately, that's why you're picking the PA. I got to kill Leshrac. No, no, Leshrac, you leave till the end. You just, if he's mana burned. You can't leave him to the end. No, if, he he's mana, if he's mana burned, he doesn't do anything. That's the whole point of the Pango, the Diffusal. Okay. Okay, fine. I'm not convinced, though. <laughs> okay. Well, you said fine, but then you said you don't agree. Yeah, but I'm just being nice. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. I'll accept that. Beautiful panel chemistry. Omni Knight gets respect banned by Falcon. Saberlight is not allowed to have it, nor the Magnus and Liquid pick out a Life Stealer. Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about Dawnbreaker to support the Lash. I would like that. Same, similar concept, right? But they do have pretty good disengage on Falcons. Like, they, their, their initiation isn't hard commitment where the Dawnbreaker ulti kind of trumps it, right? Mm -hmm. They can just swashbuckle away, Sakuchi away. Gyro doesn't really commit his hero, so maybe not the most ideal. I kind of like Brew a lot, actually. Uh, the AoE dispel is fantastic this game against Liquid's lineup. You could even dispel, like, the Shiva's debuff, uh, debuff Blood Rage, silences on your allies, all of CM's abilities. It's, it's a good game for it. Yeah, and for anyone who did not catch the group stage, believe me, Amar can play Brewmaster. You wouldn't have thought it was in his wheelhouse, but it seems like uh, the boy is expanding his repertoire. Legion Commander. Oh, I wanted to see it. Okay, Night Stalker, that's a spicy one. It's pretty nice against Brew, because the way Brewmaster survives long enough to get his ultimate off is by using his Cinder Brew while I believe in Void Stance for like 60%. Status resistance, status but it doesn't good. work on the silence. Yeah. The silence is amazing against all their heroes, but I'm just worried about he might be a bit too greedy, you know. Like he needs a lot of farm and he also needs his lane to go well. Like one thing about NS is every time you pick this hero, you need to make sure he ha he gets a lane, you know, he has a good lane. And right now I'm not really sure what's his lane matchup. So it's a pretty risky pick in my opinion. In, in, in some ways his lane's gonna go worse because Prophet's gonna leave it to go gank yeah. somewhere else often. So Something that didn't hurt him so much last game with the Omni Knight, it, it, it could affect him here. But yeah. the silence is so do, good. Do you think it could be a flex pick between them? It could be like a nice stalker carry and lash off lane if they need to stop the lanes? Uh, I don't think they'll get too cute because I know, Knight, I I know Saberlight loves playing Night Stalker. So I, I also, what I do like about this Night Stalker pick is it's not like the Visage pick where mm -hmm. he's also bad against illusion heroes, but this time around they have the Leshrac to cover that. And then I think the only heroes in the game that in the carry role that are good against both Lesh and Night Stalker, they, they banned. Like, I think Ursa and Lifesteal are the only two. So I really like these bans from Team Liquid. I think they set themselves up really well. I don't think this is an easy, like, gotcha pick for Skeeter. He can pick something good against Lesh, but it might not be good against NS. Yeah, I think Monkey King might still be the best. Oh, Wraith King, okay. That's a pretty free mm. farm lane against the Night Stalker. He has absolutely no way to deal with your skeletons, but... Is he good enough against Lesho? Do you think that he has to buy Desolator this game instead of Radiance? Like the burst damage build? Yeah, they, they have to actually burst the Lesh. Yeah, because you're probably going to have the Radiance on the Brewmaster, so yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes for like the Armlet Deso Blink on Skeeter. That'd make a lot of sense. You can Mage Slayer as well. It's not the most amazing because it's like so attack speed heavy. Mm -hmm. You really just want raw damage in a lot of cases, but... Like, it could, could work. Could you get the Mage Slayer on the Pango, though? Is it just too bad to get it on Pango? Not a bad idea, either. It does do damage over time, so it's mm -hmm. not like the absolute worst of Procket. There is some extra damage afterwards, yeah. but... 
This game's just so much about vision, though. Like, I think the picking and choosing what fights, it's really hard to go into Team Falcon's five-man. Like, their five-man is stronger with all their ultimates, but Team Liquid can pick and choose when they do fight because you have the Nature's Prophet teleport, Mickey is going to be fast on the Bloodseeker to connect, the Night Stalker ultimate. It's going to come down to whether or not, like, Liquid is able to disengage from the five-man and then split them up and take the advantageous numbered fights. And to me, like, the main question is whether Lash is the strongest hero, whether Brian is right. Also, this time, he does not have an Omni Knight in his team. So we'll see if that changed the equation very much. But we're getting ready for game number three. Kuala Lumpur, are you ready for game number three? That's what I like to hear. Then without further ado, let me present you Mike and John. Oh, thank you so much, Tsunami. We do get into a game number three between Team Falcons and, of course, the side of Team Liquid. Jonathan, you've seen the drafts. One of these teams has to go home. The other does proceed to top six. What are you thinking? I'm thinking it's very confident for Falcons to allow that Lash Rack through one more time. It looked mm. really effective the last game there for Mika. No protection of the Omni Knight does change the story, though. And I think that's where this variation coming in for Team Falcons is going to be interesting to watch out for. Yeah. How much can they get done early? We've seen Amar on this Brewmaster before be highly effective. I think the pacing here for Team Falcons feels a lot better as well. There should be some early fast play that they can bring out and some good push, especially with the Raid King on their side. So they can counteract that aggression that we saw from Liquid in the last game, right. and that's going to be the difference maker in this one. If you want to make, make a prediction, John, one of, the, one of the team or the other, which one's going home, John? Tell me. It's a, it's a tough one to call. It's a tough one, John. It's a tough that's... one. This is a really even match. You're a tough person, John. That's why I ask you the yes. tough question. This is the tough question, and it's a really even match, even by draft. I think it's fairly close. I would lean towards probably Falcon's Wrath just a little bit more. I think it, it does feel like it scales a little bit better going into the late game. Uh, they should be able to course correct as well from the last game, considering that, well, they've dealt with the NP, they've dealt with the Lush Rack, and they were prepared for it with the adjustments in the draft. And I, I, we've seen crit as well on this Weaver. That's one thing that I haven't mentioned. This guy's insane on his Weaver. Like, we've seen so much of that impact in the group stage. So. I'm sure he's going to get some work done here. At the very least, he's going to drain their economy with all of these sentries and dust that Ooh, they liquid. have to carry around. Oh, look at this, John. This, they've snuck into the, the Radiant Triangle for a moment. They'll take the Watcher, but they will not stick around. So I thought they maybe they're trying to go for a little bit of a sneaky fight from the backside here against Falcons, but not quite. Sit back and relax, go back towards their own high ground. We haven't really seen too much level one team fights breaking out here between these two teams. They have been rather conservative when it comes to the early game. See if they do want to try for this third game, just make it absolute chaos to get things started. We'll look around here from Maureen for the, for the ward on the high ground on the dire side. Crit's going to secure Chi Yin. Xenia is ready with the frostbite if necessary, and Crit is pretty far forward. Instead, that they go after ATF, and now Insania, oh. he's the one going down way too quickly, and First Blood will be fed back the way of Crit. It's a nice, juicy morsel to find. They're going to be able to snag away the bounty rune as well. So they do end up with an even start. And Crit is still being chased, though. Thing is, ATF, oh, he gets a Cinder Brew. Crit could activate it in two. Boxy may be taking a bit too much damage. Crit will be able to get away for now. And it seems as though ATF going to be OK. Crit will barely survive, by the way. It's a, it's a lot of damage. Crit, that is, he's just going to try to eat through the Tangos. You do have Turst already on Mika. So he's going to feel a little bit better. So, uh, some movement, some attack speed to play with in the lane. Not too much to really bring it to his favor already. Again, a very strong start for Falcons. This lane for Liquid with Insania on the CM, along with Mika, of course, in the Bloodseeker, is a very stable lane. Like, you can do a lot with just Frostbite into the Blood right down the line. The Brewmaster's a little bit tougher to squish down, but you've got the Sentry ready on Insania. If Crit oversteps, oh. he's a very easy target to squish. Boxy does get caught out, Snakey. Able to secure the kill, of course, you cannot underestimate the amount of damage Rocket Barrage can deal level 1. And a snaking already getting to the head of Boxy. And you want to do that against this guy as well. Because Boxy, last game around, he, he set up so many kills in the first 10 minutes. You really do want to start to get into the psyche of this guy. Yeah, this time around, Boxy's not going to be able to leave this lane as he did in the last game. The Night Stalker's not as self-sufficient. You know, Skitter's gonna have room to be able to try to bully out or just free farm. Snaking's gonna have magic damage to deal with the Night Stalker as well. So this is a lane Boxy actually has to camp in, and that's, that's going to provide more space out for Amar and for aggression here. This is a lot of damage Sableite's way. Snaking's gonna cut him off again, but the problem is he is out of mana, or was, for the Rocket Barrage, so will not be able to continue. 
once again, Sableye ha kind of copying the, the, the short end of the stick here as they do just continue to focus on him in this landing stage. And it's not the easiest start for him either. No, it, it's a rougher go. Again, Boxy's forced to stay in this lane, which, difference from game two, top lane's not under as much pressure. And that just frees up room for Falcons to breathe, play their own game. And getting that build up you'd want on Skitter, the mid lane matchup as well. For Mall Arena, something that we used to see a lot of in the DPC, and it disappeared for a while, but it's back. Just Bangalier Leshrac, classic matchup. Nisha's doing a fine job of controlling it, but you're not going to lose out on too much on Mall Arena. And that is good news. I think the last time around, Nisha was getting maybe a little bit more on that Wind Ranger. This turn around, Mall Arena shouldn't be held off. The actions seems to be at the, the bottom lane there for a moment. Top lane, Mickey so, copying it here from ATF, and it, it is very tough against this duo. Like the Cinderbrew plus the Sakuchi to activate, it can be very, very annoying to try and go against. Especially if you're, a, you're the CM Insania, like you will just melt to the damage output that they can deal. Nisha having a, another very good game in the in the mid lane so far. Top of the CS board on the Lesh rack. It's a question the panel had as well, is why would you give this guy a track again as top lane, Mickey? Can he get jumped? In fact, they might just go after Insania as the easier target, but no, Mickey is the one dropping. Here comes Boxy from the rear, trying to go on to Crit. Crit is still trying to fight back against Insania because he has no way out. And he will go down as Boxy with another successful rotation on the Prophet. He finally finds the room to get that movement out with the NP. And you're at the point where Saberlight, he's forced to solve up in lane, but it's durable enough that he can stand on his own, at least has the Bracer to pad. That leads to activity onto the mid as well. And this is when we saw those leaning issues kick in for Falcon. How much can Boxy be allowed to leave? Can they fully punish this Night Stalker? And you've got decent damage here with Snaking and Skitter, but the Night Stalker is still a pretty tick target, even though he doesn't have the most regen. He is very hard to burst down. Certainly is. Both mid laners will be able to pick, the, pick up their respective water runes. Boxy is going to rotate back towards the bottom lane, but I, I doubt there's too much he can do here on the Prophet. Obviously, probably looking for an opportunity up top when it does show. Crit's not, still trying to be a nuisance up at the top lane against Insania, but a nice setup with the Frostbite into the Blood Ride, and Crit has already committed the Sakuchi, so Boxy now can come in, and Crit will drop once again. It, it's just the presence of the Prophet every single time you've overextended. If Insania can set up like that, Boxy, he can just come in for that added damage, and it's just so tough to get away. I mean, Insania's ready. He has a good amount of sentries set out every single time that Shikuchi kicks in. Just the Frostbite and the Blood Ride combination, and it's, an, it's a really simple kill. It doesn't take too much to melt through that Weaver. I love that Liquid Understand is opening. Amar, there's only so much he can do to help outside of the offensiveness that they can try with a Cinder Brew. And Liquid starting to find a really strong foothold in this game. First nighttime kicks in as well, so Saberlight can trade a little bit more on that Night Stalker as well while he's left solo. Although he's trying to make a move now. They will give it a crack. Saberlight underneath his tier one tower, but is surrounded by three heroes and Saberlight, he's got no helping cup. They will let the Night Stalker die. That'll be a very strong pick off here for the side of Falcon. Yeah, it's a nice one to pick up, giving it over to Skitter having this room to pressure in that bot tower as well, which is almost the same move we saw in the last game, just having, or in the first game where Skitter was playing that Naga, he just had a lot of room to get that ball rolling from the safe lane. There's, they're setting that tempo here. Snaking getting maybe a little bit too excited, does move right in, thinking that Sableye was not going to TP in, but he certainly does. Thing is, Snaking is still not down, but Boxy will TP in, and Sableye, he will be gifted a, a free kill on his way. They find... They find something for their trouble. Uh, they take the good move here in Falcons to just back off. That is more time being dragged onto bot. It, rather interesting in this game that, again, we're, we're seeing this mid not be emphasized as much in comparison to most of the games we see from Falcons. And basically, Malreen and Nisha just left alone to farm. No pressure even on the towers. At some point, we would want to see some movement out from Malreen. He does have that timing with the Blightstone into the Fusal Blade next, and that's going to be a good kicking point for them to start to play around. They drag both supports in. Maybe could find this opening onto Boxy or the tower. Yeah, absolutely. Boxy missile will fly up. Looks like they will just focus on the tier one tower. See, the, the siege creep has been left alive in Falcons. They want to try and get as much value as, out of the siege creep as possible. Actually, keep
keeping it alive with the creep wave as well. So Boxy, he is sticking around, but it's just so much damage being dealt back the way of this mid-tier one tower. The Nisha is going to be forced back into the mid lane. I'm sure it does remain defended. And not allow Boxy to really have the solo XP here as Boxy does TP back towards the Wisdom Room, but Crit was waiting in the wake. So Boxy, he's going to try for perhaps a deny against the Ancients. Crit, he does time it perfectly though. He will pick up the kill. Yeah, nice little pickup for him. Gets the Wisdom Room anyway, gets the freebie kill. Boxy trying to dance around. Instead just gives another freebie out to Weaver, who's had a little bit of an up and down game. It is opening space with all of this movement onto the mid. For the side lanes, you're getting some decent build up coming out here. For Mika, you're also getting that room that you want to see out for Skitter on the side of Falcons. Amar, he hits his level 6, but he's just going for that usual Hand of Midas build into the Radiance that the panel was talking about. So he just wants space, and so far all the heroes that need the space are finding it. And that's just going to lead to an arms race into these early timings. Something like the Desso, the Armlet coming out here for Skitter. The Bloodstone timing for Nisha to try to find from mid. Now rain. Gonna fight for this power root at the 8 minute mark. Nisha will be able to pick up the illusion. Boxy was there just in case. Of course, they have some very deep vision. So Maureen, well, he's gonna jump in on Boxy. Boxy was put it under the radiant vision as well. The Prophet, though, is able to walk out. Rupture was committed. Maureen, he's gonna try for the Rolling Thunder TP away, and he's Ooh. nearly gonna make it. 75 HP just about as mid lane. They are still chasing Nisha. Nisha will be able to stick charge up, but he's not looking too healthy. He'll bury fire, but it is not gonna be enough. Snaking to secure the kill. ATF looking for a little bit more value. Will continue chasing Insania and Mike as the tips are already flying out. Maureen having a great old time. Crit, he'll get jumped. They'll find a trade with the Weaver, but now Mike, he's gonna find a way out. Boxy will at least get the sprout on ATF, not allowing the proper chase. And it seems as though Mike will be just fine. But it is still a semi-decent trade here for the side of Liquid or Falcons, really. Yeah. I'd say you're pretty happy with that on Falcons, just saving your Pango, forcing out this Bloodseeker to take part of these fights without any major atomization, taking away time. For far, where, where is in comparison, Falcons? Skitter secure down bot, no one's making moves onto the Rape King, he's just allowed to build up, and he's under a no pressure here to just keep playing with his skeletons and farming around the map. They still hold onto their objectives, that doesn't lead to anything from Liquid, and Equilibrium holds. Falcons are very pleased with that. They could try to go for more once, once again, like, the cooldowns aren't too long here on Falcons, and they will smoke up on the hunt. Look towards the bot lane, Sableye. Do scan out. Sableye will have the information necessary to potentially back off, though he does stick around Skidder, so... But revealing he is still around this area, perhaps not predicting the smoke that was incoming. You do have the T1 tower to rotate to if you do wish as liquid, but it seems as though they are going to have to let Sableye go. Sableye will go down, Maureen able to pick up his first kill of the game here in the paint. Yep, nice movement out. Scan maybe just a little bit too short. That would look like to clip them uh, just going in and out of that mid lane instead of the full rotation. So, nice move out from Falcons. Opens up again, a little bit of a shove on that bot tier one. The side of Liquid. They're not going to be able to fight against that. They'll try onto Amar. Yeah, Rupture is committed. ATF, he's a tanky guy. He's still by his T1, so they just can't really deal with him. ATF just stands there and takes it. Now, double braces are up, so it is pretty rough to get through his HP pool. Yeah, and just having the Drunken Brawler up. Uh, you don't get pinned down for too long there. Maybe a bit optimistic on Liquid, but uh, knowing that Rolling Thunder's down, you don't really have anyone else to try to pin down anyway. Might as well just try to go for the opportunity, go back to farming for Mika. Falcons. Again, they're, they're just ramping up themselves. And this really boils down to how comfy are your mids in playing. We've seen oh, Logan. Skitter. Sprout is uh, Boxy trying to chase him down, but the Sprout doesn't really lock Skitter in. And well, he had a quilling plate anyway, so he probably would have been just fine. Very hard to, to initiate with the Prophet here onto the Wraith King. But if you are liquid, you have a sea troop down to that bottom lane. You've got a few heroes around. You might be able to just start pressuring that bottom tier one tower. It seems like Boxy will leave the area. But a little, little bit of pressure to be up. Yep, just a shove in. Good, good vision to enable this push out from Liquid as well with Boxy rotating. A little bit optimistic to try to make any big plays at this moment. Everyone's just farming up. You will trade that shove down bot for more than likely the full mid tower here. Fortify is still around and Nisha does have the running haste here. So is going to be able to stave off. No one willing to commit too big. And again, the big timer for both sides that's the most immediate is likely 
on the mid, maybe a little bit more in Saber Light as well if he's willing to go with the Echo Saber. Like, that's where the activity is going to kick in. You've got the Diffuse already on Malri, so theoretically he should be set to go to look for some plays here. Radiant's bottom tower is under attack. But now he will not. So they did throw a homing missile out onto Nisha, but they won't be able to quite get there. Now Rain gonna find himself a, a nice arcane rune, and it seems as though Boxy might be the one to get hunted down, as he will try for a TP play out. Of course, there will be no cancel here from Crit. Boxy will be just fine. Doesn't mean that they remain six to four here. Oh, Boxy! Whoopsie daisies! Has ended up in the tree line. Mm. It's fine. He's all right. He can cut it down. He's a, he's a happy lad. Not gonna be stuck for long, fortunately. And Falcons and Liquid stuck in equilibrium in this game, at the very least. Uh, good forward wards this time around from Falcons to scout into that top jungle and defender position here for the Raid King farming by the bot tier one. Otherwise, no activity. Uh, poking and prodding mid. We should be inching towards that point where you're comfy. Maybe they just want to connect now with when Amar is ready to go, which is still a ways off. Does have the Midas. Pings out onto a mark. They're going to try again for ATF. ATF going to just pop the split immediately, not wasting any time. Will not be willing to risk his life. Because you do force out the split at the least here as Liquid, so you may be happy to force a fight across the map. That fight might be happening in the mid lane very, very soon, because Maureen is moving in onto Nisha. They want to try for the left, but they miss out on him instead of trying towards Saber Light. Snake King's the one being hunted, though, and Snake King, he will go down as Liquid. It's not the biggest kill in the world, but it is certainly something. It is something, considering all this downtime. Just finding that pickoff is... It, it's satisfactory for the side of Liquid. They are starting to get some good... Uh, expand their good vision here on Falcons. Setting up on that mid lane behind the tier 1 now. And we are starting to hit that timing that we're looking for from Nisha. Bloodstone being built up. Boxy playing tag still with Amar, but again, not the easiest target to pin down. The big concern is really probably the core differential now with Skitter having so much more farm in comparison just from having those skeletons running around he's got the Desolator queued up not too far off whereas Mike he's gonna go he has the Maelstrom he's going into the BKB but even with a BKB a Bloodseeker jumping forward at that point it's not necessarily the most damage it's not necessarily the best sustain as well so it does feel like you're still going to be relying more on Nisha to take point with that Blood Summon again the Lush Rack without the Omni Knight is gonna be a different story Boxy Let's get spotted here by ATF. No way to cancel the TP though, so Boxy gonna be okay to retreat. Group up back into the mid lane here. Maureen's gonna find Boxy now by the looks of it, and Crit is gonna move into boot. Boxy is gonna find out the hard way. They do have vision on that hype. Very hard to see ward though, because Crit has literally just been camping the area for quite a while, and you see Insania ready to de ward, but he knows he can't close the gap. Mikke? Yeah. Even having his farm stolen, Crit just getting as much value as possible. And that's, that's what makes Crit's Weaver so damn annoying. We've seen it so much in, in the group stages there as well. Just makes the lanes win, and then he's just this massive nuisance that you have to invest support gold into to cancel off, to just counteract. One thing for Liquid as well that's a cause of concern is the fact that they have not made progress in the tier 1s. In fact, Saberlight by that tier 1. And we'll get stunned up. Swashbuckle is there. Saberlight is also going to be purged. There's really no hope out. He'll get knocked down to the low ground at the least. Pops the ulti as well. And he's going to go for a run. The Swash apparently doesn't do much damage. The Night Stalker is going to be just fine. Mid lane, Insania. We'll be chased here by Crit. The ward is still on that high ground, so they have plenty of vision, but this it? time Crit Ooh. may get punished, but a nice time lapse. He will be all right. Surely this ward does get the awarded now. I mean, it has to go at some point. No sentry up on Insania. It, it, it is within vision. They will be able to take it out. There is still this nice ward right in front, in between where Tier 1 and Tier 2 is, so there's still some information for Falcons to play with. Uh, the movement of Crit. It's just such aggressive positioning throughout this whole game on the Weaver. Uh, it's kind of like you mentioned. This is what he's famous for when it comes to this possible Weaver. It's just the, the constant aggression, the constant vision gain for his team, the information he provides. And just a real nuisance again. Just steals your camp sometimes, just soaks some XP, just as annoying as he possibly can be. Yeah, and it, it just disrupts your gameplay on the side of Liquid. Like they're not able to shove in any of these waves. They're not able to go forward tier ones. They're not able to really cross the river at any point. And they're, they're just kind of stuck waiting. Mind you, they've got the Bloodstone up on Isha, so that's one early time. He's going into the Veil next. That should give them some confidence to start playing in. 
to what the Side of Falcons have. Equisaber is well ready to go on Saberlight. Great. Great. Spine is out. Saberlight going to move out. Silence is there as well. The Weaver. Let's have some help around. It was just snaking, but they will even be. Crit will drop. Everyone else just TPs up. ATF not interested in staying around that top lane any longer. No need to force it. Crit side of Falcons. I mean, they know some of these early timings are up on Liquid uh, with some of the inventories they've seen. They still need a more to finish up the Radiance for that forward presence to cut off some of that right click damage Saberlight might want to leverage. And maybe some, some of those uh, early protective items, or at least the early Destro for Skitter, which is still being built up, lacking the Blightstone, not too far off. Once you can melt that Leshrac, that's where things can open up. And that is the question as well. Is, is the Leshrac durable enough with just the Bloodstone without something like the Omni Knight to save? It doesn't feel like it would be, but you amp him up maybe with a Blood Rage to, for some spell amp, it could be still a massive risk to jump into. Top lane, a bit of a group up here from Liquid. Towards ATF on the, on the Brewmaster, ATF running right towards Saberlight. They'll make the jump in now. Rupture committed as well with the Frostbite and the Freezing Field just in case. And ATF will melt. Skitter, he did try to rotate. In fact, they are going to try and force a fight. Boxy is the target. It's not exactly a great trade for, for the side of Falcons, but they will have to just take it. It's Boxy still on the run. Meanwhile, Insania being chased by Snaking on the other side. It's like Boxy gets a spread off, creating plenty of space. Insania the first one to drop on the CM as Boxy still juking around, but Skitter, he can spell him in the tree line. Boxy now running towards the north, but really has no... Oh, hold on a oh. minute. Never mind. Skitter's got him. In fact, Crit was the one to take the kill. Yeah, I mean, the Gossamer escape coming a little bit clutched there, but eh, Crit will find a kill at really some space to shove in mid. And a good sequence of events for... Falcons overall, but Liquid, they equalize, they finally find a tier 1 tower. With the Desu up in Skitter though, that opens up Roshan. And with a secondary life to threaten with, they can start to force some of these bigger fights. They know some of the tools available on Liquid at this point. They've got the board to protect this take of Rosh. They can try to invade that top area, maybe force out into a tier 2, or just go hunting. Roshan will drop very freely here. The sign of Falcons. Liquid unable to really contest or really much about it. Falcons will take the aid to skid up. He wants to pick it up here on the Wraith King, so you've got multiple lives now on this guy. Seems that the Blink Dagger is going to be the, the next item built up on Skitter. So going full aggressive mode now. It's Team Liquid. You have to play the slow game once again. Like you, you never really want to fight into the multiple lives of the Wraith King. So they'll have to sit back and relax for a little bit unless they find a real prime fight. Falcons, they might start pressuring that top T2 tower. Things are coming out. Nisha. They could see him if they could hold him down for a little bit. The left rack would be the primary kill that you could ask for here if you are Falcons. They will not be able to get that lockdown we talked about. And, uh, Falcons doesn't seem like they're really too interested in committing for the T2 yet. Just keeping that farm going. And well, speaking of farm, ATF now has the full radiance of him. That's going to be one big piece for them to reveal in these bigger fights. Just the constant burn damage on top, the missed chance. Especially in something like the Night Stalker and the Blood Secret this game. Don't have any ways of sorting through that just yet. And BKB up and Mika at the very least can help. Uh, but once that shortens down, Gamar's presence will be felt. Safe shove up on the tier two. They've got some forward vision now as well on Falcon. The scout behind that little jacuzzi box up top. Liquid finally getting room to cross the river. Saberlight getting that farm himself. This blink timing on the Night Stalker is gonna be gonna be the big one. We, talked the pan we heard the panel talk about it, but having the Crippling Fear, you you're not going to care for stat resistance. Um, with no BKB on Amar, he is going to be setting up from that initiation from Saberlight. And the Brewmaster is one big oh. tool in preventing an Oh, panel. Boxy, barely able to get away from the Tormentor. <laughs> He's going to be all right, and he's just going to have to be the one to tank it. The key will be able to do so. Just fine. Shards will go the way of Boxy. And Liquid. Gotta take their Tormentor with Falcons, they'll leave theirs for now. Not too interested in trying to force it. They are just much more interested in the net worth lead. And it's such an even game. Like, less than 1k lead the way of Liquid. It could really go either way in that next fight. The only real advantage Falcons has right now is the fact that the Aegis is still up on skin. It still has a lot of time. And again, the side of Falcons are playing rather conservatively, not fully forcing in the issue 
onto any objective. Just more than happy to take their time, more than happy to play this farming game, which Liquid is also satisfied with. Getting some shove out, not even having to expend this BKB and Mika at any single point just yet. Smoke finally out from Falcons, though. They don't have vision on that bot side they're crossing into, but they run into someone on the way to the fine. Yeah, looking at mid, uh, Falcons. Not going to find the opening they're looking for. Perhaps through the mid-river they can go. Still hanging around the Dire Triangle, looking for the opening. But Liquid seem to have an idea that they are around this area. So they'll go for a counter smoke into the mid lane. But now Falcons have left the area. Not too interested in sticking around without their own smokes. So they'll just leave to the high ground, get in that position. Maureen, though, may get caught in the pango. Ooh. The jump is in the sauce. Oh. Now Maureen barely able to swash away, but it's not going to be enough. He is gone. That's a start for Liquid. Falcons, I do not believe, want to stick around and fight. They immediately all TP up at Snaking. He'll be left behind. Sableye will catch himself <laughs> another fish. The Snaking, he'll buy a little bit of time running towards the north, but understands he's not getting away. Mickey will take another. That is a really unfortunate squash there for Malreen. Looked like he might have been trying to aim at a weird angle onto the stairs. Ends up on his little cubby by the ramp and just gets picked off, giving the opening for Liquid. Finally getting some push out on that top tier one and getting to invade a little bit in that jungle. Falcons, pretty scattered out. I mean, that smoke, that smoke failing Mid to lane. get that information out a Jump lot. is there, Mickey. He's been caught here by Skidder. Forced the BKB up and just run. So a little bit of value there from Falcons. At least getting the BKB forced from Mickey. And you'll know that for 80 seconds that is down in Falcons. They'll see if they can find the opening they're looking for or maybe even just forcing this mid tier two tower. If they've got the output. Skitter is starting to get hungry to build that Desolator up with charges. Maybe force this fight here. Really quick, they're going to try and move in. ATF is a big target. He does have the Primal Split, but he's been silenced up. He's been given no chance to be able to pop this off. And ATF, he is down. They've even got the first life of the Wraith King. Keep in mind, he still has the Aegis. That'll oh be the secondary God. life. Can they get him a third time? Chris going to try to move in to help out. Nisha, oh, Skitter, that's too much damage. Oh. That is oh. too much damage. Just can't handle it. The magic damage pumping out, all the right clicks in the world, the full mule near the attack speed for Mikit. Oh, just poor old Snake. The can he get away? No. no, he cannot. Snaking will follow his carry. Four down for Falcons and Liquid, and a triple kill to Mikit. That is just overwhelming coming out here on Liquid. A really confident from Falcons, just forced that issue. Like, yes, they had a secondary life, you, you still don't have a way for Amar to play once the silences are off. And once he's held in place, if he can't split, he can't have impact. That's one life. Let's go for the second. Look how quickly this melts. The Skidder just absolutely getting deleted. That's the second one. Let's go for a third, shall we, Skidder? Just no chance. Just like that. Absolutely zero chance of survival. Just way too much output. I think ATF's face says it all, John. It's, it's a rough goal for Falcons. Liquid. Again, just doing a great job of playing at the same pace that Falcons want to. They're willing to drop these tier one towers early. They sit back, they play it safe, they farm, and they come right at you with this flash. Like Nisha is just looking insane. Nikke looked insane last game. And it's this exact same timing almost with Bloodstone BKB, with the Veil to amp up even more output. I, it's such a hard hero to deal with. You need oh, to have Fallen around for this. Oh, he's got Snaking again. Pops the ulti just in case Skidder's gonna run in. There's no Reincarnate available. Oh. Skidder, this is such a risky play. What? His team is gonna show up, but Skidder is dropping. He's been silenced up. Your armor top won't survive for now. But again, no Reincarnate available for 35 seconds. Meanwhile, Boxy still going. Does end up going down. The Skidder will leave the area. Jump in from Sableye. They found Maureen now. Maureen is gone. In fact, they even found Crip, the Weaver, being caught by the Frostbite oh, of Insania. No. He will follow. Tips out for Sableye, who's giving all the information his team needs. Just so valuable, this Night Stalker and Sableye just forcing him into such an awkward fight. I mean, I I'm just surprised Falcons are constantly forcing this issue. Skitter in particular. You mentioned it, he had no reincarnation. He almost drops the reinforcements from Liquid or not. It doesn't take too long for them to connect from that area. Well, here we go. 
This time they'll have reincarnate. Nisha, he's gonna be the one to get jumped off. The stun is there. Nisha, he's a tanky target. He's gonna try and fight through it. Pulse Nova out, Skidder dropping low again. He is gone. Uh-oh, I've seen this one before. As Skidder, he'll, re he'll come back in, but can he actually get out of this? It looks like he can. Reincarnate is down, but that's about it. Split as well, of course, as ATF trying to, to set up something for his team, but Oh, they do find Nisha again here with the Cyclone. Problem is, can you actually kill him? Nisha, he's wrapped up. Maybe they could think about it. He'll pop the Bloodstone. He's still alive, still yeah, healing man. up a Saber Life. Here he comes. Here's the, here's the Giga Chat himself onto Maureen. Maureen is gone. Onto oh the Brewmaster. God. Oh, Mickey is just again. cleaning up. An ultra kill for the Bloodseeker. And Falcons, though, they are desperately trying, but Liquid are just cleaning up as it could be a rampage out for Mickey. Oh my goodness. And it will be. And Falcons, though, what do you do? What do you do, Liquid? They are feeling it now. Liquid are on point. Falcons, it's been mess after mess. Three fights in a row, they're fighting fragmented in. They go chasing around without Malreen. What was the point of this Pango? Uh, to melt sure. the mana of the Lesh Rack. They take this fight anyway. When they finally come in with the Lesh, they've already lost reincarnation. It's not adding up. None of these fights are adding up. They're forcing it back to back to back. And maybe this is where some of that experience of how long Liquid's been together, even with a stand-in situation, kicks in. They stay cool, they stay calm, they, co they stay collected. Play to the strengths of their lineup. And they just find that timing. Mickey, a very happy boy, of course. Happy <laughs> <laughs> faces of Liquid. And how can you blame them? How can you blame them? This game is well and truly in their control now with the 16k advantage. Falcons, they're going to go for another smoke up. Another five man. They'll try again. 45 seconds till the reincarnates up, but they're not looking for a 5v5. They just want to pick off. They'll head towards the shield room. Maureen will take that one. Nisha was the primary target they were looking for, but he has left the area. And in fact, Roshan has respawned to boot. So Liquid, they will have first dips. Yeah. Just dodge out this gank while they're, while they're at as well. Forward vision being dropped by Falcons. Smoke out from Liquid. They're on the wrong side of the map. Falcons, they, they can't afford to give this one away. But they will. Yeah. Just but what no else information. do you do? They can try shoving out, they can try setting up for the high ground defense. Uh, they don't. They only have that bot tier 2 tower left standing to kind of protect their bot from the lane of Rax as well. Only the lane of Rax if they can't quite go for the super creep just yet. I will have to say as well, look, looking at this, at this build up from Malreen, he did decide to go for something like the Satanic. The panel uh, had ATF, some ideas. So. ATF boxes in with the Orchid out, he will use the Ogre Seal Totem to jump away. So the scary thing about Boxy now, right? Like he's got the blink up, he's got the orchid up, so you just you're never really safe when the prophet comes in. No boots necessary here for this prophet, just four wraith pants and four blink and orchid. You love to see it. That's that's a thing of beauty. That's Ice Frog's finest creation. Start on tier two doesn't take too long to melt. Output from Isha is insanely high. And I I'm I'm just looking at these items. Like I I get the idea behind the Satanic. I get that you want to take, you feel like these fights are going to take longer. You want to stay alive long enough to melt through the mana, to stay in true with the Satanic. But we heard the ideas of the panel. You know, Winter was saying something like the Mage Slayer could have been useful. And just preventing some of that output from Nisha could have been one way to provide more durability out the Skitter, especially pre BKB. Let's see if that BKB will make a difference down the line. Liquid not going to wait around, though. Yeah, three-man smoke up. Griff going to reveal himself in that tree line, but they want a bigger target. They're going to head south, and they do find Snake. Not quite a bigger target, but it's still going to be a one to start with as they head down towards the south. Oh. Even further, they actually ended up finding ATF, who tries to TP away and barely makes it before Sableye gets within range for the Void. But now they're onto that tier three bottom tower. Buyback was committed by Snake. Liquid, do you want to stick around? Three and a half minutes left on the Aegis of Nisha. All they can hope to do is chip away at the Lesh Rack for now and let Liquid just leave. And I believe that's exactly what Liquid will do. They will just leave and wait for another day. No, no rush here for Liquid. Still so much time left on that Aegis. They've got an Amplified Damage Rune as well to find here. That's going to be really tasty. Especially if they maybe decide to hand it over onto Nisha. Falcons, I mean, they're trying to keep as much shoved away. They're getting that build up they'd want to do on a Mar, finally starting to work onto that BKB on that Brewmaster, needing a way to just safely split in the, in the middle of these fights. It is going to be one way to get it done. 
but it, they've got some vision at least to watch that mid area. They've got some ways of trying to punish, maybe boxing, cutting, boxy cutting some waves if he does decide to go for it. But catching out right now, it's just, it feels near impossible unless they're fully grouped up. And if they're fully grouped up, I mean, Liquid, they've got information in hand. They've got some nice, awkward wards watching mid for any sort of smoke play, for any sort of peeking that the side of Falcons would want. Heck, on every lane, they've got a good forward ward. They've got a general idea if someone just steps away from the map and it's, it's just keeping them safe, just allowing them to take complete control. Full AC up on Mika. So much armor, like that burst play now with the Desolator, it doesn't feel as feasible on Tanisha. It hasn't felt feasible. And with the Shiva's guard and the AC, it's too much armor for Skitter to even consider jumping in. Like this Raid King, it, it doesn't hit hard. Even the supports are going to be a little bit of a challenge. Crit does get dusted up. They will miss out on the Sprout. Crit will be able to Tsukuchi way just fine. Meanwhile, bottom, there is a jump in. Sableye, he found ATF on his own. It's a 1v1, but Sableye is certainly at the advantage with this Crippling V. He just continues to move in. ATF can split for this, and he is forced to. Sableye finding value now needs his own way out. With the Dark Ascension, though, he probably will just be fine to do so. In fact, he might even follow ATF and just keep up the vision. With the Twin Gate, Sableye, where are we headed? He will get Cyclones up. Meanwhile, mid lane, Skitter getting jumped here by Nisha, but Nisha gonna look to retreat. But they say that Nisha just moving right back in onto the creep wave. And everyone does survive for now, but you don't have Primal split up, so it seems like Liquid wanna try and force the fight. Rupture was committed onto Maureen in the mid lane. Skitter. Meanwhile, ATF top lane, action all across the map. Skitter in the mid lane has gone down in the Radiant base. Liquid, they're just moving in. Skitter, he'll BKB up, but look at the damage! Mickey, he'll just keep going and Skitter trying to survive. Oh the best he can, he is gone. He is down. It's Liquid continuing. ATF being body blocked by Box. He just cannot make it out. He is finally down. And Liquid, GG is called. Oh GG my is God. called. Liquid have done it. Falcons, they will have to leave earlier than they anticipated for Team Liquid. They will be moving through the lower bracket and they have secured themselves at minimum top six. What a spectacular fashion for Team Liquid to get that done as well. A lot of back and forth in that draft. You know, the Bloodseeker pick working out well at Falcons. You know, they, they go back to some of that comfort, right? They bring out the Crypt Weaver. They've got that aggression early. They've got Skitter on the Raid King and it feels like they've got some answers, but it's Liquid that again, hold out, just allow that pace of the game to come around and just get that build up even better. They hit that critical mass with a Bloodstone up. They get this really strong combination for Mika to play on top to hold Amar back from his timings. And even though Boxy wasn't as active as he was in game two, like the moment he started getting those rotations out, it just felt devastating for the top lane. And Sableye just plays a steady off lane. He doesn't need much. He just stays alive and that's enough. Yeah, he certainly had a fantastic game here, Sableye, on the Night Stalker. And you, you have to argue, game two and game three, he was looking like the MVP. Of course, speaking of MVPs, Nisha. Popping off twice in a row with the left track, and you don't want to give this guy left track to begin with, but yeah, it felt as though Falcons had no choice. They tried to deal with it, but it was just way too much in the end. And for Falcons, this is a brand new team. Yeah, this is his first experience on land here together. Uh, they'll come back stronger, I'm sure. Definitely so. And this is a team with a lot of promise, of course, and just for coming out from the men of qualifiers into here, that journey was it, it was an amazing journey with a lot of high moments. But Liquid, the experience kicks in. And the adaptation, I think that's the one great thing about this lineup. They can adapt so well on the fly as the tournament changes, as the patch changes in the middle of the tournament. And that certainly shines here. Well, that was some quick adapting as well. It's not easy to play on a new patch when you've, where you've only had like, what, maybe six hours, seven hours of, uh, of time to prepare, maybe a bit more than that. And Liquid showing us why they are so great uh, as a roster. And props the same light again. Like this guy just stands in. Obviously the pressure was on. He makes it work. He shows you how great of a, of a player he is. And, well, Liquid, they deserve top six at the minimum. I don't know if the pressure's on for Saberlight. As he said, I mean, Saber. he said the pressure's off. He doesn't, he just wants to play. That's what he says. You know, you, you know he's a, he's a cheeky. I trust him. I trust him <laughs> on his word. Seems like a very trustworthy fellow. And certainly, you know, that confidence, I think, is a big factor coming in. I think it's just playing to what you're familiar with. Just, not, you know, you still care, but you, you're not pressured. And just that gives you so much room to, especially on a new patch, 
to have the right mindset to just approach the game in the, in a new manner. Well, we've got Slax with the winners on stage. Let's throw to him and see what he's got to say. All right, thank you so much, guys. Hello, hello. Yes, I am here with Mr. Bing Bong himself. Welcome back, my friend. Now, I went for Mickey. He got a rampage in the game. I went to go grab him, and they said, it is part of your contract with the team that you will be taking all the interviews in this event. Is that true? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, they would not take me as a stand-in otherwise. So here I am, your favorite Team Liquid player, guys. I know you want to hear from the rest, but you get, uh, you get Saberlight interview instead. Well, I will take that. I will take that, my friend. I'm very happy to hear from you. So tell me about that series. First one that we got to a game three. What happened in the series that you guys lost? Uh, and feel free to flame these guys. I mean, you're not technically on the team, so. Dude, I actually forgot what happened in game one. I already, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm zooted. But uh, what I will say, what I will say is that Team Falcons is like the worst team to play on this new patch. They buff Mars, they buff Timber, they buff Razor. We're like, okay, guys, uh, maybe, maybe uh, Gaven just really likes Amara because uh, there's no way. And Marine actually plays the same heroes. So it's like, uh, you, it's unlucky. <laughs> unlucky, but you guys made it work for sure. I mean, the Lashrac, pretty unbelievable there. Uh, I would get used to never playing that hero again. True. And uh, honestly, I can't leak anything, but this is not even, we have so much more cooking up. This is not even the most OP one. Oh, that's what I like to hear. Can we talk a little bit about the Omni Knight? I mean, a little ba uh, biased, but I mean, Omni Knight coming out was pretty hype. Yeah, because uh, I didn't really know what to pick. So I was like, okay, team, what do we need here? And Nisha said, uh, I think Omni good. And I was like, okay, Nisha suggests the hero. I have to pick Omni Knight. But uh, I did not touch this hero for a long time. So after, after I picked it, I had to like open the Dota screen and actually read the spells. <laughs> Because I didn't know the W is dispellable. Well, I don't know, they, they sneaked it in some, somewhere. Bro, you can't say this in a post-game interview. You're gonna make bad. You didn't even know how to play your hero when you still beat them, bro. That, that, that's cruel, but all right. Rip a bow's home. All right, take it easy. Take it easy. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I am sure we're gonna see a lot more from Saberlight as the official interviewer of Team Liquid, but thank you for a great performance. Best of luck to Liquid moving forward, and we'll throw it back to you. You're gonna get a guarantee to be able to see him tomorrow because Liquid have secured themselves a top four finish here at ESL One Kuala Lumpur 2023. And it was off the back of him, man. He was clearly carrying the entire thing. I think he's giving Nisha a little bit more credit. What, what was he saying that he didn't know? He didn't know that Guardian Angel was dispellable? I think Repel is Repel what Repel was dispelled? Yeah. I'm not buying it. He's an Omni enthusiast. Yeah, I'll say at the beginning of today, what I like about Team Liquid in these situations in these lower bracket is they just are so good at taking the pressure off of themselves. And you saw it in game three where they were still losing at one point and they got like a couple kills and they were tipping each other. Like good vibes tips, you yeah. know? And this is just the kind of thing where, I don't know. Like I don't know any other team that does this sort of thing. And I have to believe it's essential for all of their lower bracket runs that they've made throughout the last like eight months, including I, today. Yeah, I would just say it's because they win. They, they don't necessarily win tournaments, but they had so many second places last year or this year. <laughs> that, uh, they, they just go deep all the time. So like, OK, they're just in another scenario. Like, we'll see how they go. They're not at full power because Blitz isn't here. So they're just going to do their best. And that mentality and knowing that they're going to continue doing good just really makes the pressure less. I mean, maybe they need to start muting each other. That's how they're gonna Muting? Win. Yeah. Yeah, that's how they're gonna win. That's what uh, Zai said in their Riyadh Masters game. <laughs> he was playing Brood Mother, and he's like, I just had to mute everyone. That was a 1v9 game for me. Was it the Brood game? It was the Brood yeah. game. Yeah. He had to finish things off against Talon his own way. So he said the team was despair, so he had yeah. to tune them out and do his own yeah, thing. I mean, sometimes in a game, you just have to block everything out, you know? That's why not everybody gets to play the win condition hero. Which, speaking of the win condition hero, Winter, we saw Leshrac again. Are you convinced? Yes. Oh! I believe Brian. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. first time he's ever said that. Did anybody take a clip? <laughs> High praise. I, I think I'm convinced too. I mean, the, the physical damage was there with the Wraith King. There was a window when he had the Deso. But as soon as uh, Leshrac built Veil, I was like, it's over. <laughs> like, yeah. That's just the, 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 the small armor part of the Shiva's guard. So like, once he finishes Shiva's as well, Deso doesn't. No, there was this anything. one fight, like five of them went on him and he just didn't die. <laughs> and Night Stalker killed everybody. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, when I saw that fight, I'm like, okay, this game is over. A uh, change that happened a couple patches ago that I think is not is underutilized whenever I see the hero is the Night Stalker's abilities being refreshed when he uses his ultimate. 
So he was doing a really good job of chaining the silence on ATF in the mid game, where that's like 12 seconds of silence, and there's just no way that Bruce Flit was ever going off. You see, Brewmaster never wants to go Radiance into BKB, but that's what mm -hmm. ATF had to do because of that Night Stalker pick. So we did see that paying off as the game went on. I mean, do you think he could have just played without BKB and just split it from far away and just joined the fight? Could have bought like a four staff, maybe? Four staff? Yeah. <laughs> Coulda, shoulda, woulda, all things that may be running through their head, but still an admirable performance for this new roster to end up finishing with a top six performance. And to speak some closing words on their performance, we've got Slack standing by with Crit. Thank you so much, Tsunami. Yes, I have Crit, who was gracious enough to uh, give us a exit interview, so thank you so much for your time. Um, Crit, Team Falcons, a lot of new fans coming out. I feel like you guys performed really well at this tournament. A lot of expectations, especially for a new squad. How are you feeling uh, with how far you managed to come? Uh, I think before the tournament, we would have been happy. I think now, obviously, after you lose it, it always feels bad. But I think first tournament for us, and we had a good group stage. We had a lot of lessons. I think we can be pretty happy with top six. Obviously, maybe we could have gotten a little bit more, but that's, that's how Dota works. All right, any plans with the squad to, uh, you know, solve these issues? Was it more of a patch thing, or you think uh, you guys just need some more time to gel? I think it's just time. Like, it's our first LAN. Uh, Malrin has never played on LAN before either, so, like, we, we have a lot of LANs this year coming up. Like, we're, we're not in a rush to, to be good. We want to make it in time for Riyadh and TI, and that's, that's the end goal. All right, well, fantastic. Uh, any words out there to the fans? I mean, uh, I am one of them. It's really fun to see you guys gelling together and playing like this. Yeah, it was a... It was a it was a very loud crowd here. Uh, we could pretty much hear it all the time, so that was amazing. I always appreciate it uh, when it's like that, so thank you to all the people here. Uh, thank you to all the people watching at home as well. It's, it's always nice to feel the support. Well, thank you so much for